Welcome aspiring ethical hackers and curious minds to the ultimate journey into the fascinating world of cybersecurity. In this comprehensive ethical hacker full course, we will delve into the realm of ethical hacking, where we will learn the art of securing digital landscapes while keeping the digital world safe from malicious intent. Whether you are a beginner or an experienced tech enthusiast, this course is designed to equip you with the skills and knowledge needed to become a proficient ethical hacker. So let's embark on this adventure together as we unravel the secrets of ethical hacking and empower ourselves with the tools to protect and defend. And before we begin, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity or to become an ethical hacker by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch career with cybersecurity or ethical hacker by learning from the experts, then try giving a shot to simply learn postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Computing. The course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Now let's take a minute to hear from our learners who have experienced massive success by opting out these courses. Hi, I'm Philip. I'm 61 years old and last year I upskilled with Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity after working 30 years in the IT sector in various different profiles. I'm happy to tell you that I was able to clear and pass my CISSP and CCSP certification exams on the first attempt after taking the course. The course, I must say, was packed with practical examples. It was led by highly skilled certified instructors with many companies before as a, as a security analyst and the architect on a contract basis, but I needed some stability, which I got with the job I just started with Infosys as a cybersecurity consultant. Happened on the first. And if these are the types of videos you would like to watch, then hit the subscribe button, like and press on the bell icon to never miss on any future content. So stay tuned with us until the end of this video and don't forget to register your opinion in the comment section below. Meet Anne. She often shops from www.shoppingcart.com. She has her information like email ID, address and credit card details saved on the website to enable a faster and hassle-free shopping experience. The required information is stored in a server. One day, Anne received an email which stated her eligibility for a special discount voucher from ShoppingCart.com. In order to receive the coupon code, she was asked to fill in her ShoppingCart.com account credentials. This didn't seem fishy to her at the time, as she thought it was just an account verification step. Little did she realize the danger she would be facing. She was knocked off her feet when a substantial amount of money was wiped off her account. How do you think this happened? Well, yes, the email she received was fake. Anne's ShoppingCart.com account witnessed unauthorized access from a third party. This type of attack is known as a cyber attack, and the person who carries it out is called a hacker. Could Anne have prevented this attack? Indeed, she could have, with the help of cybersecurity. Cybersecurity involves techniques that help in securing various digital components, networks, data, and computer systems from unauthorized digital access. There are multiple ways to implement cybersecurity, depending on the kind of network you are connected to and the type of cyber attacks you are prone to. So, let's take a look at the various cyber attacks that Anne could have been exposed to. One of the most common types of cyber attacks is a malware attack like Trojan, Adware, and spyware, to name a few. Had Anne downloaded any suspicious attachments online, her system could have gotten corrupted by certain malicious viruses embedded within the attachments. Next is a phishing attack, the type of cyber attack which Anne experienced. Here, the hacker usually sends fraudulent emails, which appear to be coming from a legitimate source. This is done to install malware or to steal sensitive data like credit card information and login credentials. Another type of attack is the man-in-the-middle attack. Here, the hacker gains access to the information path between Anne's device and the website's server. The hacker's computer takes over Anne's IP address. By doing so, the communication line between Anne and the website is secretly intercepted. This commonly happens with unsecured Wi-Fi networks and also through malware. Password attack is one of the easiest ways to hack a system. Here, Anne's password could have been cracked by using either common passwords or trying all possible alphabetical combinations. To prevent future cyber attacks, Anne sought to implement a few cybersecurity practices. 
First, she installed a firewall. As the name suggests, it is a virtual wall between Anne's computer and the Internet. Firewalls filter the incoming and outgoing traffic from your device to safeguard your network, and they can either be software applications or hardware reinforcements. Secondly, Anne implemented honeypots. Just like how flowers attract bees, dummy computer systems, called honeypots, are used to attract attackers. These systems are made to look vulnerable in order to deceive attackers, and this, in turn, defends the real system. In addition to these, she also decided to use unique alphanumeric passwords, antivirus software, and started avoiding mails from unknown senders. That was Anne's story. Cyber attacks are not just confined to individuals, but also to public and private organizations. The cyber attacks carried out in such places are more deadly, and they result in colossal losses. Motives of such attacks are many, starting from tampering with crucial data to monetary gains. Let's have a look at a few of the cyber attacks that companies are subjected to. Various public sector organizations and large corporations face the Advanced Persistent Threat, APT. In this form of attack, hackers gain access to networks for a prolonged period in order to continuously gain confidential information. Companies also witness the denial of service attack, where networks are flooded with traffic, which in turn leaves legitimate service requests unattended. A variant of this is the distributed denial of service, DDoS attack, when multiple systems are used to launch the attack. When a hacker manipulates a standard SQL query in a database-driven website, it is known as a SQL injection attack. By doing so, hackers can view, edit, and delete tables from databases. Amidst a plethora of cyber attacks, it is indeed a challenge for organizations with several networks and servers to ensure complete security. This is not an easy task, and to help with this, cybersecurity professionals are hired to work on identifying cyber threats and securing a company's network. There are multiple job roles in the field of cybersecurity. If hacking fascinates you, then the role of an ethical hacker is something to be explored. Such professionals try to explore a network's vulnerabilities, just like how a hacker would do, but only to identify those vulnerabilities and resolve them for protection against an actual cyber attack. But if you are looking to design robust security structures, then the role of a security architect is more apt. A Chief Information Security Officer, CISO, plays a crucial role in enterprise security and is entrusted with the overall safety of the information in an organization. So, here's a question for you. Identify the type of cyber attack where the hacker's system takes over the client's IP address. A. DDoS attack. B. Man in the middle attack. C. Phishing attack. D. Password attack. Give it a thought and leave your answers in the comments section below. Three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. With the increase in the production of global digital data, it is anticipated that cyber attacks will quadruple in the near future. Organizations are going to need cybersecurity professionals who can prevent these attacks. A career in the field of cybersecurity is lucrative and a very smart decision for professionals now. We humans are highly tech savvy in today's times. With the extensive use of the internet and modern technologies, there is a massive challenge in protecting all our digital data, such as net banking information, account credentials, and medical reports, to name a few. Have you heard about the deadly WannaCry ransomware attack? The attack happened in May 2017 in Asia, and then it spread across the world. Within a day, more than 230,000 computers were infected across 150 countries. The WannaCry crypto worm encrypted the data and locked the users out of their systems. For decryption of the data, the users were asked for a ransom of $300 to $600 in Bitcoin. The users who used the unsupported version of Microsoft Windows and those who hadn't installed the security update of April 2017 were targeted in this attack. The WannaCry attack took a toll on every sector. Top-tier organizations like Hitachi, Nissan, and FedEx had to put their businesses on hold as their systems were affected too. Now, this is what you call a cyber attack. To prevent such attacks, cybersecurity is implemented. We can define cybersecurity as the practice of protecting networks, programs, computer systems, and their components from unauthorized digital attacks. 
These illegal attacks are often referred to as hacking. Hacking refers to exploiting weaknesses in a computer network to obtain unauthorized access to information. A hacker is a person who tries to hack into computer systems. This is a misconception that hacking is always wrong. There are hackers who work with different motives. Let's have a look at three different types of hackers. Black hat hackers are individuals who illegally hack into a system for a monetary gain. On the contrary, we have white hat hackers who exploit the vulnerabilities in a system by hacking into it with permission in order to defend the organization. This form of hacking is absolutely legal and ethical. Hence, they are also often referred to as ethical hackers. In addition to these hackers, we also have the gray hat hackers. As the name suggests, the color gray is a blend of both white and black. These hackers discover vulnerabilities in a system and report it to the system's owner, which is a good act. But they do this without seeking the owner's approval. Sometimes, gray hat hackers also ask for money in return for the spotted vulnerabilities. Now that you have seen the different types of hackers, let's understand more about the hacking that is legal and valid, ethical hacking, through an interesting story. Dan runs a trading company. He does online training with the money his customers invest. Everything was going well, and Dan's business was booming, until a hacker decided to hack the company's servers. The hacker stole the credentials of various trading accounts. He asked for a lump sum ransom in exchange for the stolen credentials. Dan took the hacker's words lightly and didn't pay the hacker. As a result, the hacker withdrew money from various customers' accounts, and Dan was liable to pay back the customers. Dan lost a lot of money and also the trust of his customers. After this incident, Dan gave a lot of thought as to what could have gone wrong with the security infrastructure in his company. He wished there was someone from his company who could have run a test attack to see how vulnerable his systems were before the hacker penetrated into the network. This was when he realized he needed an employee who thinks like a hacker and identifies the vulnerabilities in his network before an outsider does. To do this job, he hired an ethical hacker, John. John was a skilled professional who worked precisely like a hacker. In no time, he spotted several vulnerabilities in Dan's organization and closed all the loopholes. Hiring an ethical hacker helped Dan protect his customers from further attacks in the future. This, in turn, increased the company's productivity and guarded the company's reputation. So, now you know hacking is not always bad. John, in this scenario, exposed the vulnerabilities in the existing network, and such hacking is known as ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is distributed into six different phases. Let us look at these phases step by step with respect to how John, our ethical hacker, will act. Before launching an attack, the first step John takes is to gather all the necessary information about the organization's system that he intends to attack. This step is called reconnaissance. He uses tools like Nmap and HPing for this purpose. John then tries to spot the vulnerabilities, if any, in the target system using tools like Nmap and Nexpos. This is the scanning phase. Now that he has located the vulnerabilities, he then tries to exploit them. This step is known as gaining access. After John makes his way through the organization's networks, he tries to maintain his access for future attacks by installing backdoors in the target system. The Metasploit tool helps him with this. This phase is called maintaining access. John is a brilliant hacker. Hence, he tries his best not to leave any evidence of his attack. This is the fifth phase, clearing tracks. We now have the last phase that is reported. In this phase, John documents a summary of his entire attack, the vulnerabilities he spotted, the tools he used, and the success rate of the attack. Looking into the report, Dan is now able to take a call and see how to protect his organization from any external cyber attacks. Don't you all think John is an asset to any organization? If you want to become an ethical hacker like John, then there are a few skills that you need to acquire. First and foremost, you need to have a good knowledge of operating environments such as Windows, Linux, Unix, and Macintosh. You must have reasonably good knowledge of programming languages such as HTML, PHP, Python, SQL, and JavaScript. Networking is the base of ethical hacking, hence you should be good at it. 
Ethical hackers should be well aware of security laws so that they don't misuse their skills. Finally, you must have a global certification on ethical hacking to successfully bag a position of an ethical hacker like John. Few examples of ethical hacking certification are Certified Ethical Hacker Certification, CEH, CompTIA Pen Test Plus, and Licensed Penetration Tester Certification, to name a few. Simply Learn provides a cybersecurity expert master's program that will equip you with all the skills required by a cybersecurity expert. You could have a look at it by clicking the link in the description. So, here's a question for you. In which phase of ethical hacking will you install backdoors in the target system? A. Scanning B. Maintaining access C. Clearing tracks D. Reconnaissance Give it a thought and leave your answers in the comments section below. Three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. The endless growth of technologies in this area is directly proportional to the number of cybercrimes. Cybercrimes are estimated to cost $6 trillion in 2021. Hence, to tackle these cybercrimes, organizations are continuously on the lookout for cybersecurity professionals. The average annual salary of a certified ethical hacker is $91,000 in the U.S. and approximately rupees 7 lakhs in India. So, what are you waiting for? Get certified and become an ethical hacker like John and put an end to the cyber attacks in the world. Data is the new gold. Imagine how much data is generated by just your smartphone every single day, be it the pictures you click or the messages you send. Nearly 41 million messages are sent worldwide via WhatsApp every single minute. So safeguarding your personal data against hackers has now become a top priority. Did you know that India leads the world when it comes to ethical hackers with 23% of the worldwide hacking population from India? The top ethical hackers earn more than twice of what software engineers in India do. But what makes ethical hacking such a demanding industry? Ethical hacking is the process of taking security measures to safeguard data and networks from malicious cyber attacks. The hackers use every tool at their disposal to try and breach the security barrier and find any potential vulnerabilities. The ethical in ethical hacking denotes the lack of malicious intent since these sessions are often permitted by the system owner or the network that is being hacked into to fix any compromised entry points before black hat hackers discover and exploit them. So what is a black hat hacker you may ask? A hacker who exploits security vulnerabilities for monetary gains like stealing or destroying private data, altering, disrupting or shutting down websites and networks is known as a black hat hacker. On the other end of the spectrum, we have white hat hackers who help people secure the networks by stress testing the platform against the most dangerous of cyber attacks. That is with their consent, of course. But the most neutral of the bunch are grey hat hackers who may not ask for consent before snooping on a foreign system, but they do inform the owner if they find any vulnerabilities, sometimes in exchange for a small fee. The security breaches have become less and less prevalent thanks to rigorous ethical hacking campaigns and corporate awareness programs. The ability to fix critical security issues before black hat hackers leverage them has saved organizations billions of dollars. Google, IBM, Microsoft and virtually every major corporation are looking to protect the data. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the ethical hacking and information security job market is set to rise by nearly 28% by 2026 with salaries going as high as $225,000 per annum. So that's ethical hacking wrapped up in two minutes. To catch more bite-sized and detailed videos on different technologies, subscribe to Simply Learn and stay updated. In today's digital age where cyber threats loom large, understanding ethical hacking is crucial. By delving into the world of ethical hacking, you gain a deep comprehension of hacker techniques and vulnerabilities, which will enable you to strengthen your security measures. With the demand for cybersecurity professionals soaring, learning ethical hacking opens doors to a wide range of exciting career opportunities. Moreover, it empowers you to protect your personal data and privacy while staying one step ahead of evolving cyber threats. By embracing ethical hacking responsibly, you contribute to a safer digital environment, enhance problem-solving skills, and foster continuous growth. Get ready to embark on an exciting journey into the realm of ethical hacking and discover its immense value in today's interconnected world. And if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elects to switch careers with cybersecurity by learning 
from the experts, then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity from Schwarzman's College of Computing in collaboration with EC Council. The link in the description box page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Take action, upskill, and get ahead. But before we begin, if these are the type of videos you'd like, to subscribe button and click on the bell to never miss an update from Simply Learn. Without further ado, let's get started with understanding why you must learn ethical hacking. There are a wide variety of reasons of why to learn ethical hacking. Let's discuss the important ones. Firstly, cybersecurity awareness. Next, strengthen security measures, career opportunities, protection of personal data, awareness of cyber threats, ethical use of skills, problem solving, and continuous learning. Now that we have few important reasons, let's discuss each one of these important reasons in a bit more detail. Firstly, cybersecurity awareness. Learning about ethical hacking provides you with a deep understanding of the techniques and methods used by hackers. This knowledge helps you identify vulnerabilities in your computer systems, networks and applications, enabling you to better protect them. The next one is strengthening security measures. By learning ethical hacking, you can actively contribute to improving the security of computer systems. Ethical hackers often identify weaknesses in organizations, networks, and provide recommendations for enhancing security measures. Followed by that, we have career opportunities. The field of cyber security and there is a high demand for skilled professionals by acquiring knowledge of ethical hacking you can open up various career opportunities in industries such as it security consulting penetration testing and incidents response next ahead we have protection of personal data understanding ethical hacking techniques empowers you to safeguard your personal data with privacy you can implement security measures to protect your devices online accounts and sensitive information from potential attacks awareness of cyber threats is the next one on the list the digital landscape is constantly evolving and new threats emerge regularly learning ethical hacking helps you stay up to date with the latest cyber threats attack vectors and vulnerabilities enabling you to proactive your measures to mitigate the risks followed by that we have ethical use of skills Ethical hacking emphasizes the responsible and legal use of hacking techniques. By learning ethical hacking, you gain the knowledge of the ethical guidelines and legal boundaries associated with cybersecurity. This ensures that your skills are utilized for positive purposes, protecting individuals and organizations from malicious attacks. Next on the list is problem solving skills. Ethical hacking requires critical thinking, problem solving, and analytical skills. Through learning ethical hacking, you develop a systematic approach to identifying and solving complex security issues which can be valuable in various aspects of life and other technical domains. Next on the list is continuous learning and growth. Cybersecurity is a dynamic field that demands continuous learning to keep up with evolving cyber threats. Learning ethical hacking ensures that you remain engaged on ongoing education and skill development, fostering personal and professional growth. Now, let's get into the important aspect of today's tutorial, that is salary details for a certified ethical hacker. In the United States of America, the salary of an ethical hacker can be based on various factors such as experience, skill, level, location, industry, and the organization they work for. Generally, ethical hackers in USA tend to earn higher salaries than other countries due to the demand for cybersecurity professionals. Entry-level positions may start around $60,000 to $80,000 per annum, while experienced professionals with advanced certifications and specialized skills can earn salaries exceeding $150,000 per annum. The salary of ethical hacker in India can vary depending on factors such as experience, skill set, location, and organization they work for. On an average, a beginner level ethical hacker in India from 3 lakhs to 6 lakhs per annum. As they gain more experience and expertise, their salary can increase significantly. Experienced ethical hackers with several years of experience and advanced certifications can earn salaries ranging from 8 to 20 lakhs or more annually. Now, proceeding with the company's hiring 
ethical hackers. Several companies hire ethical hackers to enhance their cybersecurity defenses and protect their systems. Here are some prominent companies known for hiring ethical hackers. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, IBM, Cisco, Intel, Deloitte, and EY are the most prominent ones. The topics that we are going to discuss in this video are what exactly hacking is, the types of hackers, the classifications, what is ethical hacking, the skills that are required of an ethical hacker, the process that is utilized by ethical hackers in their daily activities, and then we, lastly, we are going to discuss cryptography. So let's talk about hacking and what exactly hacking is. Hacking refers to exploiting weaknesses in a computer network to obtain unauthorized access to information. A hacker is a person who tries to hack into computer systems. Now here there are some keywords that we need to understand. First and foremost, exploit. When you are exploiting weaknesses, weaknesses are technically called vulnerabilities, which are basically design flaws, misconfiguration errors, usage of default usernames and passwords, which have not been modified. So any misconfiguration or anything that has been left behind by a security administrator that can be misused, which means exploited by a hacker to gain unauthorized access. So the next term is unauthorized access, something that you're not allowed to do. And when you say a hacker is a person who tries to hack, it's basically a person with malicious intent trying to gain access to a system or a resource that they are not authorized to access in the first place. How do they do it? They find a vulnerability that is a weakness or a flaw, and then they misuse it to gain access to that particular network. So here in the diagram, you can see that a sender on the left hand side is trying to send some data to the receiver on the right hand side. The hacker would try to gain unauthorized access to the transmission that is being sent and would try to capture the data packets and read the secrets within. Let's look at a business case scenario into hacking. Now there is an organization, uh, everybody is going around their own business when they realize that their systems may have been compromised. Now they're trying to look at the customer data to ensure that that has not been compromised and they're trying to assure the customers. However, they do realize that some customer data has been lost and even the company reports have been modified as well. Now, this is the scenario where there have been some security controls in place and those controls have been identified. They realized that there is an attack that has happened and based on that attack, they have realized that the data has now been compromised and the records have been modified uh, uh, by the hacker, which means that the data is no longer trustworthy and thus cannot be used by the business for any legal transactions. So then the hacker gives a call to the organization or gets connected to the organization demanding a ransom. For the data to be replaced to be taken back into the original state where it was trusted and thus the organization can utilize it for business transactions the organization has probably no backup so they decide that they want to pay the lump sum to the hacker to restore that data so that they can continue on with the business thus money exchanges and the hacker is able to restore that data and the business continues as usual however the activity here of a hacker trying to leverage the misconfiguration of the weaknesses in the organization's security, thus being able to hack them and uh, make these ransomware demands. So the company then uh, wants to figure out, even if having a security system in place, how was the hacker able to hack their systems? Thus, one of the employees comes up with a brilliant idea of identifying vulnerabilities in the network uh, to proactively search for any flaws that have been left behind uh, so that they can plug those flaws and nobody can misuse them. Thus, they figure out that they want to hire an ethical hacker who would help them identify the security posture of the organization, identify the weaknesses, vulnerabilities and flaws and help them remedy those flaws so that in future scenarios, these scenarios will not happen. So before we go into an ethical hacker, let's understand what are the types of hackers. So what are the types of hackers? Hacker is a technically skilled person uh, who is very adept with computers. They have good programming skills. They understand how operating system works. They understand how networks work. They understand how to identify flaws and vulnerabilities within all of these aspects. And then they understand and know how to misuse these flaws to get a outcome which would be detrimental to the health of the organization. So there's six type of hackers that have been identified. Black hat hackers, white hat hackers, gray hat, script kiddies, nation sp uh, sponsored hackers, and uh, hacktivists. So black hat hackers are basi basically uh, the malicious hackers who have malicious intent and have criminalistic tendencies. They want to harm the organization by hacking into their 
infrastructure by destroying their infrastructure by destroying their data so that uh, they can gain from it from a monetary perspective. Uh, these guys are also known as crackers. The main aspect of these uh, people are that they have malicious intent, they try to do unauthorized activities and they try it for personal gain. Another important aspect to remember is that a black hat hacker will always try to hide their identity. Uh, they will spoof their online digital identity by masking it, by spoofing their IP addresses, MAC addresses and try to remain anonymous on the network. A white hat hacker on the other hand is also an ethical hacker or a security analyst who is an individual who will do exactly the same thing that a black hat hacker would do minus the malicious intent plus the intent of helping the organization identifying the flaws and remedying them so that nobody else can misuse those vulnerabilities. So they are authorized to act on the company's behalf. They are authorized to do that activity which would help the company identify those flaws and thus help the company mitigate those flaws improving on their security posture. So these uh, these kind of security experts or ethical hackers would help organizations defend themselves against unauthorized attacks. Grey hat hackers is a blend of both white hat and black hat hackers. So here they can work defensively and offensively both. They can accept contracts from organizations to increase their security posture. At the same time, they can also get themselves involved in malicious activities towards other organizations to personally gain or benefit from them by doing unauthorized activity. Script kiddies are people uh, who are technically not much aware about what hacking is. Uh, they rely on existing tools that have been created by other hackers. They have no technical knowledge of what they are doing. It's just a hit or miss for them. So they just get their hands on a tool. They try to execute those tools. Uh, if the hack works, it works. Otherwise, it doesn't. So these people are basically who are noobs or newbies who are trying to learn hacking or uh, just uh, uh, people who with malicious intent who just want to have some fun or trying to impress people around. Then we have the nation or the state sponsored hackers as the name suggests these hackers are sponsored by their government. Now this may not be a legitimate job but most of the governments do have uh, hackers uh, enrolled in their pay on um, uh, on their uh, organizations to spy on their enemies, to spy on various countries and try to figure out uh, the aspirations of those countries. So this is basically a spying activity where you are technically trying to get access to other countries resources and then try to spy on them to figure out what their activities have been or what their future plans have been. And then we have the hacktivists who is an individual who has a political agenda to promote and they promote it by doing hacking. So uh, these guys, what is the difference between a black hat hacker and a hacktivist? The black hat hacker may try to hide their identity. A hacktivist will claim responsibility of what they have done. So for them, it's a political agenda, a political cause, and they will try to hack various organizations to promote their cause. They would probably do this by defacing the website and posting the messages that they want to promote on these websites. So what exactly is ethical hacking then? We have discussed the types of hackers. We have identified a malicious hacker as a black hat hacker with the intent uh, of doing harm to an organization's network for personal gain. We have discussed what the ethical hacker is. So an ethical hacker would be doing the same activity but in an authorized manner. So they would have legal contracts that they would be signing with the organization which would give them a definite scope of what they are allowed to do and what they are not allowed to do. And the ethical hackers would function within those scopes, would try to execute those uh, test scenarios where they would be able to identify those flaws or those system vulnerabilities and then they would be submitting a report to the management of what they have found. They would also help the management to mitigate or to resolve those weaknesses so that nobody else can misuse them later on. They might use the same techniques and the same tools that black hat hackers do. However, the main difference here is that these guys are authorized to do that particular activity. They are doing it in a controlled manner with the intent of helping the organization and not with the intent of personal gains. So who is an ethical hacker? Again, an ethical hacker is a highly intelligent, highly educated person who knows how computers function, how programming languages work, how operating systems work, they can troubleshoot, they are technically very adept at computing, they understand the architecture, they understand uh, how various components in a computer work, they can troubleshoot those components and they can basically be uh, very good with programming as well. Now when I say programming, we don't want an ethical hacker to be a good developer of applications. We want them to understand programming in such a way that they can create scripts, they can write their own uh, short programs like viruses, worms, trojans or exploits which would help them achieve the objective that they have set out for. So 
uh, here you can see uh, the ethical hacker they are individuals who perform a security assessment of their companies with the permission of con uh, concerned authorities so what is a security assessment a security assessment is finding out the exact security posture of the organization by identifying what security controls are in place how they have been configured and if there are any gaps in the configurations themselves so an organization will hire a ethical hacker they they would give the ethical hacker the information about what information is or what security controls what firewalls uh, what IDSS, IPSS, intrusion detection or intrusion prevention systems, antiviruses are already in place and then they will ask the ethical hacker to figure out a way to bypass these mechanisms and see if they can still hack the organization. What is the need of an ethical hacker? The need of an ethical hacker is proactive security. The ethical hacker would identify all the existing flaws in an organization and try to resolve those flaws to help secure the organization from black hat hackers. So ethical hackers would prevent hackers from cracking into an organization's network by securing the organization by improving on their security on a periodic basis and they would also try to identify system vulnerabilities, network vulnerabilities or application level vulnerabilities that would have been missed or have already been missed and then try to figure out a way of plugging them or uh, resolving them so that they cannot be misused by other hackers. They would also analyze and enhance an organization's security policies. Now, what are policies? Policies are basically documents that have been created by an organization of rules that all the employees need to follow to ensure that the security of an organization is maintained. For example, a password policy. A password policy would help users in an organization to adhere to the standards the organization has identified for a password complexity. For example, a password when a user is creating them should adhere to standards where they are using random words, they are uh, they contain the alphabet A through Z, uppercase and lowercase, 0 through 9 as numerics and special characters and they are randomized so that the password becomes more, more stronger to prevent from brute force attacks. So what would an ethical hacker do at this point in time? They would try to test the strength of the passwords to see if brute force attacks or dictionary attacks are possible and if any of these passwords can be cracked. They would ensure that all the employees are following the policies and all the passwords are, are as secured as the policies want them to be. If there are any gaps in the policies or the implementation of the policy, it is the ethical hacker's responsibility to identify those gaps and warn the organization about it. Similarly, they would also try to protect any personal information, any data that is owned by the organization that is critical for the functioning of the organization and they will try to protect it by, uh, from falling into the hacker's hands. Now, what are the skills that are required of an ethical hacker? These are the following skills. So first and foremost, they should have good knowledge with operating systems such as Windows, Linux, Unix and Mac. Now, when we say knowledge about operating systems, it's not only about how to use those operating systems, but how to troubleshoot those operating systems, how these operating systems work, how these operating systems need to be configured, how can they be secured. For example, securing an operating system is not only installing a firewall and an antivirus, but you need to configure permissions on an operating system of what users are allowed to do and what users are not allowed to do. For example, limiting the installation of applications. How are we going to do that? We need to go into the system center, the security center of Windows and we need to configure security parameters over there of what are acceptable softwares and what are not. Same with Linux and uh, Mac softwares, operating systems. So we need to know how we can secure these operating systems. Similarly, all of these would have desktop versions and server versions of operating systems. As an ethical hacker, we need to know the desktop and server versions both, how to configure them and how to provide services within the organization on these servers so that they can be consumed in a secure manner by all the employees. At the same time, they should also be knowledgeable of programming languages or scripting languages such as PHP, Python, Ruby, HTML for programming if you will because web servers come into the picture. So again, they should not be great developers where they can create huge applications but they should be able to develop scripts, understand those scripts, analyze those scripts and figure out what the output should be of those scripts to achieve the hacking goals that they have set out for. An ethical hacker should have a very good understanding about networking. No matter whether you're in application security, you're in network security or you're in host-based security, since a computer will always be connected to a network, either a local area network like a LAN or the internet internet, we should know how networking works. We should know the seven layers of the OSI model. We should know which protocols work on those seven layers. We should identify the TCP IP model and how OSI model can be mapped to the TCP IP model. 
we should understand how TCP and UDP work, how uh, how each and every protocol is crafted, how they are supposed to behave for us to analyze and understand any network based attacks. We should be very good in security measures. So we should know where those vulnerabilities would lie, what are the latest exploits available in the market, and we should be able to identify them. We should be able to know the techniques and the tools of how to deal with security, how to analyze security, and then how to implement security to enhance it as well. Along with that, it is important that a security analyst or ethical hacker is aware of the local security laws and standards. Why is that? Because an organization cannot do any illegal activity. Whatever responses that they have, whatever security mechanisms, whatever security controls they will implement, they need to be adhering to the local law of the land. They should be legal in nature and should not cause undue harm to any of the employees or any of the third party clients that they are dealing with. So the ethical hackers should be aware of what uh, security laws are before they implement security controls or even before they start testing for security controls. And all of these should be backed up by having a global uh, certification or a globally valid certification related to networking, related to security, ethical hacking, the law of the land, anything and everything, maybe even programming. Uh, it's good to have a certification in PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, and so on and so forth. Why? Because most of the organizations when they hire ethical hackers look out for these certifications especially globally valid certifications so that they can be sure or they can be assured that the person that they are hiring has the required skill set so let's uh, talk about a few of the tools that an ethical hacker would utilize uh, in their testing scenarios to be honest there are hundreds of tools out there uh, what you see on the screen are just a few examples of them uh, Nessus is a vulnerability scanner. What is a vulnerability scanner? It is an automated tool that is designed to identify vulnerabilities within hosts, within uh, operating systems, within networks. So they come with their ready-made databases of all the vulnerabilities that have already been identified and they scan the network against that database to find out any possible flaws or any possible vulnerabilities that currently exist on the host or the operating system or on the network. Similarly, there would be application scanners like uh, Acunetix or Arachne that would help you scan applications and identify flaws within those applications as well. Now, all of these are automated tools. The essence of ethical hacker is when these tools churn out the reports, the ethical ha hacker can understand these reports, analyze them, identify the flaws and then craft their own exploits or use existing exploits in a particular manner so that they can get access or they can bypass the access uh, security controls mechanisms that are already in place. How can they do that? With the tool called Metasploit. You see that big M there on the right hand side? That M logo is for a tool called Metasploit, which is a penetration testing tool. What is a penetration testing tool? It is that tool that will allow a ethical hacker to craft their exploits or choose their exploits for the vulnerabilities that have been identified by Nessus. Since we are interacting with computers, we will always be interacting using tools. Right. So the first tool, Nessus, identifies the flaws and the possible list of vulnerabilities. We do a penetration test using Metasploit to validate those flaws and to verify that those flaws actually exist and try to figure out the complexity of those flaws. And that's where Metasploit helps us do that. Wireshark would be used in the background while you are doing both the activities using Nessus or Metasploit to keep a track of what packets are being sent and by received on the network, which will help us analyze those packets. So whenever I run a Nessus scanner, I would run a Wireshark in the background. It will capture the data packets and I can go through those data packets and analyze that data packets to identify what Nessus is actually trying to do. Similarly, when I try to attack a machine using uh, exploit on Metasploit, uh, I will keep on Wireshark running in the background to capture the data packets that have been sent and the responses that I've received from the victim so that I can also go through those packets and analyze the responses and analyze the attack, whether it was successful, to what extent was it successful, and uh, basically will also give me a validation, a proof of the activity that has happened. Nmap is another automated tool that allows me to scan for open ports and protocols. So why would I use Nmap? Because pro ports and protocols become an entry point for a hacker to gain access to devices. For example, when we connect to a web server, we connect through a web browser, but we automatically connect to port 80 using HTTP and port 443 is using HTTPS. So if I'm connecting to a web server using HTTPS, it is safe to assume that port 443 on the web server is open to accept those connections. Similarly, there would be other services that may be left open on the web server 
because nobody thought about configuring it or they misconfigured the web server and they left unwanted services running. So Nmap will allow me to scan those ports and services and allow me to understand what services are being offered on that server so then I can start analyzing that server, identify those flaws within those services and then try to attack them. If the application that I'm analyzing is connected to a database and I want to do a SQL injection attack or I, if I, if Nessus tells me that there is a SQL injection attack that may be possible on that particular application, I can use an automated tool called SQL map or SQL map that would allow me to automatically craft all the queries that are required for a SQL injection attack and help me do that attack at the same time. So here I do not have to manually create my own queries. Uh, the SQL map tool would automatically create them for me. What I would do is I would use Nessus to identify that particular flaw. If Nessus reports that flaw, I would then go use the tool SQL map, configure it to attack that particular web server. And when I fire off the tool, it will then automatically start directing queries SQL injection queries to the database to see if those uh, databases are vulnerable and if yes, what data can be retrieved from those databases. So all of these tools in a nutshell would help me hack networks, applications, operating systems and host devices. And this is what an ethical hacker does. They use these kind of tool sets, they identify what attacks they need to do, they identify the right tool for that particular attack and they write their exploits, they create those attacks and then they start attacking, analyze the response and then give a report to the management uh, providing them feedback about how the attack was created or crafted, what was the response to that attack and whether the attack was successful or not. If successful, they would also give recommendations of what to do to prevent these attacks from happening in the future. So when we are doing these attacks or when we want to launch these attacks, what is the process that, that we would follow? So there are six steps that we would do as an ethical hacker. If you are just a hacker, you probably wouldn't do the sixth step, which is a reporting step. So the first step that would be done is the reconnaissance phase, which is the information gathering phase, which is very important from an ethical hacker's perspective or a hacker's perspective. Because if I want to attack someone or something as a digital device, I need to know what I'm attacking. I need to know the IP address of the device, the MAC address of those devices. I need to know the operating system, the build or the version of that operating systems, applications on top, the versions of those applications. So I know what I'm attacking. For example, if I, if I want to attack a server, I assume it's a Windows based server and I use a particular tool to attack it, but it actually turns out to be a Linux based server. My attacks are going to be unsuccessful. So I need to focus my attack based on what is there at the other end. So in my information gathering phase, I want to identify all of that information. Once I have that information done, I'm going to scan those servers using tools like Nmap that we just talked about. And we're going to try to see the open ports, open services and protocols that are running on that server that can give me possible entry points within the network or within the device or within the operating system. At the same time, along with the scanning with Nmap, I would run a vulnerability scanner, the Nessus vulnerability scanner we talked about or Acunetics for applications. And then I would try to identify vulnerabilities in those applications, operating systems or networks. Once I've identified those vulnerabilities in the scanning phase, I would then move on to the gaining phase where I would then craft my exploits or choose existing exploits and start attacking the, attacking the victim. At this point in time, if my attack is successful, I will probably have gained access uh, by either cracking passwords or escalating privileges or exploiting a vulnerability that I may have found during the scanning phase. Once I have gained my access, I want to maintain my access. Why? Because the vulnerability may not be there for long. Maybe somebody updated the operating system and hence the flaw was no longer exist uh, existing or somebody changed the password that may ha I may have cracked, thus I no longer have access. So what do I do to maintain my access? I install Trojans or backdoor entries to those systems using which I can secretly in a covert manner get access to those devices at my own will at my own time as long as those devices are available over the network. So that's where I maintain my access. I have hacked them. Now I want to maintain my access. So I install a software which would give me a backdoor entry to that device no matter what. Once I have done this, I want to clear my track. So whatever activity that I've been doing, for example, installing a Trojan. A Trojan is also a software that would create directory, directories and files once installed on the victim's machine. So I want to hide that. If I have access data stores, if I have modified data, I want to hide that activity because if the victim comes to know that something has happened, 
they would start they would start increasing their security parameters they might start scanning their devices they may take them offline thus my hack would no longer be efficient the reason i'm clearing my tracks is that the victim doesn't find out that they have been hacked or they have been compromised or even if they do find out that they've been compromised they cannot trace the compromise back to me so i would be deleting references of any of the ip addresses or mac addresses that i may have used to attack that particular device and this is where i will be able to identify where those logs were created where those traces are once i take off those traces the victim would not be any wiser of whether they have been compromised or who compromised their system and if i am successful at all of these stages or what to whatever extent the success that i have achieved in any of these stages i would then create a report based on that and i would report to the management about the activities that we have been able to do and whatever we have been able to achieve out of those activities for example we identified 10 different flaws there were 20 different attacks that we wanted to do what attack did we do what was the outcome of that attack what was the intended ex or, or the expected output of that attack i'll create a report which would give a detailed analysis of all the steps that were taken along with screenshots and evidences of what activity was conducted what was the output what was the expected output and i would submit that report to the management giving them an idea of what vulnerabilities and flaws exist in their environment or their devices that need to be mitigated so that the security can be enhanced so these are the six steps that the ethical hacking process would take uh, just going through this the rec uh, reconnaissance is where you're going to use hacking tools like nmap hping to obtain information about targets there are hundreds of tools out there depending on what information you want then in scanning again nmap and expose these kind of tools to be utilized to identify open ports protocols and services in gaining access you're going to exploit the vulnerability by using the metasploit tool that we talked about in the previous slides in the maintaining access you're going to install backdoors you can use metasploit at the same time uh, you can craft your own scripts to create a trojan and install it on the victim's machine once you have achieved that clearing tracks is where you are going to clear all evidences of your activity so that you do not get caught or the victim doesn't even realize that they have been hacked and once you have done all of this we are going to create reports that are going to be submitted to the management to help them understand the current security evaluation of their organization so now let's see how we can hack using social engineering now what is social engineering social engineering is the art of manipulating humans into revealing confidential information which they otherwise would not have revealed so this is where your social skill and your people skills come into the picture if you are able to communicate effectively to another person they would probably give up more information that they intended to give out let's look at look at examples right if you see on the screen phishing activity what is phishing we receive a lot of fake mails on a regular basis we have always received those emails where we have won a lottery of a few million dollars but we have never realized that we didn't purchase a lottery to win a lottery in the first place we have always had those nigerian frauds where a prince died in some south african country and you out of 7 billion people on the planet have been identified where they want to transfer a few hundred million dollars through your account and they want to give you 50% of that money in return as thank you so some very basic attacks where you go on to websites and there's a banner flashing at you saying congratulations you're the 1 million visitor to this website click here to claim your prize all of these are social engineering attacks phishing attacks fake websites fake communications being sent out to users to prey on their gullibility most of humans always have that dream of striking it rich winning a huge lottery once and for all and living their life lavishly ever after but sadly in the real world that's not that doesn't happen that often and if you're receiving those mails it is very important that you first research the validity of those those communications before you even want to act upon them So why are humans susceptible to social engineering because humans have emotion machines do not try pleading with a machine to give you access to a account that you have forgotten a password to the machine wouldn't even know what you're doing try pleading with a human sympathy or empathy where you could uh, try to create a social engineering attack where you can uh, plead with them saying if i do not get access to this account immediately i might lose my job and then that would put my family into problems somebody would feel empathy or sympathy towards you and help you reset that password and give you access to that account it's how good the attack is and how convincing you are for the success of this attack to happen so what is a familiarity exploit attackers interact with victims to gain information which will benefit the attack as to crack credentials as passwords if we want to reset our passwords what do we have as a mechanism to resetting passwords we have some security questions that we set up those questions are nothing but personal information that we would know 
but through a social engineering attack we, it would be easily be able to uh, uh, gather the information that you have set for your security questions the security questions can be as simple as the first school that you attended you probably have that listed on your linkedin profile where a uh, person can just go in there and see your academic qualifications and identify the school that you were in right similarly uh, it might also be a question what was your mother's maiden name that's a very good attack and that's uh, I mean if a person can interact with you let's say they are trying to take a survey and they approach you for a feedback on a particular product that you have been utilizing and they ask you these questions you wouldn't think twice before giving those answers as long as the request sounds legitimate to us we are able to justify that request we do answer those queries so it's upon us to verify the authenticity of the request coming in before we answer it phishing as discussed would be fraudulent emails which appear to be coming from a trusted source so email spoofing uh, comes into mind uh, fake websites and so on and so forth exploiting human curiosity curiosity killed the cat right so there was uh, there's so many physical attacks where hackers just keep pen drives lying around in a parking lot now this is a open a generic attack whoever falls victim will fall victim so if i just throw around a few usbs in the parking lot obviously with trojans implemented on them some people who are curious or who are looking for a couple of freebies might take up those pen drives plug them in their computers to see what data is on the pen drives at the same time once they plug in their those pen drives on their computers the virus or the trojan would get infected and cause harm to their machine then exploiting human greed uh, we just talked about the uh, nigerian frauds and the lotteries those kind of attacks the fake money making gimmicks now basically this is where you prey upon the persons uh, greed kicking in and they kick, uh, clicking on those links in order to uh, get that money that has been promised to them in that email so one of the safest mechanism to keep data private and to keep yourself secure is using encryption now encryption can happen through cryptography what is cryptography Cryptography is the art of scrambling data using a particular algorithm so that the data becomes unreadable to the normal user. The only person with the key to unscramble that data would be able to unscramble it and make sense out of that data. So we're just making it unreadable or non-readable by using a particular key or a particular algorithm and then we're going to send the key to the end user, the end user using the uh, same key would then decrypt that data if anybody compromises that data while it is being sent over the network since it is encrypted they would not be able to read it so the encryption algorithm would be something like this now if you see uh, the computer word once made into unreadable format would uh, look like e q o r x v g t for an end user it wouldn't make any sense but the person who has a key to unscramble that would be able to convert it back to computer and then understand the meaning of that word so this is just a substitution cipher that is being shown on the screen so what is the alphabet the key is alphabet plus three so c plus three alphabets that becomes e o becomes q m becomes o so the key that is utilized to scramble the data is the character that you are at the third character from there would be the corresponding key so the encrypted message is also known as a cipher the decryption is just the other way around where you know the key now and you can now figure out what that e correspondent to by going back three characters in the alphabet most of the times a certified ethical hacker must decrypt a message without knowing the secret key so let's say a ransomware has affected your organization or has affected a device and you want to figure out uh, or you want to decrypt that data now as an ethical hacker you wouldn't be for paying a ransom uh, to the hacker would you so it is now your prerogative of how you're going to work around and how you're going to try to crack the encryption mechanism how to crack the cipher to decrypt that message and see what's within it right decryption without the use of a secret key that is known as a cryptanalysis cryptanalysis is the reversing of an algorithm to figure out uh, what the decryption was uh, without using a key so cryptanalysis can be done using uh, various formats the first one is a brute force attack second is a dictionary attack the third one is a rainbow table attack a brute force attack is trying every combination permutation and combination of the key to figure out what the key was it is 100 percent successful but may take a lot of time a dictionary attack is where you have created a list of possible encryption mechanisms a list of possible cracks and then you try to figure out whether those cracks work or not rainbow tables are where you have an encrypted text in hand 
and you're trying to figure out uh, the similarities between, between the text that you have and the encrypted data that you wanted to decrypt in the first place. So in the brute force attack, you're trying every possible combination, permutation of what the key would be. In dictionary attack, you have a word list that would tantamount to the key. And if you're, you're trying to match all the words listed in the text file or the word list to see if any of those words are going to work to decrypt that data. Here in the rainbow table, the ciphertext is compared with another ciphertext. You find out similarities and then you try to work or reverse engineer your way accordingly. So let's have a quick demo on cryptography before we end this session. So to begin with the demo of cryptography, we are on a website called spammimic.com, which will help us scramble the message that we created into a completely uh, a format which would be unrelated to the topic at hand. So if I say I want to encode a message, a turn a short message into spam. So what this does is you want to send across a secret message. You type in the secret message, a short one, and it will convert that into a spam mail. You send it across. So whoever is reading that spam mail would never get an idea of the embedded message within it. So if I want to type in a message here, hi, this is a secret message the password is asd at the rate one two three four and i want to send this out to people or to one of my colleagues but i want to send it out in a secret manner so that others are not aware of this so when i press on encode what the algorithm would do is it will convert this message into a spam mail so my message hi this is a secret message the password is at the rate one two three four or ASD at the rate one, two, three, four gets converted into this. Now, if you read it, dear e-commerce professional, this letter was specially selected to be sent to you. This doesn't make sense. There is nowhere or no reference to the actual message that I've already sent. So if I copy this entire message and I send it, let's say via email to the recipient. Now, the thing is that the recipient needs to know that I've encoded it using spam mimic. The algorithm remain, needs to remain the same. So once they know that it is spam mimic, what they can do is now in this instance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a new browser and I'm going to go to the same website. And at this point in time, I'm going to click on decode. When I click on decode, I'm going to paste the message that I've just copied. There we are. And this message is now being copied into a different browser. And if I decode this, you will see that it will convert it back to the original message that there was. So the key is there at spam mimic and uh, it is embedded within the message. So whenever we, we paste the message in the decode factor, it knows what the key was and it can decrypt that message and give me the actual message that was embedded within it. There we are, the entire message. This is what we created in the Google Chrome browser and in the Firefox browser, we decoded. Similarly, if I want to protect these kind of messages, there is an aspenencrypt.com website where let's say we use text encryption and I want to encrypt the same message. This is a secret message. The password is ASD at the rate one, two, three, four. And then I give it a password to protect this message. Let's say the word password. And I use the cipher to scramble this by using, let's say AES, which is the strongest cipher right now. And I say encrypt. So this is what the encryption would look like. And basically, uh, if I don't have the password over here, if I decrypt it, you would see that the error has occurred. Now, if I type in the password over here and then decrypt it, it will be able to convert that back into the unscrambled text and it will give me what the original message was. This is a secret message. The password is ASD at the rate one, two, three, four. So if I want to keep my data secure from hackers, I want to scramble it in such a way that they would not be able to crack it or it would be very difficult for, for them to crack it. And this is one of the first mechanisms that would be recommended by any ethical hacker and before we begin, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity or to become an ethical hacker by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch career with cybersecurity or ethical hacker by learning from the experts, then try giving a shot to simply learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Computing. The course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Hello everyone and welcome to this video on the Hackers Roadmap at the Simply Learn YouTube channel. As vast as the field of cybersecurity is, there is often an overflow of information about it at the same time. For people who wish to know more about how to venture into the cybersecurity or ethical hacking space, it is very important for them to know what's the career progression, what are the skills needed and how a person with no or bare minimum knowledge can take their first step in this amazing career. 
Well, this video is for all those individuals who wish to pursue a career in the field of cyber security and ethical hacking. Whether you are an entry level professional, a college graduate, or an experienced professional looking to understand how a career in the field of cyber security progresses and what additional skills and responsibilities would you need as you grow in the field, then you are at the right place. So, let's get started with our topic the hacker's roadmap. And before we begin, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity by graduating from the best universities, or a professional who elicits to switch careers with cybersecurity by learning from the experts, then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. The course link is mentioned in the description box that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. And if these are the types of videos you would like to watch, then hit the subscribe button, like and press on the bell icon to never miss on further content. So stay tuned with us until the end of this video and don't forget to register your opinion in the comment section below. And now we will start with what is ethical hacking and how is it different from hacking. So in the world of cybersecurity, hacking can be broadly categorized into two types, ethical hacking and unethical hacking. Ethical hacking involves using the same tools and techniques as malicious hackers to identify and fix security vulnerabilities before they can be exploited. And these experts, known as white hat hackers, work with a focus on security rather on theft. And on the other hand, we have unethical hacking that refers to unauthorized access to digital devices or networks with malicious intent performed by black hat hackers. And additionally, there are gray hat hackers who possess knowledge in offensive and defensive computer use, sometimes working as security consultants during the day and engaging in black hat activities at night. It is important to understand these distinctions to protect against cyber threats effectively. Now we will see the objective or roles of an ethical hacker. Ethical hackers also known as white hat hackers use their skills and expertise to identify vulnerabilities in system and network before malicious hackers can exploit them. Their primary objective is to simulate real world attacks and help organizations strengthen their security measures. The role of an ethical hacker involves several key phases and we will see those roles and key phases. So they are responsible for reconnaissance, scanning, gain and maintain access, clear their tracks, document their findings and compile detailed reports. So firstly, they conduct thorough reconnaissance, gathering information about the target system or organization. This includes understanding the organization's structure, network infrastructure and potential weak points. And through scanning, they identify the easiest and quickest methods to gain access to the network and gather further information. And once access is gained, ethical hackers maintain it, allowing them to exercise their privileges and control the connected systems. This step helps them identify any potential security flaws and weaknesses within the network. They also work to clear their tracks, covering their footsteps to evade detection and ensuring the security personnel cannot trace their activities. And throughout the entire process, ethical hackers document their findings, compile detailed reports on the vulnerabilities discovered, and provide recommendations to address and mitigate the identified security issues. Their vulnerability goal is to help organizations strengthen their defenses, prevent data breaches, and protect sensitive information from falling into the wrong hands. Ethical hacking is a crucial aspect of cybersecurity as it allows organizations to stay one step ahead of cyber threats. By leveraging the skills of ethical hackers, businesses can proactively identify and address vulnerabilities ensuring the overall security and integrity of their digital infrastructure. So now we'll see the skills that needed to be an ethical hacker. So now we'll see the skills. So the first skill is knowledge of computer networks, then it's the programming languages, then the knowledge of web applications, databases, ethical hacking tools, and knowledge of common attack vectors and techniques then what certificates that are required for an ethical hacker. Now we'll start with knowledge of computer networks. Understanding computer networks is fundamental for ethical hackers. This includes concepts such as IP addressing, network protocols, example TCP, IP, routing, switching and firewalls. A strong grasp of how networks function will enable you to identify vulnerabilities and potential entry points. The next is programming languages. Proficiency in programming languages is essential for effective ethical hacking. Languages like Python, Java, C++ and scripting languages such as Perl or Ruby are widely used in this field. Programming skills enable you to write custom scripts, 
and tools, automate tasks and exploit vulnerabilities. And the next we have is web applications. In today's digital landscape, web applications are often the target of attacks. Therefore, a solid understanding of web application architecture, protocols, example HTTP, and security mechanisms, example SSL, TLS, is crucial. Knowledge of web programming languages like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and frameworks like PHP or ASP.NET is also beneficial. Then we have databases. So databases store and manage sensitive data, making them attractive targets for hackers. Familiarize yourself with database management systems DBMS such as MySQL, Oracle, or Microsoft SQL Server. Learn about database security including access control, encryption, and vulnerability assessment. Then we should focus on the skill to have a knowledge on ethical hacking tools. So to perform ethical hacking tasks efficiently, you should be familiar with various hacking tools. These include network scanners, example Nmap, vulnerability scanners, example Nessus, password crackers, John the Riper, packet snipers, Wireshark, and exploitation frameworks, Metasploit. Mastering these tools will enhance your effectiveness as an ethical hacker. Then you should have knowledge of common attack vectors and techniques. That is, understanding common attack vectors and techniques is vital for an ethical hacker. This includes knowledge of different types of malware, social engineering, network attacks, that is, DDoS, and web application vulnerabilities. Example, cross-site scripting. Staying up-to-date with the latest threats and attack methodologies is crucial for effective defense. The next is certificates. So, obtaining relevant certifications demonstrates your expertise and commitment to the field. Certificates like Certified Ethical Hacker, CH, Offensive Security Certificate, Professional, OSCP, or CompTIA Security Plus are highly regarded within the industry. They validate your skills and can boost your credibility when seeking ethical hacking opportunities. The CEH certification is a multiple choice exam that evaluates your understanding of the penetration testing structure and the tools that are utilized inside it. It gives job seekers, the information security field, a head start by ensuring that the certificate holder understands the fundamentals such as information gathering, attacking computers or servers, wireless attacks and social engineering. So the objective of CEH is inform the public that credentialized individuals meet or exceed the minimum standards. Second, establish and govern minimum standards of credentiality. Third, professional information security specialist in ethical hacking. So now we will have an exam overview. So the exam name is EC Council Certified Ethical Hacker. And the exam duration is 240 minutes. And you will get questions that is 125 questions you will get in the exam and it is a multiple choice question exam and the passing score you need is 70 percent and to register for the exam you should go to Pearson View or ECC exam center and eligibility criteria for CH is there are two ways to satisfy the eligibility criteria that is attend official CH training and this can be in any format example instructor led training computer based training or live online training as long as the program is approved by EC Council and attempt without official training. In order to be considered for the EC Council certification exam without attending official training, you must have two or more years of documented information security experience. Remit a non-refundable eligibility application fee of $100, submit completed CH exam eligibility form including verification from an employer. Upon approval, EC Council will email you a voucher number to register for the CEH exam. So this was all about the CEH exam. And now we will move to the steps to become ethical hacker. So ethical hacking is an exciting and rapidly growing field that requires a combination of technical skills, knowledge and a strong sense of ethics. By following these steps, you can begin your journey towards becoming an ethical hacker and contribute to enhancing cyber security. So step 1, that is knowledge of computer systems and networks. Step 2. You should have proficiency in programming languages. Step 3. Networking and security concepts. You should have a knowledge of it. Third. Knowledge of web application and database. Fifth. Understanding of operating systems. Step 6. Familiarity with ethical hacking tools. Step 7. Problem solving and analytical thinking. Step 8. Knowledge of common attack vectors and techniques. Step 9. Certifications. So now we will elaborate all the steps one by one. So we'll start with knowledge of computer systems and networks. So to become an ethical hacker, it is crucial to have a deep understanding of computer systems and networks. 
This involves familiarizing yourself with the inner workings of computer system, network protocols, operating systems, and how different components interact within a network environment. By gaining this knowledge, you will be better equipped to identify vulnerabilities and assess potential security risks. And the next is proficiency in programming languages. So programming languages are an essential tool for ethical hackers. By gaining proficiency in programming languages such as Python, C++, Java, JavaScript, SQL, Perl, and Ruby, you will be able to develop your own scripts, automate tasks, and create exploit codes. These programming languages provide the foundation for writing secure and efficient code, as well as manipulating and analyzing data. The next step is networking and security concepts. To effectively assess and secure networks, it is important to have a solid understanding of networking and security concepts. This includes familiarizing yourself with topics such as network protocols, network security principles, encryption techniques, and firewall configurations. Understanding how data is transmitted, secured, and protected in a network environment will enable you to identify potential vulnerabilities and implement appropriate security measures. Step 4. Knowledge of web application and database knowledge. So in today's interconnected world, web applications and databases are common targets for hackers. Therefore, it is crucial to develop a strong understanding of web application architectures, web protocols, and database systems. Pay special attention to common vulnerabilities specific to web applications such as SQL injection, cross-site scripting (XSS), and cross-site request forgery (CSR). By gaining expertise in these areas, you will be able to effectively assess the security of web applications and databases and provide appropriate recommendations for securing them. And the next step is understanding of operating systems. So operating systems form the backbone of computer systems and are often targeted by hackers. It is important to gain a comprehensive understanding of different operating systems such as Windows, Linux or Mac OS. This includes understanding system configurations, file permissions, user management and security mechanisms specific to each operating system. This knowledge will enable you to identify vulnerabilities apply patches and secure operating systems effectively. Step 6. Familiarity with ethical hacking tools. Ethical hackers rely on a variety of tools to assess and secure systems and networks. Familiarize yourself with popular ethical hacking tools such as Matsplotlib, Wireshark, Nmap, Burpsuit, Kali Linux, Canvas, SQL Ninja, and Wapiti. These tools provide functionalities for vulnerability scanning, network sniffing, exploit development, and penetration testing. Understanding how to use these tools effectively will enhance your capabilities as an ethical hacker. Now we'll see the step 7, that is problem solving and analytical thinking. So being an ethical hacker requires strong problem solving skills and the ability to think analytically. You will often encounter complex systems and face intricate security challenges. Developing your problem solving abilities and analytical thinking will help you approach these challenges systematically. Identify vulnerabilities and devise effective strategies to mitigate risk. It is essential to stay updated with the latest security trends and technologies to enhance your problem solving skills. And the step 8 is knowledge of common attack vectors and techniques. So, to defend against potential threats, you must familiarize yourself with common hacking techniques and attack vectors used by malicious hackers. This includes social engineering, phishing attacks, password cracking, network based attacks, and more. Understanding how these attacks work and the methodologies used will enable you to proactively identify and prevent potential security breaches. And now the step 9 that is certifications. While certifications are not mandatory to start a career in ethical hacking, they can provide a structured learning path and validate your skills and knowledge. Consider pursuing certifications such as Certified Ethical Hacker, CEH, Offensive Security Certified Professional, OSCP, Certified Information System Security Professional, CISSP, Certified Penetration Testing Engineer, CPTE, and Certified Security Analyst, ECSA. These certifications demonstrate your expertise and dedication to the field, enhancing your credibility as an ethical hacker. Now we'll see the job roles in ethical hacking field. So starting with, like there are several job roles in ethical hacking, such as here's an elaboration on each job role in ethical hacking and we'll see some of the major ethical hacker job roles. So starting with ethical hacker. So an ethical hacker is a skilled professional who legally attempts to penetrate computer system and networks to identify vulnerabilities and weaknesses. They use their knowledge to strengthen the security infrastructure and protect against cyber threats. 
and the next is network security engineer network security engineers specialize in securing and maintaining computer networks within an organization they implement and manage security measures such as firewalls intrusion detection systems and virtual private networks that is vpns to protect sensitive data then we have cyber security analyst so cyber security analyst monitor and analyze systems for potential security breaches or incidents they investigate threats develop security protocols and implement measures to protect against attacks the next is penetration tester penetration testers also known as ethical hackers simulate real world attacks to identify vulnerabilities in computer systems networks and applications they conduct thorough assessments and provide recommendations for improving security. The next is Information Security Manager. Information Security Managers are responsible for overseeing an organization's overall security strategy and ensuring the protection of sensitive data. They develop and implement security policies, manage security teams, and handle incident response. And the next is Cybersecurity Engineer. So, Cybersecurity Engineers design and implement security systems including firewalls, encryption protocols, and intrusion detection systems. They also conduct risk assessments and perform security audits to maintain a security environment. And the next is Security Consultant. Security Consultants provide expert advice and guidance on security strategies and solutions. They assess vulnerabilities, develop security plans, and assist organizations in improving their overall security posture. In the United States, these requirements are very high. And this was all for this tutorial. Did you know that in August this year, Google openly admitted that some of its Gmail accounts were hacked by an Iranian group? Fortunately, the event was isolated and was taken care of, but rarely are security breaches this easy to stop. With more and more data moving to the cloud, the prospects of hacks like these have grown in the past decade exponentially. So consequently, organizations have now discovered the need to secure the digital infrastructure against various attack vectors, fueling the need for ethical hackers in the IT industry. So today's video is all about how you can learn the ins and outs of hacking and cybersecurity, irrespective of your learning background. So welcome to our video on how to become an ethical hacker by Simply Learn. Before we get started, ensure you are subscribed to the channel so you always stay updated with the latest technologies and trends. Let's first clear the air on an ethical hacker's role. The term hacking has inherently negative connotations. However, this will only be applicable until the duty of an ethical hacker is properly understood. Ethical hackers are the good people in the hacking field wearing the white hat. So what exactly is the responsibility of an ethical hacker? Instead of utilizing their extensive computer expertise for criminal purposes, ethical hackers find gaps in data and computer security for businesses and organizations worldwide to defend themselves against hackers with less than noble intentions. Ethical hacking is a subcategory of cybersecurity that involves lawfully breaking a system security mechanisms in order to discover possible threats and data leaks on the network. Ethical hackers can work for a corporation as independent freelancers, in-house security staff for its website or its applications, or as simulated offensive cybersecurity professionals as well. All of these careers need knowledge of current attack methodologies and tools, albeit the in-house expert may need to be knowledgeable about a single kind of software or digital asset. But how can you hone your ethical hacking skills? Let's take a look at few steps one can take while starting a career in this field. The first step is getting comfortable with Linux. There are operating systems catered specifically to ethical hackers like Kali Linux and Parrot Security. Both are based on Linux derivatives and have a plethora of tools to make your hacking workflow easy and relatively stress-free. The better versed you are with Linux and its terminal, the quicker you can achieve things when hacking. The next would be to master the mother of all programming languages, which is the C programming language. Since Linux and a lot of backend code are written in C, having a strong hand over this programming language is very important. It's always helpful to learn a couple more relevant languages like Python or JavaScript, which will help you dissect giant pieces of server code like butter. Remaining anonymous is vital in the hacking sphere, since giving a malicious actor news of your existence on a target network can cause him then to flee or attack your device instead. The usage of MAC address randomizers and proxy chains is highly beneficial and recommended when monitoring networks for criminal activity. And speaking of proxies, ethical hackers must understand networking fundamentals and exactly how they are established. Learning about various networks and protocols might help you exploit flaws. An ethical hacker with an extensive understanding of networking tools such as Wireshark, Nmap and others can overcome field incidents relatively unscathed. The fifth skill in our list is traversing the dark web using the famous Tor browser. 
Most of the internet is hidden behind the Tor networks and getting a closer look at the people who often are at the forefront of the hacking industry in the dark web directly can help you familiarize yourself with a certain domain secrets while keeping you updated with the latest happenings in the cybercrime world. A major advantage that can tip the skills in the favor of an ethical hacker is the knowledge of cryptography or encryption. Encryption is used in various elements of information security, including authentication, data integrity, anonymity, and others. Passwords and other sensitive information are always encrypted on a network. A hacker must understand how to recognize and break these encryption standards. Exploring vulnerabilities makes you a better ethical hacker simply keeps you aware of the security measures that are kept in place as industry standards while handing you the most advanced penetration testing tools on the market. Learning how to scan networks and systems for vulnerabilities that might result in a security breach. Ethical hackers may also attempt to write vulnerabilities to exploit the system in question. As a final tip, join forums for conversations with other hackers worldwide to trade, share expertise and collaborate. Discord, Reddit, Telegram and other platforms all have communities where you can join and collaborate with fellow learners to broaden your learning spectrum. Now that we understand some basic skills ethical hackers need to excel in this domain, let us look at the roadmap one can follow to get started. Many ethical hackers begin their careers by studying computer science. You can also acquire an a certification from CompTIA by appearing for and passing two additional tests. These tests assess an individual's understanding of PC components and their ability to disassemble and reassemble a PC. However, before advancing in your profession, you must gather experience and obtain a Network Plus or a CCNS certification. The Network Plus certification certifies fundamental network expertise such as network administration, maintenance, deployment and troubleshooting. The CCNS certification guarantees the same skills and strives for foundation level proficiency. Once qualified, you can advance to the next level of your career in network support. You will be responsible for monitoring and upgrading, installing security software and testing for vulnerabilities. You will obtain expertise in network security and your goal should be offered as a position as a network engineer. As a network engineer, you will build and plan networks rather than simply maintain them. Your focus should now be on the security part of your journey to becoming an ethical hacker. This is the time to focus on earning a security certification such as Security Plus or CISSP. The US Department of Defense has approved the Security Plus accreditation which covers testing on critical areas such as access control, identity authentication and cryptography. The CISSP certification is a worldwide recognized security accreditation that validates the expertise of risk management, cloud technology and application development. The next step would be to start working in the Information Security Division. An information security analyst studies systems and network security, engages with security breaches and strives to implement security solutions. For this profession, you should focus on penetration testing to gain hands-on experience with some of the most essential tools of the trade. Getting the Certified Ethical Hacker or the CEH certification should be your top priority. The training will teach you all you must understand to become a productive and ethical hacker. You will be engaged in a hands-on environment where you will be guided through breaking into a network and finding any security flaws. After obtaining this certification, you can begin marketing yourself as a professional ethical hacker. We have already covered some skills one needs to learn when starting their journey. However, an ethical hacker has certain roles and responsibilities that must be carried out meticulously. The first of which is threat modeling. Threat modeling is optimizing network security by identifying vulnerabilities and determining countermeasures for avoiding or reducing an attack's impact on the system. A threat is a real or projected negative incident jeopardizing the organization's assets. The role of an ethical hacker is to give a thorough assessment of potentially harmful assaults and their potential consequences. They can also conduct information security audits or a risk-based evaluation of a company's security. These regular exercises assess security's readiness, identify IT system weaknesses and offer strategies for reducing future attack threats. They also assess how successfully security related policies are implemented, resulting in a report that includes discovered flaws and appropriate solutions. Ethical writers must be able to collect data, detect vulnerabilities and correlate risks to create clear and unambiguous professional reports. These evaluations are frequently used to justify finalizing security asset expenditures. The market for trained ethical hackers has never been this expansive. According to various surveys, the job outlook for ethical hackers and information security analysts is supposed to grow by 33% between 2020 and 2030. Companies like IBM, Google and Microsoft are always on the lookout for trained cybersecurity personnel in this climate of data breaches and security vulnerabilities. We hope this video has cleared some doubts regarding where to start and what to learn during this journey. When it comes to web app hacking, 
It generally refers to the exploitation of applications via HTTP, which can be done by manipulating the applications via its graphical user interface. This is done by tampering with the uniform resource identifier, also known as a URI, or tampering with the HTTP elements directly, which are not a part of the URI. The hacker can send a link via an email or a chat and may trick the users of a web application into executing actions. In case the attack is on an administrator account, the entire web application can be compromised. Anyone who uses a computer connected to the internet is susceptible to the threats that computer hackers and online predators pose. These online villains typically use phishing scams, spam email, or instant messages and bogus websites to deliver dangerous malware to your computer and compromise your computer security. Computer hackers can also try to access your computer and private information directly if you are not protected by a firewall. They can monitor your conversations or peruse the back end of your personal website. Usually disguised with a bogus identity, predators can lure you into revealing sensitive personal and financial information. A web server, which can be referred to as the hardware, the computer, or the software which helps to deliver content that can be accessed through the internet. The primary function of a web server is to deliver these web pages on the request to clients using the hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP. So hackers attack the web server to steal credential information, passwords and business information by using different types of attacks like DDoS attacks, SYN flooding, ping flood, port scan and social engineering attacks. In the area of web security, despite strong encryption on the browser server channel, web users still have no assurance about what happens at the other end. Although wireless networks offer great flexibility, they have their own security problems. A hacker can sniff the network packets without having to be in the same building where the network is located. As wireless networks communicate through radio waves, a hacker can easily sniff the network from a nearby location. Most attackers use network sniffing to find the SSID and hack a wireless network. An attacker can attack a network from a distance and therefore it is sometimes difficult to collect evidence against the main hacker. Social engineering is the art of manipulating users of a computing system into revealing confidential information, which can be later used to gain unauthorized access to a computer system. The term can also include activities such as exploiting human kindness, greed, and curiosity to gain access to restricted access buildings or getting the users to installing backdoor software. Knowing the tricks used by hackers to trick users into releasing vital login information is fundamental in protecting computer systems. Coming to our main focus for today, let us have a look at the top 5 most essential ethical hacking tools to be used in 2021. At the top of the chain lies Nmap. Nmap, which stands for Network Mapper, is a free and open source utility for network discovery and security auditing. Many systems and network administrators also find it useful for tasks such as network inventory, managing service upgrade schedules and monitoring host or service uptime. It is most beneficial in the early stages of ethical hacking where a hacker must figure the possible entry point to a system before running the necessary exploits, thus allowing the hackers to leverage any insecure openings and thus breach the device. Nmap uses raw IP packets in novel ways to determine what hosts are available on the network, what service they are running, what operating systems are installed, what type of packet filters and firewalls are in use, and dozens of other characteristics. It was designed to rapidly scan large networks, but works fine against single hosts as well. Since every application that connects to a network needs to do so via a port, the wrong port or a server configuration can open a can of worms which lead to a thorough breach of the system and ultimately a fully hacked device. Next on our list we have Metasploit. The Metasploit framework is a very powerful tool that can be used by cyber criminals as well as ethical hackers to probe systematic vulnerabilities on both networks and servers. Because it's an open source framework, it can be easily customized and used with most operating systems. With Metasploit, the ethical hacking team can use ready-made or custom code and introduce it into a network to probe for weak spots. As another flavor of threat hunting, once the flaws are identified and documented, 
the information can be used to address systemic weaknesses and prioritize solutions. Once a particular vulnerability is identified and the necessary exploit is fed into the system, there are a host of options for the hacker. Depending on the vulnerability, hackers can even run root commands from the terminal, allowing complete control over the activities of the compromised system as well as all the personal data stored on the device. A big advantage of Metasploit is the ability to run full-fledged scans on the target system, which gives a detailed picture of the security index of the system along with the necessary exploits that can be used to bypass the antivirus software. Having a single solution to gather almost all the necessary points of attack is very useful for ethical hackers and penetration testers as denoted by its high rank in the list. Moving on, we have the Acunetics framework. Acunetics is an end-to-end -end web security scanner which offers a 360 degree view of an organization's security. It is an application security testing tool that helps the company address vulnerability across all their critical web assets. The need to be able to test applications in depth and further than traditional vulnerability management tools has created a market with several players in the application security space. Acunetics can detect over 7000 vulnerabilities including SQL injections, cross-site scripting, misconfigurations, weak passwords, exposed database and other out-of-band vulnerabilities. It can scan all pages, web apps and complex web applications running HTML5 and JavaScript as well. It also lets you scan complex multi-level forms and even password protected areas of the site. Acunetics is a dynamic application security testing package which has definite perks over status application security testing frameworks which are also known as SAST scanners. SAST tools only work during development and only for specific languages and have a history of reporting a lot of false positives whereas dynamic testing tools also known as DAST have the ability to streamline testing from development to deployment with minimal issues. Next on our list, we have Ergaden. This is a multi-use bash script used for Linux systems to hack and audit wireless networks like our everyday Wi-Fi router and its counterparts. Along with being able to launch denial-of-service attacks on compromised networks, this multi-purpose Wi-Fi hacking tool has very rich features which support multiple methods for Wi-Fi hacking including WPS hacking modes, WP attacks, handshake captures, evil twin and so much more. It usually needs an external network adapter that supports monitor mode, which is necessary to be able to capture wireless traffic that traverse the air channels. Thanks to its open source nature, AirGuardian can be used with multiple community plugins and add-ons, thereby increasing its effectiveness against a wide variety of routers, both in the 2.4 GHz and the 5 GHz band. Finally, at number 5, we have John the Ripper. John the Ripper is an open source password security auditing and the password recovery tool which is available for many operating systems. John the Ripper Jumbo supports hundreds of hash and cipher types including for user passwords of operating systems, web apps, database servers, encrypted keys and document files. Some of the key features of the tool include offering multiple modes to speed up the password cracking automatically deselecting the hashing algorithm used by the passwords and the ease of running and configuring the tool to make it password cracking easier. It can use dictionary attacks along with regular brute forcing to speed up the process of cracking the correct password without wasting additional resources. The word list being used in these dictionary attacks can be used by the user's end allowing for a completely customizable process. We also have a few honorary mentions in our list that just missed the cut. NetSparker, for instance, is an automated yet fully configurable web application security scanner that enables you to scan websites, web applications, and web services. The scanning technology is designed to help you secure web applications easily without any fuss, so you can focus on fixing the reported vulnerabilities. The Burp Suit Professional is one of the most popular penetration testing and vulnerability finder tools and is used for checking web application security. The term Burp, as it is commonly known, is a proxy based tool which is used to evaluate the security of web based application and to do hands on testing. Moving away from websites and applications, 
Wireshark is a free and open source packet analyzer which was launched in 2006. It is used for network troubleshooting, analysis, software and communications protocol development and education. It captures network traffic on the local network and stores data for offline analysis. Wireshark captures network traffic from Ethernet, Bluetooth, wireless networks and frame relay connections. Now that we learn about the different types of tools that can be used when conducting an ethical hacking audit, let's learn about some potential benefits of such campaigns and why organizations prefer to pay for such audits. Being able to identify defects from an attacker's perspective is game-changing since it displays all the potential avenues of a possible hack. One can only prepare for the known vulnerabilities as a defensive specialist, but proactively trying to breach a network or device can make hackers think of techniques that no defense contractors can account for. This kind of unpredictability goes a long way in securing a network against malicious actors. Another advantage of hiring ethical hackers is the ability to preemptively fix possible weak points in a company's network infrastructure. As seen on many occasions, a real breach will cause loss of data and irreparable damage to the foundation of an organization. Being able to gauge such shortcomings before they become public and can be used exploited is a benefit most organizations make use of. This is not to imply that such security audits are only beneficial to the organization paying for it. When coming across companies that provide certain services, a reliable third-party security audit goes a long way in instilling trust and confidence over their craft. If the ethical hackers cannot find any major vulnerabilities that can be leveraged by hackers, it just accentuates the technical brilliance of the organization and its engineers, thereby increasing the clientele by a substantial amount. In this, we are going to discuss ethical hacking and penetration testing. So we are going to talk about the concepts about what constitutes an ethical hack and what is a penetration test. We are going to talk about the different types of penetration tests and how they can be done. We are going to talk about an operating system called Kali Linux and we are going to talk about its usage and its importance in cybersecurity. We will also be discussing the different phases of penetration test and how people or hackers would utilize these phases uh, to gain their objectives. We will also be discussing in what areas can we do a penetration test, how to do those penetration tests. We will be discussing a, quite a few bit of penetration testing tools that are available in the Kali Linux space and then we'll be looking at a couple of demos at the end of the session to understand how these tools in the operating system can be utilized for various hacks. So let's start with, with what is ethical hacking. Now plainly defined ethical hacking is locating weaknesses or vulnerabilities of computers and information systems using the intent and actions of a malicious hacker. The major difference is here that we are hired to discover those weaknesses in a legal and ethical manner. That means, first and foremost, our intent should not be malicious. We do not wish any harm to the organization and whatever we discover is reported back and not misused. Once we report back, we will also be trying to help them out to mitigate or remove those weaknesses or vulnerabilities to enhance the com uh, company's security posture. So essentially, we would have the same training or the same knowledge as that of a malicious hacker except that the intent is going to be different. The intent is going to help the organization achieve security to protect themselves against malicious hackers. And the second most important thing about ethical hacking is that we are authorized to do that activity. I cannot in good faith hack somebody and then tell them, you know what, I just, I just wanted to help you out and uh, here are your vulnerabilities and uh, this is the way you can prevent them. I first need the authorization from the other party and only then can I perform an ethical hack. So in this example, hacker attacks an individual with malicious intent and makes misuse of whatever information they have gotten. They steal the data, they maybe fry the operating system, to hardware, destroy it, and thus uh, they leave the victim without uh, a device. With authorization, an ethical hacker can also attack the same individual, minus the destruction, of course, and the intent is good so they are willingly finding out the vulnerabilities and helping the victim plug them out so that they wouldn't be a victim of a malicious attack now here the first thing is authorization from the victim and the second thing is the good intent where we do not misuse those vulnerabilities and we report them back to the victim or to the client and help them uh, patch those vulnerabilities that's the main difference between a white hat and a black hat
So security experts are normally termed as white hat hackers, malicious hackers are termed as black hats. Now, the responsibilities of an ethical hacker are multifold. First and foremost, you have to create scripts, test for vulnerabilities. First, you have to identify those in the first place. So there's a vulnerability assessment, identifying those vulnerabilities, and then you're going to test them to see the validity and the complexity of those vulnerabilities. So your one of your responsibilities would be to develop tools to increase security as well, or to configure security in such a way that it would be difficult to breach. Performing risk assessment. Now, what is a risk? Risk is a threat that is posed to an organization by a possibility of getting hacked. So let's say I, as an ethical hacker, run a vulnerability scanner on a particular client. I identify 10 different vulnerabilities. Within those 10 vulnerabilities, I do a risk assessment to identify which vulnerability is critical, would have the most impact on the client, and what would be the repercussions if those vulnerabilities actually get exploited. So I'm trying to find out in risk assessment that if the client gets hacked with the vulnerabilities identified, what is the loss they would be facing once they get hacked? And the loss could not only be loss of data, it could be financial losses, it could be loss of reputation, penalties they have to pay to the client for breaches or penalties that they may have to pay for pay the governments in case of breaches that happened that uh, couldn't be controlled. Another responsibility of the ethical hacker is to set up policies in such a way that it becomes difficult for hackers to get access to devices or to protected data. And finally, train the staff for network security. So uh, we've got a lot of employees in an organization. We need to train the staff of what is allowed and what is not allowed, how to keep themselves secure so that they don't get compromised thus becoming a vulnerability themselves to the organization. The policies that we have talked about are administrative policies to govern the employees of the organization. For example, password policies. Most of the organizations will have a tough password policy where they say you have to create a password that meets a certain level of complexity before that can be accepted. And till you create that password, you're not allowed to log in or you're not allowed to register. So let's move on to understand what is penetration testing. Now for penetration testing, there is a phase called vulnerability assessment that happens before this. Vulnerability assessment is nothing but running a scanning tool to identify a list of potential flaws or vulnerabilities within the organization. Once you have identified the list of those vulnerabilities, you would then move on to penetration test. This is the part of ethical hacking where it specifically focuses on penetration only uh, of the information systems. So you have identified that flaw. Maybe it could be a database with a SQL injection, or it could be uh, a buffer overrun, uh, overrun flaw, or it could be a simple password cracking attempt. Your idea is to create those tools, create those attacks, and try to penetrate into those areas where security is weak. Uh, the essence of penetration testing is to penetrate information systems using various attacks. The attacks could be anything like a phishing attack, a password cracking attack, a denial of service attack, or any other vulnerabilities that you have identified uh, during the vulnerability scan. So what is Kali Linux and why is it used? Kali Linux is an operating system often used by hackers and ethical hackers both because of the tool sets that the operating system contains. It is an operating system created by professionals with a lot of embedded tools. It is a Debian based operating system with advanced penetration testing and security auditing features. There are more than 600 plus odd tools on that operating system that can help you leverage any of the attacks, man in the middle attacks, sniffing, password cracking, uh, any of these attacks would be possible with all the tools available. You just need to know how to utilize the operating system and its tools. It contains, like I said, a hundred of hundreds of tools uh, that are used for various information security tasks like uh, computer forensics, reverse, reverse engineering, information finding, even uh, getting access to different machines and then uh, creating viruses, worms, trojans, anything that you will. 600 plus tools in the Kali Linux operating system. There are periodic updates that are given out to the operating system as well. It is open source. That means it is free to utilize. You can even have the source code. You can modify it if you want to. There's customizations available for all the tools. You can download third party tools and install them if you want. There's a wide support for wireless uh, network cards. Multiple languages are being supported at the, th at the same time as well. And you can create a lot of attacking uh, scripts, you can create attacking tools, and you can write your own exploits as well on Kali Linux. So this all, uh, all in all helps you create a very robust system where you can create your own attacks and then launch them against unsuspecting victims. Now that is illegal. 
So as far as ethical hack is concerned, once you have authorization, you're going to identify which tools to be utilized. You're going to get the appropriate permissions and only then are you going to attempt those attacks. Let's talk about the phases of penetration testing. Now, there are five different phases. The first one is the reconnaissance phase, also known as the information gathering phase. This is the most important phase for any hacker. This is where the hacker or the ethical hacker, if you will, will gather as much information about the target's victim or vice versa, the, vic the victim, right? So once you have that information, you would then be able to identify what tool sets to include and how to attack the victim. For example, you want to find out the IP addresses, the domains, subdomains, the network architecture that is being utilized. You want to identify operating systems that are being utilized, the network IP ranges that are being utilized, and so on and so forth. You might want to identify employees within an organization for social engineering attacks in the future, email addresses, telephone numbers, anything and everything that will help you validate and give you information about the target is something that you want to do in the reconnaissance phase at this point in time we are not going to question whether whatever information we are getting is useful or not only time will tell depending on the various attacks that we will be building up later on this becomes your baseline this becomes your database with all the information about the victim so that you can come back from later stages back to the reconnaissance phase to look at the information that you have gathered and then you can fine tune your attacks once you have done that you're going to uh, then start the scanning phase Based on the information that you have gathered, you are going to identify live machines within the network. Once you have identified the live machines, you will scan them for open ports, protocols and procedures, any processes that are running. And then we are going to identify vulnerabilities within these processes and within these open ports. So in the scanning phase, uh, why do we need to find live machines? Because we want to find out the machines that have booted up, have an operating system and are running on the network. If a machine is not available on the network, or is in a shutdown mode, that machine cannot be hacked through a technical attack. Then it will be a physical attack where you physically go to the machine and then do whatever you want to do with it. For a technical attack, you will have to identify the machines that have booted up. Then you're going to scan the open ports because that's going to be our entry point. And on the port would be a service that is running. So you scan the service as well, identify the version of the service and then do a vulnerability scan to identify if there are any vulnerabilities on those services that are running and then based on all of this information we are going to develop our attacks as we go on so once we have this we go on to the gaining access phase where we are going to attack and try to get access to our victims machines could be a social engineering attack based on the information gathering we have done in the technical assessment and scanning phase if we have identified a vulnerability we are going to identify a relevant exploit and then use that exploit to try to gain access or we might just craft a trojan and try to uh, execute that trojan on the victims machine to uh, check if we can get access through that particular manner once we have the access could be even a, a simple password cracking attack which we have been able to accomplish and we have cracked the password of the person and now we have gained access to that person's computer right but these attacks would be temporary for example we have cracked a password somebody changes the password every 30 days after that period our attack would be useless if a trojan is executed we get a connection to that machine for once but then how do we get, uh, get a repeated connection over and over again if we want to reconnect to that machine so that's where we come into the maintaining access phase where we install uh, rootkits key loggers sniffers and things like that where we could get a backdoor entry to the victim's machine if we have already been successfully installed a trojan we would want to add the trojan to the startup menu so that every time the operating system starts the trojan gets automatically executed and thus we maintain the backdoor entry to that victim's machine once we have done all of this all these activities are going to leave a trace in the victim's machine so if we install a trojan a trojan being an application would create directories and files a virus would be destructive in nature if you are executing a script it will leave some logs behind if we even log in through the cracked password that we have it will create a login entry at for that particular timestamp along with the ip address that we utilized in the covering tracks we are essentially trying to avoid detection by deleting traces of our activity that means that we need to identify where logs have been stored we need to address those logs and we need to delete them or modify them in such a way that our activity is not traceable so these are the five main phases of a penetration test gather as much information as you can scan for machines ports 
protocols and services running on the victim's device. Try to gain access by password cracking, intrusions, exploits for the vulnerabilities if any. Maintain that access by installing further software which will allow you to get backdoor access to that particular system and then try to cover your tracks by deleting all traces of your activity. Once successful, the victim will have no idea and you have a backdoor entry and you can monitor the victim to the extent that you want. Now, in an ethical hacker's perspective, this penetration test can be done in multiple aspects. So uh, again, understand the fact that we are doing an authorized activity. We have identified the tools that we have to use, identified the attacks. We've got the appropriate authorization. And based on that authorization, we are conducting a penetration test. The penetration test may be asked to be done in one of these manners. First is the black box test. The black box test is where no information is given to the ethical hacker about the IT infrastructure. So they have no idea what it is. They start right from the first phase of the information gathering, gather as much information as they can. And based on the gathered information, they try to create and launch a attacks to see if they are going to be successful. Now, not only does it test the knowledge of the penetration tester, it would also test the security implementations that the organization has done to see whether they can identify the attack and prevent it in the first place. So this is the simulation of a malicious hacker scenario where a malicious hacker having no idea about the organization first tries to gather information and then tries to attack that organization. So no source code knowledge, no technological knowledge, nothing. They're just going to try to gather information, scan those devices, and then try to gain access. The second test is a gray box test where some information is given or some knowledge of the IT infrastructure is given. Think of it from an employee's perspective. A regular employee in an organization who doesn't have extra privileges uh, like an administrator, but is just a, a regular employee, does that means that they've got limited access within the organization based on which they get some knowledge of the IT infrastructure. So this is an attempt of an insider uh, simulation attack where a regular user may want to try to misuse the access that they've been given and then try to gather information or try to gain access to other devices which they are not authorized to. The third test is white box, where there's full knowledge of the IT infrastructure that has been given. So this is again a simulation of an insider attack, a malicious insider, if you will. But at this point in time, the person has complete knowledge of the in infrastructure, could be in an administrative position, and then they are trying to leverage their access to see if they can get information or they can compromise any stuff, any of the data. So the three attacks would be the first one, black box, where we are simulating uh, external threat a hacker sitting outside the organization trying to gain access. The gray box is an insider threat where there is a regular employee who is trying to get access to infrastructure that they are not authorized for. And then the third audit is a white box audit where there's an administrator who has all the leverage, all the access and the visibility within the inf uh, in infrastructure. And then they are trying to misuse their access to see what else they can get from whatever access has been authorized to them. Now let's look at the areas of penetration testing. Where all could we do a penetration test, thus compromising the security of the application or of the server or of the user? So first and foremost, network services. It finds vulnerabilities and weaknesses in the security of the network infrastructure. So for example, we have switches, routers, firewalls in a network. All of these are devices that need a configuration. If they have been not correctly configured or if they have not been correctly secured, they would leave some vulnerabilities behind. If we as ethical hackers are able to identify these flaws, these misconfigurations, these vulnerabilities, we could then try to exploit them and try to gain access to the network and devices within that network by uh, getting access to the network in the first place. Then we have the web applications. Web applications are nothing but softwares that are developed over or deployed over a web server and are made available over the intranet or the internet. For example, uh, websites that we visit or uh, web applications like uh, Facebook, if you will, right? So if these applications have vulnerabilities within them, we then try to attack the web-based applications and thus try to bypass authentication or get access to database or try to leak information through those applications. If not, then we try to attack the client side. Now, web application is at the server level and is hosted by the deployer. So that's at the server side. The client side is where we as users are using a computer with a browser and trying to interact with the web application. Now, the browser and the operating system that we are utilizing would have its own vulnerabilities. Thus, identifying a client side vulnerability and then exploiting it to either, either hack the client or then piggyback on the client's connection and try to get access to the server. So either you could attack the network, the web application or the client side itself. Or you could attack 
wireless networks. This test would examine all the wireless devices which are used in a corporation. Most of the wireless would have laptops, smartphones, tablets, phablets, all of those connected to them. If you are able to access any of these devices through the wireless, it would help you gain access to other devices on the wireless as well. And then social engineering. So this is where you are trying to attack humans. You are tracking an employee of a corporation to reveal some confidential information knowingly or unknowingly by tricking them with uh, fake mails or fake websites or ma malicious emails that you have sent to them uh, which they have failed to recognize as malicious and they click on it thus getting victimized social engineering attacks are always uh, successful because of the gullibility of humans empathy sympathy humans basically have emotions emotions can be toyed with and then taken advantage of if the person is not careful enough for example the most common social engineering attack that we see is the nigerian fraud where we receive an email that someone somewhere has died and has left a huge estate behind a few hundred million dollars and we have been identified as the person through whom they want to transfer the money to a foreign land to save on taxes what are the chances of that happening on a daily basis right how many princes are there so that's something that we do not verify it's just the i guess the greed if you will of striking it rich quickly that makes us believe these kind of emails. Uh, we have also received emails of lottery tickets that we have won over a period of time without even having bought a lottery ticket. So if you haven't bought one, what did you win? But we don't ask these questions. We just get excited about the amount of money that we have won and then we try to bet on our luck and try to see if that uh, email is going to fructify or is it just another scam. So social engineering attacks are dime a dozen these days and we need to be very careful on what we trust on the internet. Let's look at the penetration testing tools. There are hundreds and thousands of tools out there. Most of these have been concised and collected together and hosted on an operating system known as Kali Linux that we have talked about earlier. Now the predecessor to Kali Linux was Backtrack. Backtrack is no longer continued, it has been discontinued and Kali Linux has taken uh, the place of Backtrack, within which are all the tools that you see on your screen. Metasploit is one of the most favorite penetration testing tools of hackers and ethical hackers. Uh, there are a lot of uh, inbuilt exploits over there and we'll be doing a demo at the end of the session on this. Nmap is the information gathering tool which will scan for live devices, scan for open ports, protocols and services. Beef would be an application testing tool that would help us uh, find exploits within applications. Nessus vulnerability scanner is a network and a host based scanner that would help you identify vulnerabilities within such hosts. Wireshark is a network sniffer which allows you to capture network packets and, and analyze them to see if there, are any, there is any information worth capturing within those packets. SQL map is a automated tool used for SQL injection attacks. So you don't even have to craft your queries for SQL injection. It will be done by the SQL map tool. You just need to identify whatever is possible through the queries that the SQL is going to create and then based on the activity that you've identified, you just need to redefine your search parameters to get access to the database. We will be doing a demo on SQL map or SQL map as well. And then there is John the Ripper. John the Ripper is a tool that is used for password cracking. So dictionary attacks, brute force attacks are done using John the Ripper. What is a dictionary attack? A dictionary attack is an attack where we create list of all probable passwords, store them in a TXT file and run that list against the password tool to see if any of those passwords are going to match. A brute force attack is trying the same attack but with every permutation and combination of the alphabet that we have and we are going to try to figure out uh, if we are able to crack the password at all. So these are just some of the tools. For every tool there are another supporting 100 tools or more than that. Uh, like for Nessus vulnerability scanner you'll have Qualys vulnerability scanner. You have uh, GFI Landguard and there are other uh, lots of other softwares out there. But these are some of the most commonly utilized tools. Let's look at the Metasploit attack. Metasploit is a framework of uh, penetration testing that uh, makes hacking very simple. You just need to know how to utilize the tool, you need to identify the vulnerability associated with a particular exploit and then run the exploit on Metasploit. Uh, we'll be demoing this during the practical. So there are active exploits and passive exploits. 
An active exploit is, exploits a specific computer, runs until execution and then exits, uses brute force and exits when an error occurs. In a passive exploit, these exploits wait for incoming requests and exploit them as soon as they connect. They can also be used in conjunction with emails and web browsers. So in passive exploits, we create a payload, we, uh, like a, a reverse connection payload, we send it to the victim. Once the victim installs that software, the machine will then initiate a connection to us. Our machine will be in a listen mode and then we will once the software is executed at there and we would then try to connect and exploit that particular vulnerability this is the uh, practical that we'll be doing on metasploit so let's move on with the demos and then we'll see uh, what we can discuss amongst them all right let's have a look at some of the demos that we had uh, talked about in the ethical hacking and penetration testing module we are going to look at three different demos the first one is going to be a sql injection attack that we are going to perform on this tool that we have the second one is a password cracking attack on windows 7 and the third one is a meetup reader based or a metasploit based shellshock attack on a linux based web server so let's get cracking i've powered on this virtual machine uh, which is the ovas broken web application it is a tool that is provided for uh, people who want to enhance their skills and they can practice uh, how to do these attacks in a legal manner so we are going to go to this site. I'm just going to open up my browser. The IP address is 71.132. And that's the uh, OVAS broken web application that we want to utilize. We are going to head off to Mutili Day 2. And we are going to look at a SQL injection attack where we want to bypass authentication. Now this takes us to the login screen. So we can just try our luck here and see that the authentication mechanism works the account does not exist so the username and password that we have supplied is not the correct one so we want to ensure that there's a sql database and uh, we can uh, try to attack it and see uh, if we can bypass the authentication now uh, what we want to do is we want to create a sql based malformed query that can give us a different output so i'm just going to type in a single quote over here and type login and you can see that this is now suddenly recognized as a operator and there's an error that is given out compared to the login that we tried uh, earlier when we used a proper text-based login mechanism it gave us the account does not exist but here the single quote gave us a error and it shows us how sql works this is the query that we had created now in the trainings that you have for ethical hacking there would be explanations of what these queries are all about how this syntax works here we're just going to see if we can create a malformed query to log in as a user in this case so what i'm going to do is uh, create the query over here and we're going to give it a comparison so we're going to give it a or one equals one space hyphen hyphen space and if you now click login you should be able to bypass authentication and you can see user has been authenticated and we now have admin access to this application now here the sql queries need to be crafted in such a perspective that they're going to work so there would be a lot of exercise in identifying what the database is there's a microsoft database and oracle database and so on and so forth and then you have to choose those proper commands but identifying that would come in the training right now we're just looking at at a demo this is how a sql injection attack works now let me log out here similarly now we are in a login page the same query worked wonders where it allowed us to bypass authentication so it also depends on what kind of a page i am and what query would be accepted at this point in time so here application understanding would also come into the picture where uh, which function we are calling upon when we are connected to a particular page now this is a user lookup function right so again here we try the same method test test that's not going to work authentication error bad user or password and if you type in the same query over here single quote or and give it a condition single quote or one equals one hy space hyphen hyphen space now here it is not going to log us in because this is not a login page this is a user lookup form so here it would instead give us a dump of all the databases that it has so you can see all the usernames and passwords coming in that are stored in the user lookup field so this is where the uh, understanding comes in of which query to create at what page we are depending upon the function that is being called right so that's the sql uh, injection attack that we wanted to look at let's move on to password cracking now this is a windows 7 machine that we have i'm just going to do a very basic password cracking example we're just going to log in now here the assumption is that we are able to log in we have access to a computer and we want to check out other users who are using this computer and see if we can find out their passwords so that uh, we can log in as a different user steal data if required and we wouldn't be to blame 
if there are any locks that are created. So here we've got a tool called Kane Enable that is installed right here. Now I'm already an administrator on this machine. I'm checking out other administrators who share the same privileges or any other user who may be on this system whose password I can crack and thus I would be able to get access through their account and then do any malicious activity. Right. So this allows me to go into a cracker tool and it allows me to enumerate this machine and identify all the users and passwords that are there in this particular machine. Right. So I'm just going to click on the plus sign and I'm going to import uh, hashes from a local system. So where are these files stored? Where does Windows store its passwords? In what format are they stored? And what this tool does to retrieve those? That's something that we all need to know as an ethical hacker. Right. So import the hashes from the local system. Click on next. It's going to enumerate that file and it is going to give you a list of all the users that, that are there. So you can see the users are hacker admin test the one that we are logged in as and then there's a user called virus as well and you can see that this is the hash value of the password that is being utilized now there's a particular format uh, for a hash value for windows and how it stores but once we have these hash values let's say if i want to crack this password there are various attacks that we can do for example a dictionary based attack or a brute force attack let's try a brute force attack right ntlm is the hashing mechanism that is used by windows so we're going to try to create an ntlm hash attack and here we are going to use a predetermined rule set for example we are not sure what characters are being utilized over here so we just create an attack like this using all characters and uh, lowercase a through z uppercase a through z numeric 0 through 9 and all the special characters let's say the ca password is between 7 and 16 characters and this is the character set that we want to try the brute force attack on what is a brute force attack it is an attack where the computer is going to try each and every permutation and combination out of this character set and try to figure out if the password is going to be correct so if we click start it's going to start with a particular characters and then it is going to identify if that ntlm hash is going to work against this character and you can see the time is going to be phenomenal over here so it's not necessary that this attack would be viable it will be 100 percent successful given the time frame however the time frame is huge enough for this attack to become a little bit redundant there are other attacks that we can do which can easily identify this data for us as well but that is something that we will look on in future videos so that's how we can get access to users and passwords. Uh, there are different mechanisms where let's say we don't have login access, then what are we going to do? How we can create a fake user login or how we can remotely access a machine and then try to get the same access. And that is what we are going to try to do in the next demo on a Linux machine. So what we are doing in a Linux machine could also be doable on the Windows machine with a different exploit. So what I'm going to do is, this is the Linux web server that I have that I'm going to power on. I'm going to use a Kali Linux machine to hack that device and I'm going to just power off my Windows 7 machine. Give it a minute till it boots up. Now this is also a demo machine that we have which has its own uh, pre-configured vulnerabilities. So here we've got something from the pen testers lab uh, and has a shell shock vulnerability imp implemented inside. Shell shock vulnerability uh, affects Linux, Mac and Unix based operating systems for a particular version of the bash shell. Bash is the bone again shell which is the command line interface in these operating systems. So what we are trying to do here is we are going to use the Kali Linux machine, try to find out the vulnerability over here and if it exists we are going to use Metasploit to attack this machine. Now the first and foremost thing is we want to identify the IP address. We have no idea what the IP address is. We are in the same subnet so we are assuming that we are able to connect to this machine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a tool called Zenmap. I'm going to open up a command line interface find out what my IP address is and my IP address is this with a subnet mask of 255.255.255.0 so I want to see if there are any other machines that are live in the same subnet and we are doing a ping sweep over here to identify which machines are live in a minute we'll get all the IP addresses 71.1, 2, 133, 254 and 128 we know that we are 128 at this point in time uh, 254 is the DHCP server so we are assuming that 133 is the machine that we want to look at and let's then try to see if we can scan that machine 133 and we're going to do an intense scan to find out which ports are open what services are running over there and if it is whether the pen test machine that we were looking for you can see of the start port 22 and port 80 and 
somewhere here it's going to give us the ports that are open and the details about those ports and somewhere here it will tell us that this is the pen tester lab machine that we wanted which is correct so now we want to do a vulnerability analysis on this what we are going to do is i'm going to use another gui based tool called sparta which i can just find out from here sparta uses two tools in the background a nmap tool and a tool called Nikto. So we're just going to start scanning 192.168.71.133 was the IP address. Add to scope and over a period of time you can see all of these will start populating with information. There we are. That's the Nikto tool coming in scanning on port 80 which is uh, which means that it's a web server using HTTP. It uh, tells us it's an Apache HTTP 2.2.21 and uh, gives us the 22 port number as well. If we head over to the tab of Nikto or let's look at the screenshot first. This is what the website would be looking like and Nikto gives us the options over here. It tells us that there is a vulnerability over here for shell shock and this is the path where the vulnerability is going to exist. So what we are going to do, we go back to the command line, sorry, we open up a new one, minimize all these other windows and we are going to open up Metasploit. Metasploit is a penetration testing tool that is used by most hackers and ethical hackers to test applications and test uh, existing exploits and vulnerabilities. So just give it a minute till it starts. You can see there are already around 1700 exploits right here. Uh, we are going to see all those exploits with these commands. There we are, sorry for the typo. And it will just give us a list of all the exploits that are stored in Metasploit in this version. So all of these are Windows based. If we scroll up, we will be looking at other vulnerabilities as well or exploits, the Unix based exploits, Linux, OS X, multi exploits. And we are looking for a exploit for um, multi based Apache or HTTP. Let's go up. Uh, let's look at. So this is the one that we are looking for Apache mod cgi bash environmental executable so what we're going to do is we're just going to copy it go back to the bottom say use exploit and paste the one that we wanted press enter say show options so it'll ask us to configure this i'm just going to configure it based on the knowledge that we have set our host which is the remote host the victims machine so we put in the ip address it asks us for the target uri so that's the path that we saw set Target URI to CGI hyphen bin slash status. Enter. Now with the exploit, we need to find a payload that is going to give us the output that we want. So we say show payloads and it will give us a list of all the compatible payloads with this exploit. And we want to create a reverse TCP connection, which is this. So we know it's a Linux operating system. We want this uh, payload to be set. So set payload. Press enter. That's the payload coming in. Show options. Now that we have set the payload, this is the options for the exploit. And now we want to set our options for the payloads as well. So we are creating a reverse TCP connection, which means we are remotely executing code at the victim side and making the victim connect back to our machine, which means we need to set up a listener. So I need to put my IP address over here, set localhost or L host. 192.168.71.128, which was our IP address. Show options again, just to ensure everything is fine, which looks like it is. And we then type in the word exploit so that it will start this attack. I can see that it has created a interpreter session at the victim side and it has opened up a session. So if I do a PWD, now PWD is a Linux command for present working directory and it will show us that we'll connect it to var dub 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 cgi hyphen bin. Do an ls, it will list all the files. That's the status file over there. Do a cd backslash, it will take us to the root of this machine. And if you're someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity, that is by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch careers with cybersecurity by learning from the experts. Then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from the MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. And the course link is mentioned in the description box that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Jude is waiting at the airport to hop on her flight back home when she realizes that she missed making an important bank payment. She connects her laptop to the public Wi-Fi at the airport and goes ahead to carry out the bank transaction. Everything goes well, and Jude completes her transaction. After a couple of days, she was wiped off her feet when she learned that her bank account was subjected to a cyber attack and a hefty amount was wiped from her account. After getting in touch with the bank authority, she learned that her account was hacked at the airport. 
She then realized that the public Wi-Fi she used might have caused her this trouble. Jude wishes that had her bank transfer escaped the hacker's eyes, she would not have been a victim of a cyber attack. Bank officials advise her to use a VPN for future transactions, especially when connecting to an open or public network. Like most of us, Jude had come across the term VPN several times, but didn't know much about it, and little did she think that the repercussions of not using a VPN would be this bad. Let's understand how the hacker would have exploited Jude's transaction in the absence of a VPN. In this process, Jude's computer first connects to the internet service provider, ISP, which provides access to the internet. She sends her details to the bank's server using her IP address. Internet Protocol Address, or IP address, is a unique address that recognizes a particular device, be it a laptop or a smartphone on the internet. When these details pass through the public network, the hacker, who passively watches the network traffic, intercepts it. This is a passive cyber attack, where the hacker collects Jude's bank details without being detected. More often or not, in such an attack, payment information is likely to be stolen. The targeted data here are the victim's username, passwords, and other personal information. Such an unsecured connection exposed Jude's IP address and bank details to the hacker when it passed through the public network. So would Jude have been able to secure her transaction with the help of a VPN? Well, yes. Picture Jude's bank transaction to be happening in a tunnel that is invisible to the hacker. In such a case, the hacker will not be able to spot her transaction and that is precisely what a VPN does. A virtual private network, more often known as VPN, creates a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. For using a VPN, Jude's first step would be to install a software-based technology known as the VPN client on her laptop or smartphone that would let her establish a secure connection. The VPN client connects to the Wi-Fi and then to the ISP. Here, the VPN client encrypts Jude's information using VPN protocols. Data is encrypted to make sure it is secure. Next, the VPN client establishes a VPN tunnel within the public network that connects to the VPN server. The VPN tunnel protects Jude's information from being intercepted by the hacker. Jude's IP address and actual location are changed at the VPN server to enable a private and secure connection. Finally. The VPN server connects to Jude's bank server in the last step, where the encrypted message is decrypted. This way, Jude's original IP address is hidden by the VPN, and the VPN tunnel protects her data from being hacked. This explains how VPN makes your data anonymous and secure when it passes through the public network, and the difference between a normal connection and a VPN connection. After learning about this, Jude was certain that she should start using a VPN to carry out her online transactions in the future. This is also applicable to each one of us. Even if you work remotely or connect to public Wi-Fi, using a VPN is the safest option. In addition to providing a secure encrypted data transfer, VPNs are also used to disguise your whereabouts and give you access to regional web content. VPN servers act as proxies on the internet. This way, your actual location cannot be established. VPN enables you to spoof your location and switch to a server to another country and thereby change your location. For example, by doing so, you can watch any content on Netflix that might be unavailable for your region. Meet Jonathan. He is an investigative journalist who occasionally researches and publishes news articles contrary to the government's ideologies. On one such occasion, he could not access a global news website dealing with uncensored information. It seemed his IP was blocked from visiting the news website. With his IP blocked, Jonathan turned to a popular proxy service that was able to unblock the news website, thereby allowing an open internet to all users. Just like how your friend gives a proxy attendance for you, a proxy server serves as a stand-in user to keep the real client private. But what is a proxy? Let's understand its working by taking a look at how Jonathan was able to access geoblock content without much hassle. A proxy server acts as a gateway or intermediary server between a user and its destination website. When Jonathan wasn't able to access the news website, he connected his system to a global proxy server. Once connected, the proxy server assigns a new IP address to Jonathan's system 
an IP address of a different country where the website is not censored. Following this process, whenever Jonathan visits that website, the website administrators see the new IP address assigned via a proxy server and sees no reason to deny access to their account. Once the proxy server is able to access the website, it's passed on to Jonathan's system via the same channel. Regarding accessibility to proxy servers, you must first set it up on your computer, device, or network. Next, check the steps required for your computer or network, as each operating system has its setup procedures. In most cases, however, setup entails using an automated configuration script. There are plenty of free proxy services available on the internet. However, the safety of such proxies is rarely verified. Most free proxies will provide an IP address and a relevant port for connection purposes. Reputed proxy providers like Smart Proxy and Write Data that run on subscription models will most likely provide credentials to log into when establishing the connection. This extra step acts as authentication that verifies an existing subscription on the proxy provider server, unlike free providers that are open to all. When it comes to hiding IP addresses, many people consider a VPN to be the primary solution. While that's true up to some extent, there are a few things proxies do differently. In the case of VPNs, extra encryption is also carried out to create a secure tunnel between the user's device and a VPN server. A VPN is usually much faster, more secure thanks to multiple layers of encryption, and has little to no downtime. Proxies tend to be comparatively unsafe, with the service owners having the exact IP address of the end user and having no guarantees regarding downtimes and reliability. If you want to know more about how VPNs work, do watch how Jude could have protected her banking credentials using VPNs in our detailed video linked above. Now, let's take a small quiz to check how much we have learned. What can a VPN connection provide that a proxy service cannot? A. New IP address. B. Multiple layers of encryption. C. Access to geoblock content. D. Authentication credentials. Think about it and leave your answers below in the comments section, and three lucky winners will receive Amazon gift vouchers. What about the benefits of a proxy service, though? Besides allowing access to blocked content, proxies can serve as an efficient firewall system. They can also filter content from third-party websites, allowing control over internet usage. In many cases, browsing speeds are stabilized compared to vanilla internet, thanks to proper optimization on the base proxy server. The element of privacy proxies provides is highly lucrative to people looking to hide their actual IP address from as many prying eyes as possible. One can easily argue the benefits of using VPNs over proxies for added security measures. However, a few basic tasks don't warrant maximum privacy for the user's side, as in other cases. For example, many consumers worldwide find proxy services more convenient since all major operating systems starting from Windows to Android allow proxy configuration without the hassle of installing new applications, as is in the case of a VPN. In addition, there are services online that function as web proxies, allowing users to access block content without any setup from their end. They can enter the target URL, and the web proxy will route data from its physical server. This level of freedom is hard to come by in the case of VPNs, making proxies an ideal solution for casual browsing. With the next generation of internet exchanges focused on maximum privacy and security, a variety of ways have been enforced to maintain them as such. Censorship has been shifted from the streets to the digital domain. It forces the standard citizen to derive alternative ways to maintain anonymity. A major weapon in this battle for privacy and security is the Tor browser. An independent browser meant to browse the internet while relaying information through the Tor network. It serves as a meaningful alternative to the standard internet browsing habits. To better understand the purpose of this browser and such, we must learn about the work of the Tor network. Featuring its own routing protocol, the Tor browser is an easy way to maintain anonymity while browsing without emptying one's wallet. Let's take a look at the topics to be covered today. We start at the explanation of what is the Tor network and its significance in the working of the Tor browser. We take a look at the Onion routing protocol and how it transmits the data from the client devices to the Tor directories in order to circumvent government censorship. Moving on. 
we learn a few features of the Tor browser and the distinct advantages the Tor network provides. Next, we learn the difference between using a VPN and a Tor to anonymize internet usage. And finally, we have a live demonstration of the Tor browser anonymization features in action. Let's move on to learning about the Tor network. Tor, short for the Onion Router, it's an open source privacy network that permits users to browse the web anonymously. The Tor was initially developed and solely used by the US Navy to protect sensitive government communications before the network was made publicly available. The digital era has disrupted the traditional way of doing things in every sector of the economy. The rapid rise in development and innovation of digital products has given way to frequent data breaches and cyber thefts. In response, consumers are increasingly opting for products that offer data privacy and cybersecurity. Tor is one such underground network that was implemented for the purpose of protecting users' identities. The Tor network is one example of the many emerging technologies that attempt to fill a data privacy void in a digital space plagued by cybersecurity concerns. The Tor network intercepts the traffic from your browser and bounces a user's request of a random number of other user IP addresses. Then the data is passed to the user requester's final destination. These random users are volunteer devices which are called as nodes or relays. The Tor network disguises your identity by encrypting the traffic and moving it across different Tor relays within the network. The Tor network uses an onion routing technique for transmitting data, hence the original name of onion router. To operate within the Tor network, a user has to install the Tor browser. Any address or information requested using the browser is transmitted through the Tor network. It has its own feature set which we will be covering over later in this video. As we discussed already, the data passing through the Tor network must follow a unique protocol known as the Onion Routing Protocol. Let us learn more about its unique characteristics. In our normal network usage, the data is transmitted directly. The sender has data packets to transmit which is done directly over a line of communication with either a receiving party or a server of some kind. However, since the data can easily be captured while being transmitted, the security of this exchange is not very reliable. Moreover, it becomes very easy to trace the origin of such requests. On many occasions, websites with questionable and controversial content are blocked from the ISP. This is possible since the ISP is able to detect and spy on user information passing through the network. Apart from ISPs, there is a steady chance of your private information being intercepted by hackers. Unfortunately, easy detection of the source and contents of a web request make entire network extremely vulnerable for people who seek anonymity over the internet. However, in the Onion Routing Protocol, things take a longer route. We have a sender with the Tor browser installed on the client system. The network sends the information to Node 1's IP address, which encrypts the information and passes it on to Node 2's address, which performs another encryption and passes it on to Node 3 address. This is the last address which is also known as the exit node. This last node decrypts the encrypted data and finally relays the request to the final destination, which can be another device or a server end. This final address thinks the request came from the exit node and grants access to it. The encryption process across multiple computers repeats itself from the exit node to the original user. The Tor network obfuscates user IP addresses from unwanted surveillance by keeping the user's request untraceable. With multiple servers touching the data, it makes the tracking very difficult for both ISPs and malicious attackers. Now that we understand the way Tor works, let us learn more about the Tor browser. The Tor browser was developed by a non-profit organization as a part of the Tor project in 2008 and its first public release was announced. The Tor browser is a browser fork from the popular Firefox that anonymizes your web traffic using the Tor network. If you're investigating a competitor, researching an opposing litigant in a legal dispute, or just think it's creepy for your ISP or the government to know what websites you visit, the Tor browser might be the right solution. Before the Tor browser were developed, using that network to maintain anonymity was a huge task for everyday consumers. Starting from the setup to the usage, the entire process demanded a lot of knowledge and practice. The Tor browser managed to make it easy for users to traverse the relay servers in Tor and guarantee the privacy of the data exchange. 
A major feature of the Tor browser is the ability to delete all browser history, cookies and tracking data the moment it is closed. Every new launch of the browser opens an empty slate, having your usage habits from being tracked and singled out. A major feature that is the highlight of the Tor network is the availability of Onion links. Only a small portion of the World Wide Web is available to the general public. We have the Deep Web that contains links that are not allowed to be indexed by standard search engines like Google and Bing. The Dark Web is a further subset of the Deep Web which contains Onion links. Tor Browser gives you access to these .onion websites which are only available within the Tor network. Onion is a special use top level domain which designates an anonymous Onion service which is also known as a hidden service. Similar to the links of the Deep Web, these Onion links provide services like online shopping, cryptocurrency and many other products not available in the consumer internet space. Often being considered as a haven for illegal activities and sales, Onion links provide both information and assets in a private manner without the risk of spying by authorities. Browsing the web over Tor is slower than the clear net due to the multiple layers of encryption. Some web services also block Tor users. Tor browser is also illegal in authoritarian regimes that want to prevent citizens from reading, publishing and communicating anonymously. Journalists and dissidents around the world have embraced Tor as a cornerstone of democracy and researchers are hard at work at improving Tor's anonymity properties. Let us take a look at some of the advantages of using the Tor browser over standard web browsers. The highlight of using the Tor browser is to maintain anonymity over the internet. The cause for such requests can differ from person to person but all of these concerns are answered by the Tor network. Routing the information via multiple nodes and relay servers make it entirely difficult for the ISP to keep a track of usage data. The entire Tor project is designed to be completely free and open source. Allowing the code for the browser to be inspected and audited by third parties helps in the early detection of faulty configurations and critical bugs. It is present for multiple operating systems starting from laptops to mobile devices. A number of websites are blocked by governments for a variety of reasons. Journalists under authoritarian regimes have difficulty in getting the word out regarding the situation. Since the Onion routing protocol transfers data between multiple servers of random countries, the domains being blocked become available when used via Tor. Usage of these encryption messaging platforms is easily enforced using the Tor browser, which otherwise would have been a difficult task under oppressive circumstances. Many people believe that a VPN offers the same benefits as the Tor browser. Let's put both of them to the test and see the differences between them. Coming to the first point of difference, Tor is completely free and open source. All of the code for the browser and the network can be audited and has been cleared for security concerns. When it comes to VPN, there are many different brands which have open source clients but the same cannot be said for their counterparts. Some have partly open source while some have completely locked up their code so that they cannot be stolen further. Moving on, Tor has multiple relay points in its data transfer protocol. Between the server and the receiver, there are three different IP nodes. That number can increase but it will always be more than two. Once the data is passed from the sender, it goes through all of those relay points. While in the case of a VPN, the connection is made from the client device to the VPN server and then to the requested destination. There is no other IP node that comes into work here, thereby making the connection a one-to-one -one between the client and a VPN. As a next point, since Tor handles multiple layers of encryption and the data passes through multiple systems along the way, the performance is slow compared to a VPN, where the performance is relatively fast due to the less number of nodes the data passes through. Similarly, the multi-layer encryption of Tor is consistent. If you use Tor browser, Every single request passes through the same layer of encryption and follows the same routing protocol. In the case of a VPN, different companies offer different levels of encryption. Some have multi-hop, some prefer a single one-to-one -one connection and these kind of differences make the choice much more variable. Finally, the nodes and relays being used in the Tor network are volunteer. There is no company holding over them, so jurisdiction becomes relatively straightforward. Whereas in the case of VPNs, Many such VPNs are hosted by adware companies or are being monitored by central governments to note the usage information. 
Now that we have a better understanding of the Tor browser and its routing, let us take a look at how the Tor browser can anonymize and protect our internet usage. On opening up the Tor browser for the first time, this is the page that you are going to be welcomed with. You have the option of connecting to the Tor network before we start our browsing. So let's press connect and we can see that it is connected. Coming to the anonymization, let's check my current location on Google Chrome. Currently is showing as Navi Mumbai in Maharashtra. If we check the same link on the Tor browser, we should get a different address. Now every link that we open in the Tor browser will be a little delayed and the speed will be hampered because of the multiple layers of encryption like we discussed. Now as you can see, it's showing a German IP and the state of Bavaria. This is how the anonymization works. There is no VPN configured, there is no proxy attached. It's straight up the out of the box settings that come inbuilt with the Tor browser. Similarly, we have an option of cleaning up the data. Let's say if you want to refresh your location and you want to use a different ID for the next browsing session. If you just restart it once and you can have to check it again. We should be seeing a different country this time. As you can see, we have Netherlands right now. So this is how you can keep refreshing your address. You can keep refreshing your host location so that you cannot be tracked when in browsing the internet. Like we discussed, we have some onion links that can only be used on the Tor network. As you can see, these kind of links do not open in the Google Chrome browser. But once we copy these over to the Tor browser, As you can see, we have opened the hidden wiki, which is available only on the Tor network. This is kind of an alternative Wikipedia website where we can find articles to read and more information to learn. Similarly, we have another onion link over here, which is once again available only for the Tor browser. Now these kind of delays are expected, but they are a valid compromise because they maintain the anonymity that many people desire. Similarly, we have found a hidden wallet, which is a cryptocurrency wallet, which is specifically for dark web members. This operates over the Tor network and this is used by mostly journalists and people who want to anonymize their internet transactions when it comes to dealing money. All of the transactions that occur over the Tor network are almost impossible to track. Therefore, these kind of cryptocurrency wallets are very big on the deep web. This is just one example while having multiple different wallets for every single cryptocurrency available. Imagine our houses without a fence or boundary wall. This would make our property easy accessible to trespassers and robbers and place our homes at great risk, right? Hence, fencing our property helps safeguard it and keeps trespassers at bay. Similarly, Imagine our computers and networks without protection. This would increase the probability of hackers infiltrating our networks. To overcome this challenge, just like how boundary walls protect our houses, a virtual wall helps safeguard and secure our devices from intruders, and such a wall is known as a firewall. Firewalls are security devices that filter the incoming and outgoing traffic within a private network. For example, if you were to visit your friend who lives in a gated community, you would first take permission from the security guard. The security guard would check with your friend if you should be allowed entry or not. If all is well, your access is granted. On the other hand, the security guard would not grant permission to a trespasser looking to enter the same premises. Here, the entry access depends solely on your friend, the resident's discretion. The role of the security guard in this case is similar to that of a firewall. The firewall works like a gatekeeper at your computer's entry point, which only welcomes incoming traffic that it has been configured to accept. Firewalls filter the network traffic within your network and analyzes which traffic should be allowed or restricted based on a set of rules in order to spot and prevent cyber attacks. Your computer communicates with the internet in the form of network packets that hold details like the source address, destination address, and information. These network packets enter your computer through ports, 
The firewall works on a set of rules based on the details of these network packets, like their source address, a destination address, content, and port numbers. Only trusted traffic sources or IP addresses are allowed to enter your network. When you connect your computer to the internet, there is a high chance of hackers infiltrating your network. This is when a firewall comes to your rescue by acting as a barrier between your computer and the internet. The firewall rejects the malicious data packet and thus protects your network from hackers. On the other hand, traffic from trusted websites is allowed access to your network. This way, the firewall carries out quick assessments to detect malware and other suspicious activities, thereby protecting your network from being susceptible to a cyber attack. Firewalls can either be hardware or software. Software firewalls are programs installed on each computer. This is also called a host firewall. Meanwhile, hardware firewalls are equipments that are established between the gateway and your network. Linksys routers are a good example of a hardware firewall. Besides this, there are other types of firewalls designed based on their traffic filtering methods, structure, and functionality. The firewall that compares each outgoing and incoming network packet to a set of established rules, such as the allowed IP addresses, IP protocols, port number, and other aspects of the packet, is known as a packet filtering firewall. If the incoming network traffic is not per the predefined rules, that traffic is blocked. A variant of the packet filtering firewall is the Stateful Inspection Firewall. These types of firewalls not only examine each network packet, but also checks whether or not that network packet is part of an established network connection. Such firewalls are also referred to as Dynamic Packet Filtering Firewalls. Our next type of firewall is called a Proxy Firewall. This draws close comparison to how you give proxy attendance for a friend, like how you take the authority to represent your friend. The proxy firewall pretends to be you and interacts with the internet. They come between you and the internet and thereby prevents direct connections. This protects your device's identity and keeps the network safe from potential attacks. Only if the incoming data packet contents are protected, the proxy firewall transfers it to you. They're also known as application level gateway. A firewall can spot malicious actions and block your computer from receiving data packets from harmful sources. In addition to preventing cyber attacks, firewalls are also used in educational institutions and offices to restrict users' access to certain websites or applications. It is used to avoid access to unauthorized content. It's the year 2015, and Richard has just finished playing games on his computer. After a long gaming session, Richard tries to shut it down but find some random text file on the desktop that says ransom note. The text file mentioned how a hacking group had encrypted Richard's game files and private documents, and he had to pay a ransom of $500 worth of Bitcoin in the specified Bitcoin address. Richard quickly checked his files, only to see them being encrypted and unreadable. This is the story of how the Tesla Crypt ransomware spread in 2015 which affected thousands of gamers before releasing the master key used for encrypting the files. So, what is ransomware? For Richard to be targeted by such an attack, he must have installed applications from untrusted sources or clicked an unverified link. Both of them can function as gateways for a ransomware breach. Ransomware is a type of malware that encrypts personal information and documents while demanding a ransom amount to decrypt them. This ransom payment is mainly done using cryptocurrency to ensure anonymity, but can also employ other routes. Once the files are encrypted or locked behind a password, a text file is available to the victim, explaining how to make the ransom payment and unlock the files for it. Just like Richard found the ransom note text file on his desktop. Even after the money has been paid, there is no guarantee that the hackers will send the decryption key or unlock the files. But in certain sensitive situations, victims make the payment hoping for the best. Having never been introduced to ransomware attacks before, this gave Richard an opportunity to learn more about this, and he began his research on the topic. The spread of ransomware mostly starts with phishing attacks. To know more about phishing attacks, click the link in the button above. Users tend to click on unknown links received via emails and chat applications, promising rewards of some nature. Once clicked, a ransomware file is installed on the system that encrypts all the files or blocks access to computer functions. They can also be spread via malware, transmitted via untrusted application installation, or even a compromised wireless network. 
Another way to breach a system with ransomware is by using the Remote Desktop Protocol, or RDP access. A computer can be accessed remotely using this protocol, allowing a hacker to install malicious software on the system with the owner unaware of these developments. Coming to the different types of ransomware. First, we have Locker Ransomware which is a type of malware that blocks standard computer functions from being accessed until the payment to the hackers is complete. It shows a lock screen that doesn't allow the victim to use the computer for even basic purposes. Another type is crypto ransomware, which encrypts the local files and documents in the computers. Once the files are encrypted, finding the decryption key is impossible unless the ransomware variant is old and the keys are already available on the internet. Scareware is fake software that claims to have detected a virus or other issue on your computer and directs you to pay to resolve the problem. Some types of scareware lock the computer, while others simply flood the screen with pop-up alerts without actually damaging files. To prevent getting affected by ransomware, Richard could have followed a few steps to further enhance his security. One must always have backups of their data. Cloud storage for backup is easy but a physical backup in a hard drive is always recommended. Keeping the system updated with the latest security patches is always a good idea. Apart from system updates, one must always have reputed antivirus software installed. Many antivirus software like Kaspersky and Bitdefender have anti-ransomware features that periodically check for encryption of private documents. When browsing the internet, a user must always check for the lock symbol on the address bar which signifies the presence of HTTPS protocol for additional security. If a system is infected with ransomware already, there is a website, nomoreransom.org. It has a collection of decryption tools for most well-known ransomware packages. It can also help decrypt specific encrypted files if the list of anti-ransomware tools didn't help the victim. Malware is a malicious software that is programmed to cause damage to a computer system network and hardware devices. Many malicious programs like Trojan, viruses, bombs, and bots which cause damage to the system are known as malware. Most of the malware programs are designed to steal information from the targeted user or to steal money from the target by stealing sensitive data. Let's take a look at the introduction for two different types of malware, virus and Trojan. Firstly, let's take a look what exactly is a virus program. A computer virus is a type of malicious program that on execution replicates itself. They get attached to different files and programs which are termed as host programs by inserting their code. If the attachment succeeds, the targeted program is termed as infected with a computer virus. Now let's take a look at the Trojan horse. Trojan Horse Program is a program that disguises itself as a legitimate program but harms the system on installation. They hide within the attachments and emails then transfer from one system to another. They create back doors into a system to allow the cyber criminal to steal our information. Let's take a look how they function after getting installed into our system. Firstly, we have virus programs. The computer virus must contain two parts to infect the system. First is a search routine, which locates new files and data that is to be infected by the virus program. And the second part is known as the copy routine, which is necessary for the program to copy itself into the targeted file, which is located by the search routine. Now let's take a look at the Trojan horse functioning. For Trojan horses, entry way into our system is through emails that may look legitimate but may have unknown attachments. And when such files are downloaded into the device, the Trojan program gets installed and infects the system. They also infect the system on the execution of infected application or the executable file and attacks the system. Now that we understand what virus and Trojans are, let's understand different types of virus and Trojans. Let's take a look at different types of viruses. The first one is known as the boot sector virus. This type of virus damages the booting section of the system by infecting the master bot record, which is also known as MBI. This damages the boot sector section by targeting the hard disk of the system. Then we have the macrovirus. Macrovirus is a type of virus that gets embedded into the document related data 
and is executed when the file is open. They also are designed to replicate themselves and infect the system on a larger scale. And lastly, we have the direct action virus. This type of virus gets attached to executable files, which on execution activates the virus program and infects the system. Once the infection of the file is completed, they exit the system, which is also the reason it is known as a non-resident virus. Let's take a look at different types of trojans. The first type of trojan is the backdoor trojan. They are designed to create a backdoor in the system on execution of an infected program. They provide remote access of our system to the hacker. This way, the cyber criminal can steal our system data and may use it for illegal activities. Next, we have Crixos Trojan. They enter the system by clicking the random pop ups which we come across on the internet. They tempt the user to give their personal details for different transactions or schemes, which may provide remote access of our system to the cyber criminal. And the last Trojan type is Ransom Trojan. This type of Trojan program, after entering the system, blocks the user from accessing its own system and also affects the system function. The cyber criminal demands a ransom from the targeted user for the removal of the Trojan program from the device. Now that we understand some details regarding viruses and Trojan, let's solve a question. The question is, Jake was denied access to his system and he wasn't able to control the data and information in his system. Now, the actual question is, what could be the reason behind his system's problem? Option A, Macrovirus. Option B, Ransom Trojan. Option C, Backdoor Trojan. Give your answers in the comment section. Now let's understand how to detect the activity of viruses and Trojan in our system. To detect virus or trojan activity in a system, we can refer to the following points. For viruses, we have slowing down of the system and frequent application freeze shows that the infection of the virus is present in the system. Then we have the viruses can also steal sensitive data, including passwords, account details, which may lead to unexpected logout from the accounts or corruption of the sensitive data. And lastly, we have frequent system crashes due to virus infection, which damages the operating system. For Trojan, we have frequent system crashes and system also faces slow reaction time. Then we have there are more random pop-ups from the system, which may indicate Trojan activity. And lastly, we have modification in the system application and change of the desktop appearance can be also due to the infection of a Trojan program. Next, let's take a look at a famous cyber attack for virus and a Trojan horse. For virus, we have the MyDoom virus, which was identified in the year 2004, which affected over 50 million systems by creating a network of sending spam emails, which was to gain backdoor access into our systems. Next, for the Trojan horse, we have the Emotat Trojan program which is specifically designed for financial theft and for stealing bank-related information. Next, we have few points for how to prevent virus entry or Trojan attack for a system. The most basic way of virus protection is to using antivirus and do regular virus scan. This will prevent virus entry in the system and also having more than one antivirus provides much better protection. Then avoid visiting uncertified websites can also prevent virus entry into our system. Then we have using regular driver updates and system updates to prevent virus entry. For Trojan we have using certified softwares from legal sites to prevent any Trojan activity in our system. And also avoid clicking random pop-ups that we often see on the internet. And lastly using antivirus and firewalls for protection against Trojan horses is a good habit. Now that we have reached the end of the video, let's take a look what we learned. For the first part, we saw the main objective of the virus is to harm the data and information in a system, whereas for the Trojan we have stealing of the data files and information.
effect of viruses is more drastic in comparison to the Trojan horses. Then we have viruses which are non-remote programs, whereas Trojan horses are remote accessed. And lastly, viruses have the ability to replicate itself to harm multiple files, whereas Trojan does not have the replication ability. So let's begin with what is SQL injection. As the name suggests, SQL injection vulnerability allows an attacker to inject malicious input into a SQL statement. So SQL stands for Structured Query Language, which is a language used by an application to interact with a database. Now, normally this attack is targeted towards a database to extract uh, the data that is stored within. However, the vulnerability does not lie in the database itself. The vulnerability will always lie in the application. It is the developer's prerogative of how to develop the application, how to configure it to prevent SQL injection queries from happening. A database is created to answer questions and if a question is asked, it is supposed to answer it. Database needs to be configured for some amount of security, but the vulnerability, the flaw here for SQL injection will always lie in the application itself. It is how the application interacts with the database that needs to be modified, that needs to be maintained by the developer rather than just configuring the database itself. So the attacker at this point in time, when they send a query to the application, will form a malformed query by injecting a particular command or an operator that is recognized by the SQL language. And if that operator is passed through the application to the database, then the database uh, basically gets cracked or does a data dump because of that unwanted character coming in. So this character needs to be filtered at the application level itself. Now, let's look at a quick demo. So what we have done here is I have this virtual machine called OWASP Broken Web Applications Virtual Machine version 1.2. I'm going to power this on. Till this power is on, I'm going to show you where we can download this uh, utility from. So you can just look for OWASP Broken Web Application Project Download. You'll find it on sourceforge.net. Click on the link. You can download the Broken Web Application Project from here. This is a 1.9 GB download and you can have a zip machine directly for VMware or Oracle Virtual Box. Now, this is an application that has been developed by OWASP, which stands for Open Web Application Security Project, which is a not-for-profit organization and uh, periodically uh, releases the most top 10 risks that an application uh, will face for that particular year. So they have given a web application uh, with inbuilt vulnerabilities for professionals like us to practice upon, to develop our, uh, our skills upon, because doing this in the real world is illegal. I cannot go onto a website to demonstrate how a SQL injection attack works. Uh, neither should you try your hands on it till you become very uh, well rehearsed with it. So till uh, to up upgrade your skills, to upskill yourself, please download this machine, host it in a VMware workstation or an Oracle vir virtual box and you can uh, then try your skills on it, right? So uh, just going back to the browser here, if I open up uh, a new tab, you'll see that this machine has booted up and has an IP address called 71.132. So if I just go on to that IP address and I type in 192.168, 71.132, and you'll see the OWASP broken web application project. And there are a lot of training applications, realistic, intentionally vulnerable applications, old versions of real applications and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of applications inbuilt over here that you can try your skills upon. We are going to try to use the OWASP utility over here. Uh, this gives you the uh, OWASP top 10 risks for 2010, 2013. 2017 is the latest one so far. Uh, but the difference between 2013 and 2017 is that some of these have changed, but not all of them. Uh, the order has changed a little bit, but you can see that SQL injection is on the top A1 amongst the injection attacks. Right. And you can see there are multiple types that have been given here. The SQL injection for extracting data or SQL injection for bypass authentication or insert your injection uh, uh, attacks, blind SQL injection, 
and then there is a tool called SQL map which is available freely on your Linux machines Kali Linux or Parrot Linux whichever you want to use uh, for your practice targets and so on and so forth so if I just take you here for bypass authentication and this is a regular login page that an application may have right you look at a username you look at a password you type that in and you log in so let's say I don't know a password here I'm just going to type in a username test password is PASSWRD I try to log in and it shows me that the account does not exist so the authentication mechanism does work uh, I did try uh, type in a username and password it wasn't recognized so the account does not exist now let's try to type in a SQL query here I'm going to just give it a single quote which is an operator that is recognized by the SQL language which when uh, the database tries to execute uh, will cause the database to uh, dump some data or to bypass authentication in this case and I'm going to give it a condition single quote or one equals one space hyphen hyphen space and I'm going to click on login now right now I'm not logged in at all and we tried our username and password and we weren't able to log in so now if I log in you will see that it gave me a, st a status update saying the user has been authenticated and I'm logged in as admin got root so that is what these SQL queries can achieve I'm going to log out right now and uh, we're going to look at the basics of SQL injection so looking at that small demo looking now let's look at uh, what types of SQL injections are available so the first is in-band SQL injection. The, uh, there are two subtypes within in-band, error-based injection attack and a union-based injection attack. The second type is blind SQL injection attack, where there's a Boolean-based and a time-based attack. And the third one is uh, out-of-bound SQL injection attack. Now, what is in-band SQL injection attack? In-band is where we are either attempting the error-based or the union-based. What is error-based? Uh, we send a query, to the database we craft a query to the database and uh, it generates an error mes message and it dumps the error message right in front of us on the screen that uh, makes us realize that there is a flaw and there, there is some information that is dumped on the screen which we can then further utilize to craft our further queries as we go ahead whereas union base is the, uh, it is where we combine multiple statements at the same time. So if you look at the URL, uh, earlier in the URL, uh, you would see a large structure in that URL. Uh, we can try to add more, two or more statements within the URL itself to combine them and then confuse the database into executing both the statements together and giving a data dump at the same time, right? So what would an error-based uh, SQL injection look like? If I go back to the same database, uh, which is here, right? And if you remember the username, we gave it a single quote or one equals one space hyphen hyphen space. We gave it the condition, right? So basically what it did was this, a single quote is an operator that goes to the database, selects the default uh, table uh, in the user tables in this database column, and then compares it to the condition that is given. So the condition that we gave was one equals one, which is always true. So what it did was it selected the default uh, user table that was available in the database. And instead of comparing it to a password, it compared it to the condition. So if I give it one equals two, where the condition is false, and if I log in, you will see that the account doesn't exist, comes back again, because the condition was false. And instead of comparing the user account to the password it basically uh, compared the user account to the condition so if i give it a single quote or one equals one hyphen hyphen space uh, and log in you can see that uh, this is a correct condition and thus we are able to log in now before we even go uh, to that extent if i just forget the condition over here and i just give it a single quote the operator and i send this operator to the database and i click on login you will see that it generates an error which is right on top and it tells us the line the uh, file where the error happened and you can see it happened in the mysql handler.php file right and then it gives us the message you have an error in your sql syntax check the manual that corresponds to your mysql server version for the right syntax to use now why would a hacker want to do this in the first place because there are different types of databases 
So there is a MySQL, MS SQL or Microsoft SQL, Oracle SQL, IBM DB2. All of these are variations of the SQL database. Uh, they use the SQL language. However, every database has its own command, right? They, they have their own syntax. They have their own uh, specific commands that are utilized for the database. So in this scenario, the hacker wants to identify what database is being currently utilized. So they can craft those particular queries. So now with this injection, with just me sending the quote and the error getting generated, I now come to know that we are using a MySQL server and the version of that server is 5.1.73 and uh, the rest of the information about uh, where the handlers are located and so on and so forth. Right, this gives the information to the hacker of how they want to proceed next, what kind of queries they want to create, what kind of syntax they want to utilize. So uh, error based uh, attack is where you generate these kind of errors uh, and you get this information. The union base is where you craft your queries within the URL. Uh, you can uh, try to combine multiple statements within the input fields and try to generate a response from that. Then we come to Boolean based SQL injection. Uh, sends a SQL query to the database which forces the application to return a different result depending on whether the query returns a true or a false result. So basically if the input is false, the uh, input, both the inputs are false, the output would be false. Uh, there's one input that is false, the other input that is true, input B, the output would be true and so on and so forth. Right. So depending on the result from the inputs, the attacker will come to know which input is true. With this, he can then access the database of the website. So you're trying to figure out by sending out multiple inputs uh, and then analyzing the output to see what exactly, uh, which command exactly worked, what was the resultant output of that command. Thus, from this kind of an information, the hacker can infer their next step forward. Then you have time-based SQL injections. Uh, now. There are times when a database administrator or an application administrator has done some security configuration and thus have disabled verbose error messages. Now, what is a verbose error message? The error message that we saw right here is a verbose error message. That means that the message gives out details. The message gives out details about what the database is, the version and whatnot. So if they have sanitized these errors, and you no longer can generate these errors and thus you cannot figure out what database is, then what do you do, right? For example, if I just take you to simply learn, and take you to a URL that is supposedly not accessible. You can see that it gives a generic error. Oops, like it looks like you have crash landed on Mars. It doesn't give you a verbose error that we saw here. So this gives us a detailed error of what went wrong, where it gives us the database, the version of the database and uh, where the query went wrong and etc, etc, etc. Whereas on this site where there's some, there's a lot of security that goes in here. So you can see that it doesn't generate a error, you just get a generic page in front of you. So in that case, what does a hacker do? So the hacker then injects a time based uh, query in the URL, which allows us to verify whether the command is being executed or not. So uh, we put in a time wait, let's say 10 seconds of time wait. So if we the moment we inject the query, if the query times for 10 seconds and then gets executed, that means that the SQL injection is possible. However, if we inject the query and uh, it just gets executed without the delay, that means that the time uh, injection attack would not be uh, possible on that particular site. Out of bound is not a very common attack. It depends on the features being enabled on the database management system that is being used by the web application. So this can be a somewhat of a misconfiguration error uh, by the database administrator where you have enabled functions and not sanitize them. So you have not done in uh, access controls properly. You have not given account control. So queries should never be executed at an administrative level. They should always be uh, executed at a user level 
with minimum privileges that are required for that query to be executed now if you're allowing these kind of functions to be uh, to be enabled at the dbms and there is an administrative account that can have access to them at that point in time an out of bound injection attack is possible so let's look at how a website works right uh, how SQL works on a website. Now, the website is constructed of HTML, hypertext markup language, uh, which would include JavaScripting for functionality, cascading style sheets for the mapping of the website, right? And then React, JS, and whatnot uh, for uh, further functionality. Now, when we send a query to the website, it is normally using the HTTP protocol or HTTPS protocol. When the query reaches the application, the application would then go ahead and generate the SQL query. Uh, at the client side, you'll have uh, all these scripting languages coming in uh, on the front end uh, that we can utilize to craft queries and then send them across. At the server side, you'll have uh, databases like Oracle, MySQL, MS SQL, and so on and so forth that will then execute those queries, right? So just to give you an example, if I use a tool called Postman, what we generally do uh, when we craft a query is we send out a, a get request to the website and then we receive a response from the site uh, with the HTML code and everything. So this is a tool that is utilized by software testers to test the responses that you're going to get from various websites. So on the left hand side you can see I've uh, used it on quite a bit. Uh, here we have an example for gmail.com. So let's continue with that. So this is a get request being sent to gmail. The moment I send it, it's going to create an HTTP request and send it across. The response that I get is this. This is the HTML code for gmail.com, right? These are the cookies. Uh, these are the headers uh, that include information. So it, you can see this is a text HTML character set utilized is UTF-8 and the configuration uh, that has been done with the application, right? So this is where uh, everything comes in. This is the cookie that has been sent with that particular uh, request that I had sent out. Now, if we analyze this query, right? So when we went on to this application and I typed in that single quote and we generated this error, right? Uh, you can see that the application converted this into a SQL query. So the query was select username from accounts where the username in quotes, single quotes, and we use the quote, right? The single quote right there. So uh, that's where we use that operator and that's where the exception error occurred. So these are the kind of queries that are structured by the application and then taken on to the database for execution. When we type in, uh, it is a HTTP GET request with the username and password within that query uh, that is sent to the application. The application converts it into a SQL query, sends it to the database and the database responds with the appropriate response. So how do we prevent SQL injection in the first place? Use prepared statements and parameterized queries. Uh, these statements make sure that the parameters passed into SQL statements are treated in a safe manner. So for example, we saw that the single quote was an operator. This shouldn't be allowed to be utilized in the first place, right? So here, what we are doing here is a secure way of running a SQL query in the JDBC using a parameterized statement define which user we want to find. So there's a string, the email comes in. Connection to the database, we are going to figure out how the connection is going to be passed, how it is going to be created. Construct the SQL statement we want to run specifying the parameter, right? So we define how is it going to be uh, created, what is going to be created, what can be passed to the database and what should not be passed to the database. So that is one way of uh, uh, utilizing prepared statements and parameterized queries. Then we have object relational mapping. Most development uh, teams prefer to use object, object relational mapping frameworks to make the translation of SQL results set into code objects more seamless. So this is an example of uh, object relational mapping uh, where we map certain objects and allow that to be executed. And then escaping inputs. It is a simple way to protect against most SQL injection attacks. Many languages have standard functions to achieve this. Right. So you need to be very careful while using escape characters in your code base when a SQL statement is constructed. Not all injection attacks rely on abuse of code characters. So you need to know what characters are being utilized uh, in the configuration that you have created, in the structure that you have created, in the code that you have created, 
uh, which characters are being recognized as operators you need to sanitize those operators and you need to uh, basically ensure that these operators cannot be accepted as user input if they are they're weeded out by the application and they never reach the database other methods of uh, preventing sql injection are uh, password hashing so that passwords cannot be bypassed the passwords cannot be recovered passwords cannot be cracked uh, third party authentication you use oauth or uh, some other service for a single sign on mechanism does uh, you rely on a third party to maintain the security of authentication and uh, what kind of uh, parameters are passed for example uh, using linkedin logins or facebook logins right uh, for the layman you normally go on to facebook and you allow if you're using a game right if you start playing a game you're allowed to log into the game using your facebook credentials or your google credentials now that is not just for ease of use but the game user the developer has outsourced the authentication mechanisms to third parties such as facebook or google because they understand that that authentication mechanism is as safe as can be facebook and google are wealthy organizations uh, hire a lot of security experts and the development for their authentication mechanisms is top notch small organization cannot spend that kind of money on security itself right so you use a third party authentication mechanism to ensure that these kind of attacks may not happen then web application firewalls uh, having a web application firewall and configuring it properly uh, for sql injection attacks is one of the sure shot method of uh, mitigating or minimizing the uh, threat in the first place so at this point in time you have realized that the application has some vulnerabilities for sql injection and instead of recoding or restructuring the application uh, you want to take the easier way out or the cheaper way out so what you do is you uh, you install a web application firewall and you configure the web application firewall to identify malicious queries and stop them uh, at the firewall level itself so they never reach the application and thus the vulnerabilities on the application don't get executed buy better software and uh, keep on updating the software so it's not necessary that once you have a software you install it it's going to be safe for life new vulnerabilities are discovered every day every hour and it may so happen what is secure today may be completely insecure tomorrow or the day after right so you need to keep on upgrading the software if there are no upgrades available and the vulnerabilities still exist you might want to migrate to a better software and thus uh, ensure that you don't get hacked right always update and use patches organizations keep on sending out updates and patches as and when they are released you need to install them to uh, enhance your security postures and then continuously monitor sql statements and databases use protocol monitors uh, use different softwares use the firewalls to keep on monitoring what kind of queries you're uh, getting and based on those queries you want to ensure the inputs and the queries that are creating uh, are not detrimental to the health of the software that you have jane is relaxing at home when she receives an email from a bank that asks her to update her credit card pin in the next 24 hours as a security measure. Judging the severity of the message, Jane follows the link provided in the email. On delivering her current credit card pin and the supposedly updated one, the website became unresponsive, which prompted her to try sometime later. However, after a couple of hours, she noticed a significant purchase from a random website on that same credit card, which she never authorized. Frantically contacting the bank, Jane realized the original email was a counterfeit or a fake message with a malicious link that entailed credit card fraud. This is a classic example of a phishing attack. Phishing attacks are a type of social engineering where a fraudulent message is sent to a target on the premise of arriving from a trusted source. Its basic purpose is to trick the victim into revealing sensitive information like passwords and payment information. It's based on the word phishing, which works on the concept of baits. If a supposed victim catches the bait, the attack can go ahead, which in our case makes Jane the fish and the phishing emails the bait. If Jane never opened the malicious link or was cautious about the email authenticity, an attack of this nature would have been relatively ineffective. But how does the hacker gain access to these credentials? A phishing attack starts with a fraudulent message, which can be transmitted via email or chat applications. 
even using SMS conversations to impersonate legitimate sources is known as smishing, which is a specific category of phishing attacks. Irrespective of the manner of transmission, the message targets the victim in a way that coaxes them to open a malicious link and provide critical information on the requisite website. More often than not, the websites are designed to look as authentic as possible. Once the victims submit information using the link, be it a password or credit card details, the data is sent to the hacker who designed the email and the fake website, giving him complete control over the account whose password was just provided. Often carried out in campaigns where an identical phishing mail is sent to thousands of users, the rate of success is relatively low, but never zero. Between 2013 and 2015, corporate giants like Facebook and Google were tricked off of $100 million due to an extensive phishing campaign where a known common associate was impersonated by the hackers. Apart from credit access, some of these campaigns target the victim device and install malware when clicked on the malicious links, which can later function as a botnet or a target for ransomware attacks. There is no single formula, for there are multiple categories of phishing attacks. The issue with Jane, where the hacker stole her bank credentials, falls under the umbrella of deceptive phishing. A general email is sent out to thousands of users in this category, hoping some of them fall prey to this scam. Spear phishing, on the other hand, is a bit customized version. The targets are researched before being sent an email. For example, if you never had a Netflix subscription, sending you an email that seems like the Netflix team sends it becomes pointless. This is a potential drawback of deceptive phishing techniques. On the other hand, a simple screenshot of a Spotify playlist being shared on social media indicates a probable point of entry. The hacker can send counterfeit messages to the target user while implying the source of such messages being Spotify, tricking them into sharing private information. Since the hacker already knows the target uses Spotify, the chances of victims taking the bait increase substantially. For more important targets like CEOs and people with a fortune on their back, the research done is tenfold which can be called a case of whaling. The hackers prepare and wait for the right moment to launch their phishing attack, often to steal industry secrets for rival companies or sell them off at a higher price. Apart from just emails, farming focuses on fake websites that resemble their original counterparts as much as possible. A prevalent method is to use domain names like Facebook with a single O or YouTube with no E. These are mistakes that people make when typing the full URL in the browser leading them straight to a counterfeit web page, which can fool them into submitting private data. A few more complex methods exist to drive people onto fake websites, like ARP spoofing and DNS cache poisoning, but they are rarely carried out due to time and resource constraints. Now that we know how phishing attacks work, let's look at ways to prevent ourselves from becoming victims. While the implications of a phishing attack can be extreme, protecting yourself against these is relatively straightforward. Jane could have saved herself from credit card fraud had she checked the link in the email for authenticity and that it redirected to a secure website that runs on the HTTPS protocol. Even suspicious messages shouldn't be entertained. One must also refrain from entering private information on random websites or pop-up windows, irrespective of how legitimate they seem. It is also recommended to use secure anti-phishing browser extensions like Cloudfish to sniff out malicious emails from legitimate ones. The best way to prevent phishing is browsing the internet with care and being on alert for malicious attempts at all times. Start by learning about cross-site scripting from a layman's perspective. Cross-site scripting, also known as XSS, is a type of code injection attack that occurs on the client side. The attacker intends to run harmful scripts in the victim's web browser by embedding malicious code in a genuine web page or online application. The real attack takes place when the victim hits the malicious code infected web page or online application. The web page or application serves as a vehicle for the malicious script to be sent to the user's browser. Forums, message boards, and online pages that enable comments are vulnerable vehicles that are frequently utilized for cross-scripting assaults. A web page or web application is vulnerable to XSS if the output it creates contains unsanitized user input. The victim's browser must then parse this user input. In VBScript, ActiveX, Flash, and even CSS, cross-site scripting attacks are conceivable. 
They are nevertheless most ubiquitous in JavaScript owing to the fact that JavaScript is most important to most browser experiences nowadays. The main purpose of this attack is to steal the other user's identity, be it via cookies, session tokens and other information. In most of the cases, this attack is being used to steal the other person's cookies. As we know, cookies help us to log in automatically. Therefore, with the stolen cookies, we can log in with other identities. And this is one of the reasons why this attack is considered as one of the riskiest attacks. It can be performed with different client-side programming languages as well. Cross-site scripting is often compared with similar client-side attacks, as client-side languages are mostly being used during this. However, an XSS attack is considered riskier because of its ability to damage even less vulnerable technologies. Most often this attack is performed with JavaScript and HTML. JavaScript is a programming language that runs on web pages inside your browser. The client-side code adds functionality and interactivity to the web page and is used extensively on all major applications and CMS platforms. Unlike server-side languages such as PHP, JavaScript code runs inside your browser and cannot impact the website for other visitors. It is sandboxed to your own navigator and can only perform actions within your own browser window. While JavaScript is client-side and does not run on the server, it can be used to interact with the server by performing background requests. Attackers can then use these background requests to add unwanted spam content to a web page without refreshing it. They can then gather analytics about the client's browser or perform actions asynchronously. The manner of attack can range in a variety of ways. It can be a single link which the user must click on to initiate a JavaScript piece of code. It can be used to show any piece of images that can be later used as a front-end for malicious code being installed as malware. With the majority of internet users unaware of how metadata works or the ways in which web requests are called, the chances of victims clicking on a redirecting links is far too high. Cross-site scripting can occur on the malicious script executed at the client side using a fake page or even a form that is displayed to the user. On websites with displayed advertisements, malicious emails can also be sent to the victim. These attacks occur when the malicious user finds the vulnerable parts of the website and sends it as appropriate malicious input. Now that we understand the basics of cross-site scripting, let us learn more about how this kind of attack works. In the first place, we have the website or the web browser, which is used to show content to the victim or which is the user in our case. Whenever the user wants to grab some content from the website, the website asks the data from the server. The server provides this information to the website and the web browser, which ultimately reaches the victim. How the hacker comes into play here, it passes on certain arguments to the web browser, which is, can be then forwarded back to the server or to the user at hand. The entire cross-site scripting attack vector means sending and injecting malicious code or script. This attack can be performed in different ways. Depending on the type of attack, the malicious script may be reflected on the victim's browser or stored in the database and executed every time when the user calls the appropriate function. The main reason for this attack is inappropriate user's input validation, where the malicious input can get into the output. A malicious user can enter a script which will be injected onto the website's code then the browser is not able to know if the executed code is malicious or not. Therefore, this malicious script is being executed on the victim's browser or any faked form if that is being displayed for the users. There are many ways to trigger an XSS attack. For example, the execution could be triggered automatically when the page loads or when a user hovers over specific elements of the page like hyperlinks. Potential consequences of cross-site scripting attacks include capturing keystrokes of a user, redirecting a user to malicious websites, running web browser-based exploits, obtaining cookie information of a user who is logged into a website, and many more. In some cases, cross-site scripting attack leads to complete compromise of the victim's account. Attackers can trick users into entering credentials on a fake form which can then provide all information to the attacker. With the basic working of a cross-site scripting attack out of the way, let us go over the different ways hackers can leverage vulnerable web applications to gather information and eventually breach those systems. The prime purpose of performing XSS attack is to steal the other person's identity. 
as mentioned it may be cookies session tokens etc xss may also be used to display fake pages or forms for the victim however this can be performed in several ways we have a reflected attack this attack occurs when a malicious script is not being saved on the web server but is reflected in the website results. Reflected XSS code is not being saved permanently. In this case, the malicious code is being reflected in any website result. The attack code can be included in the faked URL or in the HTTP parameters. It can affect the victim in different ways by displaying fake malicious page or by sending a malicious email. In a reflected cross-site scripting example, the input of a search form is reflected on the page to show what the search key was. An attacker may craft a URL that contains malicious code and then spread the same URL via email or social media. A user who clicks on this link opens the valid web application which then runs the malicious code in the browser. This script is not stored in the web application and malicious code is shown only to one user. The user that opens the link executes the strip and the attack is not necessarily visible on the server side or to the app owner itself. The next variant is a stored cross-site scripting attacks. This occurs when a malicious script is being saved on the web server permanently. This can be considered a riskier attack since it has leverage for more damage. In this type of attack, the malicious code or script is being saved on the server, for example in the database of the website. It is executed every time the users call the appropriate functionality. This way, stored XSS attack can affect many users. Also, as the script is being stored on the web server, it will affect the website for a longer time. In order to perform stored XSS attack, the malicious scripts should be sent through the vulnerable input form. For example, can be a comment field or a review field. This way, the appropriate script will be saved in the database and evaluated on the page load or appropriate function calling. In a stored XSS example, the script might have been submitted via an input field to the web server which did not perform a sufficient validation and stores the script permanently in the database. The consequence of this might be that the script is now being delivered to all users visiting the web application and if, for example able to gain access to the user session cookies. In this attack, the script is permanently stored in the web app. The users visiting the app after the information retrieve the script. The malicious code then exploits the flaws in the web application and the script and the attack is visible on the server side or to the app owner as well. The third variant is DOM based cross-site scripting attacks. This type of attack occurs when the DOM environment is being changed but the client side code does not change. When the DOM environment is being modified in the victim's browser, the client-side code executes differently. In order to get a better understanding of how XSS DOM attack is being performed, let us analyze the following example. If there is a website called texting.com, we know default is a parameter. Therefore, in order to perform XSS DOM attack, we should send a script as parameters. A DOM-based XSS attack may be successfully executed even when the server does not embed any malicious code into the web page by using a flaw in the JavaScript executed in the browser. For example, if the client-side JavaScript modifies the DOM tree of the web page, it can be based on an input field or the get parameter without validating the input. This allows the malicious code to be executed. The malicious code that exploits flaws in the browser on the user side and the script and the attack is not necessarily visible on the server side or to the app owner. By now, it is clear that cross-site scripting attacks are difficult to detect and even tougher to fight against. There are however plenty of ways one can safeguard against such attacks. Let's go through some of these preventive measures. Like mentioned earlier, XSS attacks are sometimes difficult to detect. However, this can be changed if you get some external help. A way to prevent XSS attacks is using automated testing tools like Crash Test Security Suit or Acunetic Security Suit. Still, manual testing is highly time consuming and costly and therefore not possible to be done for every iteration of your web application. Consequently, your code shouldn't be untested before any release. Using automated security, you can scan your web application for cross-site scripting and other critical vulnerabilities before every release. This way, 
you can ensure that your web application's live version is still secure whenever you alter or add a feature. Input fields are the most common point of entry for XSS attack script. Therefore, you should always screen and validate any information input into data fields. This is particularly important if the data will be included as HTML output. This can be used to protect against reflected XSS attacks. Validation should occur on both the client side and server side as an added precaution. This helps validating the data before it's being sent to the servers and can also protect against persistent XSS scripts. This can be accomplished using JavaScript. XSS attacks only appear if any user input is being displayed on the web page. Therefore, try to avoid displaying any untrusted user input if possible. If you need to display user data, restrict the places where the user input might appear. Any input displayed inside a JavaScript tag or a URL shown on the site is much more likely to be exploited than the input that appears inside a division or a span element inside the HTML body. Protecting against XSS vulnerabilities typically requires properly escaping user-provided data that is placed on the page. Rather than trying to determine if the data is user-provided and could be compromised, we should always play it safe and escape data whether it is user-provided or not. Unfortunately, because there are many different rules for escaping, you still must choose the proper type of escaping before settling on a final code. Encoding should be applied directly before user controllable data is written to a page because the context you are writing into determines what kind of encoding you need to use. For example, values inside a JavaScript string require a different type of escaping to those in an HTML context. Sometimes you'll need to apply multiple layers of encoding in the correct order. For example, to safely embed user input inside an event handler, you need to deal with both JavaScript context and the HTML context. So you need to first Unicode escape the input and then HTML encode it. Content Security Policy or CSP is a computer security standard introduced to prevent cross-site scripting clickjacking and other code injection attacks resulting from the execution of malicious content in the trusted web page context. It is a candidate recommendations of the W3C working group on web application security. It's widely supported by modern web browsers and provides a standard method for website owners to declare approved origins of content that browsers should be allowed to load on their website. HTTP only is an additional flag included in a set cookie HTTP response header. Using the HTTP only flag when generating a cookie helps mitigate the risk of client side script accessing the protected cookie, that is, if the browser supports it. If the HTTP only flag is included in the HTTP response header, the cookie cannot be accessed through a client side script. Again, this is if the browser supports this flag. As a result, even if a cross-site scripting flaw exists and a user accidentally accesses a link that exploits this flaw, the browser will not reveal the cookie to a third party. If a browser does not support HTTP only and a website attempts to set an HTTP only cookie, the HTTP only flag will be ignored browser browser, thus creating a traditional script accessible cookie. As a result, the cookie becomes vulnerable to theft of modification by any malicious script. Next on our docket is a live demonstration where we solve a set of cross-site scripting problems starting from the basic level to the topmost level 6. We are going to start at level 1. In this web application, it demonstrates the common cause of cross-site scripting where user input is directly included in the page without proper escaping. If we interact with the vulnerable application window here and find a way to make it execute JavaScript of our choosing. We can take actions inside the vulnerable window or directly edit its URL bar. This task needs only basic knowledge. Let's see why the most primitive injections work here right away. Let's do a simple query and inspect the resulting HTML page. I'm going to use this phrase with a single quote as a special character. We can now inspect the HTML page. We can see here in this line, the special character single quote appears in the result over here. 
the provided query text is placed directly in a B tag as in a body element. We need to perform a reflected XSS into the web application because they are non-persistent XSS attacks and the payload should be included in the URL to perform successful exploitation. We can use any payload but we are going to use the simple one to perform an alert in this web application. It's simple and can be shown easily. We're just going to write the script over here. And we're going to press search. As you can see, we have successfully launched our first cross-site scripting attack. We can see an alert box pop up with the necessary message and a similar process can be used to steal browser cookies and passwords, albeit with different commands. Now we have the option to move to level 2. In this web application, it shows that how easily XSS bugs can be introduced in complex chat applications. Chat app conversations are stored in a database and retrieved when a user wants to see the conversation. Therefore, if a malicious user injects some JavaScript code, all visitors will be infected. This kind of cross-site scripting attack is more powerful and it is more riskier than reflected cross-site scripting attacks and that's why it is known as stored XSS. I posted my query with a special character of a single quote and this is what I get. Whatever I typed in simply appeared on the page right after I click on share status. Let's see the source. You can see here, the text I posted seems directly put inside a block code tag. So even a simple script tag we used in level 1 should work here, but it will not. Let us examine the code to understand why. We're going to toggle the code away here and check the index.html file. Important part is line 32. The generated HTML fragment which is the HTML variable in the code is added to the mail HTML using the inner HTML method. So when the browser parsing this HTML fragment, it will not execute any script tag defined within that HTML fragment. HTML parser will not execute a script tag when it parses HTMLs via this method. This is why the script tag like we used in level 1 is not going to work here. Our solution is to use events. Events will execute the defined JavaScripts. We're going to use an image over here. And when we press on share status. In the above injection, we are loading an image that doesn't exist which causes to trigger an on error event. In on error event, the it will execute our alert method. With that, we are able to beat level 2 and we can now move up to the next level in our challenge. As you can see, clicking on any tab causes the tab number to be displayed in the URL fragment. This hints that the value after the hashtag controls the behavior of the page, that is it is an input variable. To confirm, let's analyze the code. As you can see in line 43, inside the event handling, the value provided after the hash in the URL is directly passed onto the true tab method. No input validation is being performed. The value passed to the choose tab method is directly injected into the img tag in line 17. This is an unsafe assignment and it is the vulnerable part of the code. 
Now all we have to do now is to craft a payload that would adjust the IMG tag to execute our JavaScript. Remember, the script tag from level 1 would not work here since the variable HTML is used to add the DOM dynamically. Hence the events are our aces here once again. I will choose to use the existing IMG tag and change the source to something that doesn't exist. Hence forcing it to fall in to execute an on error even which I will pass the URL. Once we visit that URL, we can see that our Java pop-up has opened up here with the same message of XSS level 3 has been completed. With this, we can now move on to level 4, which is going to present a different kind of attack. In this web application, there is a timer on the page. That means whatever numbers we put in the box, a countdown starts. And then when it finishes, the application alerts that the countdown is finished. And we can see the time is a pop up appearing over here and this resets the timer again. Now it is obvious that the value entered in the text box is transferred to the server over the timer parameter in the URL. Let us examine the code to see how the timer parameter is being handled. We're going to visit timer.html over here. And we're going to check over here. In line 21. The start timer method is being called in the onload event. However, the timer parameter is being directly passed to the start timer method. We need to perform a pop up alert in the web application which escapes the content of the function start timer without breaking the JavaScript code. The parameter value is directly added to the start timer method without any filtering. What we can try to do here is to inject an alert function to be executed inside the onload event along with the start timer method. We are going to remove this argument and put our script over here. Now when we press on create timer and we have a pop up with XSS level 4 complete. We can now move on to level 5. In this web application, this application XSS is different because this challenge description says cross-site scripting isn't just about correctly escaping data. Sometimes attackers can do bad things even without injecting new elements into the DOM. It's kind of open redirect because the attack payload is executed as a result of modifying the DOM environment in the victim's browser. This environment is used by the original client-side script so that the client-side code runs in an unexpected manner. The vulnerability can be easily detected if the next link in the signup page is inspected. The href attribute value of next link is confirmed, which is exactly the value of the next URL query parameter. As you can see over here, this means using the next query parameter can be used to inject a JavaScript code to the href attribute of the next link. The following is the best way to do it. As soon as the user clicks on the link, the script will be triggered. going to press anything random and now that we click next we can see the XSS level 5 that we had provided in the URL as a parameter to the next variable. 
Since the value of next provided appears in a pop-up, we can consider the attack as success and move on to the final level 6. In this web application, it shows some of the external JavaScript is retrieved. If you analyze the URL, you can see that the script is loaded already. The vulnerability lies within how the code handles the value after the hashtag. If you check on line 45, the value right after the hashtag is taken as the gadget name. And then in line 48, the value is directly passed on to the include gadget method. And in the include gadget method that we can see over here, you can see in line 18, a script tag is created and the URL gadget name parameter value is directly used as the source attribute of the script tag in line 28. This means we can completely control the source attribute of the script tag that is being created. That is, with this vulnerability, we can inject our own JavaScript file into the code. We can inject a URL of our own hosted JavaScript into the web application's URL after the hashtag and the URL should not be using HTTPS but anything like that to bypass the regular expression for security checking. Going to remove the pre-stored URL. And we're going to load our own JavaScript file. Finally, we have reached the end of our challenge. We completed six different varieties of cross scripting attacks and used different solutions for all of the six questions. With work from home being the norm in today's era, people spend considerable amount of time on the internet, often without specific measures to ensure a secure session. Apart from individuals, Organizations worldwide that host data and conduct business over the internet are always at the risk of a DDoS attack. These DDoS attacks are getting more extreme, with hackers getting easy access to botnet farms and compromised devices. As can be seen in the graph, three of the six strongest DDoS attacks were launched in 2021, with the most extreme attack occurring just last year in 2020. Lately, Cybercriminals have been actively seeking out new services and protocols for amplifying these DDoS attacks. Active involvement with hacked machines and botnets allow further penetration into the consumer space, allowing much more elaborate attack campaigns. Apart from general users, multinational corporations have also had their fair share of problems. GitHub, a platform for software developers, was the target of a DDoS attack in 2018. Widely suspected to be conducted by Chinese authorities, this attack went on for about 20 minutes after which the systems were brought into a stable condition. It was the strongest DDoS attack to date at the time and made a lot of companies reconsider the security practices to combat such attacks. Even after years of experimentation, DDoS attacks are still at large and can affect anyone in the consumer and corporate space. Hey everyone, this is Bebop from Simply Learn. And welcome to this video on what is a DDoS attack. Let's learn more about what is a DDoS attack. A distributed denial of service attack or DDoS is when an attacker or attackers attempt to make it impossible for a service to be delivered. This can be achieved by thwarting access to virtually anything, servers, devices, services, networks, applications, and even specific transactions within applications. In a DOS attack, it's one system that is sending the malicious data or requests. A DDoS attack comes from multiple systems. Generally, these attacks work by drowning a system with requests for data. This could be sending a web server so many requests to serve a page that it crashes under the demand, or it could be a database being hit with a high volume of queries. The result is available internet bandwidth, CPU, and RAM capacity become overwhelmed. The impact could range from a minor annoyance from disrupted services to experiencing entire websites, applications, or even entire businesses taking offline. More often than not, these attacks are launched using machines in a botnet. 
A botnet is a network of devices that can be triggered to send requests from a remote source, often known as the command and control center. The bots in the network attack a particular target, thereby hiding the original perpetrator of the DDoS campaign. But how do these devices come under a botnet? And what are the requests being made to the web servers? Let's learn more about these and how DDoS attack work. A DDoS attack is a two-phase process. In the first phase, a hacker creates a botnet of devices. Simply put, a vast network of computers are hacked via malware, ransomware or just simple social engineering. These devices become a part of the botnet which can be triggered anytime to start bombarding a system or a server on the instruction of the hacker that created the botnet. The devices in these networks are called bots or zombies. In the second phase, a particular target is selected for the attack. When the hacker finds the right time to attack, all the zombies in the botnet network send these requests to the target thereby taking up all the server's available bandwidth. These can be simple ping requests or complex attacks like SYN flooding and UDP flooding. The aim is to overwhelm them with more traffic than the server or the network can accommodate. The goal is to render the website or service inoperable. There is a lot of wiggle room when it comes to the type of DDoS attack a hacker can go with. Depending on the target's vulnerability, we can choose one of the three broad categories of DDoS attacks. Volume-based attacks use massive amounts of bogus traffic to overwhelm a resource. It can be a website or a server. They include ICMP, UDAP and spoofed packet flood attacks. The size of volume-based attack is measured in bits per second. These attacks focus on clogging all the available bandwidth for the server, thereby cutting the supply short. Several requests are sent to the server, all of which warrant a reply thereby not allowing the target to cater to the general legitimate users. Next, we have the protocol level attacks. These attacks are meant to consume essential resources of the target server. They exhaust the load balancers and firewalls which are meant to protect the system against the DDoS attacks. These protocol attacks include SYN floods and Smurf DDoS among others and the size is measured in packets per second. For example, in an SSL handshake, server replies to the hello message sent by the hacker, which will be the client in this case, but since the IP is spoofed and leads nowhere, the server gets stuck in an endless loop of sending the acknowledgement without any end in sight. Finally, we have the application level attacks. Application layer attacks are conducted by flooding applications with maliciously crafted requests. The size of application layer attacks is measured in requests per second. These are relatively sophisticated attacks that target the application and operating system level vulnerabilities. They prevent the specific applications from delivering necessary information to users and hog the network bandwidth up to the point of a system crash. Examples of such an attack are HTTP flooding and BGP hijacking. A single device can request data from a server using HTTP POST or GET without any issues. However, when the requisite botnet is instructed to bombard the server with thousands of requests, the database bandwidth gets jammed and it eventually becomes unresponsive and unusable. But what about the reasons for such an attack? There are multiple lines of thought as to why a hacker decides to launch a DDoS attack on unsuspecting targets. Let's take a look at a few of them. The first option is to gain a competitive advantage. Many DDoS attacks are conducted by hacking communities against rival groups. Some organizations hire such communities to stagger their rivals' resources at a network level to gain an advantage in the playing field. Since being a victim of a DDoS attack indicates a lack of security, the reputation of such a company takes a significant hit, allowing the rivals to cover up some ground. Secondly, some hackers launch these DDoS attacks to hold multinational corporations at ransom. The resources are jammed and the only way to clear the way is if the target company agrees to pay a designated amount of money to the hackers. Even a few minutes of inactivity is detrimental to a company's reputation in the global market and it can cause a spiral effect both in terms of market value and product security index. Most of the time, a compromise is reached and the resources are freed after a while. DDoS attacks have also found use in the political segment. Certain activists tend to use DDoS attacks to voice their opinion. 
Spreading the word online is much faster than any local rally or forum. Primarily political, these attacks also focus on online communities, ethical dilemmas, or even protests against corporations. Let's take a look at a few ways that companies and individuals can protect themselves against DDoS attacks. The company can employ load balancers and firewalls to help protect the data from such attacks. Load balancers reroute the traffic from one server to another in a DDoS attack. This reduces the single point of failure and adds resiliency to the server data. A firewall blocks unwanted traffic into a system and manages the number of requests made at a definite rate. It checks for multiple attacks from a single IP and occasional slowdowns to detect a DDoS attack in action. Early detection of a DDoS attack goes a long way in recovering the data lost in such an event. Once you've detected the attack, you will have to find a way to respond. For example, you will have to work on dropping the malicious DDoS traffic before it reaches your server so that it doesn't throttle and exhaust your bandwidth. Here's where you will filter the traffic so that only legitimate traffic reaches the server. By intelligent routing, you can break the remaining traffic into manageable chunks that can be handled by your cluster resources. The most important stage in DDoS mitigation is where you will look for patterns of DDoS attacks and use those to analyze and strengthen your mitigation techniques. For example, blocking an IP that's repeatedly found to be offending is a first step. Cloud providers like Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure who offer high levels of cybersecurity, including firewalls and threat monitoring software can help protect your assets and network from DDoS criminals. The cloud also has greater bandwidth than most private networks, so it is likely to fail if under the pressure of increased DDoS attacks. Additionally, reputable cloud providers offer network redundancy, duplicating copies of your data, systems and equipment, so that if your service becomes corrupted or unavailable due to a DDoS attack, you can switch to a secure access on backed up versions without missing a beat. One can also increase the amount of bandwidth available to a host server being targeted. Since DDoS attacks fundamentally operate on the principle of overwhelming systems with heavy traffic, simply provisioning extra bandwidth to handle unexpected traffic spikes can provide a measure of protection. This solution can prove expensive as a lot of that bandwidth is going to go unused most of the time. A content delivery network or a CDN distributes your content and boosts performance by minimizing the distance between your resources and end users. It stores the cached version of your content in multiple locations and this eventually mitigates DDoS attacks by avoiding a single point of failure when the attacker is trying to focus on a single target. Popular CDNs include Akamai CDN, Cloudflare, AWS CloudFront, etc. Let's start with our demo regarding the effects of DDoS attacks on a system. For our demo, we have a single device that will attack a target, making it a DOS attack of sorts. Once a botnet is ready, multiple devices can do the same and eventually emulate a DDoS attack. To do so, we will use the virtualization software called VMware with an instance of Parrot Security Operating System running. For a target machine, we will be running another VMware instance of a standard Linux distribution known as Linux Lite. In a target device, we can use Wireshark to determine when the attack begins and see the effects of the attack accordingly. This is Linux Lite, which is our target machine. And this is Parrot Security, which is used by the hacker when trying to launch a DDoS attack. This is just one of the distros that can be used. To launch the attack, we must first find the IP address of our target. So to find the IP address, we open the terminal. We use the command ifconfig. And here we can find the IP address. Now remember, we're launching this attack in VMware. Now the, both the instances of Parrot Security and Linux Lite are being run on my local network. So the address that you can see here is 192.168.72.129, which is a private address. This IP cannot be accessed from outside the network, basically anyone who is not connected to my Wi-Fi. When launching attacks with public servers or public addresses, it will have a public IP address that does not belong 
to the 192.168 subnet. Once we have the IP address, we can use a tool called HPing3. HPing3 is an open source packet generator and analyzer for the TCP IP protocol. To check what are the effects of an attack, we will be using Wireshark. Wireshark is a network traffic analyzer. We can see whatever traffic that is passing through the Linux Lite distro is being displayed over here with the IP address, the source IP and the destination IP as to where the request is being transferred to. Once we have the DOS attack launched, you can see the results coming over here from the source IP which will be Parrot Security. Now, to launch the HPing3 command, we need to give sudo access to the console which is the root access. Now, we have the root access for the console. The HPing3 command will have a few arguments to go with it which are as you can see on the screen minus s and a flood a hyphen v hyphen p80 and the IP address of the target which is 192.168.72.129 In this command we have a few arguments this, such as the minus s which specifies syn packets like in an SSL handshake we have the SYN request that the client sends to the server to initiate a connection. The hyphen flood aims to ignore the replies that the server will send back to the client in response to the SYN packets. Here the Parrot Security OS is the client and Linux Lite being the server. Minus V stands for verbosity as in where we will see some output when the requests are being sent. The hyphen P80 stands for port 80, which we can replace the port number if we want to attack a different port. And finally, we have the IP address of our target. As of right now, if we check Wireshark, it is relatively clear and there is no indication of a DDoS attack incoming. Now, once we launch the attack over here, we can see the uh, requests coming in from this IP, which is 192.168. 72.128 till now even if the network is responsive and so is Linux Lite. The requests keep on coming and we can see the HTTP flooding has started in flood mode. After a few seconds of this attack continuing the server will start shutting down. Now remember Linux Lite is a distro that can focus on and that serves as a backend. Now remember Linux Lite is a distro and such Linux distros are served as backend to many servers across the world. For example, a few seconds have passed from the attack. Now the system has become completely irresponsive. This has happened due to the huge number of requests that came from Parrot Security. You can see whatever I press, nothing is responded. Even the Wireshark has stopped capturing new requests because the CPU usage right now is completely 100% and at this point of time, anyone who is trying to request some information from this Linux distro or where this Linux distro is being used as a backend for a server or a database cannot access anything else. The system has completely stopped responding and any request, any legitimate request from legitimate users will be dropped. Once we stop the attack over here, it takes a bit of time to settle down. Now remember, it's still out of control, but eventually the traffic dies down and the system regains its strength. It is relatively easy to gauge right now the effect of a DOS attack. Now remember, this Linux Lite is just a VM instance. Actual website servers and web databases, they have much more bandwidth and are very secure and it is tough to break into. That is why we cannot use a single machine to break into them. That is where a DDoS attack comes into play. What we did right now is a DOS attack, as in a single system is being used to penetrate a sub target server using a single request. Now, 
when a DDoS attack, multiple systems such as multiple pirate security instances or multiple zombies or bots in a botnet network can attack a target server to completely shut down the machine and drop any legitimate request thereby rendering the service and the target completely unusable and inoperable. As a final note, we would like to remind that this is for educational purposes only and we do not endorse any attacks on any domains. Only test this on servers and networks that you have permission to test on. Cybersecurity has become one of the most rigid industries in the last decade while simultaneously being the most challenged. With every aspect of corporate culture going online and embracing cloud computing, there is a plethora of critical data circulating through the internet all worth billions of dollars to the right person. Increasing benefits require more complex attacks and one of these attacks is a brute force attack. A brute force or known as brute force cracking is the cyber attack equivalent of trying every key on your key ring and eventually finding the right one. Brute force attacks are simple and reliable. There is no prior knowledge needed about the victim to start an attack. Most of the systems falling prey to brute force attacks are actually well secured. Attackers let a computer do the work, that is trying different combinations of usernames and passwords until they find the one that works. Due to this repeated trial and error format, the strength of password matters a great deal. Although with enough time and resources, brute force will break a system since they run multiple combinations until they find the right passcode. Hey everyone, this is Bhavab from Simply Learn, and welcome to this video on what is a brute force attack. Let's begin with learning about brute force attacks in detail. A brute force attack, also known as an exhaustive search, is a cryptographic hack that relies on guessing possible combinations of targeted password until the current password is discovered. It can be used to break into online accounts, encrypted documents, or even network peripheral devices. The longer the password, the more combinations that will need to be tested. A brute force attack can be time consuming and difficult to perform if methods such as data obfuscation are used and at times downright impossible. However, if the password is weak, it could merely take seconds with hardly any effort. Dictionary attacks are an alternative to brute force attacks where the attacker already has a list of usernames and passwords that need to be tested against the target. It doesn't need to create any other combinations on its own. Dictionary attacks are much more reliable than brute force in a real-world context, but the usefulness depends entirely on the strength of passwords being used by the general population. There is a three-step process when it comes to brute forcing a system. Let's learn about each of them in detail. In step one, we have to settle on a tool that we are going to use for brute forcing. There are some popular names on the market like Hashcat, Hydra, and John the Ripper. While each of them has its own strengths and weaknesses, each of them perform well with the right configuration. All of these tools come pre-installed with certain Linux distributions that cater to penetration testers and cybersecurity analysts like Kali Linux and Parrot Security. After deciding what tool to use, we can start generating combinations of alphanumeric variables whose only limitation is the number of characters. For example, while using Hydra, a single six-digit password will create 900,000 passwords with only digits involved. Add alphabets and symbols to that sample space and that number grows exponentially. The popular tools allow customizing this process. Let's say the hacker is aware of the password being a specific eight-digit word containing only letters and symbols. This will substantially increase the chances of being able to guess the right password since we remove the time taken to generate the longer ones. We omit the need for including digits in such combinations. These small tweaks go a long way in organizing an efficient brute force attack since running all the combinations with no filters will dramatically reduce the odds of finding the right credentials in time. In the final step, we run these combinations against the file or service that is being broken. We can try and break into a specific encrypted document, a social media account, or even devices at home that connect to the internet Let's say there is a Wi-Fi router. The generated passwords are then fed into the connection one after the other. It is a long and arduous process, but the work is left to the computer rather than someone manually clicking and checking each of these passcodes. Any password that doesn't unlock the router is discarded and the brute force tool simply moves on to the next one. 
This keeps going on until we find the right combination which unlocks the router. Sometimes reaching the success stage takes days and weeks, which makes it cumbersome for people with low computing power at their disposal. However, the ability to crack any system in the world purely due to bad password habits is very appealing and the general public tends to stick with simple and easy to use passwords. Now that we have a fair idea about how brute force works, let's see if we can answer this question. We learned about how complex passwords are tougher to crack by brute force. Among the ones listed on the screens, which one do you believe will take the longest to be broken when using brute force tools? Leave your answers in the comment section and we will get back to you with the correct option next week. Let's move on to the harmful effects of getting a system compromised due to brute force attacks. A hacked laptop or mobile can have social media accounts logged in, giving the hackers free access to the victim's connections. It has been reported on multiple occasions where compromised Facebook accounts are sending malicious links and attachments to people on their friends list. One of the significant reasons for hacking, malware infusion is best done when spread from multiple devices, similar to distributing spam. This reduces the chance of circling back the source to a single device which belongs to the hacker. Once brute forced, a system can spread malware via email attachments, sharing links, file upload via FTP, etc. Personal information such as credit card data, usage habits, private images and videos are all stored in our systems, be it in plain format or root folders. A compromised laptop means easy access to these information that can be further used to impersonate the victim regarding bank verification, among other things. Once a system is hacked, it can also be used as a mail server that distributes spam across lists of victims. Since the hacked machines all have different IP addresses and MAC addresses, it becomes challenging to trace the spam back to the original hacker. With so many harmful implications arising from a boot force attack, it's imperative that the general public must be protected against such. Let's learn about some of the ways we can prevent ourselves from becoming a victim of brute force attacks. Using passwords consisting of alphabets, letters and numbers have a much higher chance of withstanding brute force attacks thanks to the sheer number of combinations they can produce. The longer the password, the less likely it is that a hacker will devote the time and resources to brute force them. Having alphanumeric passwords also allows the user to keep different passwords for different websites. This is to ensure that if a single account or a password is compromised due to a breach or a hack, the rest of the accounts are isolated from the incident. Two-factor authentication involves receiving a one-time password on a trusted device before a new login is allowed. This OTB can be obtained either via email, SMS or specific 2FA applications like Authy and Aegis. Email and SMS based OTPs are considered relatively less secure nowadays due to the ease with which SIM cards can be duplicated and mailboxes can be hacked. Applications that are specifically made for 2FA cores are much more reliable and secure. CAPTCHAs are used to stop bots from running through web pages precisely to prevent brute forcing through their website. Since brute force tools are automated, forcing the hacker to solve CAPTCHA for every iteration of a password manually is very challenging. The CAPTCHA system can filter out these automated bots that keep refreshing the page with different credentials, thereby reducing the chances of brute force considerably. A definite rule that locks the account being hacked for 30 minutes after a specific number of attempts is a good way to prevent brute force attempts. Many websites lock account for 30 minutes after 3 failed password attempts to secure the account against any such attack. On an additional note, some websites also send an email instructing the user that there have been 3 insecure attempts to log into the website. Let's look at a demonstration of how brute force attacks work in a real world situation. The world has gone wireless. With Wi-Fi taking the reins in every household, it's natural that the security will always be up for debate. To further test the security index and understand brute force attacks, we will attempt to break into the password of a Wi-Fi router. For that to happen, we first need to capture a handshake file, which is a connection file from the Wi-Fi router to a connecting device like a mobile or a laptop. The operating system used for this process is Parrot Security, 
a Linux distribution that is catered to penetration testers. All the tools being used in this demo can easily be found pre-installed in this operating system. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. To start our demo, we're going to use a tool called Airgeddon, which is made to hack into wireless networks specifically. At this point, it's going to check for all the necessary scripts that are installed in the system. To crack into a Wi-Fi and to capture the handshake file, we're going to need an external network card. The significance of the external network card is a managed mode and a monitor mode. For now, the WLX1 named card is my external network adapter which I'm going to select. To be able to capture data over the air, we're going to need to put it in monitor mode. As you can see above, it's written it is in managed mode right now. So we're going to select option 2 which is to put the interface in monitor mode. And its name is now WLAN0 monitor. The monitor mode is necessary to capture data over the air. That is the necessary reason why we need an external card since a lot of inbuilt cards that come with the laptops and the systems, they cannot have a monitor mode installed. Once we select the mode, we can go into the fifth which is the handshake tools menu. In the first step, we have to explore for targets and it is written that monitor mode is necessary to select a target. So let's explore for targets and press enter. We have to let this run for about 60 seconds to get a fair idea about the networks that are currently working in this locality. For example, this ESS ID is supposed to be the Wi-Fi name that we see when connecting to a network. Geo24, Recover Me, these are all the names that we see on our mobile when trying to search for the Wi-Fi. This BSS ID is supposed to be an identifier, somewhat like a MAC address that identifies this network from other devices. The channels features on one or two, uh, there are some many channels that the networks can focus on. This here is supposed to be a client that is connected to one such network. For example, the station that you can see 5626, this is supposed to be the MAC address of the device that is connected to a router. This basis ID is supposed to be which Wi-Fi it is connected to. For example, 5895D8 is this one, which is the Geo24 router. So we already know which router has a device connected to it and we can use our attack to capture this handshake. Now that we, it has already run for one minute, now that we press Ctrl C, we will be asked to select a target. See, it has already selected the number 5 which is the Geo24 router as the one with clients. So it is easy to run an attack on and it is easy to capture a handshake for. We select network 5 and we run a capture handshake. It says we have a valid WPA WPA2 network target selected and that the script can continue. Now, to capture the handshake, we have a couple of attacks, a DAuth or a DAuth air replay attack. What this attack does is kick the clients out of the network. In return, when they try to reconnect to the Wi-Fi, as they are configured that way, that when a client is disconnected, it tries to reconnect it immediately. It tries to capture a handshake file, which in turn contains the security key, which is necessary to initiate the handshake. For our demo, let's go with the second option, that is the DAuth air replay attack. Select a timeout value, let's say we give it 60 seconds. And we start the script. We can see it capturing data from the Geo24 network and here we go. We have the WPA handshake file. Once the handshake file is captured, we can actually close this and here we go. Congratulations. In order to capturing a handshake, it has verified that a PMK ID from the target network has successfully been captured. This is the file that is already stored, the dot cap file. For the path, we can, let's say we can keep it in a desktop. Okay, we give the path and the handshake file is generated. We can already see 
a target over here, same Geo24 router with the BSS ID. Now if we return to its main menu, we already have the handshake file captured with us. Now our job is to brute force into that handshake capture file. The capture file is often encrypted with the security key of the Wi-Fi network. If we know how to decrypt it, we will automatically get the security key. So let's go to the offline WPA WPA2 decrypt menu. Since we'll be cracking personal networks, we can go with option 1. Now to run the brute force tool, we have two options. Either we can go with the air crack or we can go with the hash cat. Let's go with air crack plus crunch, which is a brute force attack against a handshake file. We can go with option 2. It can already detect the capture file that we have generated. So we select yes. The BSS ID is the one which denotes the Geo24 router. So we're going to select yes as well. The minimum length of the key, for example, it has already checked that the minimum length of a Wi-Fi security key, which is a WPA to PSK key, will always be more than 8 digits and below 64 digits. So we have to select something in between this range. So if we already know, let's say that the password is at least 10 digits, we can go with the minimum length as 10. And as a rough guess, let's say we put the maximum length as 20. The character set that we're going to use for checking the password will affect the time taken to brute force. For example, if we already know that or we have seen a user use the password while connecting to the router as something that has only numbers and symbols, then we can choose accordingly. Let's say if we go with only uppercase characters and numeric characters, go with option 7 and it's going to start decrypting. So how aircrack is working right here, you can see this passphrase over here. The first 5 or 6 digits are A. It starts working its way from the end, from the last character. It keeps trying every single combination. You can see the last, the fourth character from the right side, the D. It will eventually turn to E because it keeps checking up every single character from the end. This will keep going on until all the single characters are tested and every single combination is tried out. Since the handshake file is encrypted using the security key that is the WPA2 key of the router, whichever passphrase is able to decrypt the handshake key completely will be the key of the Wi-Fi router. This is the way we can brute force into Wi-Fi routers anywhere in the world. Cyber attacks are frequently making headlines in today's digital environment. At any time, everyone who uses a computer could become a victim of a cyber attack. There are various sorts of cyber attacks ranging from phishing to password attacks. In this video, we'll look into one such attack that is known as botnet. But before we begin, if you love watching tech videos, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon never to miss an update. To begin with, let's take a look at some of the famous botnet attacks. The first one is Mirai Botnet, which is a malicious program designed to attack vulnerable IoT devices and infect them to form a network of bots. That on command perform basic and medium level denial of service attacks. Then we have the Zeus Bot, specifically designed for attacking the system for bank related information and data. Now let's see what exactly a botnet is. Botnet refers to a network of hijacked interconnected devices that are installed with malicious codes known as malware. Each of these infected devices are known as bots and a hijacked criminal known as bot hoarder remotely controls them. The bots are used to automate large scale attacks including data theft, server failure, malware propagation and denial of service attacks. Now that we know what exactly a botnet is, Let's dive deeper into learning how a botnet works. During the preparation of a botnet network, the first step involves preparing the botnet army. After that, the connection between the botnet army and the control server is established. And the end, the launching of the attack is done by the bot herder. Let's understand through an illustration. Firstly, we have a bot herder that initiates the attack. According to the control server commands, the devices that are infected with the malware programs 
and begins to attack the infected system. Let's see some details regarding the preparation of the botnet army. The first step is known as the prepping the botnet army. The first step is creating a botnet is to infect as many as connected devices as possible. This ensures that there are enough bots to carry out the attack. This way, it creates bots either by exploiting the security gaps in the software or websites or using phishing attacks. They are often deployed through Trojan horses. For the next step we have establishing the connection. Once it hacks the device, as per previous step, it infects it with the specific malware that connects the device back to the control bot server. A bot herder uses command programming to drive the bot's actions. And the last step is known as launching the attack. Once infected, a bot allows access to admin level operation like gathering and stealing of data, reading and rewriting the system data, monitoring user activities, performing denial of service attacks, including other cyber crimes. Now let's take a look at the botnet architecture. The first type is known as client server model. The client server model is a traditional model that operates with the help of a command and control center server and communication protocols like IRC. When the bot order issues a command to the server, it is then relayed to the client to perform malicious actions. Then we have peer to peer model. Peer controlling the infected bots involves a peer to peer network that relies on a decentralized approach. That is, the bots are topological interconnected and acts as both CNC servers, that is, the server and the client. Today, hackers adopt this approach to avoid detection and single point failure. In the end, we will see some points on some countermeasure against botnet attacks. The first step is to have updated drivers and system updates. After that, we should avoid clicking random pop-ups or links that we often see on the internet. And lastly, having certified antivirus, anti-spyware softwares and firewall installed into a system will protect against malware attack. The internet is an endless source of information and data. Still, in some cases, we come across some occurrences like cyber attacks, hacking, poor entry, which may affect our time on the web. Hi everyone and welcome to the Simply Learn channel. Today we will discuss a topic that secretly records our input data that is known as keyloggers. But before we begin, if you like watching tech videos, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update. To understand the keylogging problem better, let's take a look at an example. This is June. She works in a business firm where she manages the company's data regularly. This is Jacob from the information department who is here to inform her about some of the security protocols. During the briefing, she informed him about some of the problems her system was facing with, which included slow reaction speed and unusual internet activity. As Jacob heard about the problems with the system, he thinks of the possibility what could be the reason behind these problems her system was facing with. The conclusion that he came across was the key logging issue. Unknown to the problem her system was facing with, she asked him about some of the details regarding it. For today's topic, we learn what exactly keyloggers are and how they affect our system, what are the harmful effects that keylogging can bring into the system. To begin with, we learn what exactly the keylogging program is. As the name suggests, Keylogger is a malicious program or a tool that is designed to record keystrokes that are typed during data input and record them into a log file. Then the same program secretly sends these log files to its origin, where they can be used for malicious acts by the hacker. Now that we know what the keylogging program is, let's take a look how they enter into the system. Searching for a suitable driver for a system can often lead to the installation of the keylogging program into the system if we often visit suspicious sites and uncertified software are installed into our system. Then, if we use unknown links or visiting unknown websites which come through unknown addresses can also be a reason behind the keylogging issue entering into the system. And lastly, there are often cases where 
different pop-ups that we often see on social sites or different media sites can lead to the installation of key logging program into our system. Now that we know how the problem gets into the system, let's take a look how to identify whether the system is infected by the key logging issue. The key logging issue can be identified if there are often cases when a keyboard lags behind the system. The data that we enter sometimes is stuck in between when we type through the input. Then there are cases when the system freeze occurs unknowingly to what exactly could be the reason behind them and also there are delayed reaction time for different applications that run on the system. And lastly, there are different cases when we often see suspicious internet activity on the system that we don't know about. This could lead to the identification of a problem into the system. Now, we'll take a look at different types of key loggers that are present on the net which can harm our system differently. The first problem that key loggers arouse is API based. The most common key logging case, which uses APIs to keep a log of the type data and share it to its origin for malicious purposes. Each time we press a key, the key logger intercepts the signal and logs it. Then we have form grabbing based key loggers, as the name suggests. They are a based key loggers that store the form data. That is, if we often use web forms or different kinds of forms to enter different data, they can be recorded into the system by the program and send it to its origin. Then we have kernel based key loggers. These key loggers are installed deeply into the operating system where they can hide from different antivirus if not checked properly and they record the data that we type on the keyboard and send it to its origin. And lastly, we have hardware key loggers. These key loggers are present directly into the hardware. That is, they are embedded into system where they record the data that we type on the keyboard. Now, let's take a look how hackers differentiate different type of recorded data and exploit them. When hackers receive information about the target, they might use it to blackmail the target, which may affect the personal life of the target and also blackmail them for different money related issues. Then, in case of company data that is recorded by the key logging program can also affect the economic value of the company in the market, which may lead to the downfall of the company. Also, in some cases, the key logging program can also log data about military secrets, which may include nuclear codes or security protocols which are necessary to maintain the security of a country. Now let's take a look whether mobile devices get infected with the key logging issue or not. In the case of hand devices, infection of key loggers are low in comparison to the computer systems as they use on screen keyboard or virtual keyboard. But in some cases, we often see different kinds of malicious programs getting installed into the hand device if we often visit different uncertified websites or illegal websites or torrent sites and also the device that is infected with the key logging issue or different kind of malicious program can often lead to the exploitation of data that includes photos emails or important files by the hacker or the cyber criminal that install the particular malicious program into the system now to prevent a system from getting infected by the key logging program, let's take a look at different points. The first point includes using of different antivirus softwares or tools which can prevent the entering of malicious program into the system. Then keeping system security protocols regularly updated is also a good habit. And lastly, using virtual keyboard to input our sensitive data which may include bank details, login details or different passwords related to different websites. Now that we have some understanding about the topic of key loggers, let's take a look at the demo to further increase the knowledge about the topic. For the first step, we have to download some of the important libraries that are required into the system. 
which is this library. Now we'll run it. The system says the library is already installed into the system. Now let's take a look what exactly modules are required from the particular library. From this library, we'll import the keyboard module, which will help us to record the data that we type on the keyboard. Now, from the same, we'll also import key module and the listener module. And also the logging module which will help us to record the data into a log file. For the next part, we'll write a piece of code that will allow us to save the data that is recorded by the program into a text file that will be named as key underscore log text file along with the date and time stamp. Let's take a look. Now, we'll provide it with the file name that will be given as keylog.txt file. And also, so the part where the format of the data is recorded. Put the brackets over here to contain the file name. Now, we'll write the format in which the data will be recorded into the log file which will be given as the format would be the message and the timestamp which would be given as along with the timestamp given as percentage and ending it with the bracket. Now for the next step we will design two of the functions that will be used into the program that will be termed as while press function and while release function. Let's take a look. While press function would be a function that will come into play when the keyboard key has been pressed is pressed and this would go for the format that we designed in the above line and logging the pressed key info a string file to be recorded into the log file now now we'll design a function that is while release that will come into play when the escape key has been pressed that is the program will terminate itself and the program will stop from running and in the end we require for the functioning of the program to loop these functions that is while press and while release to continue its cycle. That will be going for while press and on release will contain while release 
function. As listener. And now this part would join the different threads and store them into the log file. Now that we have completed the code for the program, let's run it. We have to wait for a moment so the program runs it. Now, to verify the program, let's open Notepad. And on the Notepad, we'll write Hello World, which will be the basic whether the program is working or not. Let's take a look. And we'll go for the main page on Jupyter Notebook and refresh the page. Go to the bottom. Over here, we see the key log text. That is a text file that we created. Let's open it. And over here, we have the data that is created. As we started with, note, then this is a hello world part that we created just now, which shows that the program we created is working properly. Now that we have reached the end of the module, let's take a look at the summary. Firstly, we learn what exactly key loggers are. Then we understood what different modes are present how the system get infected with the key logging problem. Then we learn how to detect the problem into our system. Then we learn what different types of key loggers are present on the net. We also understood how hackers use the recorded data from the program. And we also learn whether mobile devices get infected with the key logging problem or not. And lastly, we understood what different points can be taken to prevent the entering of the key logging problem into the system. And before we begin, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity or to become an ethical hacker by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch career with cybersecurity or ethical hacker by learning from the experts, then try giving a shot to simply learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Computing. The course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Before we learn about the Pegasus platform, let us understand what spyware is and its working. Spyware is a category of malware that can gather information regarding a user or a device straight from the host machine. It is mostly spread by malicious links via email or chat applications. When a link with the malware is received, clicking on this link will activate the spyware, which allows the hacker to spy on all our user information. With some spyware systems, even clicking on the link isn't necessary to trigger the malicious payload. This can ultimately cause security complications and further loss of privacy. One such spyware system that is making the rounds in the tech industry today is Pegasus. The Pegasus is a spyware system developed by an Israeli company known as the NSO Group. It runs on mainly mobile devices, spanning across the major operating systems like the Apple's iOS on iPhone and the standard Android versions. This is not a newly developed platform since Pegasus has existed since as early as 2016. A highly intricate spyware program that can track user location, read text messages, scan through mobile files, access device camera and microphone to record voice and video. Pegasus has all the tools necessary to enforce surveillance for any client that wishes to buy its services. Initially, the NSO group had designed the software to be used against terrorist factions of the world. With more and more encrypted communication channels coming to the forefront, Pegasus was designed to maintain control over the data transmission that can be a threat to national security. Unfortunately, the people who bought the software had complete control over who, how and up to what level they can put surveillance limits on. Eventually, the primary clients became sovereign nations. Spying on public information that is supposed to stay private became really easy with this service. Multiple devices can be affected with the same spyware system to create a network information. This network keeps feeding data to the host. To understand how a network can be created, let's know how a mobile device can be affected by Pegasus. We all communicate with friends and family over instant messaging applications and email in some instances. If you check your inbox on a regular basis, 
you must have noticed that we receive some spam emails that the mail providers like Gmail and Yahoo can just filter into the spam folder. Some of these messages bypass this filter and make their way into a person's inbox. They look like generic emails which are supposed to be safe. The Pegasus spyware targets such occurrences bypassing malicious messages and links which install the necessary spy software on the user's mobile device, be it Android or an iPhone. This isn't unique to the email ecosystem since it's equally likely to be targeted by SMS texts, WhatsApp, Instagram or even the most secure messaging apps like Signal and Threema. Once the malicious links are clicked, a spyware package is downloaded and installed on the device. After the spyware is successfully installed, the perpetrator who sent the payload to the victim can monitor everything the user does. Pegasus can collect private emails, passwords, images, videos and every other piece of information that passes through the device network. All this data is transmitted back to the central server where the primary spying organization can monitor the activities at a granular level. This is not even surface level since complex spyware software like Pegasus can access the root files on our mobiles. These root files hold information that is crucial to the working of the Android and iOS operating systems. Leaking such private information is a massive blow to the security and the privacy of an individual. The information that may seem trivial, like the name of your Wi-Fi connection or the last time you ordered an item from Amazon, are indeed all valuable information. This exploitation is primarily possible due to the zero-day vulnerabilities known as bugs in the software development process. The zero-day bugs are the ones that have just been discovered by some independent security company or a researcher. Once they are found, reporting these vulnerabilities to the developer of the platform, which would be either Google for Android or Apple for iOS, is the right thing to do. However, many such critical bugs make their way onto the dark web where hackers can use them to create exploits. These exploits are then sent to innocent users with a link or a message like we had discussed before. Pegasus was able to affect the latest devices with the, all the security patches installed, but some bugs are not reported to the developers or just cannot be fixed without breaking some core functionality. These become the gateway for spyware to enter into the system. You can never be 100% safe, but you sure can give it all in protecting yourself. The one thing where Pegasus stands out is its zero-click action feature. Usually in spam emails, the malicious code is activated when the user clicks the malware link. A user doesn't need to click the link in the new version of the Pegasus and a few other spyware programs. Once the message arrives in the inbox of WhatsApp, Gmail or any other chat applications, the spyware gets activated and everything can be recorded and sent back to the central server. The primary issue with being affected by spyware as a victim is detection. Unlike crypto miners and trojans, spying services usually do not demand many system resources which makes them tough to detect after they have been activated. Since many devices slow down after a couple of years, any kind of performance hit due to such spyware is often attributed to poor software longevity by the users. They do not check meticulously for any other causes that is causing the slowdown. When left unchecked, these devices can capture voice and video from the mobile sensors while keeping the owner in the dark. Let's take a moment to check if you are well aware of the causes of such attacks. How do users fall prey to such spyware programs? A. By installing untested software B. By clicking on the third-party links from email and messages C. By not keeping their apps and phones updated or D. All of the above Let us know your answers in the comment section below and we will reveal the correct answer next week. But what about the unaffected devices, the vulnerable ones? While we cannot be certain of our security, there are a few things we can do to boost our device be it against Pegasus or the next big spyware on the market. Let's say we are safe now and we have the time to take the necessary steps to prevent a spyware attack. What are the things we can go for? A primary goal must always be to keep our apps and the operating system updated with the latest security patches. The vulnerabilities that the exploits target are often discovered by developers from Google and Apple which send the security patches quickly. This can be done for individual apps as well so keeping them updated is of utmost importance. While the most secure devices have fallen prey to Pegasus as well, a security patch from developers may help in minimizing the damage at a later stage or maybe negate the entire spyware platform altogether. Another big factor is the spread of malware 
is the trend of sideloading Android applications using .apk files. Downloading such apps from a third-party website have no security checks involved and are mostly responsible for adware and spyware invasions on user devices. Avoiding the sideloading of apps would be a major step in protecting yourself. We often receive spam emails or texts from people we may not know on social medias. They are accompanied with links that allow malware to creep into our device. We should try to follow the trusted websites and not click on any links that redirect us to unknown domains. Spyware is a controversial segment in governance. While the ramifications are pretty extreme in theory, it severely impacts user privacy against authoritarian regimes. Sufficient resources and a contingent plan can alter the false veil of democracy altogether. Even if our daily life is rather simplistic, we must understand that privacy is not about what we have to hide. Instead, it portrays the things we have to protect. It stands for everything we have to share with the outside world, both rhetorically and literally. Hey everyone, today we look at the hack which took the world by storm and affected multiple governments and corporations, the SolarWinds attack. The global statistics indicate that upward of 18,000 customers have been affected, potentially needing billions to recover the losses incurred. Before we have a look at this hack, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to never miss an update from SimpliLearn. The date is December 8, 2020. FireEye, a global leader in companies specializing in cybersecurity, released a blog post that caught the attention of the entire IT community. A software known as Orion, which was developed by SolarWinds Incorporated, had become a victim of a remote access trojan or a RAT. The breach was estimated to be running since the spring of 2020 and went virtually unnoticed for months. The reveal sent the developers of the Orion software into a frenzy as they quickly released a couple of hotfixes for their platform in order to mitigate this threat and prevent further damage. But how did this come into existence? We first need to understand the platform which was responsible for this breach. SolarWinds, a software company based in Texas, United States, had developed a management platform known as Orion. Catering to corporations and governments worldwide, Orion was responsible for the monitoring and management of IT administration. This included managing the client servers, virtualization components, and even the organization's network infrastructure that bought the platform. SolarWinds claims they have more than 300,000 clients, including US government agencies and several Fortune 500 companies. This entire chain can be classified as a supply chain attack. In this variant of cybercrime, the hackers target relatively weaker links in an organization's chain of control and delivery. These are preferably services rendered by a third party since there is no direct jurisdiction over it. In this case, the Orion platform was the primary target. The culprit, however, was software updates. The update server for SolarWinds Orion had a malicious version attached with malware, or a Trojan to be precise. This was made possible since the code repository that handled the software updates was breached. Once the update server repository was compromised, the source code of the applications became open to modification and malicious code found its way onto the software. The remote access trojan was attached to a potential update nicknamed the Sunburst update. This update gave hackers backdoor access to any client that uses the correct version. On its release, many clients believed the update to be legitimate since it came from the right source and they had no reason to believe otherwise. American government agencies were supposedly hit the hardest as the list of victims included the US Departments of Homeland Security, Treasury and Health. Several private companies like Cisco, Nvidia and Intel were compromised, according to a list published by the cybersecurity firm TrueSec. Most of the companies had issues quick updates to fix these vulnerabilities introduced by the software. While the actual perpetrators have never been found, it is believed that this was an act of cross-border corporate espionage conducted by state-sponsored hackers either from Russia or China. Before we move forward, let's take a recap of the things we learned. What category of malware was responsible for the SolarWinds hack? Was it one, a virus, a remote access trojan, a spyware or a worm? Let us know your answers in the comment section right away and we will reveal the correct answer in a week. Coming to possible reparations, the Biden government has launched a full investigation on the effects and the repercussions of this breach. There are a couple of things that we as consumers must always tend to when working our way through the World Wide Web. Using a password manager is highly recommended which can generate secure alphanumeric passwords. You must also use different passwords for different accounts, thereby reducing the chances of a single point of failure should one of those accounts get breached. 
Usage of two-factor authentication applications is also encouraged since it acts as a safety net if hackers directly get a hold of our credentials. Clicking on unknown links transmitted via emails is also a strict no, as is installing applications from unverified sources. The SolarWinds hack is estimated to cost the parent company nearly $18 million as reparations, making it one, if not the biggest hacks in cyberspace history. As recently as of July 2021, the hackers accessed some US attorneys' Microsoft 365 email accounts as part of the attack. Criminal organizations like the FBI and CIA are determined to figure out the culprits responsible for this debacle. However, the intricacy and the full extent of the breach makes it a way more complicated job than it looks on paper. The day is 26th February, 2022. The world is hit with breaking news that Russian state TV channels have been hacked by Anonymous, a hacktivist collective and movement who have made a name taking part in multiple cyber wars in the past decade. This was in response to the Russian aggression on Ukrainian territory in the hopes of annexation. Anonymous hacked the Russian state TV networks to combat propaganda in Russia and highlight the damage to life meted out by the Kremlin in Ukraine. They also hacked 120,000 Russian troops' personal information and the Russian central bank, stealing 35,000 files. This served as a clear indicator of how cyber war can change the momentum in battle something which people had never seen so closely. So what is cyber war? A digital assault or series of strikes or hacks against a country is sometimes referred to as a cyber war. It has the ability to cause havoc on government and civilian infrastructure, as well as disrupt essential systems, causing state harm and even death. In this day and age, the internet plays a bigger role than just watching videos and learning content. It's where you have your personal data and carry financial transactions. So rather than resorting to physical violence, cyber wars become the new means to cause havoc, considering the vulnerability of the data passing through the internet. In most circumstances, cyber warfare involves a nation state attacking another. In certain cases, the assaults are carried out by terrorist organizations or non-state actors pursuing a hostile nation's aim. In June, 2021, Chinese hackers targeted organizations like Verizon to secure remote access to their networks. Stuxnet was a computer worm designed to attack Iran's nuclear facilities, but evolved and expanded to many other industrial and energy producing sites in 2010. Since the definition of cyber war is so vague, applying rules and sanctions based on digital assault is even tougher, making the field of cyber warfare a lawless land, not bound by any rules or policies. There are multiple ways in which these attacks can be carried out. A major category of cyber attack is espionage. Espionage entails monitoring other countries to steal critical secrets. This might include compromising vulnerable computer systems with botnets or spear phishing attempts before extracting sensitive data in cyber warfare. The next weapon in cyber war is sabotage. Government agencies must identify sensitive data and its dangers if it is exploited. Insider threats, such as disgruntled or irresponsible personnel or government staff with ties to the attacking country, can be used by hostile countries or terrorists to steal or destroy information. By overwhelming a website with bogus requests and forcing it to handle them, denial of service attacks prohibit real users from accessing it. Attacking parties may use this form of assault to disrupt key operations and systems and prevent citizens, military, and security officials and research organizations from accessing sensitive websites. But what benefits does cyber war offer in contrast to traditional physical warfare? The most important advantage is the ability to conduct attacks from anywhere globally without having to travel thousands of miles. As long as the attacker and target are connected to the internet, organizing and launching cyber wars is relatively less tedious than physical warfare. People living in or battling for a country are subjected to propaganda attacks in an attempt to manipulate their emotions and thoughts. Digital infrastructure is highly crucial in today's modern world. Starting from communication channels to secure storage servers, rippling a country's footprint and control on the internet is very damaging. But what are some of the ways we as citizens protect ourselves in the case of a cyber war? In the unfortunate event that your country is involved in warfare, be sure to fact check every piece of information and follow only trusted sources in that frame of time. Even conversations online should be limited to a need to know basis, considering propaganda campaigns have the power to influence the tide of war drastically. 
It is highly crucial to follow basic security guidelines to secure our devices, like regularly updating our operating systems, occasionally running full system antivirus scans, etc. If your country or organization is being attacked, having devices segregated in a network goes a long way in bolstering security. Try to avoid sharing a lot of personal data online. In this era of Instagram and Facebook, divulging private information can be detrimental to keeping a secure firewall for your data. The more information an attacker has access to, the higher his chances of being able to devise a plan to infiltrate defenses. And if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity, that is by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch careers with cybersecurity by learning from the experts, then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from the MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. And the course link is mentioned in the description box that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. During data transmission, there are various external factors which can affect the transmission of data over a network channel. To prevent such cases from happening, we use Internet Protocol Security, which we'll be discussing in the session on IPsec Explain. Hi guys, and welcome to yet another interesting video by Simply Learn. But before we begin, if you love watching tech videos, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from us. Now, without further ado, let's take a look at the agenda for this session. To begin with, we will look into what is IPsec. Continuing with why do we use IPsec in a network? Followed by components of IPsec, modes of IP security. As for the last topic, we will look into working steps involved in IP security. Let's begin with the first heading that is, what is IPsec? IPsec, Internet Protocol Security, is defined as a set of framework and protocol to ensure data transmission over a network channel. This protocol was initially defined of two main protocols for data security over a network channel, which were authentication header, which is responsible for data integrity and anti-replay services. And the second protocol is encapsulating security payload, in short ESP, which includes data encryption and data authentication. Now let's move on to the next setting that is, why do we use IPsec in a network? IPsec is used to secure sensitive data and information such as company data, clinical data, bank data, and various sensitive information regarding an institution, which are used during data transmission over a network channel. The use of VPNs that are virtual private networks and apply IPsec protocols to encrypt the data for end-to-end -end transmission. Let's continue with why do we use IPsec services? IPsec is also used to encrypt data for application layer in the OSI model and provide security for sharing data over network routers and data authentication. Let's take a look at the working of IPsec services. To begin with, we have two different systems, System 1 and System 2, which will establish a network channel and then the encryption of data will take place when one host will share the data to the second host. During this, IPsec services will secure the data that is to be transferred over the network channel by applying router encryption and authentication. Now let's move on to the next topic that is components of IPsec. The IPsec services comprises of multiple protocols that ensure the data transmission over the network channel. The first one is encapsulating security payload protocol in short ESP. This protocol of IP security provides data encryption and authentication services. And it also authenticates and encrypts the data packet in the transmission channel. Moving on, we have authentication header, in short AH. Similar to ESP, the authentication header also provides all the security services, but it does not encrypt the data. It also protects the IP packet and adds additional headers to the packet header. The modified IP datagram looks this way, where the IP components are included at the second position, the seventh position, and the sixth position. 
along with the authentication of data services over the network channel. Moving on, we have Internet Key Exchange, IKE. This protocol provides protection for content data and also changes the attribute of the original data to be shared by implementing SHA and MD5 algorithms. They also check the message for authentication and then only is forwarded to the receiver side. For example, this is the original data packet we are used to with IP header path, TCP UDP and data. Whereas this is the modified IPsec data packet where ESP header is added between IP header and the TCP protocol. Now let's move on to the next heading that is modes of IPsec. There are basically two types of IPsec modes available for data transmission over the network channel where the first one is tunnel mode. This mode of transmission is used to secure gateway to gateway data. It is applied when the final destination of the data is to be connected to a sender site through a connection gateway over the internet. For example, we have two hosts, host A and host B. Through the host A, we are sending a message to host B, which will pass through a gateway at host A point. And it passes through a gateway to host B then. This is a basic format for gateway to gateway data transmission. And the given IP datagram format is used for tunnel mode. Now let's move on to the second mode of IPsec that is transport mode. This mode of IPsec is used to protect protocols like TCP or UDP and is used to ensure end to end communication unlike tunnel mode. The transport mode data at authentication header and encapsulating security payload for security purpose in the IP header. This is the modified IP datagram for transport mode. The point to be noted is the IPsec header is always added between IP header and TCP header. Now let's move on to the last setting for the session on IPsec that is the working steps involved in IP security. In general, there are five steps involved in the working of IPsec to ensure data transmission over a network channel. The first step is host recognition. In the first step, the host system will check if the packet is to be transmitted or not by automatically triggering the security policy for the data, which is implemented by the sender side for proper encryption. Then the second step is known as IKE phase one. In this step, the two host devices, the sender and the receiver side will authenticate each other to establish a secure network channel. It is comprised of two modes. The main mode, this provides much better security with a proper time limit. And the second mode known as aggressive mode, as the name suggests, it establishes the IPsec protocol much faster in comparison to main mode. Let's move on to the third step, which is IKE phase two. After the second step, the host decide the type of cryptography algorithm to apply over the session in the network channel and the secret key for the algorithm to be used to encrypt the data for transmission. Then we have IPsec transmission. This step involves the actual transfer of data over the network channel using the various protocols used in IPsec security, which are implemented under the tunnel condition. And the last step is IPsec termination. After the completion of data exchange or session timeout, the IPsec tunnel is terminated and the security key established is discarded by both the host system. Network security is a set of technologies that protects the usability and integrity of a company's infrastructure by preventing the entry or proliferation within a network. Its architecture comprises of tools that protect the network itself and the applications that run over it. Effective network security strategies employ multiple lines of defense that are scalable and automated. Each defensive layer here enforces a set of security policies which are determined by the administrator beforehand. This aims at securing the confidentiality and accessibility of the data and the network. 
The every company or organization that handles a large amount of data has a degree of solutions against many cyber threats. The most basic example of network security is password protection. It has the network the user chooses. The recently, network security has become the central topic of cybersecurity, with many organizations involving applications from people with skills in this area. It is crucial for both personal and professional networks. Most houses with high-speed internet have one or more wireless routers, which can be vulnerable to attacks if they are not adequately secured. Data loss, theft, and sabotage risk may be decreased with the usage of a strong network security system. Your workstations are protected from hazardous spyware thanks to network security. Additionally, it guarantees the security of the data which is being shared over a network. By dividing information into various sections, encrypting these portions and transferring them over separate pathways, network security infrastructure offers multiple levels of protection to thwart man in the middle attacks, preventing situations like eavesdropping, among other harmful attacks. It is becoming increasingly difficult in today's hyper connected environment as more corporate applications migrate to both public and private clouds. Additionally, modern applications are also frequently virtualized and dispersed across several locations, some outside the physical control of the IT team. Network traffic and infrastructure must be protected in these cases since assaults on businesses are increasing every single day. We now understood the basics of network security. But we need to understand how network security works in the next section in slightly more detail. Network security revolves around two processes, authentication and authorization. The first process, which is authentication, is similar to access paths, which ensure that only those who have the right to enter a building. In other words, authentication checks and verifies that it is indeed the user belonging to the network who is trying to access or enter it, thereby preventing unauthorized intrusions. Next comes authorization. This process decides the level of access provided to the recently authenticated user. For example, the network admin needs access to the entire network, whereas those working within it probably need access to only certain areas within the network. Based on the network user's role, the process of determining the level of access or permission level is known as authorization. Today's network architecture is complex and faces a threat environment that is always changing and attackers that are always trying to find and exploit vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities can exist in many areas, including devices, data, applications, users, and locations. For this reason, many network security management tools and applications are in use today that address individual threats. When just a few minutes of downtimes can cause widespread disruption and massive damage to an organization's bottom line and reputation, it is essential that these protection measures are in place beforehand. Now that we know a little about network security and its working, let's cover the different types of network security. The fundamental tenet of network security is the layering of protection for massive networks and stored data that ensure the acceptance of rules and regulations. As a whole, there are three types. The first of which is physical security, the next being technical, and the third being administrative. Let's look into physical security first. This is the most basic level that includes protecting data and network to unauthorized personnel from acquiring control over the confidentiality of the network. This include external peripherals and routers that might be used for cable connections. The same can be achieved by using devices like biometric systems. Physical security is critical, especially for small businesses that do not have many resources to devote to security personnel and the tools as opposed to large firms. When it comes to technical network security, it focuses mostly on safeguarding data either kept in the network or engaged in network transitions. This kind fulfills two functions. One is defense against unauthorized users. The other is a defense against malevolent actions. The last category is administrative. This level of network security protects user behavior, like how the permission has been granted and how the authorization process takes place. This also ensures the level of sophistication the network might need to protect it through all the attacks. This level also suggests necessary amendments that have to be done to the infrastructure. I think that's all the basics that we need to cover on network security. In which our next topic, we're going to go through two mediums of network security, which are the transport layer and the application layer. The transport layer is a way to secure information as it is carried over the internet 
with users browsing websites, emails, instant messaging, etc. TLS aims to provide a private and secure connection between a web browser and a website server. It does this with a cryptographic handshake between two systems using public key cryptography. The two parties to the connection exchange a secret token and once each machine validates this token, it is used for all communications. The connection employs lighter symmetric cryptography to save bandwidth and processing power. Since the application layer is the closest layer to the end user, it provides hackers with the largest threat surface. Poor app layer security can lead to performance and stability issues, data theft, and in some cases, the network being taken down. Examples of application layer attacks include distributed denial of service attacks or DDoS attacks, HTTP floods, SQL injections, cross-site scripting, etc. Most organizations have an arsenal of application layer security protections to combat these and more, such as web application firewalls, secure web gateway services, etc. Now that we have the theory behind network security has been covered in detail, let us go through some of the tools that can be used to enforce these network security policies. The first tool to be covered in this section is a firewall. A firewall is a type of network security device that keeps track of incoming and outgoing network traffic and it decides which traffic to allow or deny in accordance to a set of security rules. For more than 25 years, firewalls have served as network security's first line of defense. They provide a barrier between trustworthy internal protected and regulated networks from shady external networks like the internet at some point. The next tool which can be used to bolster network security is a virtual private network or VPN for short. It's an encrypted connection between a device and a network via the internet. The encrypted connection aids the secure transmission of sensitive data. It makes it impossible for unauthorized parties to eavesdrop on the traffic and enables remote work for the user. The usage of VPN technology is common in both corporate and personal networks. Next, we cover the importance of intrusion prevention systems in network security or IPS frameworks. An intrusion prevention system is a network security tool that continually scans the network for harmful activity and responds to it when it does occur by reporting, blocking, or discarding it. It can be either hardware or software. It's more sophisticated than an intrusion detection system or an IDS framework, which can just warn an administrator and merely identify harmful activities. While in the case of an IPS, it actually takes against that activity. The next tool in this section and the final one are going to be behavioral analytics. Behavioral analytics focus more on the statistics that are being carried over and stored through months and years of usage. When some kind of similar pattern is noted, but the IT administrator can detect some kind of attack, the similar attacks can be stopped and the security can be further enhanced. But now that we have covered all that we need to know about network security, the necessary tools, its different types, etc., let's go to the benefits of network security as a whole. The first, which is protection against external threats. The objective for cyber assaults can be as varied as the defenders themselves. Although they're typically initiated for financial gain, whether they are industrial spies, hacktivists, or cyber criminals, these bad actors all have one thing in common, which is how quick clever and covert the attacks are getting. A strong cybersecurity posture that considers routine software updates may assist firms in identifying and responding to the abuse techniques, tools, and the common entry points. The next benefit is protection against internal threats. The human aspect continues to be the cybersecurity system's weakest link. Insider risk can originate from current or former workers, third-party vendors, or even trusted partners, and they can be unintentional, careless, or downright evil. Aside from that, the rapid expansion of remote work and the personal devices used for business purposes, while even IoT devices in remote locations, can make it easier for these kind of threats to go undetected until it's too late. However, by proactively monitoring networks and managing access, these dangers may be identified and dealt with before they become expensive disasters. The third benefit is increased productivity. It is nearly impossible for employees to function when networks and personal devices are slowed to a crawl by viruses and other cyber attacks during the operation of website and for the company to run. You may significantly minimize violations and the amount of downtime required to fix the breach by implementing various cybersecurity measures such as enhanced firewalls, virus scanning, and automatic backups. 
employee identification of possible email phishing schemes, suspicious links, and other malicious criminal activities can also be aided by education and training. Another benefit is brand trust and reputation. Customer retention is one of the most crucial elements in business development. Customers today place a premium on maintaining brand loyalty through a strong cybersecurity stance, since this is the fastest way to get other businesses back, get referrals, and sell more tickets overall. Additionally, it helps manufacturers get on the vendor list with bigger companies as a part of the supply chain, which is only as strong as its weakest link. This opens possibilities for potential future endeavors and development. With the rise in censorship and general fear over privacy loss, consumer security is at an all-time high risk. Technology has made our life so much easier while putting up a decent target on our personal information. It is necessary to understand how to simultaneously safeguard our data and be up to date with the latest technological developments. Maintaining this balance has become easier with cryptography taking its place in today's digital world. So hey everyone, this is Bevab from Simply Learn and welcome to this video on cryptography. But before we begin, if you love watching tech videos, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. So here's a story to help you understand cryptography. Meet Anne. Anne wanted to look for a decent discount on the latest iPhone. She started searching on the internet and found a rather shady website that offered a 50% discount on the first purchase. Once Anne submitted her payment details, a huge chunk of money was withdrawn from a bank account just moments after. Devastated, Anne quickly realized she had failed to notice that the website was a HTTP web page instead of an HTTPS one. The payment information submitted was not encrypted and it was visible to anyone keeping an eye, including the website owner and hackers. Had she used a reputed website which has encrypted transactions and employs cryptography, our iPhone enthusiast could have avoided this particular incident. This is why it's never recommended to visit unknown websites or share any personal information on them. Now that we understand why cryptography is so important, let's take a look at the topics to be covered today. We take a look into what cryptography is and how it works. We learn where cryptography is being used in our daily lives and how we are benefiting from it. Then we will understand the different types of cryptography and their respective uses. Moving on, we will look at the usage of cryptography in ancient history and a live demonstration of cryptography and encryption in action. Let's now understand what cryptography is. Cryptography is the science of encrypting or decrypting information to prevent unauthorized access. We transform our data and personal information so that only the correct recipient can understand the message. As an essential aspect of modern data security, using cryptography allows the secure storage and transmission of data between willing parties. Encryption is the primary route for employing cryptography by adding certain algorithms to jumble up the data. Decryption is the process of reversing the work done by encrypting information so that the data becomes readable again. Both of these methods form the basis of cryptography. For example, when Simply Learn is jumbled up or changed in any format, not many people can guess the original word by looking at the encrypted text. The only ones who can are the people who know how to decrypt the coded word, thereby reversing the process of encryption. Any data pre-encryption is called plain text or clear text. To encrypt the message, we use certain algorithms that serve a single purpose of scrambling the data to make them unreadable without the necessary tools. These algorithms are called ciphers. They are a set of detailed steps to be carried out one after the other to make sure the data becomes as unreadable as possible until it reaches the receiver. We take the plain text, pass it to the cipher algorithm and get the encrypted data. This encrypted text is called the cipher text. And this is the message that is transferred between the two parties. The key that is being used to scramble the data is known as the encryption key. These steps, that is the cipher and the encryption key are made known to the receiver who can then reverse the encryption on receiving the message. Unless any third party manages to find out both the algorithm and the secret key that is being used, they cannot decrypt the messages since both of them are necessary to unlock the hidden content. Wonder what else we would lose if not for cryptography? 
Any website where you have an account can read your passwords. Important emails can be intercepted and their contents can be read without encryption during the transit. More than 65 billion messages are sent on WhatsApp every day, all of which are secured thanks to end-to-end -end encryption. There is a huge market opening up for cryptocurrency, which is possible due to blockchain technology that uses encryption algorithms and hashing functions to ensure that the data is secure. If this is of particular interest to you, you can watch our video on blockchain, the link of which will be in the description. Of course, there is no single solution to a problem as diverse as explained. There are three variants of how cryptography works and is in practice. They are symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption and hashing. Let's find out how much we have understood until now. Do you remember the difference between a cipher and ciphertext? Leave your answers in the comments and before we proceed, if you find this video interesting, make sure to give it a thumbs up before moving ahead. Let's look at symmetric encryption first. Symmetric encryption uses a single key for both the encryption and decryption of data. It is comparatively less secure than asymmetric encryption but much faster. It is a compromise that has to be embraced in order to deliver data as fast as possible without leaving information completely vulnerable. This type of encryption is used when data rests on servers and identifies personnel for payment applications and services. The potential drawback with symmetric encryption is that both the sender and receiver need to have the same secret key and it should be kept hidden at all times. Caesar cipher and Enigma machine are both symmetric encryption examples that we will look into further. For example, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, she can apply a substitution cipher or a shift cipher to encrypt the message. But Bob must be aware of the same key itself so he can decrypt it when he finds it necessary to read the entire message. Symmetric encryption uses one of the two types of ciphers, stream ciphers and block ciphers. Block ciphers break the plain text into blocks of fixed size and use the key to convert it into ciphertext. Stream ciphers convert the plain text into ciphertext one bit at a time instead of resorting to breaking them up into bigger chunks. In today's world, the most widely used symmetric encryption algorithm is AES-256 that stands for Advanced Encryption Standard which has a key size of 256-bit with 128-bit and 196-bit key sizes also being available. Other primitive algorithms like the Data Encryption Standard that is the DES, the Triple Data Encryption Standard 3DES and Blowfish have all fallen out of favor due to the rise of AES. AES chops up the data into blocks and performs 10 plus rounds of obscuring and substituting the message to make it unreadable. Asymmetric encryption on the other hand has a double whammy at its disposal. There are two different keys at play here, a public key and a private key. The public key is used to encrypt information pre-transit and a private key is used to decrypt the information post-transit. If Alice wants to communicate with Bob using asymmetric encryption, she encrypts the message using Bob's public key. After receiving the message, Bob uses his own private key to decrypt the data. This way, nobody can intercept the message in between transmissions and there is no need for any secure key exchange for this to work since the encryption is done with the public key and the decryption is done with the private key that no one except Bob has access to. Both the keys are necessary to read the full message. There is also a reverse scenario where we can use the private key for encryption and the public key for decryption. A server can sign non-confidential information using its private key and anyone who has its public key can decrypt the message. This mechanism also proves that the sender is authenticated and there is no problem with the origin of the information. RSA encryption is the most widely used asymmetric encryption standard. It is named after its founders Rivest, Shamir and Edelman and it uses block ciphers that separate the data into blocks and obscure the information. Widely considered the most secure form of encryption, albeit relatively slower than AES, it is widely used in web browsing, secure identification, VPNs, emails and chat applications. With so much hanging on the key's secrecy, there must be a way to transmit the keys without others reading our private data. Many systems use a combination of symmetric encryption 
and asymmetric encryption to bolster security and match speed at the same time. Since asymmetric encryption takes longer to decrypt large amounts of data, the full information is encrypted using a single key, that is, symmetric encryption. That single key is then transmitted to the receiver using asymmetric encryption, so you don't have to compromise either way. Another route is using the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which relies on a one-way function and is much tougher to break into. The third variant of cryptography is termed as hashing. Hashing is the process of scrambling a piece of data beyond recognition. It gives an output of fixed size, which is known as the hash value of the original data or just hash in general. The calculations that do the job of messing up the data collection form the hash function. They are generally not reversible without resilient brute force mechanisms and are very helpful when storing data on website servers that need not be stored in plain text. For example, many websites store your account passwords in a hashed format so that not even the administrator can read your credentials. When a user tries to log in, they can compare the entered password's hash value with the hash value that is already stored on the servers for authentication since the function will always return the same value for the same input. Cryptography has been in practice for centuries. Julius Caesar used a substitution shift to move alphabets a certain number of spaces beyond their place in the alphabet table. A spy can't decipher the original message at first glance. For example, if he wanted to pass confidential information to his armies and decides to use the substitution shift of plus 2, A becomes C, B becomes D, and so on. The word attack, when passed through a substitution shift of plus 3, becomes D -W -W -D -E -F -N. This cipher has been appropriately named the Caesar cipher, which is one of the most widely used algorithms. The Enigma is probably the most famous cryptographic cipher device used in ancient history. It was used by the Nazi German armies in the World Wars. They were used to protect confidential political, military and administrative information and it consisted of three or more rotors that scrambled the original message depending on the machine's state at that time. The decryption is similar but it needs both machines to stay in the same state before passing the cipher text so that we receive the same plain text message. Let's take a look at how our data is protected while we browse the internet thanks to cryptography. Here we have a web-based tool that will help us understand the process of RSA encryption. We see the entire workflow from selecting the key size to be used until the decryption of the cipher text in order to get the plain text back. As we already know, RSA encryption algorithm falls under the umbrella of asymmetric key cryptography. That basically implies that we have two keys at play here, a public key and a private key. Typically, the public key is used by the sender to encrypt the message and the private key is used by the receiver to decrypt the message. There are some occasions when this allocation is reversed and we will have a look at them as well. In RSA, we have the choice of key size. We can select any key from a 512-bit to 1024-bit all the way up to a 4096-bit key. The longer the key length, the more complex the encryption process becomes and thereby strengthening the ciphertext. Although with added security, more complex functions take longer to perform the same operations on similar size of data. We have to keep a balance between both speed and strength because the strongest encryption algorithms are of no use if they cannot be practically deployed in systems around the world. Let's take a 1024-bit key over here. Now we need to generate the keys. This generation is done by functions that operate on pass phrases. The tool we are using right now generates these pseudo-random keys to be used in this explanation. Once we generate the keys, you can see the public key is rather smaller than the private key, which is almost always the case. These two keys are mathematically linked with each other. They cannot be substituted with any other key, and in order to encrypt the original message or decrypt the ciphertext, this pair must be kept together. The public key is then sent to the sender and the receiver keeps the private key with himself. In this scenario, let's try and encrypt a word, simply learn. We have to select if the key being used for encryption is either private or public, since that affects the process of scrambling the information. Since we are using the public key over here, let's select the same and copy it and paste over here. 
The cipher we are using right now is plain RSA. There are some modified ciphers with their own pros and cons that can also be used provided we use it on a regular basis and depending on the use case as well. Once we click on encrypt, we can see the cipher text being generated over here. The pseudorandom generating functions are created in such a way that a single character change in the plain text will trigger a completely different cipher text. This is a security feature to strengthen the process from brute force methods. Now that we are done with the encryption process, let's take a look at the decryption part. The receiver gets this ciphertext from the sender with no other key or supplement. He or she must already possess the private key generated from the same pair. No other private key can be used to decrypt the message since they are mathematically linked. We paste the private key here and select the same. The cipher must always so be the same used during the encryption process. Once we click decrypt, you can see the original plain text we had decided to encrypt. This sums up the entire process of RSA encryption and decryption. Now some people use it the other way around. We also have the option of using the private key to encrypt information and the public key to decrypt it. This is done mostly to validate the origin of the message. Since the keys only work in pairs, if a different private key is used to encrypt the message, the public key cannot decrypt it. Conversely, if the public key is able to decrypt the message, it must have been encrypted with the right private key and hence the rightful owner. Here we just have to take the private key and use that to encrypt the plain text and select the same in this checkbox as well. You can see we have generated a completely new ciphertext. This ciphertext will be sent to the receiver and this time we will use the public key for decryption. Let's select the correct checkbox and decrypt and we still get the same output. Now let's take a look at practical example of encryption in the real world. We all use the internet on a daily basis and many are aware of the implications of using unsafe websites. Let's take a look at Wikipedia here. Pretty standard HTTPS website where the H stands for secured. Let's take a look at how it secures our data. Wireshark is the world's foremost and most widely used network protocol analyzer. It lets you see what's happening on your network at a microscopic level and we are going to use the software to see the traffic that is leaving our machine and to understand how vulnerable it is. Since there are many applications running in this machine, let's apply a filter that will only show us the results related to Wikipedia. Let's search for something that we can navigate the website with. Okay, once we get into it a little, we can see some of the requests being populated over here. Let's take a look at the specific request. These are the data packets that basically transport the data from our machine to the internet and vice versa. As you can see, there's a bunch of gibberish data here that doesn't really reveal anything that we searched or watched. Similarly, other secured websites function the same way and it is very difficult, if at all possible, to snoop on user data this way. To put this in perspective, let's take a look at another website, which is a HTTP web page. This has no encryption enabled from the server end, which makes it vulnerable to attacks. There is a login form here, which needs legitimate user credentials in order to grant access. Let's enter a random pair of credentials. These obviously won't work, but we can see the manner of data transfer. Unsurprisingly, we weren't able to get into the platform. Instead, we can see the data packets. Let's apply a similar filter that will help us understand what request this website is sending. These are the requests being sent by the HTTP login form to the internet. 
if we check here see whatever username and password that we are entering we can easily see it with the wireshark now we used a dummy pair of credentials if we select the right data packet we can find our correct credentials if any website had asked for a payment information or a legitimate credentials it would have been really easy to get a hold of these to reiterate what we have already learned we must always avoid http websites and just unknown or not trustworthy websites in general because the problem we saw here is just the tip of the iceberg even though cryptography has managed to lessen the risk of cyber attacks it is still prevalent and we should always be alert to keep ourselves safe online there are two types of encryption in cryptography symmetric key cryptography and asymmetric key cryptography both of these categories have their pros and cons and differ only by the implementation today we are going to focus exclusively on symmetric key cryptography let us have a look at its applications in order to understand its importance better this variant of cryptography is primarily used in banking applications where personally identifiable information needs to be encrypted with so many aspects of banking moving on to the internet having a reliable safety net is crucial symmetric cryptography helps in detecting bank fraud and boosts the security index of these payment gateways in general they are also helpful in protecting data that is not in transit and rests on servers and data centers these centers house a massive amount of data that needs to be encrypted with a fast and efficient algorithm so that when the data needs to be recalled by the respective service there is the assurance of minor to no delay while browsing the internet we need symmetric encryption to browse secure https websites so that we get an all around protection it plays a significant role in verifying website server authenticity exchanging the necessary encryption keys required and generating a session using those keys to ensure maximum security this helps us in preventing the rather insecure http website format so let us understand how symmetric key cryptography works first before moving on to the specific algorithms symmetric key cryptography relies on a single key for the encryption and decryption of information both the sender and receiver of the message need to have a pre-shared secret key that they will use to convert the plain text into cipher text and vice versa as you can see in the image the key used for encryption is the same key needed for decrypting the message at the other end the secret key shouldn't be sent along with the cipher text to the receiver because that would defeat the entire purpose of using cryptography key exchange can be done beforehand using other algorithms like the diffie hellman key exchange protocol for example for example if paul wants to send a simple message to jane they need to have a single encryption key that both of them must keep secret to prevent snooping on by malicious actors it can be generated by either one of them but must belong to both of them before the messages start flowing suppose the message i am ready is converted into cipher text using a specific substitution cipher by paul in that case jane must also be aware of the substitution shift to decrypt the cipher text once it reaches her irrespective of the scenario where someone manages to grab the cipher text mid transit to try and read the message not having the secret key renders everyone helpless looking to snoop in the symmetric key algorithms like the data encryption standard have been in use since the 1970s while the popular ones like the aes have become the industry standard today with the entire architecture of symmetric cryptography depending on the single key being used you can understand why it's of paramount importance to keep it secret on all locations the side effect of having a single key for the encryption and decryption is it becomes a single point of failure anyone who gets their hand on it can read all the encrypted messages and do so mainly without the knowledge of the sender and the receiver so it is the priority to keep the encryption and decryption key private at all times should it fall into the wrong hands the third party can send messages to either the sender or the receiver using the same key to encrypt the message upon receiving the message and decrypting it with the key it is impossible to guess its origin if the sender somehow transmits the secret key along with the cipher text anyone can intercept the package and access the information consequently this encryption category is termed private key cryptography since a big part of the data's integrity is riding on the promise that the users can keep the key secret this terminology contrasts with asymmetric key cryptography which is called public key cryptography because it has two different keys at play one of which is public 
Provided we manage to keep the key secret, we still have to choose what kind of ciphers we want to use to encrypt this information. In symmetric key cryptography, there are broadly two categories of ciphers that we can employ. Let us have a look. Stream ciphers are the algorithms that encrypt basic information one bit at a time. It can change depending on the algorithm being used, but usually it relies on a single bit or byte to do the encryption. This is the relatively quicker alternative considering the algorithm doesn't have to deal with blocks of data at a single time. Every piece of data that goes into the encryption can and needs to be converted into binary format. In stream ciphers, each binary digit is encrypted one after the other. The most popular ones are the RC4, Salsa and Panama. The binary data is passed through an encryption key which is a randomly generated bit stream. Upon passing it through, we receive the cipher text that can be transferred to the receiver without fear of man in the middle attacks. The binary data can be passed through an algorithmic function. It can have either XOR operations as it is most of the time or any other mathematical calculations that have the singular purpose of scrambling the data. The encryption key is generated using the random bitstream generator and it acts as a supplement in the algorithmic function. The output is in binary form, which is then converted into the decimal or hexadecimal format to give our final ciphertext. On the other hand, block ciphers dissect the raw information into chunks of data of fixed size. The size of these blocks depend on the exact cipher being used. A 128-bit block cipher will break the plain text into blocks of 128-bit each and encrypt those blocks instead of a single digit. Once these blocks are encrypted individually, they are chained together to form a final ciphertext. Block ciphers are much slower, but they are more tamper-proof and are used in some of the most widely used algorithms employed today. Just like stream ciphers, the original ciphertext is converted into binary format before beginning the process. Once the conversion is complete, the blocks are passed through the encryption algorithm along with the encryption key. This would provide us with the encrypted blocks of binary data. Once these blocks are combined, we get a final binary string. This string is then converted into hexadecimal format to get our ciphertext. Today, the most popular symmetric key algorithms like AES, DES and 3DES are all block cipher methodology subsets. With so many factors coming into play, there are quite a few things symmetric key cryptography excels at while falling short in some other. Symmetric key cryptography is much faster variant when compared to asymmetric key cryptography. There is only one key in play, unlike asymmetric encryption, and this drastically improves calculation speed in the encryption and decryption. Similarly, the performance of symmetric encryption is much more efficient under similar computational limitations. Fewer calculations help in better memory management for the whole system. Bulk amounts of data that need to be encrypted are very well suited for symmetric algorithms. Since they are much quicker, handling large amounts of data is simple and easy to use in servers and data farms. This helps in better latency during data recall and fewer mixed packets. Thanks to its simple single key structure, symmetric key cryptography algorithms are much easier to set up a communication channel with and offer a much more straightforward maintenance duties. Once the secret key is transmitted to both the sender and receiver without any prior mishandling, the rest of the system aligns easily and everyday communications becomes easy and secure. If the algorithm is applied as per the documentation, symmetric algorithms are very robust and can encrypt vast amounts of data with very less overhead. DES algorithm stands for Data Encryption Standard. It is a symmetric key cipher that is used to encrypt and decrypt information in a block by block manner. Each block is encrypted individually and they are later chained together to form our final cipher text which is then sent to a receiver. DES takes the original unaltered piece of data called the plain text in a 64-bit block and it is converted into an encrypted text that is called the cipher text. It uses 48-bit keys during the encryption process and follows a specific structure called the Fistel cipher structure during the entire process. It is a symmetric key algorithm, which means DES can reuse the keys used in the encryption format to decrypt the ciphertext back to the original plain text. Once the 64-bit blocks are encrypted, they can be combined together before being transmitted. 
let's take a look at the origin and the reason DES was founded. DES is based on a crystal block cipher called Lucifer, developed in 1971 by IBM cryptography researcher Horst Fistel. DES uses 16 rounds of this crystal structure using a different key for each round. It also utilizes a random function with two inputs and provides a single output variable. DES became the organization's approved encryption standard in November 1976 and was later reaffirmed as a standard in 1983, 1988 and finally in 1999. But eventually DES was cracked and it was no longer considered a secure solution for all official routes of communication. Consequently, Triple DES was developed. Triple DES is a symmetric key block cipher that uses a double DES cipher. Encrypt with the first key, delete encryption with the second key, and encrypt again with the third key. There is also a variation of the two keys where the first and second key are duplicate of each other. But Triple DES was ultimately deemed too slow for the growing need for fast communication channels, and people eventually fell back to using DES for encrypting messages. In order to search for a better alternative, a public-wide competition was organized and helped cryptographers develop their own algorithm as a proposal for the next global standard. This is where the Rindal algorithm came into play and was later credited to be the next advanced encryption standard. For a long time, DES was the standard for data encryption for data security. Its rule ended in 2002 when finally the advanced encryption standard replaced DES as an acceptable standard following a public competition for a place. To understand the structure of a crystal cipher, we can use the following image as a reference. The block being encrypted is divided into two parts, one of which is being passed on to the function, while the other part is XORed with the function's output. The function also uses the encryption key that differs for each individual round. This keeps going on until the last step, until where the right hand side and the left hand side are being swapped. Here we receive our final ciphertext. For the decryption process, the entire procedure is reversed, starting from the order of the keys to the block sorting. If the entire process is repeated in a reverse order, we will eventually get back our plain text and this simplicity helps the speed. Overall, this was later detrimental to the efficiency of the algorithm, hence the security was compromised. A crystal block cipher is a structure used to derive many symmetric block ciphers such as DES, which as we have discussed in our previous comment. Crystal cipher proposed a structure that implements substitution and permutation alternately so that we can obtain ciphertext from the plain text and vice versa. This helps in reducing the redundancy of the program and increases the complexity to combat brute force attacks. The crystal cipher is actually based on the Shannon structure that was proposed in 1945. The Fistel cipher is the structure suggested by Horst Feistel, which was considered to be a backbone while developing many symmetric block ciphers. The Shannon structure highlights the implementation of alternate confusion and diffusion. And like we already discussed, the Fistel cipher structure can be completely reversed depending on the data. However, we must consider the fact that to decrypt the information by reversing the Fistel structure, we will need the exact polynomial functions and the key orders. To understand how the blocks are being calculated, we take a plain text which is of 64 bit and that is later divided into two equal halves of 32 bit each. In this, the right half is immediately transferred to the next round to become the new left half of the second round. The right hand is again passed off to a function which uses an encryption key that is unique to each round in the Fistel cipher. Whatever the function gives off as an output, it is passed on as an XOR input with the left half of the initial plain text. The next output will become the right half of the second round for the plain text. This entire process constitutes of a single round in the Fistel cipher. Taking into account what happens in the polynomial function, we take one half of the block and pass it through an expansion box. The work of the expansion box is to increase the size of the half from 32 bit to 48 bit text. This is done to make the text compatible to a 48 bit keys we have generated beforehand. Once we pass it through the XOR function, we get a 48 bit text as an output. Now remember, a half should be of 32 bit. So this 48 bit output is then later passed on to a substitution box. 
This substitution box reduces its size from 48 bit to 32 bit output, which is then later XORed with the first half of the plain text. A block cipher is considered the safest if the size of the block is large, but large block sizes can also slow down encryption speed and the decryption speed. Generally, the size is 64 bit. Sometimes modern block ciphers like AES have a 128 bit block size as well. The security of the block cipher increases with increasing key size, but larger key sizes may also reduce the speeds of the process. Earlier, 64 bit keys were considered sufficient. Modern ciphers need to use 128 bit keys due to the increasing complexity of today's computational standards. The increasing number of rounds also increase the security of the block cipher. Similarly, they are inversely proportional to the speed of encryption. A highly complex round function enhances the security of the block cipher. Albeit, we must maintain a balance between the speed and security. The symmetric block cipher is implemented in a software application to achieve better execution speed. There is no use of an algorithm if it cannot be implemented in a real life framework that can help organizations to encrypt or decrypt the data in a timely manner. Now that we understand the basics of Fistel ciphers, we can take a look at how DES manages to run through 16 rounds of the structure and provide the cipher text at the end. Now that we understand the basics of Fistel ciphers, we can take a look at how DES manages to run through 16 rounds of this structure and provide a cipher text. In simple terms, DES takes the 64 bit plain text and converts it into a 64 bit cipher text. And since we are talking about asymmetric algorithms, the same key is being used when it is decrypting the data as well. We first take a 64 bit key plain text and we pass it through an initial permutation function. The initial permutation function has the job of dividing the block into two different parts so that we can perform fistel cipher structures on it. There are multiple rounds being procured in the DS algorithm, namely 16 rounds of fistel cipher structure. Each of these rounds will need keys. Initially, we take a 56 bit cipher key, but it is a single key. We pass it on to a round key generators which generates 16 different keys for each single round uh, that the Fistel cipher is being run. These keys are passed on to the rounds as 48 bits. The size of these 48 bits keys is the reason we use the substitution and permutation bonds in the polynomial functions of the Fistel ciphers. When passing through all these rounds, we reach round 16 where the final key is passed on from the round key generator and we get a final permutation. In the final permutation, the rounds are swapped and we get a final cipher text. This is the entire process of DES with 16 rounds of fistel ciphers encompassed in it. To decrypt a cipher text back to the plain text, we just have to reverse the process we did in the DES algorithm and reverse the key order along with the functions. This kind of simplicity is what gave DES the bonus when it comes to speed, but eventually it was detrimental to the overall efficiency of the program when it comes to security factors. DES have five different modes of operation to choose from. This one of those is electronic codebook. Each 64 bit block is encrypted and decrypted independently in the electronic codebook format. We also have cipher block chaining or the CBC method. Here, each 64 bit block depends on the previous one and all of them use an initialization vector. We have a cipher feedback block mechanism where the preceding cipher text becomes the input for the encryption algorithm. It produces a pseudo random output, which in turn is XORed with the plain text. There is an output feedback method as well, which is the same as cipher feedback, except that the encryption algorithm input is the output from the preceding DES. A counter method has a different way of approach, where each plain text block is XORed with an encrypted counter. The counter is then incremented for each subsequent block. There are a few other alternatives to these modes of operation, but the five mentioned above are the most widely used in the industry and recommended by cryptographers worldwide. Let's take a look at the future of DES. The dominance of DES ended in 2002 when the advanced encryption standard replaced the DES encryption algorithm as the accepted standard. It was done by following a public competition to find a replacement. NIST officially withdrew the global acceptance standard in May 2005 
although triple DES is approved for some sensitive government information through 2030. NIST also had to change the DES algorithm because its key length was too short given the increased processing power of the new computers. Encryption power is related to the size of the key and DES found itself a victim of ongoing technological advances in computing. We have received a point where 56-bit was no longer a challenge to the computers of cracking. Note that because DES is no longer the NIST federal standard, it does not mean that it is no longer in use. Triple DES is still used today and is still considered a legacy encryption algorithm. To get a better understanding of how these keys and ciphertext look like, we can use an online tool for our benefit. As we already know, to encrypt any kind of data, a key is mandatory. This key can be generated using mathematical functions or computerized key generation program such as this website offers. It can be based on any piece of text. Let's say the word is simply learn in our example. Once the key is settled, we provide the plain text or the clear text that needs to be encrypted using the aforementioned key. Suppose our sentence for this example is this is my first message. We have satisfied two prerequisites, the message and the key. Another variable that goes into play is the mode of operation. We have already learned about five different modes of operation, while we can see some other options here as well. Let us go with the CBC variant, which basically means the cipher block chaining method. One of CBC's key characteristics is that it uses a chaining process. It causes the decryption of a block of ciphertext to depend all on the preceding ciphertext blocks. As a result, the entire validity of all the blocks is contained in the previous adjacent blocks as well. A single bit error in a ciphertext block affects the decryption of all the subsequent blocks. Rearrangement of the order of these, for example, can cause the decryption process to get corrupted. Regarding the manner of displaying binary information, we have two options here. We can either go with Base64 or the hexadecimal format. Let's go with the Base64 right now. As you can see, the ciphertext is readily available. Base64 is a little more efficient than hex, so we will be getting a smaller ciphertext when it comes to Base64. Albeit the size of both the formats will be the same. The hex has a longer ciphertext since base64 takes 4 characters for every 3 bytes while hex will take 2 characters for each byte. Hence, base64 turns out to be more efficient. Now to decrypt the ciphertext, we go by the same format. Choose base64. We copy the ciphertext onto our decryption tool and we have to make sure that the key we are using is exactly the same. We choose similar mode of operation and we choose the correct encoding format as well which is base64 in this case as you can see the decryption is complete and we get a plain text back even if you keep everything the same but we just change the encoding format it will not be able to decrypt anything unfortunately ds has become rather easy to crack even without the help of a key the advanced encryption standard is still on top when it comes to symmetric encryption security and will likely stay there for a while. Eventually, with so much computing power growth, the need for a stronger algorithm was necessary to safeguard our personal data. As solid as DES was, the computers of today could easily break the encryption with repeated attempts, thereby rendering the data security helpless. To counter this dilemma, a new standard was introduced which was termed as the Advanced Encryption Standard or the AES algorithm. Let's learn what is Advanced Encryption Standard. The AES algorithm, also known as the Rindal algorithm, is a symmetric block cipher with a block size of 128 bits. It is converted into ciphertext using keys of 128, 192 or 256 bits. It is implemented in software and hardware throughout the world to encrypt sensitive data. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as NIST, started development on AES in 1997 when it was announced the need for an alternative to the data encryption standard. The new internet needed a replacement for DES because of its small key size. With increasing computing power, it was considered unsafe against entire key search attacks. The triple DES was designed to overcome this problem 
However, it was deemed to be too slow to be deployed in machines worldwide. Strong cases were present by the Mars RC6, Serpent and the Two-Fish algorithms, but it was the Rindal encryption algorithm, also known as AES, which was eventually chosen as the standard symmetric key encryption algorithm to be used. Its selection was formalized with the release of Federal Information Processing Standards Publication 197 in the November of 2001. It was approved by the US Secretary of Commerce. Now that we understand the origin of AES, let us have a look at the features that make AES encryption algorithm unique. The AES algorithm uses a substitution permutation or SP network. It consists of multiple rounds to produce a ciphertext. It has a series of linked operations including replacing inputs with specific outputs, that is substitutions, and others that involve bit shuffling, which is permutations. At the beginning of the encryption process, we only start out with a single key, which can be either a 128-bit key, a 192-bit key, or a 256-bit key. Eventually, this one key is expanded to be used in multiple rounds throughout the encryption and the decryption cycle. Interestingly, AES performs all its calculations on byte data instead of bit data, as seen in the case of the DES algorithm. Therefore, AES treats 128 bits of a clear text block as 16 bytes. The number of rounds during the encryption process depends on the key size that is being used. The 128-bit key size fixes 10 rounds, the 192-bit key size fixes 12 rounds, and the 256-bit key holds 14 rounds. A round key is required for each of these rounds, but since only one key is input into the algorithm, the single key needs to be expanded to get the key for each round, including the round 0. With so many mathematical calculations going on in the background, there are bound to be a lot of steps throughout the procedure. Let's have a look at the steps followed in AES. Before we move ahead, we need to understand how data is being stored during the process of AES encryption. Everything in the process is stored in a 4 into 4 matrix format. This matrix is also known as a state array and we'll be using these state arrays to transmit data from one step to another and from one round to the next round. Each round takes state array as input and gives a state array as output to be transferred into the next round. It is a 16 byte matrix with each cell representing one byte with each four bytes representing a word. So every state array will have a total of four words representing it. As we previously discussed, we take a single key and expand it to the number of rounds that we need the key to be used in. Let's say the number of rounds are n, then the key has to be expanded to be used with n plus 1 rounds because the first round is the key 0 round. Let's say n is the number of rounds, the key is expanded to n plus 1 rounds. It is also a state array having 4 words in its vicinity. Every key is used for a single round and the first key is used as a round key before any round begins. In the very beginning, the plain text is captured and passed through an XOR function with a round key as a supplement. This key can be considered the first key from the n plus 1 expanded set. Moving on, the state array resulting from the above step is passed on to a byte substitution process. Beyond that, there is a provision to shift rows in the state arrays. Later on, the state array is mixed with a constant matrix to shuffle its column in the mix column segment, after which we add the round key for that particular round. The last four steps mentioned are part of every single round that the encryption algorithm goes through. The state arrays are then passed from one round to the next as an input. In the last round, however, we skip the mix columns portion with the rest of the process remaining unchanged. But what are these byte substitution and row shifting processes? Let's find out regarding each step in more detail. In the first step, the plain text is stored in a state array and it is XORed with the K0, which is the first key in the expanded key set. This step is performed only once on a block while being repeated at the end of each round as per iteration demands. The state array is XORed with the key to get a new state array, which is then passed off as input to the sub-bytes process. 
In the second stage, we have byte substitution. We leverage an X box called as a substitution box to randomly switch data among each element. Every single byte is converted into a hexadecimal value having two parts. The first part denotes the row value and the second part denotes the column value. The entire state array is passed through the S box to create a brand new state array which is then passed off as an input to the row shifting process. The 16 input bytes are replaced by looking at a fixed table given in the design. We finally get a matrix with 4 rows and 4 columns. When it comes to row shifting, each bit in the 4 rows of the matrix is shifted to the left. An entry that is a fall off is reinserted to the right of the line. The change is done as follows. The first line is not moved in any way. The second line is shifted to a single position to the left. The third line is shifted two positions to the left and the fourth line is shifted three positions to the left. The result is a new matrix that contains the same 16 bytes but has been moved in relation to each other to boost the complexity of the program. In mixed columns, each column of four bytes is now replaced using a special mathematical function. The function takes four bytes of a column as input and outputs four completely new bytes. We will get a new matrix with the same size of 16 bytes and it should be noted that this phase has not been done in the last round of the iteration. When it comes to adding a round key, the 16 bytes of the matrix are treated as 128 bits and the 128 bits of the round key are XOR. If it is the last round, the output is the ciphertext. If you still have a few rounds remaining, the resulting 128 bits are interpreted as 16 bytes and we start another similar round. Let's take an example to understand how all these processes work. If our plain text is the string 2192, we first convert it into a hexadecimal format as follows. We use an encryption key which is that's my kung fu and it is converted into a hexadecimal format as well. As per the guidelines, we use a single key which is then later expanded into n plus 1 number of keys in which case it's supposed to be 11 keys for 10 different rounds. In round 0, we add the round key. The plain test is XORed with the k0 and we get a state array that is passed off as an input to the substitution bytes process. When it comes to the substitution bytes process, we leverage an S box to substitute the elements of each byte with a completely new byte. This way the state array that we receive is passed off as an input to the row shifting process on the next step. When it comes to row shifting, each element is shifted a few places to the left with the first row being shifted by 0 places, second row by 1 place, third row by 2 places and the last by 3. The state array that we received from the row shifting is passed off as an input to mix columns. In mix columns, we multiply the state array with a constant matrix after which I receive a new state array to be passed on onto the next step. We add the new state array as an XOR with the round key of the particular iteration. Whatever state array we receive here, it becomes an output for this particular round. Now since this is the first round of the entire encryption process, the state array that we receive is passed off as an input to the new round. We repeat this process for 10 more rounds and we finally receive a ciphertext. Once the final state array can be denoted in the hexadecimal format, this becomes our final ciphertext that we can use for transferring information from the sender and receiver. Let's take a look at the applications of AES in this work. AES finds most use in the area of wireless security in order to establish a secure mode of authentication between routers and clients. Highly secure mechanisms like WPA and WPA2PSK are extensively used in securing Wi-Fi endpoints with the help of Rindile's algorithm. It also helps in SSL TLS encryption that is instrumental in encrypting our internet browser sessions. 
AES works in tandem with other asymmetric encryption algorithms to make sure the web browser and web server are properly configured and use encrypted channels for communication. AES is also prevalent in general file encryption of various formats ranging from protocol documents to the media files. Having a large key allows people to encrypt media and decrypt data with maximum security possible. AES is also used for processor security in hardware appliances to prevent machine hijacking among other things. As a direct successor to the DES algorithm, there are some aspects that AES provides an immediate advantage in. Let us take a look. When it comes to key length, the biggest flaw in DES algorithm was its small length was easily vulnerable by today's standards. AES has managed to nab up 128, 192 and 256 bit key lengths to bolster the security further. The block size is also larger in AES owing to more complexity of the algorithm. The number of rounds in DES is fixed irrespective of the plain text being used. In AES, the number of rounds depends on the key length that is being used for the particular iteration, thereby providing more randomness and complexity in the algorithm. The DES algorithm is considered to be simpler than AES, even though AES beats DES when it comes to relative speed of encryption and decryption. This makes advanced encryption standard much more streamlined to be deployed in frameworks and systems worldwide when it compares to the data encryption standard. Hello, in our last video on cryptography, we took a look at symmetry key cryptography. We used a single private key for both the encryption and decryption of data and it works very well in theory. Let's take a look at a more realistic scenario now. Let's meet Joe. Joe is a journalist who needs to communicate with Ryan via long distance messaging. Due to the critical nature of the information, people are waiting for any message to leave Joe's house so that they can intercept it. Now Joe can easily use symmetric cryptography to send the encrypted data so that even if someone intercepts the message, they cannot understand what it says. But here's the tricky part. How will Joe send the required decryption key to Ryan? The sender of the message as well as the receiver need to have the same decryption key so that they can exchange messages. Otherwise, Ryan cannot decrypt the information even when he receives the ciphertext. If someone intercepts the key while transmitting it, there is no use in employing cryptography since a third party can now decode all the information easily. Key sharing is a risk that will always exist when symmetric key cryptography is being used. Thankfully, asymmetric key encryption has managed to fix this problem. This is Bhavab from Simply Learn and welcome to this video on asymmetric key cryptography. Let's take a look at what we are going to learn today. We begin by explaining what asymmetric key cryptography is and how it works. We take a look at its application and uses. We understand why it's called public key cryptography and then learn a little bit about RS encryption. And then we learn about the advantages of asymmetric key cryptography over symmetric key cryptography. Let's understand what asymmetric key cryptography is. Asymmetric encryption uses a double layer of protection. There are two different keys at play here, a private key and a public key. A public key is used to encrypt the information pre-transit and a private key is used to decrypt the data post-transit. These pair of keys must belong to the receiver of the message. The public keys can be shared via messaging, blog posts or key servers and there are no restrictions. As you can see in the image, the two keys are working in the system. The sender first encrypts the message using the receiver's private key, after which we receive the ciphertext. The ciphertext is then transmitted to the receiver without any other key. On getting the ciphertext, the receiver uses his private key to decrypt it and get the plain text back. There has been no requirement of any key exchange throughout this process, therefore solving the most glaring flaw faced in symmetry key cryptography. The public key known to everyone cannot be used to decrypt the message and the private key which can decrypt the message need not be shared with anyone. The sender and receiver can exchange personal data using the same set of keys as often as possible. To understand this better, take the analogy of your mailbox. Anyone who wants to send you a letter has access to the box and can easily share information with you. In a way, you can say the mailbox is publicly available to all, but only you have access to the key that can open the mailbox and read the letters in it. This is how the private key comes to play. 
No one can intercept the message and read its contents since it's encrypted. Once the receiver gets its contents, he can use his private key to decrypt the information. Both the public key and the private key are generated so they are interlinked and you cannot substitute other private keys to decrypt the data. In another example, if Alice wants to send a message to Bob, let's say it reads call me today, she must use Bob's public key while encrypting the message. Upon receiving the cipher message, Bob can proceed to use his private key in order to decrypt the message and hence complete security is attained during transmission without any need for sharing the key. Since this type of encryption is highly secure, it has many uses in areas that require high confidentiality. It is used to manage digital signatures, so there is valid proof of a document's authenticity. With so many aspects of business transitioning to the digital sphere, critical documents need to be verified before being considered authentic and acted upon. Thanks to asymmetric cryptography, senders can now sign documents with their private keys. Anyone who needs to verify the authenticity of such signatures can use the sender's public key to decrypt the signature. Since the public and the private keys are linked to each other mathematically, it's impossible to repeat this verification with, a, with duplicate keys. Document encryption has been made very simple by today's standards, but the background implementation follows a similar approach. In blockchain architecture, asymmetry key cryptography is used to authorize transactions and maintain the system. Thanks to its two key structures, changes are reflected across the blockchain's peer-to-peer -peer network only if it is approved from both ends. Along with asymmetric key cryptography's tamper-proof architecture, its non-repudiation characteristic also helps in keeping the network stable. We can also use asymmetric key cryptography combined with symmetric key cryptography to monitor SSL or TLS encrypted browsing sessions to make sure nobody can steal our personal information when accessing banking websites or the internet in general. It plays a significant role in verifying website server authenticity, exchanging the necessary encryption keys required and generating a session using those keys to ensure maximum security instead of the rather insecure HTTP website format. Security parameters differ on a session-by-session -session basis, so the verification process is consistent and utterly essential to modern data security. Another great use of the asymmetric key cryptography structure is transmitting keys for symmetric key cryptography. With the most significant difficulty in symmetric encryption being key exchange, asymmetric keys can help clear the shortcoming. The original message is first encrypted using a symmetric key. The key used for encrypting the data is then converted into the ciphertext using the receiver's public key. Now we have two ciphertexts to transmit to the receiver. On receiving both of them, the receiver uses his private key to decrypt the symmetry key. He can then use it to decrypt the original information on getting the key used to encrypt the data. While this may seem more complicated than just asymmetry key cryptography alone, symmetric encryption algorithms are much more optimized for vast amounts of data on some occasions. Encrypting the key using asymmetric algorithms will definitely be more memory efficient and secure. You might remember us discussing why symmetric encryption was called private key cryptography. Let us understand why asymmetric falls under the public key cryptography. We have two keys at our disposal. The encryption key is available to everyone. The decryption key is supposed to be private. Unlike symmetric key cryptography, there is no need to share anything privately to have an encrypted messaging system. To put that into perspective, we share our email address with anyone looking to communicate with us. It is supposed to be public by design so that our email login credentials are private and they help in preventing any data mishandling. Since there is nothing hidden from the world, if they want to send us any encrypted information, this category is called the public key cryptography. There are quite a few algorithms being used today that follow the architecture of asymmetric cryptography, none more famous than the RSA encryption. RSA encryption is the most widely used encryption or public key encryption standard using asymmetric key approach. Named after its founders, Rivest, Shamir and Edelman, it uses block ciphers to obscure the information. If you are unfamiliar with how block ciphers work, they are encryption algorithms that divide the original data into blocks of equal size. The block size depends on the exact cipher being used. Once they are broken down, these blocks are encrypted individually and later chained together to form the final ciphertext. Widely considered to be the most 
secure form of encryption, albeit relatively slower than symmetric encryption algorithms, it is widely used in web browsing, secure identification, VPNs, emails, and other chat applications. With so many variables in play, there must be some advantages that give asymmetric cryptography an edge over the traditional symmetric encryption methodologies. Let's go through some of them. There is no need for any reliable key sharing channel in asymmetric encryption. It was an added risk in private key cryptography that has been completely eliminated in public key architecture. The key which is made public cannot decrypt any confidential information and the only key that can decrypt doesn't need to be shared publicly under any circumstance. We have much more extensive key lengths in RSA encryption and other asymmetric algorithms like 2048-bit key and 4096-bit keys. Larger keys are much harder to break into via brute force and are much more secure. Asymmetric key cryptography can use as a proof of authenticity since only the rightful owner of the keys can generate the messages to be decrypted by the private key. The situation can also be reversed. Encryption is done using a private key and decryption is done by the public key, which would not function if the correct private key is not used to generate the message, hence proving the authenticity of the owner. It also has a tamper protection feature where the message cannot be intercepted and changed without invalidating the private key used to encrypt the data. Consequently, the public key cannot decrypt the message and it is easy to realize the information is not 100% legitimate when and where the case requires. Now that we have a proper revision, let's understand what digital signatures are before moving on to the algorithm. The objective of digital signatures is to authenticate and verify documents and data. This is necessary to avoid tampering and digital modification or forgery of any kind during the transmission of official documents. They work on the public key cryptography architecture with one exception. Typically, an asymmetric key system encrypts using a public key and decrypts with a private key. For digital signatures, however, the reverse is true. The signature is encrypted using a private key and is decrypted with the public key. Because the keys are inked together, decoding it with the public key verifies that the proper private key was used to sign the document, thereby verifying the signature's provenance. Let's go through each step to understand the procedure thoroughly. In step 1, we have M, which is the original plain text message and it is passed on to a hash function denoted by H hash to create a digest. Next, it bundles the message together with the hash digest and encrypts it using the sender's private key. It sends the encrypted bundle to the receiver who can decrypt it using the sender's public key. Once the message is decrypted, it is passed through the same hash function h hash to generate a similar digest. It compares the newly generated hash with the bundled hash value received along with the message. If they match, it verifies data integrity. In many instances, they provide a layer of validation and security to messages through a non-secure channel. Properly implemented, a digital signature gives the receiver reason to believe that the message was sent by the claimed sender. Digital signatures are equivalent to traditional handwritten signatures in many respects but properly implemented digital signatures are more difficult to forge than the handwritten type. Digital signature schemes in the sense used here are cryptographically based and must be implemented properly to be effective. They can also provide non-repudiation, meaning that the signer cannot successfully claim that they did not sign a message while also claiming their private key remains secret. Further, some non-repudiation schemes offer a timestamp for the digital signature so that even if the private key is exposed, the signature is valid. To implement the concept of digital signature in real world, we have two primary algorithms to follow. The RSA algorithm and the DSA algorithm, but the latter is a topic of learning today. So let's go ahead and see what the digital signature algorithm is supposed to do. Digital signature algorithm is a FIPS standard which is the Federal Information Processing Standard for Digital Signatures. It was proposed in 1991 and globally standardized in 1994 by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as the NIST. 
it functions on the framework of modular exponential and discrete logarithmic problems which are difficult to compute as a force brute system. Unlike DSA, most signature types are generated by signing message digest with the private key of the originator. This creates a digital thumbprint of the data. Since just the message digest is signed, the signature is generally much smaller compared to the data that was signed. As a result, digital signatures impose less load on processors at the time of signing execution and they use small volumes of bandwidth. DSA on the other hand does not encrypt message digest using private key or decrypt message digest using public key. Instead, it uses mathematical functions to create a digital signature consisting of two 160-bit numbers which are originated from the message digests and the private key. DSAs make use of the public key for authenticating the signature but the authorization process is much more complicated when compared with RSA. DSA also provides three benefits which is the message authentication, integrity verification and non-repudiation. In the image, we can see the entire process of DSA validation. A plain text message is passed on to a hash function where the digest is generated which is passed on to a signing function. Signing function also has other parameters like a global variable G, a random variable K and the private key of the sender. The outputs are then bundled onto a single pack with the plain text and sent to the receiver. The two outputs we receive from the signing functions are the two 160-bit numbers denoted by S and R. On the receiver end, we pass the plain text through the same hash function to regenerate the message digest. It is passed onto verification function which has other requirements such as the public key of the sender, global variable G and SNR received from the sender. The value generated by the function is then compared to R. If they match, then the verification process is complete and data integrity is verified. This was an overview of the way the DSA algorithm works. We already know it depends on logarithmic functions to calculate the outputs. So let us see how we can do the same in our next section. We have three phases here. The first of which is key generation. To generate the keys, we need some prerequisites. We select a queue which becomes a prime divisor. We select a prime number p such that p minus 1 mod q equal to 0. We also select a random integer g which must satisfy the two formulas being mentioned on the screen right now. Once these values are selected, we can go ahead with generating the keys. The private key can be denoted by x and it is any random integer that falls between the bracket of 0 and the value of q. The public key can be calculated as y equal to g to the power x mod p where y stands for the public key. The private key can then be packaged as a bundle which comprises of values of p, q, g and x. Similarly, the public key can also be packaged as a bundle having the values of p, q, g and y. Once we're done with key generation, we can start verifying the signature and this generation. Repeat. Once the keys are generated, we can start generating the signature. The message is passed through a hash function to generate the digest H first. We can choose any random integer k which falls under the bracket of 0 and q. To calculate the first 160-bit number of a signing function of R, we use the formula g to the power k mod p into mod q. Similarly, to calculate the value of the second output that is s, we use the following formula that is shown on the screen. The signature can then be packaged as a bundle having r and s. This bundle along with the plain text message is then passed on to the receiver. Now with the third phase, we have to verify the signature. We first calculate the message digest received in the bundle by passing it to the same hash function. We calculate the value of w, u1 and u2 using the formulas shown on the screen. We have to calculate a verification component which is then to be compared with the value of r being sent by the sender. This verification component can be calculated using the following formula. Once calculated, this can be compared with the value of r. If the values match, 
then the signature verification is successful and our entire process is complete starting from key generation to the signature generation all the way up to the verification of the signature. With so many steps to follow, we are bound to have a few advantages to boot this and we would be right to think so. DSA is highly robust in the security and stability aspect when compared to alternative signature verification algorithms. We have a few other ciphers that to aim to achieve the simplicity and the flexibility of DSA but it has been a tough ask for all the other suits. The key generation is much faster when compared to the RSA algorithm and such. While the actual encryption and decryption process may falter a little in comparison, a quicker start in the beginning is well known to optimize a lot of frameworks. DSA requires less storage space to work its entire cycle. In contrast, its direct correspondent, that is RSA algorithm, needs a certain amount of computational and storage space to function efficiently. This is not the case with DSA, which has been optimized to work with weaker hardware and lesser resources. The DSA is patented, but NIST has made this patent available worldwide royalty-free. A draft version of the speculation FIPS 18865 indicates that DSA will no longer be approved for digital signature generation, but it may be used to verify signatures generated prior to the implementation date of that standard. The RSA algorithm is a public key signature algorithm developed by Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir and Leonard Edelman. Their paper was first published in 1977 and the algorithm uses logarithmic functions to keep the working complex enough to withstand brute force and streamlined enough to be fast post-deployment. RSA can also encrypt and decrypt general information to securely exchange data along with handling digital signature verification. Let us understand how it achieved this. We take our plain text message M. We pass it through a hash function to generate the digest H, which is then encrypted using the sender's private key. This is appended to the original plain text message and sent over to the receiver. Once the receiver receives the bundle, we can pass the plain text message through the same hash function to generate a digest and the ciphertext can be decrypted using the public key of the sender. The remaining hashes are compared. If the values match, then the data integrity is verified and the sender is authenticated. Apart from digital signatures, the main case of RSA is encryption and decryption of private information before being transmitted across communication challenge. This is where the data encryption comes into play. When using RSA for encryption and decryption of general data, it reverses the key set usage. Unlike signature verification, it receives the receiver's public key to encrypt the data and uses the receiver's private key in decrypting the data. Thus, there is no need to exchange any keys in this scenario. There are two broad components when it comes to RSA cryptography. One of them is key generation. Key generation employs a step of generating the private and the public keys that are going to be used for encrypting and decrypting the data. The second part is the encryption and decryption functions. These are the ciphers and steps that need to be run when scrambling the data or recovering the data from the ciphertext. You will now understand each of these steps in our next subtopic. Keeping the previous two concepts in mind, let us go ahead and see how the entire process works starting from creating the key pair to encrypting and decrypting the information. You need to generate the public and private keys before running the functions to generate ciphertext and plain text. To use certain variables and parameters all of which are explained. We first use two large prime numbers which can be denoted by P and Q. We can compute the value of n as n equal to p into q and compute the value of z as p minus 1 into q minus 1. A number e is chosen at random satisfying the following conditions and a number d is also selected at random following the formula e d mod z equal to 1 and it can be calculated with the formula given below. The public key is then packaged as a bundle with n and e and the private key is packaged as a bundle using n and d. This sums up the key generation process. For the encryption and decryption function, we use the formula C and M. The ciphertext can be calculated as C equal to M to the power E mod N and the plain text can be calculated from the ciphertext as C power D mod N. When it comes to a data encryption example, 
Let's take p and q as 7 and 13. The value of n can be calculated as 91. If we select the value of e to be 5, it satisfies all the criteria that we needed to. The value of d can be calculated using the following function which gives it as 29. The public key can then be packaged as 91,5 and the private key can then be packaged as 91,29. The plain text if it is 10 which is denoted by m. Ciphertext can be calculated to the formula c equal to m to the power e mod n which gives us 82. If somebody receives this ciphertext, they can calculate the plain text using the formula c to the power d mod n which gives us the value of 10 as selected as our plain text. We can now look at the factors that make the RSA algorithm stand out versus its competitors in the advantageous topics of this lesson. RSA encryption depends on using the receiver's public key so that you don't have to share any secret key to receive the messages from others. This was the most glaring flaw faced by symmetric algorithms which were eventually fixed by asymmetric cryptography structure. Since the key pairs are related to each other, a receiver cannot intercept the message since they do not have the correct private keys to decrypt the information. If a public key can decrypt the information, the sender cannot refuse signing it with his private key without admitting the private key is not in fact private anymore. The encryption process is faster than that of the DSA algorithm. Even if the key generation is slower in RSA, many systems across the world tend to reuse the same keys so that they can spend less time in key generation and more time on actual cipher text management. Data will be tamper proof in transit since meddling with the data will alter the usage of the keys. The private key won't be able to decrypt the information, hence alerting the receiver of any kind of manipulation in between. The receiver must be aware of any third party who possesses the private key since they can alter the data mid-transit, the cases of which are rather low. Imagine creating an account on a new website. You provide your email address and set a password that you are confident and you would not forget. What about the website owner? How securely are they going to store your password? For website administrators, they have three alternatives. They can either store the passwords in a plain text format. They can encrypt the passwords using an encryption and decryption key. Or they can store the passwords in a hash value. Let's have a look at each of these. When a password is stored in plain text format, it is considered to be the most unsafe option since anyone in the company can read your passwords. A single hack and a data server breach will expose all the account's credentials without needing any extra effort. To counter this, owners can encrypt the passwords and keep them in the servers as a second alternative. But that would mean they also have to store the decryption key somewhere on their servers. In the event of a data breach or the server hack, both the decryption key and encrypted passwords will be leaked, thus making it a single point of failure. What if there was an option to store the passwords after scrambling them completely, but with no way to decrypt them? This is where hashing comes to play. Since only the hashed values are stored in the server, no encryption is needed. With no plain text passwords to protect, your credentials are safe from the website administrators. Considering all the pros, hashed passwords are the industry standard when it comes to storing credentials nowadays. Before getting too deep into the topic, let's get a brief overview of how hashing works. Hashing is the process of scrambling a piece of information or data beyond recognition. We can achieve this by using hash functions, which are essentially algorithms that perform mathematical operations on the main plain text. The value generated after passing the plain text information through the hash function is called the hash value, digest, or in general, just the hash of the original data. While this may sound similar to encryption, the major difference is hashes are meant to be irreversible. No decryption key can convert a digest back to its original value. However, a few hashing algorithms have been broken due to the increase in computational complexity of today's new generation computers and processors. There are new algorithms that stand the test of time and are still in use among multiple areas for password storage, identity verification, etc. Like we discussed earlier, websites use hashing to store the user's passwords. So how do they make use of these hash passwords? When a user signs up to create a new account, the password is then run through the hash function 
and the resulting hash value is stored on the servers. So the next time a user comes to log into the account, the password he enters is passed to the same hash function and compared to the hash stored on the main server. If the newly calculated hash is the same as the one stored on the website server, the password must have been correct because according to hash functions terminology, same inputs will always provide the same outputs. If the hashes do not match, then the password entered during login is not the same as the password entered during the sign up. Hence, the login will be denied. This way, no plain text passwords get stored, preventing both the owner from snooping on user data and protecting users' privacy in the unfortunate event of a data breach or a hack. Apart from password storage, hashing can also be used to perform integrity checks. When a file is uploaded on the internet, the file's hash value is generated and it is uploaded along with the original information. When a new user downloads the file, he can calculate the digest of the downloaded file using the same hash function. When the hash values are compared, if they match, then file integrity has been maintained and there has been no data corruption. Since so much important information is being passed onto the hash function, we need to understand how they work. A hash function is a set of mathematical calculations operated on two blocks of data. The main input is broken down into two blocks of similar size. The block size is dependent on the algorithm that is being used. Hash functions are designed to be one way. They shouldn't be reversible, at least by design. Some algorithms like the previously mentioned MD5 have been compromised, but most secure algorithms are being used today, like the SHAF MLF algorithms. The digest size is also dependent on the respective algorithm being used. MD5 has a digest of 128 bits, while SHA256 has a digest of 256 bits. This digest must always be the same for the same input, irrespective of how many times the calculations are carried out. This is a very crucial feature since comparing the hash value is the only way to check if the data is untouched as the functions are not reversible. There are certain requirements of a hash function that need to be met before they are accepted. While some of them are easy to guess, others are placed in order to preserve security in the long run. The hash function must be quick enough to encrypt large amounts of data at a relatively fast pace, but it also shouldn't be very fast. Running the algorithm on all cylinders makes the functions easy to brute force and a security liability. There must be a balance to allow the hash function to handle large amounts of data and not make it ridiculously easy to brute force by running through all the possible combinations. The hash function must be dependent on each bit of the input. The input can be text, audio, video, or any other file extension. If a single character is being changed, it doesn't matter how small that character may be, the entire digest must have a distinctly different hash value. This is essential to create unique digests for every password that is being stored. But what if two different users are using the same password? Since the hash function is the same for all users, both the digests will be the same. This is called a hash collision. You may think this must be a rare occasion where two users have exactly the same password, but that is not the case. We have techniques like salting that can be used to reduce these hash collisions as we will discuss later in this video. You would be shocked to see the most used passwords of 2020. All of these passwords are laughably insecure and since many people use the same passwords repeatedly on different websites, hash collisions risks are more common than one would expect. Let's say the hash functions find two users having the same password. How can they store both the hashes without messing up the original data? This is where salting and peppering come to play. Salting is the process of adding a random keyword to the end of the input before it is passed on to the hash function. This random keyword is unique for each user on the system and it is called the salt value or just the salt. So even if two passwords are exactly the same, the salt value will differ and so will the digest. There is a small problem with this process though. Since the salt is unique for each user, they need to be stored in the database along with the passwords and sometimes even in plain text to speed up the process of continuous verification. If the server is hacked, then the hashes will need to be brute forced, which takes a lot of time. But if they receive the salts as well, the entire process becomes very fast. 
This is something that peppering aims to solve. Peppering is the process of adding a random string of data to the input before passing them to the hash function. But this time the random string is not unique for each user. It is supposed to be common for all users in the database and the extra bit added is called the pepper in this case. The pepper is in stored on the servers. It is mostly hard coded onto the website source code since it's going to be the same for all credentials. This way, even if the servers get hacked, they will not have the right pepper needed to crack into all the passwords. Many websites use a combination of salting and peppering to solve the problem of hash collision and bolster security. Since brute force takes such a long time, many hackers avoid taking the effort. The returns are mostly not worth it and the possible combinations of using both salting and peppering is humongous. With the consensus aiming towards an educated public on digital privacy, it's no surprise to see an increasing interest in encryption algorithms. We have already covered the major names like the DES and the AES algorithm. MD5 algorithm was one of the first hashing algorithms to take the global stage as a successor to the MD4. Despite the security vulnerabilities encountered in the future, MD5 still remains a crucial part of data infrastructure in a multitude of environments. The MD5 hashing algorithm is a one-way cryptographic function that accepts a message of any length as input and it returns as output a fixed length digest value to be used for authenticating the original messages. The digest size is always 128 bits irrespective of the input. The MD5 hash function was originally designed for use as a secure cryptographic hash algorithm to authenticate digital signatures. MD5 has also been depreciated for uses other than as a non-cryptographic checksum to verify data integrity and detect unintentional data corruption. Ronald Rivest, founder of RSA Data Security and Institute professor at MIT, designed MD5 as an improvement to a prior message digest algorithm which was the MD4. As already iterated before, the process is straightforward. We pass a plain text message to the MD5 hash functions which in turn perform certain mathematical operations on the clear text to scramble the data. The 128-bit digest received from this is going to be radically different from the plain text. The goal of any message digest function is to produce digests that appear to be random. To be considered cryptographically secure, the hash function should meet two requirements. First, that it is impossible for an attacker to generate a message that matches a specific hash value and second, that it is impossible for an attacker to create two messages that produce the same hash value. Even a slight change in the plain text should trigger a drastic difference in the two digests. This goes a long way in preventing hash collisions which take place when two different plain texts have the same digest. To achieve this level of intricacy, there are a number of steps to be followed before we receive the digest. Let us take a look at the detailed procedure as to how the MD5 hash algorithm works. The first step is to make the plain text compatible with the hash function. To do this, we need to pad the bits in the message. When we receive the input string, we have to make sure the size is 64 bits short of a multiple of 512. When it comes to padding the bits, we must add 1 first followed by zeros to round out the extra characters. This prepares a string to have a length of just 64 bits less than any multiple of 512. Here on out, we can proceed on to the next step where we have to pad the length bits. Initially in the first step, we appended the message in such a way that the total length of the bits in the message was 64 bits short of any multiple of 512. Now we add the length bits in such a way that the total number of bits in the message is perfectly a multiple of 512. That means 64 bit lengths to be precise are added to the message. Our final string to be hashed is now a definite multiple of 512. The next step would be to initialize the message digest buffer. The entire hashing plain text is now broken down into 512 bit blocks. There are four buffers or registers that are of 32 bits each named A, B, C and D. These are the four words that are going to store the values of each of these sub blocks. 
The first iteration to follow these registers will have fixed hexadecimal values as shown on the screen below. Once these values are initialized, of these 512 blocks, we can divide each of them into 16 further sub-blocks of 32 bits each. For each of these sub-blocks, we run 4 rounds of operations having the 4 buffer variables A, B, C and D. These rounds require the other constant variables as well, which differ with each round of operation. The constant values are stored in a random array of 64 elements. Since each 32-bit sub-block is run 4 times, 16 such sub-blocks equal 64 constant values needed for a single block iteration. The sub-blocks can be denoted by the alphabet M and the constant values are denoted by the alphabet T. Coming to the actual round of operation, we see our 4 buffers which already have pre-initialized values for the first iteration. At the very beginning, the values of buffers B, C and D are passed on to a non-linear logarithmic function. The formula behind this function changes by the particular round being worked on as we shall see later in this video. Once the output is calculated, it is added to the raw value stored in buffer A. The output of this addition is added to the particular 32-bit sub-block using which we are running the four operations. The output of this requisite function then needs to be added to a constant value derived from the constant array k. Since we have 64 different elements in the array, repeat. Since we have 64 different elements in the array, we can use a distinct element for each iteration of a particular block. The next step involves a circular shift that increases the complexity of the hash algorithm and is necessary to create a unique digest for each individual input. The output generated is later added to the value stored in the buffer B. The final output is now stored in the second buffer of B of the output register. Individual values of C, D and A are derived from the preceding element before the iteration started, meaning the value of B gets stored in C, value of C gets stored in D and the value of D in A. Now that we have a full register ready for this sub-block, the values of A, B, C, D are moved on as input to the next sub-block. Once all 16 sub-blocks are completed, the final register value is saved and the next 512-bit block begins. At the end of all these blocks, we get a final digest of the MD5 algorithm. Regarding the non-linear process mentioned in the first step, the formula changes for each round it's being run on. This is done to maintain the computational complexity of the algorithm and to increase randomness of the procedure. The formula for each of the four rounds uses the same parameters that is B, C and D to generate a single output. The formulas being used are shown on the screen right now. Algorithm. Unlike the latest hash algorithm families, a 32-bit digest is relatively easier to compare when verifying the digests. They don't consume a noticeable amount of disk storage and are comparatively easier to remember and reiterate. Passwords need not be stored in plain text format, making them accessible for hackers and malicious actors. When using digest, the database security also gets a boost since the size of all the hash values will be the same. In the event of a hack or a breach, the malicious actor will only receive the hashed values so there is no way to regenerate the plain text which would be the user passwords in this case. Since the functions are irreversible by design, hashing has become a compulsion when storing user credentials on the server nowadays. A relatively low memory footprint is necessary when it comes to integrating multiple services into the same framework without a CPU overhead. The digest size is the same and the same steps are run to get the hash value irrespective of the size of the input string. This helps in creating a low requirement for computational power and is much easier to run on older hardware which is pretty common in server farms around the world. We can monitor file corruption by comparing hash values before and after transit. Once the hashes match, file integrity checks are valid and we can avoid data corruption. Hash functions will always give the same output for the similar input irrespective of the iteration parameters. It also helps in ensuring that the data hasn't been tampered with en route to the receiver of the message. 
We use our Wi-Fi every day for work and we use the internet for entertainment and communication. The dependency on technology is at an all-time high thanks to the radical developments and innovation in these last two decades. A big portion of this belongs to ensuring secure channels of communication and data transmission. The secure hash algorithm are a family of cryptographic hash functions that are published by the National Institute of Standards and Technology along with the NSA. It was passed as a Federal Information Processing Standard also known as FIPS. It has four different families of hash functions. SSJ0 is a 160-bit hash function published in 1993 and it was closed down later after an undisclosed significant flaw. SHA-1 is also a 160-bit hash function which resembles the earlier MD5 algorithm. This was designed by the NSA to be a part of the digital signature algorithm. SHA-2 is a family of two similar hash functions with different block sizes known as the SHA-256 and the SHA-512. They differ in the word size. SHA-256 uses 32-bit words while SHA-512 uses 64-bit words. SHA-3 is a hash function properly known as KCAC. It was chosen in 2012 after a public competition among non-NSA designers. It supports the same hash lengths as SHA-2 and its internal structure differs significantly from the rest of the SHA family. As we have already iterated, the process is straightforward. We pass a plain text message to the SHA hash function, which in turn performs certain mathematical operations on the clear text to scramble the data. The 160-bit digest received from this is going to be radically different from the plain text. The goal of any hash function is to produce digests that appear to be random. To be considered cryptographically secure, the hash function should meet two requirements. First, that it is impossible for an attacker to generate a message that matches a specific hash value. And second, it should be impossible for an attacker to create two messages producing the exactly same hash value. Even a slight change in the plain text should trigger a drastic difference in the two digests. This goes a long way in preventing hash collisions, which takes place when two different plain texts have the same digest. The SHA family functions have some characteristics that they need to follow while generating the digests. Let's go through a few of them. The length of the clear text should be less than 2 to the power 64 bits in the case of SHA1 and SHA256. This is essential to keep the plain text compatible with the hash function and the size needs to be in comparison area to keep the digest as random as possible. The length of the hash digest should be 256 bits in the SHA256 algorithm, 512 bits in the SHA512 algorithm and so on. Bigger digest usually suggests significantly more calculations at the cost of speed and space. We typically go for the longest digest to bolster security, but there must be a definite balance between the speed and security of a hash function. By design, all hash functions of the SHA 512, SHA 256 are irreversible. You should neither get a plain text when you have the digest beforehand, nor should the digest provide the original value when you pass it through the same hash function again. Another case of protection is that when the hash digest is passed into the SHA function for a second time, we should get a completely different digest from the first instance. This is done to reduce the chance of brute force attacks. To achieve this level of intricacy, there are a number of steps to be followed before we receive the digest. Let us take a look at the detailed procedure as to how the SHA algorithm works. The first step is to make the plain text compatible with the hash function. To do this, we need to pad the bits in the message. When you receive the input string, you have to make sure the size is 64 bits short of a multiple of 512. When it comes to padding the bits, you must add one first followed by the remaining zeros to round out the extra characters. This prepares a string to have a length just 64 bits less than any multiple of 512. Here on out, we can proceed to the next step where we have to pad the length bits. Initially in the first step, we appended the message in such a way that the total number of bits in the message was 64 bits short from becoming a multiple of 512. 
Now we add the length of bits in such a way that the total number of bits in the message is a perfect multiple of 512. That means 64 bits plus the length of the original message becomes a multiple of 512. This becomes a final string that needs to be hashed. In the next step, we have to initialize these chaining variables. The entire plain text message can now be broken down into blocks of 512 bits each. Unlike other hash algorithms like MD5, which use 4 registers or buffers, SHA family use 5 buffers of 32 bits each. They are named A, B, C, D and E. These registers go through multiple rounds of operation, where the first iteration has fixed hexadecimal values as can be seen in the screen. Moving on, we have to process each of the 512 bit blocks by breaking each of them into 16 sub blocks of 32 bits each. Each of them goes through 4 rounds of operation that use the entire register and have the 512 bit block along with the constant array. Out of those 4 rounds, each round has 20 iterations. So in general, we have 80 rounds sum total. The constant value of k is an array of 80 elements. Of those 80, 16 elements are being used each round, so that comes out to 80 rounds for each of those elements. The value of t differs by the number of rounds as can be seen in the table below. A single formula is necessary to calculate the output of each round and iteration. The formula can be ABCDE register is equal to E plus a non-linear process P along with a circular shift of A plus WT plus KT. In this formula, ABCD is the register value of the chaining variables as we discussed before. P is the logical process which has a different formula for each round. S5 is a circular shift by 5 bits. And WT is a 32 bit string derived from the existing subblock. This can be calculated depending on the iteration at hand. And KT signifies a single element of the 80 character element array, which changes depending on the particular round at hand. For the values of WT, the first 16 values are the same as that of the subblocks, so there is no extra calculation needed. For the next 64 elements, the value of WT can be calculated as shown in the formula here. To better understand this, let's take a look at how each of this goes in a sequential process. We have our initial register using the 5 words of 32 bits each. In the first step, we put the values of A, B, C and D to the subsequent register as the output. Next, we use a non-linear process P that changes depending on the round and uses the values of B, C and D as input. Whatever output is generated from the non-linear process, it is added with the value of the E register. Next, the value of A is circular shifted by 5 bits and is added with the output generated in the previous step. The next step is adding the value of WT and the constant element of KT. The current output is then stored in the register A. Similarly, this iteration is repeated every round and for each subblock in the process. Once all the registers are complete and all the subblocks are joined together to form the single ciphertext message, we will have our hashed output. Regarding the non-linear process P that uses the values of B, C and D as input, the formula changes every round to maintain a complexity of the program that can withstand brute force attacks. Depending on the round, the values are passed through a logical operation, which is then added with the values of WT, KT and so on. Now that we understand how to get our hash digest from the plain text, let us learn about the advantages we obtain when using the SHA hash algorithm instead of relying on data in a plain text format. Digital signatures follow asymmetric encryption methodology to verify the authenticity of a document or a file. Hash algorithms like SHA-256 and the industry standard SHA-512 go a long way in ensuring the verification of signatures. Passwords need not be stored in a plain text format which makes them accessible to hackers and other malicious actors. When using Digest, the database security also gets a boost since the size of all hash values will be the same. In the event of a hack or a breach, the malicious actor will only receive the hash values with no way to regenerate the plain text. 
In this case, the plain text would be user credentials. Since the hash functions are irreversible by design, it has become a compulsion when storing passwords on the servers. The SSL handshake is a crucial segment of the web browsing sessions and it's done using SHA functions. It consists of your web browsers and the web servers agreeing on encryption keys and hashing authentication to prepare a secure connection. It relies on a combination of symmetric and asymmetric algorithms which ensure the confidentiality of the data transmitted between a web server and a web client like the browsers. You can monitor file corruption by comparing hash values before and after transit. Once the hashes match, file integrity checks are valid and data corruption is avoided. Hash functions will always give the same output for the same input, irrespective of the iteration parameters. It also helps in ensuring that the data hasn't been tampered with en route to the receiver of the message. Passwords are by far the most common type of user authentication. They are popular because the theory makes perfect sense to individuals and is reasonably simple to implement for developers. On the other hand, poorly constructed passwords can pose security flaws. A well-designed password-based authentication process does not save the user's actual password. This would make it far too simple for a hacker or a malevolent insider to access all of the system's user accounts. In this video, you will learn how to crack passwords and simultaneously try to make your passwords as brute force resistant as possible. Let's take a look at the topics to be covered today. We start by learning about what is password cracking in general. Next, we take a look at the different techniques of password cracking that hackers use in order to generate user credentials for hacking. Moving on, we take a look at the multiple tools that hackers can use to generate these hashes and the passwords. Finally, we take a look at the steps and the guidelines that users can follow to prevent their passwords from being cracked. Let's start by giving a basic idea about password cracking. Password cracking is the process of identifying an unknown password to a computer or a network resource using a program code. It can also assist a threat actor in gaining illegal access to resources. Malicious actors can engage in various criminal activities with the information obtained through password cracking. The procedure might entail comparing a set of words to guess credentials or using an algorithm to guess the password repeatedly. Password cracking can be done for several reasons, but the most malicious reason is in order to gain unauthorized access to a computer without the owner's awareness. This results in cybercrime, such as stealing passwords for the purpose of accessing banking information. Other non-malicious reasons for password cracking occur when someone has misplaced or forgotten a password. Another example of non-malicious password cracking may take place if a system administrator is conducting tests on password strength as a form of security test. This enables so that the hacker cannot easily access protected systems. The best way that users can protect their passwords from cracking is to ensure that they choose strong passwords. Typically, passwords must contain a combination of mixed case random letters, digits and symbols. Strong passwords should never be actual words. In addition, strong passwords are at least 8 characters long. In many password protected applications, users are notified of the strength of the password they have chosen upon entering it. The user can then modify it and strengthen the password based on the indications of its strength. Now that we understand the basics of password cracking, let's go through the basic techniques hackers use to retrieve passwords from general victims. Asking the customer for their password is simple approach to hacking. A phishing email directs the unwary reader to a counterfeit login page linked with whatever service the hacker wants to access, generally by demanding the user fix some critical security flaw or aid in a database reset. That page then captures their password, which the hacker can subsequently exploit for their own purpose. Social engineering influences the victim to get personal information, such as bank account numbers or passwords. The strategy is popular among hackers because they realize that humans are the gateway to vital credentials and information. Through social engineering, the employee tried and true tactics to exploit and influence age-old human tendencies rather than devising novel means to breach secure and advanced technologies. It has been demonstrated that many firms either lack adequate security or are overly friendly and trustworthy when they should not be. They allow granting access to critical facilities based on a uniform or a sob story. 
A hacker searches a password dictionary for the correct password in the case of a dictionary attack. Password dictionaries cover many themes and a mixture of topics such as politics, movies, and music groups. Users' failure to create a strong password is why this approach efficiently cracks passwords till today. Simply said, this assault employs the same terms that many individuals use as passwords. A hacker can compare the password hash obtained to hashes of the password dictionaries to find the correct plain text password. Now that the passwords have been hashed, the hackers attempt to achieve authentication by breaking the password hash. They accomplish this by employing a rainbow table, which is a set of pre-computed hashes of portable password combinations. Hackers can use the rainbow table to crack the hash, resulting in guessing your password. As a result, it retrieves the password hash from the system and eliminates any need to break it. Furthermore, it does not necessitate the discovery of the password itself. The breach is accomplished if the hash matches. In a brute force assault, the attacker attempts multiple password combinations until the correct one is identified. The attacker uses software to automate this process and run exhaustive password combination in a substantially shorter length of time. With the growth of hardware and technology in recent years, such programs have been invigorated. It won't be quick if your password is more than a few characters lengthy, but it will eventually reveal your password. Brute force assaults can be sped up by throwing more processing resources at them. With so many different techniques coming together to crack passwords, none of them are useful without the right tools. There are a plethora of scripts and snippets of code that can retrieve passwords from either encrypted storage or from the hash digest. Let's go through some of these tools. Kane and Able is a password recovery tool for Microsoft operating systems. It allows easy recovery of various kinds of passwords by sniffing the network, cracking encrypted passwords using dictionary, brute force, and crypt analysis attacks. Recording VoIP conversations, decoding scrambled passwords, recovering wireless network keys, etc. are some of the other features of Kn Enable. The latest version is faster and contains a lot of new features like ARP poison routing, which enables sniffing on switched LANs and man-in-the-middle attacks. The sniffer in this version can also analyze encrypted protocols such as SSH1 and HTTPS while containing filters to capture credentials from a wide range of authentication mechanisms. It also ships routing protocol authentication monitors and route extractors. Dictionary and brute force crackers are also present along with common hashing algorithms and several specific authentications, password hash calculators, and other features. John the Ripper is a password cracking application that was first released in 1996 for Unix-based computers. It was created to evaluate password strength, brute force encrypted hash passwords, and break passwords using dictionary attacks. It can use dictionary attacks, rainbow tables, and other attacks depending on the target type. Rainbow Crack is a password cracking application that uses time memory trade-off algorithm to crack password hashes with rainbow tables. Rainbow tables make password cracking more easier and faster than traditional brute force attacks. It is like a dictionary containing nearly every possible password and the pre-calculated hashes. Creating this kind of dictionary takes much more time than cracking a single hash, but after that, you can use the same dictionary over and over again. This procedure might take a long time. However, once the table is ready, it can break passwords far quicker than brute force methods. With so many tools ready to nab our passwords, there are a certain set of rules users can follow to protect their credentials from being compromised. Let's cover some of these guidelines. Longer passwords are required, making the brute force mechanism tougher to implement. Longer passwords and passphrases have been demonstrated to boost security significantly. However, it is still critical to avoid lengthier passwords that have previously been hacked or that feature often in cracking dictionaries. This password policy encourages users to establish passwords that do not contain personal information. As previously said, most users create passwords utilizing personal information such as hobbies, nicknames, pet or family member names, etc. If a hacker has access to personal information about a specific user, for example via social media, they will test password combinations based on that knowledge. Password regulations should compel users to distinguish between security and convenience. Users should be prohibited from using the same password for all services. 
password sharing between users including those who work in the same department or use the same equipment should be avoided a single breached password doesn't affect your other accounts with this policy some password regulations necessitate the creation of a passphrase rather than a password while passphrases serve the same objective the length make them more difficult to break in addition to letters a good pass should include numbers and symbols passwords may be easier for users to remember than passphrases however the latter is much more breach resistant two factor authentication or 2fa can help secure an online account or even a smartphone 2fa does this by asking the user to provide two forms of information a password or a personal identification pin and a code texted to the user's smartphone or a fingerprint before accessing whatever is secured This helps discourage unauthorized entries to an account without the original owner's permission. At this point, you may wonder why you need a strong password in the first place. Even if most websites are safe, there is still a danger that someone will try to access or exploit your information. A strong password is among the most effective ways to protect your accounts and personal information from hackers. You should follow certain rules and guidelines while creating a strong password. password managers are also recommended to help remember the created passwords for convenience of usage with that being said let's take a look at the topics we are covering today we start by learning about the state of password cracking in today's world and why creating strong passwords is an absolute must for every account next we will look at some guidelines and rules that help strengthen passwords and make password cracking a daunting task for hackers moving on We understand why passphrases have grown in popularity and are being recommended for credential protection over traditional passwords. And finally, we take a look at how password managers help alleviate the problem of creating and remembering complex passwords along with other critical personal information. Let's start by learning about why strong passwords have become an absolute necessity. One of the most common ways that hackers break into computers is by guessing passwords. Simple and commonly used passwords enable intruders to easily gain access and control a computing device. Conversely, a password that is difficult to guess makes it prohibitively difficult for common hackers to break into a machine and will force them to look for another target. The more difficult the password, the lower the likelihood that one's computer will fall victim to an unwanted intrusion. Many individuals opt to tie their websites to something they can readily recall to generally easy, memorable combos. However, This does not make the password unique. In fact, it's the reverse. Passwords are handled by 53% of individuals using their recollections and memory. With modern computational standards, simple passwords take seconds and a couple of minutes at worst to be completely brute forced. According to global surveys, more than 60% of people use the same passwords for their personal and job applications. While this may allow the user never to forget the password, it makes a single point of failure the only pin to drop. If one of the accounts gets breached, all subsequent accounts are as good as hacked. To further elaborate on how you can create strong passwords, let's go through some of the guidelines. Let's go through some do's and don'ts to understand how to create new passwords for our accounts. It is recommended to keep the password length at least 12 characters to ensure brute forcing to be difficult. A combination of upper and lowercase alphabets is an absolute necessity when creating strong passwords. It is also recommended to use numerics along with those alphabets to create a complicated password. Finally, special characters help in making a password much more brute force resistant than any number of alphabets or letters can make. Moving over to the don'ts section, It's absolutely not recommended to keep simple dictionary terms such as computer or even the word password as your credential because those are very easy to be brute forced and are usually present in majority of the dictionary attack word list. Similarly, changing a single alphabet or a single character in a dictionary word does not make it brute force resistant considering there are already algorithms present that can counter this tactic. Using the same character multiple times in a password also reduces the strength and makes it easier to crack for hackers. Apart from using single characters multiple times, following patterns that are present on the traditional English keyboard such as KWERTY or 
the line below the main alphabet such as the Z, X, C, V, B, N, M, etc. make it easier to guess since these are once again common combinations that are present in word lists already. Finally, the most important part being not using personal information such as birthdays, addresses and other important information in the passwords. More often than not, if a hacker is trying to break into your account, there has been some amount of research done, be it via social media or any other medium. If they have already this information present with them, breaking into your account becomes all the more easier. Now that you understand how to create strong password, look at how passphrases have become prevalent as a replacement for plain text passwords. A passphrase is a sentence-like string of words used for authentication that is longer than a traditional password, easy to remember and difficult to crack. Typical passwords range on an average from 8 to 16 characters, while passphrases can reach up to 100 characters or more. Using a long passphrase instead of a short password to create a digital signature is one of the many ways that users can strengthen the security of their data, devices and accounts. The longer a passphrase is, the more likely a user is to incorporate bits of entropy or factors that make it less predictable to potential attackers. As more websites, applications and services increase the user security requirements, a passphrase is a fast and easy way to meet these criteria. Let's take a look at some of the advantages that passphrases have over common passwords. Passphrases are simpler to remember than just a random assortment of symbols and characters. It's easier to comprehend a line from your favorite song or a quotation than a short but difficult password. Passwords are reasonably easy for humans and robots to guess or crack. Online thieves have also advanced and created cutting-edge hacking tools to crack even the most complex passwords. Passphrases are nearly hard to crack since most efficient password cracking programs fail at approximately 10 characters. As a result, even the most sophisticated cracking tool will be unable to guess brute force or pre-compute these passwords. Compliance with password setting rules with ease are passphrases. The usage of punctuation and upper and lower case passwords satisfy the password complexity criteria. Most operating systems and apps support passphrases. Phrases of up to 127 characters are permitted on all major operating systems including Windows, Linux and Mac. As a result, for optimal protection you can use lengthier passphrases. But when creating a strong password, the major problem people come across is remembering these passwords or the passphrases. This is where you can find a use for a password manager. When you establish accounts or change passwords, password managers generate new strong passwords and they keep all of them in one place protected by a single strong master password. If you maintain your master password, the manager will retain everything else including your username, and passphrases and fill them in for you whenever you sign on to a website or app on your computer or phone. There is no good memory needed for this. This implies that everyone may use the most recent suggestions for strong passwords such as extended phrases, symbols, grammar and capitalization. Password managers enable consumers to write a single master password and automatically fill each website with their own unique set of credentials. And not just passwords, credit card information may be stored securely with several password managers. Some others make multi-factor authentication or use a second test such as answering a question once the correct password is input, which is a simple and effective solution to verify legitimate login inputs. Among the global players in password managers, services like Bitwarden, KeePass and Dashlane have been running for years now and are very worthy recommendations if you want to get started with password management. Now that we understand what is hacking, let's take a look at some points to know whether our system is already hacked or not. The first point regarding how to check whether our system is hacked or not can be cases where the system security is switched off by unknown means and it is not visible to the user. This is one of the most primary checkpoint to know if our system is hacked or not. Next point to check whether a system is hacked or not would be frequent antivirus software failures which are due to the interference from hacking attempts performed by a professional hacker or a cyber criminal. 
Then we also face problems regarding system's reaction speed, which is affected due to the execution of unknown applications in the background of the system, which also affects the hardware resources in the device. Next, we also face problems regarding passwords, which are no longer working or are changed without a user's intervention, which might indicate that there was some unknown hacking activity that took place in our account. Let's take a look at some more points regarding the topic. There are often cases when the system's cursor move on its own and perform tasks indicating that the system is being used by someone else using an illegal hacking method. There are also cases when we often see files and folders being created in the storage disk on the system, which is unknown to us. To better understand the points regarding how to identify whether our system is hacked or not, let's take a look. Then let's start with the first point. If we want to check whether a system is hacked or not, the first point would be to choose the settings option and using privacy and security and moving on to the window security. This option that is available on our system allows us to see various protection applications that are available on the system. If we see any problem regarding any one of them, for example, apps and browser control, in my system it says there's a problem with it, which might be due to hacking attempts that was done on my system. Now let's take a look at the other option, how we can check whether our system is hacked or not. That would be checking the antivirus software that is installed in our system. If you face problems regarding that, this might be the issue. According to my antivirus software, it says my computer is at risk. This might be due to the interference from a cyber criminal or a hacker while using different illegal softwares during its hacking attempt. Then there are also cases where we see there are unknown programs being executed in the background of our system, which we can take a look using the task manager software. Using the task manager, we can take a look at each and every application that is being executed in the system and see the origin. If we find any unknown program or application, we can assume that it might be due to a hacking attempt. Moving on, if we want to check further whether our system is hacked or not, we can check for files or folders that are being created unknown to us. For example, this unknown folder, which contains some security details that are unknown to me. This might be also due to a hacking attempt by a hacker or a cyber criminal. Then there are also cases when the system's cursor move on its own and perform tasks that are not initiated by us and performs copying of different folders or data from one file to other. This is due to a hacking attempt that was done on a system and the hacker has taken control of a system. Then there are also cases regarding login issues or password problem. For example, if I want to access into my account and there's a problem with the password, it might be due to the attempt of hacking into my account by a professional hacker. Seems like there's a problem with the username, which means there was a hacking attempt by a professional hacker. We can further check hacking attempts by accessing a web browser and checking whether there's some extra add-ons or unknown add-ons that wasn't installed by us. This might also indicate a hacking attempt on the system. Now that we are clear about how to check whether a system is hacked or not, let's take a look at some of the countermeasure against hacking. Let's begin. The first point regarding how to avoid hacking is 
do regular manual security checks and keep the system security updated. Using certified antivirus softwares is a basic countermeasure against hacking attempts. And if possible, visit only secure websites for surfing on the internet or use VPN or other internet security applications to mask your system's network to avoid any hacking attempts for the device. Then we have avoid clicking on random web pop-ups and ads to avoid hackers from getting into a system and accessing a device data. And lastly, use strong passwords or complex passwords for your login details. Applying these countermeasures, we can avoid hacking to a certain extent. The concept of instant messaging crossed into the mainstream in the 1990s, allowing friends, acquaintances, colleagues, and like-minded thinkers from all over the world to connect in real time. Since then, instant messaging has revolutionized how we communicate, and today over a billion people are signed up for at least one messaging app. The present instant messaging experience is seamless, and it intuitively integrates features like video, photos, voice, e-commerce, and gaming with plain old messaging. Among these apps, WhatsApp has comfortably found its place among the most popular messaging platforms. Like everyone associated with the internet, a matter of security is never far away. Considering the huge user base of this messaging app, hackers are always on the lookout for compromised accounts to grab. Today, we are going to cover some of the ways we can protect our WhatsApp account from falling into malicious hands. We start by learning about the importance of security when it comes to WhatsApp and instant messaging apps in general. Next, we cover some of the most important steps that should be followed in order to protect our WhatsApp accounts from hackers. Finally, we learn what we should do when a WhatsApp account gets compromised. Let's start by learning why we need to focus on the safety of WhatsApp. In the year of 2020, the big news was about Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos and his phone being hacked by Saudi Arabia. A report coming from The Guardian suggested that Bezos' phone was hacked via a video file sent on WhatsApp. The report said that Bezos' mobile phone was hacked by a Saudi Arabian prince in the year 2018 and gigabytes worth of data was stolen from the device. While there are some issues being raised about the report which states with the medium to high confidence that Jeff Bezos' phone was hacked, it does raise a security fear for regular users. After all, if the phone of one of the world's most powerful men can be hacked, the same can happen to any one of us as well. When it comes to regular users, we exchange messages with our loved ones regarding a paradigm of topics. The information which may seem trivial initially can later function as ammunition for a campaign regarding identity theft. Basic information like preferred banks, occasional dining places can go a long way in social engineering attacks, further increasing the need for secure messaging habits. WhatsApp uses end-to-end -end encryption to protect all communication on its platform. These encryption keys not only make it impossible to decrypt messages, but they also prevent third parties and even WhatsApp from accessing messages or calls. But not entirely. Although end-to-end -end encryption makes WhatsApp more secure than other communication apps, no app is 100% safe to use. Like any application or digital device, WhatsApp is often targeted by bad actors. It also has access to your contacts and tracks where and how long you use it putting your privacy and personal information at risk. We all have access to our cell phones, so it's no surprise that SMS two-factor authentication is one of the most widespread types of MFA available. You don't need any apps or digital keys, and it's not tied to a specific ecosystem. Unfortunately, it's also not a secure multi-factor authentication method. The nature of SMS itself opens up your organization to a host of risks. Hackers may have many ways to leverage SMS to find a way into your accounts and network. Be it via spoofed SIM cards or message hijacking, WhatsApp 2FA using SMS isn't a foolproof solution. Now that we understand the variety of reasons why WhatsApp needs extra security, let's go through some of the ways we can achieve this. It is more than probable that one fine day you might receive a WhatsApp message or even an SMS that reads that your order is delayed, please check its data here, or your account is locked and please unlock it here, or even some tempting messages like win free 3G and movie tickets here. Some of them may sound intimidating and some of them may be lucrative, but they all have one purpose, to trick you into clicking that link. And once you do that, it's already over. 
It will install malware on your phone and you won't have a clue about it. Only when you start noticing that your phone bills are abnormally high or your bank account has been used without your permission, the realization will dawn upon you that something is wrong with your phone. But by then it may be too late. WhatsApp in itself provides various privacy options to users. The messaging platform provides users with option to choose who they want to share their profile photo, status and other details with. It's a good idea to change the settings to contacts only. This means only phone numbers that are saved on your smartphone will be able to see your profile photo, status, phone number and auto-delete status as well. Make sure you enable the option to lock the screen every time WhatsApp is closed. This will ensure no one else but you can open your WhatsApp account. Just head to the settings menu, privacy and select the screen lock option. You will then need to register your fingerprint. After the process is completed, you will have to scan your fingerprint every time you open the WhatsApp app. This adds an extra layer of security. The two-step verification works as an extra layer of security and helps WhatsApp users to protect their OTPs and documents shared through WhatsApp. It is very easy to set up a PIN to activate a two-step verification. Users have to enter it periodically once it is activated. WhatsApp will sometimes keep asking users to enter this six-digit passcode. Users cannot disable this without disabling the two-step verification feature altogether. In case users do not provide WhatsApp with an email ID and want to disable two-step verification, then the number will be permitted to re-verify on WhatsApp without the passcode after seven days. However, the users will lose all pending messages upon re-verifying. We often have the tendency to log into WhatsApp web at the office and then leave the account open on the desktop. This habit can actually create problems for you. Someone else sitting on the same PC can access all your chats without you even realizing it. It's a good practice to log out from WhatsApp web before leaving the office. It just takes a few seconds to log in again by just scanning the code and you're done. All WhatsApp users should ensure that the chats are end-to-end -end encrypted. To verify that a chat is end-to-end -end encrypted, open the chat, tap on the name of the contact to open the contact info screen and then tap encryption to view the QR code and a 60-digit number. WhatsApp end-to-end -end encryption ensures that only you and your contact can read the messages that are being exchanged and nobody in between, not even WhatsApp. With the necessary guidelines out of the way, let us go through the recommended course of action should our WhatsApp accounts be compromised. The first and most important thing that you need to do is report the issue to the WhatsApp support team for assistance. Make sure that you reach out to the support team through its help desk and report the hacking attempt. WhatsApp Help Center will take the shortest time to resolve your issue via email or within the app itself. This will help you to take prompt legal action against the hackers. If you can't access your email, call the support team. In some cases, the support will deactivate your WhatsApp account and request you to reactivate it within 30 days if you don't want it to be deleted completely. When someone compromises your WhatsApp account, they can now send messages to your contacts stating that the company sent your verification code and gain access to their account. That's why one of the first things you'll want to do is send a message to your friends and family letting them know that you've lost access to your account. This action prevents further exploitation of your account and others. Another reason you'll want to let your contacts know you have no access to your WhatsApp account is that they may fish for personal information. From your banking number to your email address, hackers will cleverly attempt to gain as much access to your personal information as possible. WhatsApp Web is an extension of WhatsApp Messenger over the web that facilitates easy synchronization of our smartphone and personal computer. This is the biggest security threat that hackers can easily exploit to get into your personal data over WhatsApp. Therefore, it is highly recommended that you use this WhatsApp feature carefully. Once you notice that your WhatsApp Messenger has been hacked, go to your WhatsApp web and tap or click on the Logout from All Computers option. This will deactivate all the web extensions of your account. Under the unfortunate circumstances where the account recovery doesn't seem likely, you can always ask WhatsApp support to delete your account permanently. While far from the ideal solution, it can act as a fail-safe option if you want to protect your personal data at any cost possible. You can always open a new account later with the security issues mitigated. And before we begin, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity, 
or to become an ethical hacker by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch career with cyber security or ethical hacker by learning from the experts and try giving a shot to simply learn's postgraduate program in cyber security with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Computing the course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered it's no secret that the majority of our internet usage is at the risk of being hacked be it via unsafe messaging applications or misconfigured operating systems to counteract this void of digital security penetration testing has become the norm when it comes to vulnerability assessment kali linux is an operating system that has become a well known weapon in this fight against hackers a linux distribution that is made specifically for penetration testers Kali Linux has layers of features that we will be covering in today's lesson. Let's take a look at the topics to be covered in this video. We start by learning about Kali Linux and a basic explanation of its purpose. We take a look at the history of Kali Linux from the story of its origin to its current day exploits. Next, we learn a few distinct features of Kali that make it an attractive choice for penetration testers worldwide. Finally, We take a look at the multiple ways we can install Kali Linux to start our journey in the world of penetration testing. Let's start by learning about Kali Linux in general. Kali Linux, which is formerly known as Backtrack Linux, is an open-source Linux distribution aimed at advanced penetration testing and security auditing. It contains several hundred tools that are targeted towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics and reverse engineering. Kali Linux is a multiple platform solution accessible and freely available to information security professionals and hobbyists. Among all the Linux distributions, Kali Linux takes its roots from the Debian operating system. Debian has been a highly dependable and stable distribution for many years, providing a similarly strong foundation to the Kali desktop. While the operating system is capable of practically modifying every single part of our installation, the networking components of Kali become disabled by default. This is done to prevent any external factors from affecting the installation procedure, which may pose a risk in critical environments. Apart from boosting security, It allows a deeper element of control to the most enthusiastic of users. We did not get Kali Linux since the first day. How did it come into existence? Let's take a look at some of its history. Kali Linux is based on years of knowledge and experience in building penetration testing and operating systems. During all these project lifelines, there have been only a few different developers as the team has always been small. The first project was called Wopex which stands for White Hat Nopex. As can be inferred from the name, it was based on the Nopex operating system as its underlying OS. Wopex had releases ranging from version 2.0 to 2.7. This made way for the next project which was known as Wax or the long hand being White Hat Slax. The name change was because the base OS was changed from Nopex to Slax. Wax started at version 3 as a nod, it carrying on from Wopex. There was a similar OS being produced at the same time Auditor Security Collection often being shorted to just Auditor which was once again using Nopex its efforts were combined with Wax to produce Backtrack Backtrack was based on Slackware from version 1 to version 3 but switched to Ubuntu later on with version 4 to version 5 using the experience gained from all of this Kali Linux came after Backtrack in 2013 Kali started off using Debian stable as the engine under the hood before moving to Debian testing when Kali Linux became a rolling operating system. Now that we understand the history and the purpose of Kali Linux, let us learn a little more about its distinct features. The latest version of Kali comes with more than 600 penetration tools pre-installed. After reviewing every tool that was included in Backtrack, Developers have eliminated a great number of tools that either simply did not work or which duplicated other tools that provided the same or similar functionality. The Kali Linux team is made up of a small group of individuals who are the only ones trusted to commit packages and interact with the repositories, all of which is done using multiple secure protocols. Restricting access of critical code bases to external assets greatly reduces the risk of source contamination. 
which can cause Kali Linux users worldwide a great deal of damage as a direct victim of cybercrime. Although penetration tools tend to be written in English, the developers have ensured that Kali includes true multilingual support, allowing more users to operate in their native language and locate the tools they need for the job. The more comfortable a user feels with the intricacies of the operating system, the easier it is to maintain a stronghold over the configuration and the device in general. Since ARM-based single board systems like the Raspberry Pi are becoming more and more prevalent and inexpensive, the development team knew that Kali's ARM support would need to be as robust as they could manage with fully working installations. Kali Linux is available on a wide range of ARM devices and has ARM repositories integrated with the mainline distributions, so the tools for ARM are updated in conjunction with the rest of the distribution. All this information is necessary for users to determine if Kali Linux is the correct choice for them. If it is, what are the ways that they can go forward with this installation and start their penetration testing journey? The first way to use Kali Linux is by launching the distribution in the live USB mode. This can be achieved by downloading the installer image file or the ISO file from the Kali Linux website and flashing it to a USB drive with a capacity of at least 8 GB. Some people don't need to save their data permanently and a live USB is the perfect solution for such cases. After the ISO image is flashed, the thumb drive can be used to boot a fully working installation of the operating system with the caveat that any changes made to the OS in this mode are not written permanently. Some cases allow persistent usage in live USBs, but those require further configuration than normal situations. But what if the user wants to store data permanently in the installed OS? The best and the most reliable way to ensure this is the full-fledged hard disk installation. This will ensure the complete usage of the system's hardware capabilities and will take into account the updates and the configurations being made to the OS. This method is supposed to override any pre-existing operating system installed on the computer, be it Windows or any other variant of Linux. The next alternative route for installing Kali Linux would be to use virtualization software such as VMware or VirtualBox. The software will be installed as a separate application on an already existing OS and Kali Linux can be run as an operating system in the same computer as a window. The hardware requirements will be completely customizable starting with the allotted RAM to the virtual hard disk capacity. The usage of both a host and guest operating system like Kali Linux allows users a safe environment to learn while not putting the systems at risk. If you want to learn more about how one can go forward with this method, we have a dedicated video where Kali Linux is being installed on VMware while running on a Windows 10 operating system. You can find the link in the description box to get started with your very own virtual machine. The final way to install Kali Linux is by using a dual boot system. To put it in simple words, the Kali Linux OS will not be overwriting any pre-installed operating system on a machine but will be installed alongside it. When a computer boots up, the user will get a choice to boot into either of these operating systems. Many people prefer to keep both the Windows and Kali Linux installed so the distribution of work and recreational activities is also allotted effectively. It gives users a safety valve should their custom Linux installation run into any bugs that cannot be fixed from within the operating system. Now for the convenience of explanation, we are going to install Kali Linux today on a virtual machine software known as VMware. VMware is able to run multiple operating systems on a single host machine which in our case is a Windows 10 system. To get started with Kali Linux installation, we have to go to the website to download an image file. We go to get Kali and as you can see there are multiple platforms on which this operating system can be inverted. As per our requirement, we are going to go with the virtual machine section as you can see it is already recommended by the developers. This is the download button which will download a 64-bit ISO file. We can download 32-bit but that is more necessary for hard metal machines or if you are going to use it for older devices which do not support 64-bit operating systems yet. After clicking on the download button, we can see we have a window archive which will have the ISO files. For now, we have downloaded the ISO file and it is already present with me. So we can start working on the VMware side of things. 
Once the ISO file is downloaded, we open up VMware Workstation. Go to File and we create a new virtual machine. In these two options, it is highly recommended to go with the typical setup rather than the custom one. The custom is much more advanced and requires much more information from the user, which is beneficial for developers and people who are well versed with virtualization software. But for 90% of the cases, typical setup will be enough. Here we can select the third option, which will be I will install the operating system later. In some operating systems, we can use the ISO file here directly and VMware will install it for us. But for right now, in the case of Kali Linux, the third option is always the safest. Kali Linux is a Linux distribution. So we can select Linux over here and the version, as you can see here, it have multiple versions such as the multiple kernels. Every distribution has a, a parent distribution. For example, Kali Linux has Debian and there are other distributions which are based or forked from some parent distribution. Kali Linux is based off Debian. So we can go with the highest version of Debian, which is the Debian 10.x 64 bit. Go on next. We can write any such name. We can write Kali Linux so that it will be easier to recognize the virtual machine among this list of virtual machine instances. The location can be any location you decide to put. By default, it should be the documents folder, but anywhere you put, it will hold up all the information of the operating system, all the files you download, all the configurations you store, everything will be stored in this particular location that you provide. When we go next, we are asked about the disk capacity. This disk capacity will be all the storage that will be provided to your virtual machine of Kali Linux. Think of your Windows device. If you have a one terabyte of hard drive, you have the entirety of the hard disk to store data on. How much data you give here, you can only store up to that amount of data. Not to mention some amount of capacity will be taken up by the operating system itself to store its programs and applications. For now, we can give around, let's say 15 GB of information. Or if it recommended size for Debian is 20, you can just go ahead at 20. It depends all on the user case. If you are going to use it extensively, you can even go as high as 50 or 60 GB if you have plans to download many more applications and perform multiple different tests. Another option we get over here is storing virtual disks as a single file or storing them into multiple files. As we already know, this virtual machine run entirely on VMware. Sometimes when transferring these virtual machine instances, let's say from a personal computer to a work computer, we're going to need to copy up the entire folder that we had mentioned before over here. Instead, all virtual machines have a portability feature. Now this portability feature is possible for all scenarios, except it is much easier if the split the virtual disk into multiple files. Now, even if this makes porting virtual machines easier from either system to system or software to software. Let's say if you want to switch from VMware to VirtualBox or vice versa, the performance takes a small hit. It's not huge, but it's recommended to go with storing the virtual disk as a single file if you have no purposes of ever moving the virtual machine. Even if you do, it's not a complete stop that it cannot be ported. It's just easier when using multiple files. But in order to get the best performance out of the virtual machine, we can store it as a single file over here. This is a summary of all the changes that we made and all the configurations that have been settled until now. Now at this point of time, we have not provided the .iso file yet, which is the installation file for the Kali Linux that we downloaded from this website. As of right now, we have only configured the settings of the virtual machine. So we can press on finish. And we have Kali Linux in the list. Now, to make the changes further, we press on edit virtual machine settings. The memory is supposed to give the RAM of the virtual machine. The devices with RAM of 8 GB or below that, giving high amount of RAM will cause performance issues and the host system. If the memory has some amount of free storage left, Let's say on idle storage, my Windows machine takes about 2 GB. So I have 6 GB of memory to provide. 
although if you provide all of the 6 GB, it will be much more difficult for the host system to run everything properly. So for this instance, we can keep it as 2 GB of memory for the virtual machine instance. Similarly, we can use the number of processors and we can customize it according to our liking. Let's say if we want to use one processor, but we want to use two different cores, we can select them as well. Hard disk is pre-set up as the SCSI hard disk and it does not need to be changed for the installation of this operating system at all. CDID DVD. This is where the installation file comes. You can think of the ISO file that we downloaded as a pen drive or a USB thumb drive which is necessary to install an operating system. To provide this, we are going to select use ISO image file, we are going to click on browse, go and go to downloads and select the ISO file over here. Select open and you can see it is already loaded up. Next in the network adapter, it is recommended to use NAT. This helps the virtual machine to draw the internet from the host machine settings. If your host machine is connected to the internet, then the virtual machine is connected as well. There are some other options such as host only or custom segments or LAN segments, but those are not necessary for installation. Rest of them are pretty standard which do not need any extra configuration and can be left as it is. Press OK and now we can power on this virtual machine. In this screen we can choose how we want to proceed with the installation. We have a start installer option over here. So we are going to press enter on that. We are going to wait for the things to load from the ISO file. Um, the first step in the installation is choosing the language of the operating system. For this we can go with English as standard. This is a location. This will be used for setting up the time and some of the internal settings which depend entirely on the location of the user. So for this we are going to go with India. Configuring the keyboard it's always recommended to go with the American English first. Many people make a mistake of going with the Indian keyboard if it is possible and it provides a lot of issues later on. So it's always preferred to go with the American English and if later we see some necessity of another keyboard dialect that is required, we can install it later. But for now, we should always stick with American English as a basic. At this point, it's going to load the installation components from the .iso file. It is a big file of 3.6 GB, so it has a lot of components that need to be put into the virtual machine, which can also be used to detect hardware. Once the hardware and the network configuration is done by the ISO file, we want to write a host name for the system. This host name can be anything which is used to recognize this device on a local network or a LAN cable. Let's say if we use the name Kali. Domain name, we can skip it for now. It's not necessary as such for the installation. This is the full name for the user. Let's say we can provide the name as simply learn as a full name. Next, we're going to set up a username. This username is going to be necessary to identify the user from its root accounts and the subsequent below accounts. For now, we can give it as something as simply123. Now we have to choose a password for the user. Now remember, since this is the first user that is being added onto this newly installed operating system, it needs to be a password for the administrator. We can use whichever password we like over here and use the same password below and press on continue. At this point it's going to detect on the components on which the operating system can be installed. Like here, there are multiple options like the use entire disk, use entire disk and set up LVM, use entire disk and set up encrypted LVM. For newcomers it is recommended to just use the first one since LVM encryption is something that you can learn afterwards when you are much more hands on with the Linux operating system. 
For now, we're going to use the use entire disk guided installation and press on continue. When we set up the virtual machine on VMware, we had set up a disk capacity that we gave a purpose 20 GB. That is the hard disk which is being discovered here. Even though it is a virtual disk, on VMware it acts as a normal hard disk on which an operating system can be installed. So we select this one and press on continue. Here there is a multiple partition system. All the operating systems that are installed have different components. One is used for the keeping of the applications, one for the files, other for the RAM management and other things. For newcomers it is always recommended to keep it in one partition and we're going to select that and press on continue. This is just an overview of the partition it's going to make. As you can see it has a primary partition of 20.4 GB and a logical partition of 1 GB used for swap memory. Now these kind of naming can be confusing for people who are not well versed with Linux operating systems or in general virtualization. But for now you can go ahead and press on continue as this will be fine. We can press on finish partitioning and write changes to disk and continue. It's just a confirmation page. As you can see, it's so that SCSI3 is our virtual hard disk of 20 GB disk capacity. We write the changes to the disk. We press yes and click on continue. At this point, the installation has started. Now this installation will take a while depending on the num amount of RAM provided, the processors provided and how quickly the performance of the system is being hampered by the host machine. On quicker systems this will be rather quick while on the smaller ones this will take a while. Since this is going to take some time to install as it is being run on a virtual machine with only 2 GB of RAM, we are going to speed up this part of the video so we don't have to waste any more time just watching the progress bar. Now that our core installation is completed, it's asking us to configure a package manager. The work of a package manager on Linux operating system is similar to the Google Play Store on Android mobile devices and on the App Store for the Apple devices. It's an interface to install external applications which are not installed by default. Let's say for Google Chrome or any other browser which can be used to browse the internet. At this point of time, it's asked us to select a network mirror. We're going to select as yes and move forward with this. Next, it's going to ask us for an HTTP proxy, which we can leave it as blank and press it as continue forward. At this point of time, it's looking for updates to the Kali Linux installation. This will fetch the new builds from the Kali server, so the installation is always updated to the latest version. Now that the package manager is configured, we have the grub bootloader. The grub is used for selecting the operating system while booting up. Its core functionality is to allow the operating system to be loaded correctly without any faults. So at this point of time, if it asks install the grub bootloader to your primary drive, we can select it as yes and press continue. Remember the installation was conducted on dev SDA. So we're going to select installation of the grub loader on the same hard disk that we have configured. We press this one and press continue. So now the grub bootloader is being installed. The grub is highly essential because it, is, it shows the motherboard where to start the operating system from. Even if the operating system is installed correctly and all the files are in correct order, the absence of a bootloader will not be able to launch the OS properly. As you can see, the installation is finally complete. So now we can press on continue and it's going to finalize the changes. Now you can see Kali Linux being booted up straight away. It doesn't check for the ISO file anymore since the operating system is now installed onto the virtual hard disk storage that we had configured before. Here we're going to enter our username and password that we had set up before.
and we have the color Linux system booted up. And this is your home page. We can see the installed applications over here which are being used for penetration testing by multiple security analysts worldwide. All of these come pre-installed with Kali Linux and others can be installed using the APT package manager that we had configured. We can see a full name over here. And with this our installation of the Kali Linux is complete. Hey everyone, it's no secret that the majority of our internet usage is at the risk of getting hacked, be it via unsafe messaging applications or misconfigured operating systems. To counteract this void of digital security, penetration testing has become the norm when it comes to vulnerability assessment. Parrot Security OS is an operating system that has become a well-known weapon in this fight against hackers. A Linux distribution more catered towards penetration testers specifically, Parrot Security has layers of features that we will be covering in today's lesson. Let's take a look at the topics for this video. We start by learning about what Parrot Security is and why it should be considered as a viable alternative next to Kali Linux for penetration testers. Next, we take a look at the minimum system requirements necessary to obtain optimum performance from an installation of Parrot Security. Moving on, we learn about some unique features that make Parrot stand out among the multiple ethical hacking operating systems available on the market. And finally, we look at the multiple ways that Parallel Security OS can be installed, be it on a single system or for portable media. So let's start out by learning what Parallel Security is. Parrot OS is a Debian-based Linux distribution with an emphasis on security, privacy and development. It is built on Debian's testing branch and uses a custom hardened Linux kernel while being founded in 2013. Parrot Security contains several hundred tools targeted towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics, and reverse engineering. It has become a multi-platform solution, accessible and freely available to information security professionals and hobbyists. It features a distinct forensics mode that does not mount any of the system hard disks or partitions and has no influence on the host system making it more stealthy than regular mode. This mode is used on the host system when there is a need for executing forensic procedures. In software development, a rolling release is a paradigm in which software upgrades are rolled out constantly rather than in batches of versions. This ensures that the software is constantly up to date. A rolling release distribution such as Parrot Security OS follows the same concept providing the most recent Linux kernel and software versions as they become available on the market. With the basic introduction to the operating system out of the way, let us have a look at the bare minimum system requirements necessary to be able to run this operating system. First up, we got a CPU requirement which states that a 1 GHz dual core CPU is the absolute minimum in order to use Barrett OS. While multiple core systems will provide more optimum performance, a small beginner has been included. A very distinct thing to be noted is that the operating system can be installed on all variants of chipsets, be it 32-bit, 64-bit and the newly popular ARM portfolio of devices. Unlike Kali Linux, which requires some amount of graphical acceleration needed to display the operating system correctly, Parrot OS has no such requirements and can be used with the leanest of machines. Taking into account the RAM issue, a minimum of 256 MB to 512 MB free RAM provides the optimum usage scenarios. Even when the OS is installed on a hard drive storage media, it should theoretically occupy around 8 GB of information, which may extend up to 16 GB depending on the tools being installed out of the box. When it comes to booting options, we have the option of going with the legacy BIOS settings or with the more modern UEFI settings. These are just some of the requirements for the installation of Parrot Security OS. To understand this process more vividly and to learn how visualization can help install an OS in our existing computer, please follow the link to our Parrot Security installation video linked right above. Let's understand what some of the things that make Parrot Security unique among all the other penetration testing operating systems. Along with all the giant catalog of scripts, Parallel Security has its own custom hardened Linux kernel 
which has been modified explicitly to provide as much security and resistance to hackers as possible as a first line of defense. The configurations in the operating system act as a second gateway, taking care of malicious requests and dropping them off. This is particularly beneficial since should there be a scenario where the latest Linux kernel is causing some particular issue, the Parrot OS development team will most likely iron it out first before passing it on as an update. If the custom hardened kernel wasn't reasoning enough, Parrot security developers managed to install more hacking tools and scripts to ensure a smooth transition for the Gali Linux users. All the tools you found in Gali are present in Parrot OS and then a few extra ones for good measure. And this has been achieved while keeping roughly the same size of the installation file between both operating systems. However, it's not all productivity points for Parrot OS. They provide a choice between two different desktop environments, the made desktop, which comes pre-installed by default, and KDE. For those unfamiliar with Linux terminology, you can think of desktop environments as the main UI for a Linux system. Being highly modular in nature, one can use Kali Linux or Parrot OS while adding another desktop environment which they find appealing. While Kali has only a single option, Parrot OS has managed to provide two optimized builds with made desktop and KDE desktop ready-made on their website. One of the primary advantages of Parrot OS over Kali is that it's relatively lightweight. This implies that it takes significantly less disk space and computing power to function properly with as little as 320 MB of RAM required. In reality, Parrot OS is also designed to operate successfully off a USB stick but Kali Linux does not work well from a USB stick and is generally installed in a virtual machine. Parrot OS can be seen as more of a niche distribution if you are searching for something lighter than Kali Linux. There are multiple ways to go about with this installation. Many people prefer to install it directly onto a hard disk where the Parrot Security OS will overwrite whichever data the hard disk already has. Now this is beneficial if you want to preserve your data for the long term, but this might pose some trouble to people who do not have a spare hard disk or do not want to lose their current installation of Windows operating system. Another way to use Parrot security is by using the live boot, but whatever changes you make to the live boot operating system, those changes are removed the moment we restart or shut down the system. A very good common ground between both these installations is virtualization. Using virtualization software like VMware or VirtualBox, we can install Parrot security on our systems while simultaneously saving our data and having the convenience of a host machine such as a Windows operating system in case things go wrong. To start the installation, we first need to get an ISO file for the Parrot security operating system. This can be found on the current website parrotsec.org. Once we enter the website, move into the download section and select the Get Security Edition over here. Parrot Security OS has multiple desktop environments to you to choose from. These desktop environments serve as a different user interface for the user. For example, right now we have the Mate desktop and the KDE desktop. As you can see from the screenshots, both of these look quite different while having a similar look and feel to them. For our example, let's go with the Mate desktop. We have two options, either we can go with the direct download or we can get the torrent file. For this example, if we press on the download button and our download will start. I have already downloaded this file, but the ISO file provided over here will serve as an installation. It will have around 4.5 GB of space. It will be used to install this operating system in VMware. Once the file is downloaded, we can close this and open VMware Workstation. VMware can also be used as a player version or the workstation version. If you have much more familiarity with using VirtualBox or virtualization application, we can use that as well. Once the VMware is open, we click on File and select a new virtual machine. For the first time installation, we're going to go with the typical and recommended installation procedure instead of an advanced one. If you have already installed multiple virtual machine OSs, going with the advanced option will give you much more control over the hardware customization. But for now, we're going to stick with the typical option. Moving on, it will ask us for a source to where to install the operating system from. 
since we're going to use a live ISO first, we're going to select the third option, which will be I will install the operating system later and press next. As we already know, Parrot Security is a Debian derivative. So when selecting the guest operating system type, we're going to go with Linux. And in the selection, we're going to choose whichever the highest version of Debian is along with a 64-bit OS. We're going to click on next. We're going to name our virtual machine, let's say, Parrot Security OS. We're going to select the location where we want to save the virtual machine. This will have all the hard disks of the operating system installation. We're going to click on next. For the disk size, we're going to specify how much of the current memory are we going to allocate. This is the hard disk memory of the operating system installation. Whatever changes we make in the operating system, whatever applications we install on the virtual instance will all be stored in this amount of memory. While it is recommended to go with at least 15 GB of storage, we can go as high as possible and we're going to select the recommended 20 GB as written. When given the choice of storing the virtual disk as a single or multiple files, many people want to keep their virtual instance in a way so that it helps them stay portable. People change systems and sometimes they want to swap their instances between the work and their personal computer. If there is no portability in mind, storing the virtual disk as a single file gives the best performance and should be the recommended go-to when installing for the first time. We click on next here and it's going to give us a summary of the settings we have already settled till now. We're going to press on finish and there we go. We have our installation first step completed. Here on out, we're going to click on edit virtual machine settings. Here we're going to have a look at some of the requirements that the Parrot Security OS will need. It is known to be a memory lightweight operating system, but just to have the most optimum performance, we're going to provide around 2 GB of RAM from our host system, which is a Windows 10 machine. When it comes to the processors, I'm going to increase it to 2 and the number of cores to 2 as well. So giving out a total 4 processor cores to the operating system. Now this depends on what are your computer rig and how much resources you can justify. So these need to be customized according to the system at hand. Hard disk size has already been set at 20 GB and the rest of them are pretty standard and we can go on. One thing that we need to make sure is selecting the CD DVD IDE. Here we have to use our ISO image file over here. Previously, it should be use physical drive and at auto detect. We're going to use a use ISO image file over here. We're going to click on browse. We're going to go to where we have downloaded the ISO file, which is over here and select it. Press OK here. And we can now power on this virtual machine. At this point of time, there are two options. We can go with the try install option using the graphical user interface or we can go using the terminal mode. To get a better user experience, we're going to go with the try install mode specifically. Press enter and it's going to start the live boot ISO. Meanwhile, VMware has a prompt over here where it will try to install some VMware tools on it. While this is not mandatory, it is much more recommended to install these tools so that you can get some additional features like drag and drop with the host system and many more things. For now, we are going to close this prompt. As you can see, this is the live boot ISO of the Parrot security operating system. Currently, it's running the Mate desktop as we have downloaded in the website. The live boot ISO is necessary to get a good feel of the operating system. There are many good Linux distros that have this live boot option so that you can give a try of the operating system before installing it permanently. Once you are into the live boot, we can start up with the installation using the shortcut, as you can see, install Parrot. I'm going to double click it. 
and this is the Calamaris installer. Choose your language as American English and press next. You can select your time zone according to your location. And we can go next. At this point of time, you have to choose the correct keyboard. Now, what many people go, get confused is choosing their own language keyboard. What people must keep in mind is what keyboard the laptop provides. Most of the systems that come pre-built provide the English US keyboard. So, whatever keyboard you choose, make sure to type here and test that all the buttons, including the superscript and the subscript buttons are working correctly before moving forward with this step. Once you've settled on the keyboard that you need to install, you can go ahead. Here it will ask you to select storage device and the only option you are going to get is the amount of hard disk storage you have given in the virtual machine settings. We have already provided 20 GB of storage. We are going to choose that and we are going to erase this disk. Manual partitioning can be useful when you are going to install Parrot security on an operating system or on a hard disk where it is already including a Windows OS. For now, we are going to select Erase Disk and press Next. We are going to give our full name. Let it be Simply Learn. You can give the name of the computer and this is the username which we will use to log in. This is your root password that we are going to give over here. The root password of this Kali Linux will act as the administrative access and it will be necessary for making changes to the system or installing and updating software. Enter the password and repeat it over here. You have the option to log in automatically without asking for the password, but for security purposes, it is recommended to keep this disabled. Click on next. This is another summary of the installation that we are going to move forward with. Have a look that whatever changes we have made is according to your requirements and once everything is checked, you can press on install. Click on install now. And we are going to let it complete the work. As you can see, the installation of Parrot security is now completed. We're going to make sure that we have the restart now button over here disabled. I'm going to click on done. We're going to shut down this live boot ISO. We're going to click on menu. Turn off the device. And shut down. We're not restarting straight away because if you remember correctly, in the virtual machine instance settings, we had given it an ISO file. Please remove the live medium and press enter to continue. We can just press enter to continue. And it's going to shut down. Now, to move on, we're going to click on edit virtual machine settings. We're going to CD, DVD and we're going to use physical drive now. We're going to remove it from the ISO image file because the installation has already been completed and we don't want to use the same ISO file again and again. By using physical drive over here, it's going to detect the 20 GB hard disk that we have already provided and installation is done on it. We're going to press OK and we're going to power on this virtual machine for testing. Make sure this you click ES over here. This is the grub menu. At this, we get different choices, for example, which NVIDIA drivers off or with some other advanced options. More often than not, we're going to choose the first option and press enter. If you remember clearly, we did not get the option of try install or a terminal run, just like we did in the live boot ISO. Since this is running straight from the 20 GB hard drive storage, it's going to start the OS directly. Now with the login screen, you can see our username over here as we provided in the installation. We're going to enter our root password.
and press enter. And this is a currently working desktop of the Paris security operating system. We can open the terminal over here. And we're going to try a root password and installation. To install any software, we're going to use the keyword sudo apt install and neofetch. We're going to use the root password that we used to log in. We're going to press Y for yes. This is just an additional step that we're doing to check that the installation is done correctly with the correct amount of hardware requirements that we had provided. Now that we have installed NeoFetch, we can write the command NeoFetch and this is going to give us some information about our installation. You can see the OS name as Parrot OS 4.11 is running on a VMware host, so the kernel versions and some of the other information like the number of packages installed, the current shell version, resolution of the VMware instance that we are running, the desktop environment which is made as we had downloaded once and some other things. You can see the memory is supposed to be 1951 megabytes which is supposed to equal around 2 GB of RAM usage that we had provided. Kali Linux and Parrot OS are two popular penetration testing distributions. While these operating systems each have unique offerings, the overall choice can differ between personnel thanks to their various tools and hardware specifications. Today we will look at both these distributions and settle on the perfect choice for each type of user. Let's go through the agenda for this video. We will learn about Kali Linux and Parrot Security OS from scratch while understanding their primary selling points as a Linux distribution catered towards penetration testers. Next, we know about some features of these operating systems that stand out of their package. Finally, we directly compare Kali Linux and Parrot Security OS, thereby making a clear-cut conclusion on which OS is perfect on a per-requirement basis. So let's start by learning about Kali Linux from a ground level. Kali Linux, which is formerly known as Backtrack Linux, is an open source Linux distribution aimed at advanced penetration testing and security auditing. It contains several hundred tools targeted towards various information security tasks such as penetration testing, security research, computer forensics, and reverse engineering. Kali Linux is a multi platform solution accessible and freely available to information security professionals and hobbyists. Among all the Linux distributions, Kali Linux takes its roots from the Debian operating system. Debian has been a highly dependable and a stable distribution for many years, providing a similarly strong foundation to the Kali Linux desktop. While the operating system can practically modify every single part of our installation, the networking components of Kali Linux come disabled by default. This is done to prevent any external factors from affecting the installation procedure which may pose a risk in critical environments. Apart from boosting security, it allows a more profound element of security control to the most enthusiastic of users. Now, let's take a look at Parrot Security Operating System. Parrot Security OS is a Debian-based Linux distribution with an emphasis on security, privacy, and development. It is built on the Debian's testing branch and uses a custom hardened Linux kernel. Parrot Security contains several hundred tools targeted towards tasks such as penetration testing, computer forensics, reverse engineering, and security research. It is seen as a generally lightweight distribution that can work under rigorous hardware and software specifications. It features a distinct forensics mode that does not mount any of the system's hard disks or partitions and has no influence on the host system making it much more stealthy than its regular occurrence. This mode is used on the host system to execute forensic procedures. A rolling release is a paradigm in which software upgrades are rolled out constantly rather than in batches of versions in software development. This ensures that the software is constantly up to date. A rolling release distribution such as Parrot Security OS follows the same concept. 
It provides the most recent Linux kernel and software versions as soon as they become available. With the basic introduction to the operating systems out of the way, let us take a look at the unique features of both Kali Linux and Parrot Security OS. The latest version of Kali Linux comes with more than 600 penetration tools pre-installed. After reviewing every tool included in Backtrack, developers have eliminated a significant number of tools that either simply did not work or duplicated other tools that provided the same and similar functionality. The Kali Linux team comprises a small group of individuals who are the only ones trusted to commit packages and interact with the repositories, all of which is done using multiple secure protocols. Restricting access of critical code bases to external assets dramatically reduces the risk of source contamination, which can cause Kali Linux users worldwide a great deal of damage as a direct victim of cybercrime. Although penetration tools tend to be written in English, the developers have ensured that Kali includes proper multilingual support allowing more users to operate in the native language and locate the tools they need for their job. The more comfortable a user feels with the intricacies of the operating system, the easier it is to maintain a strong hold over the configuration and the device in general. Since ARM-based single board systems like the Raspberry Pi are becoming more prevalent and inexpensive, the development team knew that Kali's ARM support would need to be as robust as they could manage with fully working installations. Kali Linux is available on a wide range of ARM devices and has ARM repositories integrated with the mainline distribution. So the tools for ARM are updated in conjunction with the rest of the distribution. Let's take a look at some of the features of Parrot Security Operating System now. Along with the giant catalog of scripts, Parrot Security OS has its own hardened Linux kernel modified explicitly to provide as much security and resistance to hackers as possible in the first line of defense. The configurations in the operating system act as the second gateway, taking care of malicious requests and dropping them off. This is particularly beneficial since should there be a scenario where the latex Linux kernel is causing some particular issue, the Parrot OS development team will most likely iron it out first before passing it on as an update. If the custom hardened kernel wasn't reason enough, Parrot security developers managed to install more hacking tools and scripts to ensure a smooth transition for the Kali Linux users. All the tools you find in Kali are present in Parrot OS and a few extra ones for good measure. And this has been achieved while keeping roughly the same operating system size between both of them. However, it's not all productivity points for Parrot OS. They provide a choice between two different desktop environments, Mate, which comes pre-installed by default, and KDE. For those unfamiliar with Linux terminology, you can think of desktop environments as the main UI for a distribution. Being highly modular in nature, one can use Parrot Security OS while adding another desktop environment that they find appealing. While Kali Linux has only a single option, Parrot Security has provided two optimized builds with Mate Desktop and KDE Desktop. One of the primary advantages of Parrot OS over Kali Linux is that it's relatively lightweight. This implies that it takes significantly less disk space and computing power to function correctly, with as little as 320 MB of RAM required. In reality, Parrot OS is designed to operate successfully off a USB stick, but Kali Linux does not work well from a USB drive and is generally installed in a virtual machine. Parrot OS is more of a niche distribution if you are searching for something lighter than Kali Linux. Features are great, but what about performance? Real world metrics. Let us compare both these operating systems directly with respect to their hardware specifications and usability. In the end, we can decide on what distribution is fit for each type of user. For our first point of comparison, let's take a look at the RAM required. For optimum performance of the operating system, which is highly essential when trying to crack hashes or something of similar nature, RAM usage is a very important facet. While Kali Linux demands at least 1 GB of RAM, 
Palace security can operate optimally with a minimum of 320 MB of RAM. For correctly displaying graphical elements, Kali Linux requires GPU based acceleration, while this is not the case with Parrot Security OS, which doesn't require any graphical acceleration needed from the user side. Once these operating systems are installed on VMware using their live boot ISOs, they take up a minimum amount of hard disk storage. Both of these operating systems have a recommended disk storage of minimum of 20 GB in Kali Linux and a minimum of 15 GB in Parrot Security so they can install all the tools necessary in the ISO file. When it comes to the category and the selection of tools, Kali Linux has always been the first in securing every single tool available for hackers in the penetration testing industry. Parrot Security on the other hand has managed to take it up a notch. While specializing in wireless pen testing, Parrot Security makes it a point that all the tools that Kali Linux provides has been included in the ISO while simultaneously adding some extra tools that many users will have to install from third-party sources in Kali Linux. Being a decade-old penetration testing distribution, Kali Linux has formed up a very big community with strong support signature. Parrot Security on the other hand is still growing and it is garnering much more interest among veteran penetration testers and ethical hackers. A primary drawback of Kali Linux is the extensive hardware requirement. To perform optimally, it requires higher memory than Parrot Security. It also needs graphical acceleration while demanding more virtual hard disk storage. Parrot Security, on the other hand, was initially designed to run off a USB drive directly, thereby requiring very minimal requirements from a hardware perspective like just 320 MB of RAM and no graphical acceleration needed. This means Parrot Security is much more feasible for people who are not able to devote massive resources to either their virtual machine or on their laptop hard disk directly. With the comparison done between both of these operating systems, let's take a look at the type of users both of these are catered to. One can go with Kali Linux if they want the extensive community support offered by its users. If they want to go with a trusted development team that have been working on this distribution since many years. If they have a powerful system which can run Kali Linux optimally without having to bottleneck performance. And if they are comfortable with a semi-professional environment which may or may not be very useful for new beginners. One can decide to go with Parrot Security if they want to go with a very lightweight and lean distribution that can run pretty much on all systems. It also has a lot of tools pre-installed and some of them are not even present on Kali Linux. It is much more suitable for underpowered rigs where users do not have a lot of hardware resources to provide to the operating system and thereby it is much more feasible for people with underpowered laptops or no graphical acceleration. Compared to Kali Linux, Parrot Security's desktop environment is also relatively easier to use for new beginners. For people who are just getting into ethical hacking, Parrot Security does a relatively better job of introducing them to the operating system and to the various tools without having to dump them into the entire intricacies. With ethical hacking and penetration testing becoming mainstream in corporate environments, trained personnel and relevant equipment are in high demand. The right software framework can be the tipping point in a hacking campaign which deals with intricate hardware. One such tool that has become a mainstay for decades is Nmap. When it comes to scanning machines for open ports and services, Nmap has always been the first choice for hackers. Being lightweight and open source, Nmap has strong community backing and receives regular updates. Let's take a look at the topics to be covered today. We start by learning about the different phases in ethical hacking and where Nmap is most valuable to ethical hackers. We learn the basics of Nmap and its purpose during a penetration testing campaign. Next, we take a look at the top level approach of Nmap as a scanning tool and how it conducts these scans on host machines. Moving on, we cover the multiple modes and types of scans that can be performed using Nmap on unsuspecting users. We also look at some alternatives that users can prefer if Nmap is not something they are comfortable with 
while our live demonstration of the powers of NMAP will help in shedding light on the topics being taught today. Let us first understand where and why NMAP is essential. There are essentially five phases in ethical hacking. The reconnaissance phase is the first phase of the penetration test. Here, the security researcher collects information about the target. It can be done actively or passively or both. It helps security firms gather information about the target system, network components, active machines, etc. This activity can be performed by using the information publicly available and by using different tools. The scanning phase is more tool-oriented rather than being performed manually. The tester runs one or more scanner tools to gather more information about the target. By using various scanners such as war dialers, port scanners, network mappers and vulnerability scanners, the penetration tester collects as many vulnerabilities which help in turn to attack a target in a more sophisticated manner. In the gaining access phase, the penetration tester tries to establish a connection with the target and exploit the vulnerabilities found in the previous phase. The exploitation may be a buffer overflow attack, denial of service attack, session hijacking and many more. Basically, the penetration tester extracts information and sensitive data from the servers by gaining access with different tools. In the maintaining access phase, the penetration tester tries to create a backdoor for himself. It helps him to identify hidden vulnerabilities in the system while allowing him to come back to the system to retrieve more data further on. In the clearing tax phase, the tester tries to remove all logs and footprints which might help the administrator identify his presence. This helps the tester to think like a hacker and perform corrective actions to mitigate those activities. NMAP is most beneficial in the early stages of ethical hacking where a hacker must figure the possible entry point to a system. It is necessary to know this before running the necessary exploits, thus allowing the hackers to leverage any insecure openings and breach the device. So the reconnaissance and the scanning phase are the points where NMAP finds the most use. Let us now understand what NMAP is from a layman's perspective. NMAP, which stands for Network Mapper, is a free and open source utility for network discovery and security auditing. Many systems and network administrators also find it useful for tasks such as network inventory, managing service upgrade schedules, and monitoring host and service uptime. The program is most commonly used via a command line interface and is available for many different operating systems such as Linux, FreeBSD, and Gentoo. It is most beneficial in the early stages of ethical hacking where a hacker must figure the possible entry point to a system before running the necessary exploits. NMAP was developed for enterprise-scale networks and can scan through thousands of connected devices. However, in recent years NMAP is being increasingly used by smaller companies as well. NMAP uses raw IP packets in novel ways to determine what hosts are available on the network, what services these hosts are offering, what operating systems they are running, what type of packet filters and firewalls are in use, and dozens of other characteristics. It was designed to rapidly scan large networks but works fine against single hosts as well. The rise of the IoT, in particular, now means that networks used by these companies have become more complex and therefore harder to secure. Since every application that connects to a network needs to do so via a port, the wrong port or server configuration can open a can of worms that leads to a thorough breach of the system. The recent emergence of IoT botnets like Mirai has also simulated interest in NMAP, not least because of its ability to interrogate devices connected via the UPnP protocol but also to highlight any devices that may be malicious. Now that we understand what NMAP is, let us take a look at the workflow of how an ethical hacker uses this tool in penetration testing. At a practical level, NMAP is used to provide detailed, real-time information on your networks and on the devices connected to them. We have the hacker running NMAP on a system, with a victim machine running a standard installation of the operating system, be it Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. The NMAP interface will send specially crafted packets to generate some reply from the victim machine. The victim machine in return will send some information back to the NMAP host with replying some of the services and hosts that are being run on the computers. NMAP allows the network admins to find which devices are running, discover some open ports and other services. This in turn helps discover the vulnerabilities and the possible entry points for hackers to breach into. We are now aware of how NMAP works on a basic level. 
but the many varieties of cans that users can run on local machines. Let's take a look at some of them. The ping sweep is a simple type of NMAP scan where it pings to all the available IP addresses to check which IPs respond to ICMP protocol. If the users need to know only the number of IP addresses and not many details, the ping sweep is very useful. It's fast and hence the results to be known are fetched very easily. The SYN scan is the most useful type of NMAP scan which does work very quietly. It sends an SYN packet via the TCP protocol or the transfer control protocol to all the intended ports. If an acknowledgement packet is received to the system, it is sure that a port is opened there. No response means that the port is either closed or not available. Here the acknowledgement pack is not sent back to the system, assuming that the connection is not valid. The scan is not shown in most of the scan logs and hence it is safe to use SYN scan to identify the open ports. The TCP connect scan is similar to SYN scan in many aspects as it uses the TCP layer to send packets and is passed to all the ports. Here, the difference is that the full connection is done by sending the acknowledgement packets back. The logs can easily find the TCP scan and need more power from the machines to do the work, but it is more accurate. If all the accesses related to the OS are available to the user, it is better to do a TCP scan than an SIN scan as all the low-level and high-level accesses are required for the scan. The network is also loaded more and hence users must be careful about overloading the system and the networks. The idle scan is really used to check whether any malicious attacks are planned on any particular network. Users need not control the external host, but an IP address and a port should be given to the same. All other requirements are taken from the scanner itself. The RPC scans or remote procedure calls are done by hackers to make the system vulnerable to virus attacks. It is thus necessary to know whether our systems answer such calls and make our system open to malware. RPC scan is done to check this by finding the ports open with certain commands being run by RPC. The Windows scan is a simple scan where the application scans the acknowledgement packets received from the ports once the SYN packets are sent. If there are any abnormalities in the ACK packets received, the scan reports the same and helps in recognizing which ports are functioning in a different manner. The bound scan is used to check the security in the file transfer protocol layer. FTP layers mostly do not accept any packets and once it is rejected from the FTP layers, there are chances that it might be sent to an internal layer so that it can access the internal machines. Bounce can check this loophole by doing exactly the same process and identifies whether our FTP layer is open to vulnerability or not. The FIN scan is similar to SYN scan where the system that sends the packets receives the response back and it will be mostly be a TCP FIN packet. If the system sends an RST packet, it is a false alarm and users need not be worried about the same. The null scan is useful for other systems than Windows where the systems can easily identify what kind of packets they have received and respond back with either TCP packets or null responses. Null scans are not useful for Windows as they may not always produce the desired results. When it comes to looking at alternatives, there is a wide range of free network monitoring utilities as well as free open source vulnerability scanners available to network administrators and security auditors. What makes NMAP stand out as a tool IT and network security managers need to know is its flexibility and power. There are some alternatives to NMAP, but most of them are focused on providing specific niche functionality than the average system administrator does need frequently. Mass scan, for instance, is much faster than NMAP but provides less detail. In reality, however, NMAP provides all the functionality and speed that the average user requires, especially when used along with other similar tools like NetCat, which can be used to manage and control network traffic, and ZenMap, which provides a graphical user interface for NMAP. But as an all-rounder solution to network scanning, nobody can go wrong with NMAP as their tool of choice. Let's now take a tour of NMAP based on all the things we have covered today. In this live demonstration, we start by learning of how to install NMAP on a fresh operating system that doesn't come pre-installed with the tool. We also cover the different types of scans that can be run on local machines, along with checking multiple inferences an ethical hacker can gather based on the scan output of an NMAP screen. Finally, we run scans on vulnerable machines to get an idea of how to proceed with the outputs we gather using this tool.
If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. The first step in our demonstration is installing Nmap. Now it depends heavily on what Linux distribution you're going to use to perform ethical hacking. Right now I'm using Parrot Security Operating System. If you're not aware of what Parrot Security is or even what Kali Linux is, we highly suggest that you check out the videos of those two operating systems on our YouTube channel so that you can get a fair idea of what they serve. Now if you are using any of these two operating systems, Nmap should come pre-installed by default. To check if Nmap is pre-installed or not, you can just press on Applications over here. Go to the Pen Testing section. Go to this Information Gathering tab. And you should be able to see Nmap right here. Now let's say you do not have Nmap pre-installed. Maybe you're using a Linux distribution like Ubuntu or Linux Mint or something that is based on Debian operating systems. One thing you have to make sure that Nmap should be in the distribution repository. Once you check that, or even if you do not know if it is present, you can just this command it should be sudo, which is to give root permissions for installation, apt. apt is the package manager of all Linux distributions that are based on Debian. That goes for Debian Stable, Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Kali Linux, Parrot Security, and anything of that nature. APT is the package manager which handles the installation and removal of applications in these specific operating systems. Once you're here, just write install and nmap. Press enter and it's going to ask you for the root password that you set when you install the operating system in the first place. Enter your root password and press enter again. As you can see, it's saying that nmap is already installed the newest version since I'm running Parrot Security Operating System. Now, should you be running this operating system or even Kali Linux, you should receive a similar message and the installation is already done. If you are using some other distribution, let's say even Black Arcs, Arch Linux or Manjaro, anything like that, the installation steps will be slightly different. This sudo apt install nmap command is for distributions that are derived from Debian and Ubuntu. If you want to install in Arch Linux based distributions, you have to use their package manager, which is known as PAMAC. But that is for a different step. And if you want to get ethical hacking, the best way to start is by learning either Kali Linux or Parrot Security. Now that the installation is done, we're going to learn how to use Nmap. One of the most basic functions of Nmap is to identify active hosts on the network. We can do this by using a ping scan. The ping scan identifies all of the IP addresses that are currently online without sending any packets to these hosts. Now to run the ping scan, we're going to write nmap. The flag we're going to mention over here is sp. Now these flags are the different um, traits of the nmap scan. Depending on what flag we use, we can send different kinds of requests to the host that we are scanning. Now, before moving forward with this, let me open another terminal over here and check the IP address. We're going to write the command ifconfig and find the subnet in which this system is present. As you can see, the IP address is 192.168.72.131. Now this operating system is being run on a virtual machine software known as VMware. The VMware in itself is running on a Windows 10 operating system. Considering they are now a part of the local network, this IP address is of Parrot security and the Windows operating system, which is the host system in my scenario, will fall in this particular subnet. So to run our scan, we're going to target 192.168.72.1-24. This command then returns a list of hosts on your network and the total number of assigned IP addresses. This is going to be capital P. If you spot any hosts or IP addresses on that list that you cannot account for, you can then run further commands to investigate them further. As of right now, you can see the machine that is the Parrot security. This IP address 
can be detected in the subnet. The 192.168.72.1 is my local Windows machine that is running VMware software and ultimately this virtual machine. The 72.2 is the DHCP server that hosts the internet connection of the Parrot security. This we can ignore for now. Now, the Windows machine that we have over here, let's run some tests on that. We're going to clear our terminal and we can close this actually. When scanning hosts, nmap commands can use server names, IPv4 addresses or IPv6 addresses. A basic nmap command will produce information about the given host. To run a basic port scan, we can just use nmap along with the IP. Now, as we remember, the IP is 192.168.72.1. This is the IP of my local Windows 10 machine. As you can see, it shows the ports that are open and the particular servers that these ports are running. Now, you can also have a detection of the operating system. Now, mind you, this is not 100% correct and the reliability depends on the installation and what kind of fingerprinting measures are available. Now, since this does TCP IP fingerprinting, it needs some extra permissions. The flag that we are going to use is nmap minus O along with the same IP address. Like I said, since this is TCP IP fingerprinting, it requires root privileges. Now, to provide root privileges, we're just going to add the nmap and sudo keyword. Going to repeat the same command that we wrote above. As you can see, it has successfully detected that I am running Microsoft Windows 10 with this MAC address. It has also shown the correct build number of the Windows 10 system that I am using. This is useful for troubleshooting, scanning for few vulnerabilities, or even locating some services that need to be updated. Now to get the necessary information about these services, for example, what versions they are using, we have a command known as SV, which stands for service version. We use the same IP address and press enter. Now, as you can see, the scan is complete. And if you can check the results of the scan above here, you don't see any version number for the services. Here, we can actually check what version they are running. Now, this becomes helpful when we are trying to find specific versions to exploit. For example, if VMA Workstation 16.1.2 had some particular vulnerability, we can exploit it by checking this command. Apart from the host scanning, port scanning is one of the most basic utilities. There are a few ways that this command can be customized as well. For example, I have already checked that the 443 command is open, but I have found out after running this lengthy scan. Let's say I only want to check if command if the port 443 is open. And map. I'm going to use the flag of minus P, which stands for port and give 443 as an argument here using the same IP address and you can see it says it's open but we already knew it is open let's say there was something else uh, if let's say we're going to scan if the Apache web server port is open which usually runs on 80 obviously since I'm not running an Apache web server it says it's closed now we can combine these two commands by running both ports simultaneously. To do that, we can just put a comma and complete the rest similarly. Expected 80 is closed and 443 is open. Another feature of Nmap for port scanning is showing of ranges. Now, ranges can be beneficial when you're trying to see up to a certain limit. For example, nmap minus p, we're going to check what ports are open between 100 to let's say 2000. 
this acts as a range. Everything else is the same. And it checks all ports in the range of 100 to 2000. Whatever ports is open in between that range, it can be mentioned over here. We're going to clear the screen now. Another flag that can be used with nmap is the ss command. This runs a stealth scan, which is a little harder to detect if you're the IT admin of the system that is being scanned. The results will more or less be the same, although this will need elevated root privileges. 2.1 As you can see, this is more or less similar to a port scan, which just adds an extra MAC address as well for good measure. But like I said, it's more about the stealth. The normal scans usually are easier to detect when the logs are being checked. Stealth scans are relatively tougher to check. On much more intricate systems, this takes longer as well. Now that we're done with port scanning, let's look at a vulnerable machine. The system that you're scanning right now is this, my own personal system with everything is pretty locked down as much as it can be. There is an attack box running in the cloud, the IP address of which is over here. Now, to be able to get into this network, we need to connect to their personal network using a VPN. So what I'm going to do is switch to a different workspace over here. I'm going to open a terminal. And if you can see over here, there is a hacktest.ovpn file. I'm going to connect to their VPN network using this OVPN file. And once we get the initialization sequence completed message, we know that the connection has been established. Like we discussed, this is the vulnerable device IP. We're going to copy this and we're going to try to ping this. Let's open a new terminal. We're going to try to ping this and check if we are able to reach this machine. And as you can see, we're getting a reply back, which means we are now part of the local network where the vulnerable machine is present. Let's run a service scan map with the respective versions. We ran the similar scan on my local machine, where we were able to detect what version each service was running. What we're going to do over here is by checking what kind of services are open on the machine running on the cloud, we're going to decide what we are going to do next. And we're going to see if Nmap alone can point us to a direction where we can gain access to the machine. As you can see, the scan is now completed. And we have some of the ports that are being opened over here and what kind of service they are running. Now, like we discussed, this is the first stage or sometimes even the second stage of ethical hacking. What we can infer from here is what are the services that are being run. Now these two ports 139 and 445 are actually Windows SMB server ports, which are above the Windows Samba server. Now every service has a particular port attached to it that will be consistent whichever machine you may use. Apache server will always run on port 80. SMB servers will function on these two ports. Now SMB servers have had a vulnerability known as the eternal blue exploit, which was pretty well known. As of right now from the scan results, we are not able to detect if this machine has the similar vulnerability or not. But since it has the SMB server open, it's worth a shot that we try that exploit on this machine. Now to start the exploit on this, we're going to open another terminal over here. And we're going to use Metasploit for trying the exploit there. We're going to write sudo msf console. msf console is the keyword for launching the Metasploit console. Enter the root password and wait for Metasploit to launch. 
other than the ports, we can also see that it has checked the host name of the system and the operating system as well. Now that the Metasploit is open, we're going to launch the exploit. Now before launching, we're going to have to check what exploits are there for the Eternal Blue vulnerability. We're going to write use exploit blue and we're going to check what kind of results we are getting over here. As you can see, serial number 9. Exploit Windows SMB MS170010 Eternal Blue. It was first disclosed in 2017 and SMB Remote Kernel Pool Corruption. Let's say we're going to use this particular exploit. Now, all of this may be confusing if you're not aware of Metasploit, but remember, this is the next stage of ethical hacking which comes into the gaining access part. We're going to use exploit number 9 as we found above. To use exploit number 9. We're going to set a payload which is our malicious code that will run on the victim machine. Now we're going to check some options. As you can see it has by default pointed it to the 445 port since that is the port where SMB server can be accessed from. The parameter that's missing over here is our host. The R host is the IP address of the vulnerable machine, basically the machine in which we want to attack. Now I'm going to use the set command to set the IP address. Now if we check, we now have a victim IP address set. Another parameter that we can change is the L host. This is basically the IP address of our own system where we are going to gain access. Now, if you remember, we had connected using a VPN. So we're going to be assigned a new IP according to the VPN. So if we write ifconfig and check this one, TUN0 is the VPN adapter. This is our IP address that we have been assigned in the server in the network where the vulnerable machine is present. So we're going to copy this IP address. You are going to move over this, this workspace. And we're going to set L host with that IP address. With that, our options are set. Now we're going to run exploit. And it's going to check if Samba server vulnerability is present. As you can see, it has written that the target is vulnerable to this particular exploit. It's going to send the malicious code and the malicious code is set in the payload that you sent above. And we now have the shell command of the Windows machine. As you can see, see Windows System 32. To be sure that this is in fact this Windows machine that is being used, we're going to write ipconfig, which is a Windows only shell command. As you can see, this is the IP address that was assigned to the victim, victim machine. Now, while the major part of this process was done on Metasploit, we would not have reached this stage had we not found out that the 139 and 445 ports are open, which basically pointed us that we can try the Eternal Blue exploit of the Windows Samba servers. Similarly, all the scans that we run serve as a preface to the actual stages or the actual hacking stages of the campaigns. This SV command was necessary because we could check what are the exact services that are being running. In some cases, if the if it Apache server is being run, there are particular versions which have particular exploits. Those exploits will not work on other versions. So we're going to have to check what particular version is being run and accordingly apply the exploit. That can be done in the Metasploit or you can run some other tool. But what 
exact exploit we have to run and which vulnerability we have to target, that is where LMAP comes to help. With the world moving towards the next generation of computer hardware, the softer side of things still has a lot left to be discovered. With the majority of laptops coming with Windows pre-installed, many users are devoid of the Linux operating system experience, which is more resource-friendly than the mainstream operating systems. It can be attributed to the difficulty people used to face when installing a new operating system like Linux in the old days. However, a lot of these issues are fixed nowadays thanks to the big names like Debian and Ubuntu who have been instrumental in making Linux-based operating systems as user-friendly as possible. But which one of them is better for you? Let's take a look at the topics to be covered today as we answer this question for you. We start by learning about the operating systems from a layman's perspective and uncovering the basic offerings of both entities. Next, we cover the unique features of both Ubuntu and Debian and how they stack up against each other and other industry counterparts. Moving on, we take a look at some pointers before installing each of these operating systems and the respective download links. Finally, we compare the contrasting features of both Ubuntu and Debian and infer the kind of users each OS caters to. So let's start by learning about Ubuntu and Debian in general. Ubuntu is an open source, free Linux distribution. It is an operating system for cloud computing in accordance with support with OpenStack. Ubuntu is developed by the Canonical community and it is freely available. Also, Canonical Limited is responsible for the funding of Ubuntu. Basically, Ubuntu is released every six months. Free support is available for 9 months after every release and long-term support, which are the LTS, is released every 2 years. The first release of Ubuntu was in October 2004. You must have heard about Ubuntu no matter what. It is the most popular Linux distribution overall, not just limited to servers, but also the most popular choice for Linux desktops. It's easy to use, offers a good experience, and comes pre-installed with essential tools to get a head start. Of course, Ubuntu managed to simplify the Linux experience years back and that is the reason why it is still so popular even with several impressive Linux distributions available right now. Every new release is more polished and comes loaded with new features and improvements. Thanks to its huge user base, a number of software vendors have made their applications compatible with Ubuntu. While the catalog may not be as extensive as Windows, the options are still well curated. More importantly, the advantage of Linux-based operating systems is the ability to use free and open source alternatives to major proprietary software. By lacking some polish and overall feature set, most alternatives are enough to get the job done for majority of the users. The never-ending community support also helps in troubleshooting should things go wrong at any point in time. The default desktop environment in Ubuntu is GNOME or a Unity. The Unity is a modern desktop environment with a powerful search tool for finding all your applications and documents with its base setup as GNOME. It integrates well with common applications such as audio players, video players and social media. There are a few other desktop environments for Ubuntu as well with Unity as its flagship environment. Debian on the other hand is a free operating system for your computer which started in 1996 and is maintained by global contributors. If the operating system, a set of basic programs and utilities that make your computer run, its core is the kernel. The kernel is the most fundamental program on the computer. Debian uses the Linux kernel, a completely free piece of software which was started by Linus Torvalds and supported by thousands of programmers worldwide. A large part of the basic tools that fill out the operating system come from the GNU project and those tools are free as well. Debian is the mother of Linux distributions. Beginners always wonder why this not-so-good-looking distro is so popular inside the Linux developers community, especially when there are a lot of modern distributions that are easy to use and have beautiful UI. Later on, they found out the power of Debian after using a bunch of distributions from other developers. You will be surprised to know that almost all other popular consumer-level distros are based on Debian, even Ubuntu. It is so stable and feature-rich that the developers find it easy to build their distros based on Debian rather than building it from scratch. Debian is run and maintained on its GitHub repository thanks to contributions from developers worldwide. The major decisions are taken up on the repository issues tab 
leading to community-wide feedback and a holistic approach to open source development of the Debian operating system. Thanks to this variety of personnel, the source code of Debian comprises around 70 different programming and scripting languages. Debian supports all kinds of graphical environments, ranging from full-feature desktop environments to lighter alternatives and even minimalist window managers. Ubuntu ships with Unity Desktop by default, but the package manager can install the GNOME environment if needed, while also including Cinnamon, LDXD, XFC, KDE, and Mate. On the other hand, Debian gives you the choice of choosing which desktop environment you want from the get-go by providing ISO files for each desktop environment individually. Now that we understand where both these operating systems stand, let us take a look at some of the best features offered by each of these distributions. Ubuntu is the closest thing to a household name among desktop Linux distributions. It is a great distribution to start with and it's even a great distribution to keep using after you're more experienced if you're happy with it. It is user-friendly in a lot of ways. It provides a simple desktop, has an easy installer, and provides a checkbox during the installation process that will automatically install Flash plugins and various codecs that you will need for multimedia support. There's an additional drivers tool that will detect closed source or proprietary drivers that might be necessary to get all your hardware working and easily install them for you. Ubuntu is produced by Canonical and their friends. It is run as an open project to enable others with diverse ideas to benefit from all the work the developers do to deliver the world's best open platform. Still, Canonical is responsible for delivering six monthly milestone releases and regular LTS releases for enterprise production use. Enterprises can count on Canonical to support, secure, and manage Ubuntu infrastructure and devices. With more than 500 employees in over 39 countries, the company underpins the critical infrastructure for thousands of businesses and millions of Ubuntu users around the world. Unity Desktop was originally developed by Canonical and introduced earlier for netbook computers with Ubuntu 10.10. .10. Then it went on to be the default desktop environment for Ubuntu. Eventually, it has been dropped by Canonical and replaced by GNOME. However, it has made a comeback after Ubuntu 18.04. While being completely stable, the HUD and global menu hold up just fine with major applications such as LibreOffice, Thunderbird, and other web browsers. That means that the Unity desktop works as it is supposed to while making you more productive. While some desktop environments have a steep learning curve, Unity is very intuitive for new users in spite of deviating from the traditional start menu format that the Windows users are generally accustomed to. The Calamaris installer is a framework. By design, it is very customizable in order to satisfy a wide variety of needs and use cases. Calamaris aims to be easy, usable, beautiful, pragmatic, and more importantly, distribution agnostic. Calamaris includes an advanced partitioning feature as well, with support for both manual and automated partitioning operations. It is the first installer with an automated replace partition option, which makes it easy to reuse a partition over and over for distribution testing. Coming to Debian, it is a community distribution through and through. It's governed by a board of elected developers. It has its own internal structure and laws, and just about everyone working on it is a volunteer, making it completely community-driven. It is maintained and developed by programmers and developers all around the world. This form of development ensures continuity. If one of the developers decides to stop working on the project, another developer might come in and take place and keep the project going on. It is completely free of centralized control, and this is also one of the reasons for an undecided stable release cycle. Debian SID is the permanently unstable development version of Debian. It is where the latest versions of programs are being considered for inclusion in the Debian release cycle are uploaded and tested. Because it has no official install media, and the few netboot images that are built often don't work, even people who are willing to risk using a development version may have trouble installing it. However, it still remains the best place to test new features that have not yet made their way onto the stable branch. Debian has only free and open source software in its repositories. This is mostly ample for our users. Except for users who use hardware that only has proprietary drivers, these repositories work well in most cases. It is possible to add other repos as well that have proprietary software if that is the requirement. 
Debian's standard version is very stable as software and libraries in it go through rigorous testing. This stability makes Debian a perfect server OS. And it's also the same reason why average users shy away from using Debian as their primary OS on desktop. This is also one of the reasons why many developers use Debian as a base for their derivative, one of which is also Ubuntu. Now that we are aware of each distribution's unique features, let's take a look at how we can go ahead and install these operating systems and where we can get their downloadable images. When it comes to Ubuntu, Ubuntu has dropped the support for 32-bit systems. Currently, it supports only 64-bit devices and ARM devices. Installation is easy with the Calamaris framework coming into ISO pre-default and the latest ISO can be downloaded from the link being shown on the screen right now. In the case of Debian, the support for multiple range of devices is still present. That can also include 32-bit systems and other smaller devices which are not modern. Even though it does not use the Calamaris installer, even downloading the ISO file can be a bit hectic for newer users. Considering this is a distribution aimed at developers and intermediate users, Finding the right link can be difficult because of which we have mentioned the link on the screen below where we can get the latest ISO depending on which desktop environment you choose to go with. With the installation out of the way, let's take a direct comparison of the features between both Ubuntu and Debian. Debian is a community-driven open-source Linux distribution and is primarily aimed to be robust, capable and most importantly free. On the other hand, Ubuntu is also an free and open source like Debian, but it's backed up and developed by a Canonical, which is a corporate company. Debian and Ubuntu are both fundamentally fast regarding performance. As Debian comes bare minimum and is not bundled or pre-packed with additional software and features, it makes it super fast and lightweight, at least when compared with Ubuntu directly. Both Ubuntu and Debian use the same APT software packaging management system, but provide a different software repository. Debian is more like promoting freedom of choosing free software. Thus, it does not include any proprietary software by default. You can always install the paid versions, but you have to enable it manually. Ubuntu focuses on usability, including all the software, including free, paid, open source, closed source, etc. Ubuntu also introduced a universal package management system called Snap. It will be used across distros and thus prevent more distro-based software fragmentations. As the Debian distro does not contain any proprietary blobs, there might be some problems with drivers and firmware. That means Debian lacks some of the essential proprietary firmware by default, but the users can enable the repository and install it manually like other paid software. On the other hand, Ubuntu does not care how much whether it's paid, free, open source or clone source, so it includes as many drivers and firmware as possible. Ubuntu also lets you install and configure the necessary drivers and firmware automatically during installation or afterward. If you are a gamer, then you will probably be concerned with the latest software, drivers and hardware support. While Debian can potentially provide that, it is likely that you might end up breaking your installation. As mentioned before, Ubuntu supports certain proprietary packages as well, which often consist of graphic drivers, which are essential to gaming. Debian focuses on the open source aspect of the software. Hence, it can be a well-known fact that with gamers, Ubuntu and some other distributions like Pop! OS have been working much better regarding both software and hardware support. Regarding the audience they cater to, both Ubuntu and Debian have their pros and cons. Ubuntu is a very good distribution for amateur users with little to no experience and if they want to have the latest versions of packages and applications at all times on their systems. It is also for users who do not want a lot of customizability in spite of Unity being a very customizable desktop environment. It is also perfect for users with newer hardware since it comes updated with all the latest graphical devices and their respective drivers. Debian on the other hand is catered towards a little bit of experienced users who can fix some minor bugs on their own or with minimal community support. It also is for users who want to support an open source approach rather than an operating system which is devoid of any contribution from other end and is primarily backed by a corporation. 
It also doesn't favor gaming since it does not guarantee compatibility with all the newest graphic cards or even Wi-Fi cards in some cases. However, due to the low memory overhead, Debian is very useful for people who are looking to run home servers or even corporate environments where running servers on Debian will provide much more use. Data protection is of paramount importance in today's world. The vast amount of data flow between corporations and consumer needs to be secured considering that they are entrusted with a lot of belief. A company can spend millions of dollars on the most secure servers but it takes a single hacker to ruin all the goodwill between the organizations. To prevent these malicious attacks, many automated security systems have been developed but none of them have been as used as IDS platforms which are also known as intrusion detection systems. Welcome to this introductory lesson on intrusion detection systems. So let's go through the topics that we are going to cover today. We start with the basic definition of IDS from a layman's perspective. Then moving on, we cover the multiple types of intruders that seek to access confidential information without any authorization. Next, we cover the basic ways to detect intrusion signatures from the perspective of a network administrator. We then take a look at the different types of IDS systems that can be used in corporate environments today. A small explanation of the two types of protection is then followed by an introduction to some of the most well-known IDS tools on the market. So let's get started with what is an IDS. An intrusion detection system is an app or device that monitors inbound and outward network traffic, continuously analyzing for activity changes and patterns and alerts an administrator when it detects unusual behavior. That administrator then reviews alarms and take action to remove the threat. For example, an IDS might inspect the data carried by network traffic to see if it contains known malware or other malicious content. If it detects this type of threat, it sends an alert to your security team so they can investigate and remediate it. Once your team receives the alert, they must act quickly to prevent an attack from taking over the system. To ensure that the IDS doesn't slow down network performance, the solutions often use a switched port analyzer or a text access port to analyze a copy of the inline data traffic so that they do not meddle with the actual traffic. However, they do not block threat once they enter the network as intrusion prevention systems do. Regardless of whether you set up a physical device or an IDS program, the system can recognize attack patterns with network packets, monitor user behavior, identify abnormal network activity, or ensure user and system activity do not go against security policies. The main goal of an IDS is to detect the anomalies before the hackers complete their objective. Once the system detects a threat, the IT team is informed and the information is passed on. Given the requirement for understanding context, an enterprise has to be ready to make any IDS fit its own unique needs, expert advice. What this means is that an IDS cannot be a one-size-fits-all configuration to operate accurately and effectively. And this requires a savvy IDS analyst to tailor the IDS for the interests and needs of a given site. And knowledgeable trained system analysts are scarce. The trick with IDS is that you have to know what the attack is to be able to identify it. The IDS has always had the patient zero problem. You have to have found someone who got sick and died before you can identify it. It can usually go for two types of protection, active protection and passive. In a passive system, the IDS detects a potential security breach, logs the information and signals an alert. In a reactive system or an active system, the IDS responds to the suspicious activity by logging off a user or by reprogramming the firewall to block network traffic from the suspected malicious source. So now that we understand what an IDS is, let us go through the different types of intruders IDS platforms must be aware of. To understand this type of intruders, let us go through a scenario. We have the servers, which are protected by the IDS platforms in place. So let's say a hacker tries to breach the system from outside the organization. This can be done using multiple attacks like DDoS attacks, injection attacks, etc. The category of individuals that are not authorized to use the system but still exploit users' privacy and confidential information using different techniques are known as masqueraders. A masquerader is an intruder that is an outsider who does not have direct access to the system and aims to attack unethically by stealing data or information. However, there is another intruder who is theoretically harder to detect and approve than a masquerader. These are the people within the organization who want to weaken the security defenses, be it for corporate espionage, 
or to aid other masqueraders. The category of individuals that are authorized to use the system but misuse the granted access and privilege. These are individuals that take undue advantage of the permissions and give access to them. And this category of intruders are known as misfeasors. Misfeasors are people that are insiders and have direct access to the system which they aim to attack unethically by stealing data or information. Let us now go through some of the ways the IDS platforms can detect intrusion before it is too late. Intrusion detection systems primarily use two key methods. One is signature based intrusion and the anomaly based intrusion. Signature based intrusion detection is designed to detect possible threats by comparing the given network traffic and log data to existing attack patterns. These patterns are called sequences and could include byte sequence, which is also known as malicious instruction sequences. Signature based detection enables you to accurately detect and identify possible known attacks. Anomaly based intrusion detection is the opposite. It's designed to pinpoint unknown attacks, such as new malware, and adapt to them on the fly using machine learning. Machine learning techniques enable an intrusion detection system to create baselines of trustworthy activity, which is known as a trust model, then compare new behaviors to verify trust models. False alarms can occur when using an anomaly based IDS since previously unknown yet legitimate network traffic could be falsely identified as malicious activity. Now, if you combine both of those, you have the hybrid intrusion detection. They use signature based and anomaly based intrusion detection to increase the scope of your IDS. This enables you to identify as many threats as possible. A comprehensive intrusion detection system can understand the evasion techniques cyber criminals use to trick an IDS to thinking there isn't an attack taking place. These techniques could include fragmentation, low bandwidth attack, pattern change evasion, and many more. We can now take a look at the type of protection offered by IDS platforms. There are a couple of ways that can be set up, so let's go through each method. The first is a network based IDS. The sensors are deployed at strategic points within the network, such as within the DMZ or at the network's perimeter. The sensor can monitor individual packets of inbound and outbound traffic to and from all devices on the network. It analyzes them for malicious activity and depending on the network architecture and amount of traffic involved, multiple instances of network based IDS may be necessary. The second category is host based intrusion detection systems or HIDS. An agent runs on all servers, endpoints, and devices in the network that have access to both the internet and the internal network. Intrusions are identified by analyzing operating specific activities like the modification of the file system, registry, or access control lists, and by monitoring system application logs as well. They augment network based IDS systems by detecting anomalous traffic which originate within the organization or from the host that is being monitored. For example, a host infected with malware that is attempting to spread it to other internal hosts is an issue that a network based IDS could potentially fail to detect. The third variant is a cloud based intrusion detection system. Because of the internet facing nature of the cloud, on premises ID solutions are not necessarily optimized for monitoring. For example, network based sensors need to be deployed within the cloud at an environment's network perimeter, and yet a cloud service provider may or may not have a way to facilitate this. Cloud-based servers use purpose-built cloud sensors that use Cloud Service Provider Application Programming Interface or Cloud Service Provider APIs to get as much visibility as possible into your cloud environment. Now that we understand the different types of IDS deployment tactics, let us go through some tools that excel in this field, offering top-of-the-line implementations in a corporate and consumer environment. The first tool being covered is the SolarWinds Security Event Manager. The SolarWinds Security Event Manager is designed to integrate real-time log data from across your infrastructure, enabling it to act both as a network-based IDS system and a host-based IDS system. The solution can let you discover all kinds of malicious attacks and help you protect your network from harm. It is also designed to enact both signature-based and anomaly-based intrusion detection by comparing sequences of network traffic against a set of customizable rules. Next, we have the McAfee LiveSafe. McAfee LiveSafe is an intrusion detection system designed to bring real-time threat awareness to your physical and virtual networks. It uses signature-based intrusion prevention and anomaly-based intrusion detection along with emulation techniques to spot and identify malicious activity. 
McAfee is also built to correlate threat activity with application usage, which can further prevent network issues stemming from cyber attacks. Next, we have Blumera. Blumera is a security information and event management platform built to enact threat detection and responses across your cloud and on-premises environments. It is designed to continuously monitor your IT infrastructure for suspicious activity and misconfigurations, both of which could result in data leaks and compliance breaches. It enables you to respond to an attack in progress and stop malicious actors in their tracks. Monitoring usage of corporate data and access to privileged information had been a daunting task before the advent of IAM. Encompassing numerous APIs, single sign-on frameworks and data handling policies, IAM has established itself as a key component of every IT department. But how does it enforce these rules and who are the key benefactors of these policies? What about the advantages of these frameworks and the workflow of these systems? We are here today to answer these questions. Let's take a look at some of the topics to be covered today. We start by learning about IAM, that is Identity and Access Management from a surface level so as to put a clear idea of what it is. Next, we cover the general workflow and process of how IAM works. Moving on, we cover some of the tools that find their place in an IAM framework and are crucial components. Finally, we go through some of the advantages of the IAM, learning what makes them a lucrative deal for organizations. So let's get started by learning about IAM from a surface level perspective. Identity and Access Management or IAM is a set of processes, policies and tools for defining and managing the roles and access privileges of individual network entities to a variety of cloud and on-premise applications. The users can include customers, partners, employees, devices like computers, smartphones, routers, etc. The core objective of IAM systems is one digital identity per individual or item. Once a digital identity has been established, it must be maintained, modified and monitored throughout each user's or device's access lifecycle. Access and user are two vital IAM concepts. Access refers to the actions permitted to be done by a user, like view, create or change a file. Users could be employees, partners, suppliers, contractors or even customers. Furthermore, employees can be further segmented based on their roles. IAM systems are designed to perform three key tasks, identify, authenticate and authorize. Meaning that only the right person should have access to computers, hardware, software apps, any IT resources, etc. For the entry of new users or the changing of the roles of existing users, the list of access privileges must be up to date all the time. IAM functions usually fall under IT departments or sections that handle cybersecurity and data management. Now that we understand the importance of IAM in today's cybersecurity sphere, let us understand the process of this framework. We have multiple components that aid this process. Let's start by going through each of them individually. Principal is an entity that can perform actions on an AWS resource or any cloud management system. A user, a role, or an application can be a principal. It's always the principal who raises a concern to access or modify data on servers, serving as the first point of contact in the IAM workflow. Authentication is the process of confirming the identity of the principal trying to access the product. The principal must provide its credentials or required keys for authentication. This step can be further enhanced by multiple authentication factors and geologs, among other things. Once the identity is confirmed, the principal has the ability to view the data behind the wall of security and take the necessary steps. When it comes to requests, a principal then sends a request to the cloud management system specifying the action and which resource should perform it. In this step, the user can ask to modify, delete, edit or affect other users in this particular bucket of organization by changing the data or the information. When it comes to authorization, it carries out the rest of an organization identity and access management processes once the user has been authenticated. Users are granted authorizations according to their role at an organization. The practice is referred to as Role-Based Access Control or RBAC. Authorizations determine a role's resources and level of access in the network. These items may include systems, applications, file shares, printers and more. For example, an accounting department employee who regularly works with payroll software 
must be authorized to do such. If authentication resembles a passport, these are the things your digital identity can access with it. While authentication is fully straightforward, authorizations and their management are far more challenging. Authorizations consist of complex set of rules and policies and groups which are permitted explicitly configured per user account. With the working of IAM frameworks out of the way, let's cover some of the tools that these systems work on. SSO is an IAM tool that enables a user to log into one an organization's properties and automatically be logged into a design set of other properties. For example, when you log into Google, you're automatically logged into your Gmail and your YouTube accounts. Similarly for users, single sign-on reduces friction since they don't have to keep track of different credentials for every application. For organizations, SSO helps in collecting valuable insights about user behavior and preferences since it tags them as they move from one application to another connected by one single login. Next is multi-factor authentication or MFA. Implementing multi-factor authentication is crucial to protect your organization's data from malicious intrusions and virtually every IAM platform offers some form of MFA. However, it's equally crucial to customize MFA with the appropriate level of security. For example, in business-to-consumer scenarios, you need to consider UX and try not to create unnecessary friction for users who don't want to be subjected to heightened scrutiny every time they log in. For workforce IAM, you may want a more stringent MFA since the consequences of an unauthorized party gaining access to your private network can be so devastating. A modern IAM solution will allow you to implement MFA only when it's needed. This can be accomplished through setup authentication or adaptive authentication in which users only trigger MFA if they are trying to access sensitive data or their behavior is flagged as risky. In the past few years, identity has become the preferred gateway for hackers to break into systems. Brute force attacks, credential stuffing attacks, and even highly targeted phishing campaigns are all attempts by hackers to break in through a company's front door, which is the login box. There are multiple ways IAM systems can help detect and mitigate these malicious attacks. IAM solutions detect attacks by monitoring signals such as the velocity of traffic, detection of login patterns that differ from a user's routine, use of a breached password, use of devices and IP addresses with a poor reputation, among other things. These are some of the most widely used tools when it comes to IAM frameworks. But why do we go through setting up so many tools and firewalls? Let's go through some of the advantages of using IAM systems in both corporate and consumer environments. IAM solution helps identify and mitigate security risks. You can use IAM to identify policy violations or remove inappropriate access privileges without having to search through multiple distributed systems. We can also leverage IAM to ensure that security measures are in place to meet regulatory and auditing requirements. IAM provides a common platform for access and identity management information. You can apply the same security policies across all the operating systems and devices used by the organization. The IAM framework can help you enforce policies related to user authentication, privileges and validation and attend to the privilege creep problems. IAM simplifies sign-up and user management processes for application owners, end users, and system administrators. It makes it simple to provide and manage access and promotes user satisfaction. IAM services can also lower operating costs. Using federated identity services means you no longer need local identities for external users. This makes application administration easier. Cloud-based IAM services can reduce the need to buy and maintain on-premise infrastructure. So, importance of a cybersecurity certification. First and foremost, when I see a certification, I look at it from three different aspects. The first is the training itself, which allows me to gain the knowledge, which allows me to understand the aspects of security or whatever the certification is there for. The second aspect is the exam itself. How do I need to prepare myself for the exam and how do I need to approach the exam? How do I need to ensure that I pass in my first attempt? And the third aspect is the certification itself, which allows me to be eligible to apply for a particular job role. So obtaining a cybersecurity certification ensures or shows uh, to the organization that you're applying to that you do have that pre prerequisite knowledge and you should be shortlisted for an interview. The knowledge that you have gained during the training will help you when you attend that interview and when you attempt to answer the questions asked to you. So, these certifications are designed for a specific role. 
for example, a forensic investigation certificate will teach you how to investigate a crime scene forensically, a digital crime scene for a matter of fact. A certified ethical hacking course will teach you about penetration testing. So it is you who's going to decide which certification you require and then attempt get certified on it. Of course, a fresher with a cybersecurity certification will have better employment opportunities because they can showcase their knowledge with the certification that they already have. Even professionals who want to enhance their careers can get into managerial or advanced uh, certifications to improve on their knowledge and get promoted in their job profiles. So, cybersecurity uh, certifications can be classified in three different aspects. The first one being the foundational level, then the managerial level, and the advanced level. Uh, in the previous video, we just had a small overview. Here, we are going to discuss about what the certification covers, how the exams are conducted, and uh, the price points for each and every exam. So, let's start with the foundational certifications. We start off with CCNA, which is the basic certification for networking. So the CCNA routing and switching certification, basically it helps you build your networking career. You will join an organization as a networking engineer where you can help the organization establish the routing, uh, the pathing of how data packets will travel across the network. This certification covers all the basic concepts that you require to understand networking. The basic requirements for this certification are that the candidate must have a bachelor's degree, but apart from that, there are no other prerequisites. So it's just that you need a bachelor's degree and then you can apply, uh, you can study for this, you can undergo a training and then you can attempt the exam. Uh, the certification provider obviously is Cisco. So the knowledge that is limited to this training and certification is for Cisco devices only. The exam fees for this certification is approximately $325. The exam, when it is conducted, uh, it has around 50 to 60 odd questions which need to be answered in 90 minutes. The type of questions that you're going to get is multiple choice questions where you have a question and four answers and you have to choose the correct answers among those. Drag and drop where you have to click on an object and drag it to its appropriate place. Probably a architectural diagram and you have to, uh, let's say, pick on a router and place it into a particular uh, position. If you place it correctly, you answer the uh, answer the question correctly. Otherwise, it's wrong. And a simulator where you go, where there could be a configuration. You need to configure it in a particular manner and then check whether the configuration is correct or not. The pass mark is around 800 to 850 out of a possible thousand marks. So each question will have a different weightage depending on the depth of the question, depending on the difficult level of the question or the difficulty level of the question, which uh, would then count towards your marks. And if you score 800 to 850, that's when you clear the exam. The job roles, as we have discussed over here, would be more, more on the network administrator side or a network engineer side, depending on the level of experience that you have. The salaries uh, that are expected from this job roles in the US are around $55,000 to $90,000 annually. The next one is the Comcha certification called Security Plus. Comcha is also a global certification authority for uh, InfoSec courses. So this certification teaches candidates on how to secure applications, networks, and devices. It focuses on hands-on practical skills in the field of network security. I have trained people on this certification myself. So uh, I know this certification is quite hands-on. It deals with the concepts to the core. It helps you understand the concepts. And then in the practical hands-on demo, uh, you need to execute the practical yourself so that uh, you can gain that knowledge. The recommended level for a candidate to attempt this training would be at least around two years of experience in the IT sector. In addition, if you have already been certified for Network Plus certification from Comchia, which is the baseline networking certification, this is also a preferred uh, way to go for this certification. As said, Comchia is the certificate provider and the exam fees for this certification is $339. The exam is quite simple, 90 questions in 90 minutes, that's one minute per question. It sounds like a lot of time, but believe me, the questions can be a little bit confusing, can be a little bit lengthy. So you will require all those 90 minutes to answer those questions, especially when they're tricky and they're technical in nature. The questions would be multiple choice and performance based. The pass mark for this exam is around 750 points out of a possible 900. The job profiles for this kind of a certification is when you want to apply for a security analyst position or a security engineer's position where you're going to analyze some data to understand and figure out what problems are ongoing in the organization. Uh, the average annual salary of this uh, person would be around $72,000. Then comes the CEH or the Certified Ethical Hacker training from EC Council. Now, this is a very well-known course. 
and also uh, EC Council is a global certifying authority very well accepted across a lot of countries uh, this is an offensive certification so here you're basically trying to become a penetration tester you're taught how to hack you're taught how to attack a particular organization from an ethical hackers perspective so the job profiles that you'll be looking here are of a pen tester where you go into an organization you test their security controls or you test their devices find out flaw flaws within them and then provide recommendations of how to plug those flaws or mitigate those flaws and improve the security of that organization it is recommended that you have two years of experience at least in networking or security for these uh, to attempt this kind of trainings and certifications again a basic understanding of networking uh, maybe a little bit of applications operating systems would be necessary uh, before attempting this certification the certification provider is ec council and the exam fees for this certification is 500 dollars so the exam here would be 125 questions which needs to be attempted in four hours and you will only get multiple choice questions in here now for ceh there are two exams one is the multiple choice questions and the second is a practical exam where uh, you need to solve some given problems to you in a ilab scenario and if you are able to solve them properly you then get certified for ceh practical the cutoff varies from 65 to 85% depending on the questions that you have answered and the weightage associated with each and every question. As said, the job roles would be as a penetration tester or a security engineer and your salaries would start from around $90,000 annually. Then comes the CND or the Certified Network Defender also from EC Council. Now this is more on the network defense side. So here again the job roles would be where, you're, uh, where there's a network that you have and you're going to try to secure the network and the communications that are going to travel over the network. So you need to be a network administrator, a network security engineer or a, uh, in a similar profile to understand how networks work and then you're going to attempt to secure those networks. The certificate provider again is EC Council and the certification is placed a little bit below uh, CEH so it becomes network defense then CEH where you're going to become a penetration tester. The exam fees for this certification is 350 US dollars. The exam the exam is of 100 questions to be answered in four hours. Again it's just a multiple choice questions so you get a question with four options you answer the correct one and you move on to the next question. The pass percentage again varies from 60 to 85 percent depending on the questions answered and the weightage of that question. Job rules to be applied network defense technician, CND analyst or a security analyst from a network perspective. Salaries would range from $65,000 to $75,000 per annum. Then comes the forensic investigator course, which is exactly what it is, digital forensic investigator. This will help you understand how computers work, where data is stored and how you can retrieve that data to investigate a crime that has uh, taken place. So the candidate must have at least two years of experience in the information security sector they need a good understanding of how networks work how computers work how operating systems work how they store data the location where that data is stored how databases work how those databases store those data and so on and so forth this certification is sought after more mainly in the law enforcement areas but there are a few corporates that offer forensic investigation as a service especially when a corporate gets compromised and they want to uh, conduct their own investigations the certification provider for this is also EC Council and the exam fees are $500. This is an advanced level certification so uh, understanding of applications, networks and operating systems is a must before you attempt this. The exam is quite similar 150 questions in 4 hours. Again it's just a multiple choice question exam. The cutoff again is from 60% to 85% depending on the questions and the weightage of each and every question. Job rules, IT security specialist, network security pro, the job rules, forensic investigators, law enforcement agencies, security specialists, homeland security jobs, and your salaries would be around $88,000 and above. All right, now let's talk about the managerial level certifications. COBIT stands for Control Objectives for Information and Related Technologies. It's a certification that will give a candidate an in-depth knowledge of the framework uh, which COBIT is all about and the framework helps you manage and govern enterprise IT environments. Now this is advanced certification so around 8 years of managerial experience is suggested before you attempt the COBIT 5 certification to understand all the aspects and to help you implement the framework properly. The certification certificate provider is ISACA. The exam fee is around $175. Now this is a small exam. 50 questions but in 40 minutes so you really have to be on your toes you have to know the knowledge there's very limited time to think 
and you have to be fast in your answers. The pass percentage is 50%. The job roles associated with this certification would be to uh, when you apply for a uh, information security manager or as a security consultant or a cyber security manager and your roles and responsibilities would be to govern the uh, IT space that the organization owns. So all the servers, desktops, the network, the data flows, the databases, everything and how it needs to be managed and how it needs to be governed in a secure manner. Annual salaries would be around $100,000 plus. Then the CISM, also called as CISM. It stands for Certified Information Security Manager. And as the name suggests, it's a security manager certification. It helps the candidate in understanding the relationship between business goals and information security. So now you're going into the space where you're not only technical in nature, but you also have to understand the business needs, the goals of the business, and you have to align the information security of your infrastructure along with the business needs and the business goals. So it is your inputs that are going to go to the management to see if the infrastructure is aligned to the business goals or if the infrastructure or the business goals need any fine tuning. Around five years of work experience is recommended in the information security field for attempting the CISM. Out of the five years, the candidate must have a background as an information security manager for three years. So you have some experience as a manager, uh, you have implemented those things yourselves, which will give you a better understanding, and then you attempt the certification. Again, providing by ISACA and the exam fees for ISACA members is $575. For non-members, it is $760. The exam is where you have to answer 150 questions in four hours. Uh, quite a bit of time, but questions are going to be uh, scenario based questions where they're going to give you a lot of scenarios. You have to think about it and you have to give the most probable and the correct answer for that particular scenario. The pass mark is 450 out of 800. Your job profiles would be either a risk manager or a risk consultant analyzing the business requirements to the infrastructure security that uh, that you have and to identify if there are any risks associated with the infrastructure, highlight those risks and then put in security controls and manage those controls in a way where security is mitigated. Your average salaries would be around $88,000 and above. Then the CISA or the CISA, the Certified Information Systems Auditor Certification. It not only looks into security, but it also looks into auditing and controls uh, in information systems. This is a highly reputed certificate and you gain a better understanding of governance, regulations and auditing your information landscape. Again, a minimum of five years of work, uh, work experience in the field of information systems, auditing, control or security is necessary. Now here the question would be, what's the difference? Security is where you're technical in nature. You have done, let's say, a vulnerability assessment or a penetration test. You have implemented firewalls. You have architected security. Controls are all about the security controls that you're going to implement, like firewalls, IDSS, IPSS, data loss prevention systems, uh, maybe even uh, UTMs and whatnot. So experience in architecting or implementing those controls in an effective manner, mitigating your security uh, or your, uh, your vulnerabilities that you have identified in the organization. And auditing would basically mean about looking at compliance to ensure that uh, everything is in place, you're compliant with, let's say, uh, ISO 27001 guidelines or the policies that you have created yourself and everything is working in order. So it's more of a checklist where you're going to just check everything is in place and you're conforming to standards. This certification is also provided by ISACA and the exam fees for ISACA members are $575, whereas non-ISACA members will have to pay $760 for the certification. 150 questions again in four hours, multiple choice questions, scenario based. So you have to really understand the uh, real world scenarios of where, what controls and what audit mechanism should be in place. Pass mark is 450 out of 800. Your job roles would be mainly becoming an auditor or a senior auditor, a director for information security, information audit manager or an information technology consultant where you provide intelligence on how the company should implement their infrastructure. Average salaries would be 103000 and above. 
Then comes the CRISC, also called as CRISC, uh, Certified in Risk and Information Systems Control. Certification helps the candidate design and maintain information systems controls for an organization. This is one of the most sought after certifications as far as risk management is concerned. In Europe and in US, if you have this kind of certifications, you automatically qualify for a risk manager or a security risk manager or a information security consultant kind of a role. You should have a minimum of three years of experience in the field of IS controls. That means information security controls. You should have knowledge about firewalls. You should know about how to mitigate risks, how to identify risks in the first place risk analysis, risk management, and after which you're going to implement security controls to mitigate that risk or bring it to acceptable levels. At this point in time, you will also be responsible to create policies revolving those risks and how you want to calculate those risks and tr treat those risks in their lifetime. Certificate provider again is ISACA, $575 for ISACA members, $760 for non-ISACA members for the exam fees. A similar question, 150 questions to be answered in four hours, multiple choice based on performances. So they may give you a scenario where you have to perform a risk analysis and provide a report and a solution based on your findings. Again, the pass mark is 450 out of 800. The job profiles associated as discussed earlier are the IT risk management professionals where they're going to identify risks, treat those risks, calculate, analyze, maybe do a business impact analysis to ascertain how uh, the organization is going to be affected. And then you will also be looking at compliances as far as these job roles are concerned. Average annual salary would be 119,000 and above. Moving on to advanced level certification. Now this is where we come across the CISSP or the CISP certification. Certified Information Systems Security Professional. This is the gold standard of all certifications. If you have this certificate, it's you can basically be assured of a job in the IT world. Now, just to qualify, you'll have to have five years of experience in the information security field. There are eight domains that are specified by CISSP, and you have to prove that you have knowledge and your work experience of around five years in at least two of those domains. If you do not have those kind of experiences, you can still attempt the exam, but you become an associate of IIC Square, which means that you get six years to accomplish the five years of uh, experience requirement for this certification. Before taking up the CISP certification, it is suggested that the candidate clears all the intermediate level certifications. Not all, but some of them. In fact, I have seen people do the other way around. They qualify for CISSP, they give the exam. Once you're CISSP, the CISA or CISM, CIS or CISM exams are way easier to crack. But you need to have that kind of experience. I have seen people with 15 years of experience and more fail at this certification in the first attempt. The certificate provided is ISC Square. The exam fees is $699. Like I said, this certification is where most sought after the gold standard. In fact, there is hardly any other certifications after this that you might want to do. The questions, now the exam has changed. If it is the English version that you're giving, it's 150 questions to be answered in three hours. If it is the non-English exam that you're attempting, then it is 250 questions in six hours. It's a marathon. And if you're opting for the six hour exam, you need to plan it really well. It sounds really easy, but the questions are quite tough. They're scenario based and the answers are quite confusing as well. You would get multiple choice questions. You would get drag and drop and you might get simulators as well. Uh, the pass mark is 700 out of 1000, but each question has a different weightage. So uh, it depends on which questions are asked of you and which questions you have answered correctly. The job rules associated with this certification would be anything and everything in information security at the managerial level and above. So information security manager, risk manager, system uh, information system security officer, the CISO role, the CISO, chief information security officer, any role that you might think of as a risk uh, from a risk compliance strategy could be achievable after this kind of a certification. The average annual salary is $108,000 for this certification. And if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity, that is by graduating from the best universities or a professional who elicits to switch careers with cybersecurity by learning from the experts, then try giving a shot to Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity with modules from the MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. And the course link is mentioned in the description box that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. And before we begin, if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cybersecurity or to become an ethical hacker by graduating from the best universities 
or a professional who elicits to switch career with cyber security or ethical hacker by learning from the experts and try giving a shot to simply learn postgraduate program in cyber security with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Computing. The course link is mentioned in the description box below that will navigate you to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. In today's interconnected world, the significance of cyber security has reached paramount levels. As technology continues to advance at an unprecedented pace, so do the risks and threats lurking in the digital landscape. Recently, in April 2023, the Shields Healthcare Group, a medical service provider located in Massachusetts, experienced the most significant data breach. Towards the end of the month, reports surfaced revealing that an individual involved in cybercrime had illicitly accessed the organization's systems and successfully obtained the personal information of approximately 2.3 million individuals. Organizations and individuals alike are realizing the critical need for qualified professionals who possesses the skills to defend against cyber attacks. One such certification that has gained widespread recognition is the Certified Ethical Hacker or CEH certification. So in this video on step-by-step -step guide to crack CEH exam, we will be covering various topics like why CEH, what is CEH, exam eligibility criteria for CEH and how to prepare for CEH exam. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. Now before moving forward, let me ask you a quick question. So which of the following terms describes an individual who gains unauthorized access to computer systems with malicious intent? Option A is white hat hacker, option B is black hat hacker, option C is gray hat hacker and option D is script kiddie. Now you can pause this video and answer in the comment section below. Now let's start with the first topic which is why CEH or Certified Ethical Hacker. So there is a high demand for cyber security experts in various businesses. To hire these experts, organizations have certain requirements. These professions need to have a good understanding of security concepts and be familiar with the latest tools, processes and frameworks to stay ahead of cyber criminals and prevent data breaches. Certifications like CEH or Certified Ethical Hacker offered by EC Council play a significant role in this scenario. The CEH programming is designed to train ethical hackers comprehensively, covering the latest hacking trends and introducing professionals to technologies that help prevent data breaches. This certification is recognized globally, meaning your skills and knowledge will be valued by organizations around the world, regardless of your location. The course instructs participants on practical strategies that can be used in real-life situations and future careers. The CEH exam focuses on understanding how malicious individuals exploit weaknesses in addition to offering promising job prospects. The CEH certification training provides a wealth of knowledge that is not easily obtained through other information security courses. So if you are someone who is interested in building a career in cyber security by graduating from the best universities, then try giving a shot at Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cyber security with modules from MIT Schwarzman College of Engineering. The link is in the description box that will navigate to the course page where you can find a complete overview of the program being offered. Also, have a look at what our learners has to say about the course. Hi, I'm Philip. I'm 61 years old and last year I upskilled with Simply Learn's postgraduate program in cybersecurity after working 30 years in the IT sector in various different profiles. I'm happy to tell you that I was able to clear and pass my CISSP and CCSP certification exams on the first attempt after taking the course. The course, I must say, was packed with practical examples and was led by highly skilled certified instructors with many companies before as a, as a security analyst and the architect on a contract basis, but I needed some stability, which I got with the job I just started with Infosys as a cybersecurity consultant. Happened on a first. Now let us understand about this Certified Ethical Hacker or CEH exam. So the CEH exam focuses on theoretical understanding and does not involve hacking actual systems. It emphasizes comprehension of hacking concepts, tools and methodologies. However, to obtain the CEH master's designation, you must also pass a 6 hour practical exam with 20 challenges. This exam evaluates your practical application of knowledge and skills in real life scenarios. But that's a choice if you want to apply for masters. So the CEH exam is 4 hours long. The exam consists of 125 multiple choice questions. The passing score required for certification varies depending on the specific exam. Some exams state in passing score as a percentage while others base it on the difficulty of questions and the knowledge or skills needed to demonstrate competence in the subject. 
The actual cut score determined by subject matter experts depends on the difficulty of the questions and ensures fairness in evaluation skills. If you encounter more challenging questions, fewer correct answers are needed to pass, while an easier set of questions requires higher percentage of correct answers. Thus, performance relative to the passing standard can be higher even with fewer correct answers in a difficult question set. So now let's have a look at the sections. So the sections covered in the program includes section number one, that is background. Then there is section number two, which is analysis or assessment. Then there is section number three, security. Then comes section number four, tools, systems and programs. Section five is procedures and methodology. Section six is regulation and policy. Section seven is ethics. So this was about the CEH exam. Now let's have a look at its eligibility criteria. So the eligibility criteria for CEH exam. Before you start preparing for CEH exam, it's important to meet certain requirements. Firstly, you must show this EC council that you have at least two years of experience in information security and a specialization in that field through your educational background. Additionally, keep in mind that the CEH exam has a cost of 100 US dollars and make sure you fulfill these criteria before moving forward to avoid wasting your time. So this was about the eligibility criteria for CEH exam. Now let's understand how to prepare for CEH exam. So the first step in preparing for CEH exam is joining a forum. So there are many online forums and blogs dedicated to CEH where people with similar interests and goals gather. These forums are filled with individuals who are either preparing for CEH exam or have already taken it. They share valuable tips, strategies and general advice based on their experiences. By participating in these forums, you can interact with other CEH students and professionals. This allows you to exchange knowledge and discover each other's strengths and weaknesses. It's a great way to identify areas where you may need to improve your understanding. Remember, what one person is good at, another person may struggle with. Through discussions on the forum, you can learn from others and reinforce your own knowledge through repetition, which helps with better retention. The second thing you can do is create important topics checklist. So once you have identified the areas where you lack knowledge as a hacker, it's important to make a checklist of study topics. Prioritize the topics that need more attention. Don't forget to allocate some study time to the topics you already know. It's always beneficial to reinforce and refresh your existing knowledge. However, the main focus should be on addressing the knowledge gaps first. Once you have addressed those gaps, you can revisit the other topics later. Along with this, you can also take up EC Council Certification Assessment. EC Council Certification Assessment refers to the international evaluation process conducted by the International Council of Electronic Commerce Consultants. The certification assessment typically involves an examination that accesses the candidate's understanding of the relevant concepts, tools, and best practices in their chosen certification track. The exam is educational and the questions are beneficial for studying purposes. Using the training platform, the candidate can access their levels of readiness and analyze their preparedness for the exam. Along with taking self-assessment, you can also take help from study guides. While we emphasize the importance of not relying solely on books, it cannot be denied that books hold a wealth of knowledge. When preparing for the CH exam, it is essential to thoroughly read the recommended books. This approach will address all your what and why questions regarding cybersecurity and ethical hacking. The content provided in these books is of top quality, offering precise definitions, descriptions, and diagrams for almost every topic. We suggest dedicating at least one hour daily to study in order to grasp all the concepts covered in the training. So by understanding the exam objectives, setting up study plan, utilizing quality resources, and reviewing your weak areas, you are well equipped for success. Remember to stay focused, manage your time effectively, and maintain a positive mindset throughout your preparation. With dedication and perseverance, you can confidently approach the CH exam and achieve your certification goals. Hello and welcome to Simply Learn's YouTube channel. In today's video, we will be discussing the intriguing world of ethical hacking. With the rise of cyber threats and the increasing need for robust cyber security, ethical hackers have become an integral part of the modern digital landscape. In this video, we will explore what ethical hacking is, why ethical hacking are in high demand, salary trends in the field of ethical hacking, skills required for a career in ethical hacking, and tips for starting a successful career as an ethical hacker. At the end of this video, we will be sharing some useful tips. So keep watching till the end of this video. So let's dive in. Before moving forward, let me ask you a quick question. So what is the main goal of an ethical hacker? Option A is to hack into systems and steal sensitive information. 
Option B is to test and identify vulnerabilities in systems and networks. Option C is to create new security threats and exploits. Option D is to cause harm and damage to the target organization. Now you can pause the video and answer in the comment section below. So let's start with the first topic that is what is ethical hacking? Ethical hacking also known as white hat hacking is the practice of intentionally probing computer systems, networks or applications to identify vulnerabilities and weaknesses. The main difference between ethical hackers and malicious hackers is the intent and legality of their actions. Ethical hackers operate with the permission of the system owner and their goal is to identify vulnerabilities before they can be exploited by malicious hackers. They use their skills and knowledge to help organization strengthen their cybersecurity defenses and protect sensitive data from unauthorized access. As reliance on technology and the internet continues to grow, so does the risk of cyber threats. Organizations, both large and small, are constantly seeking ways to secure their digital assets and safeguard their business operations. The demand has led to a significant need for skilled ethical hackers who can proactively identify and fix vulnerabilities in systems. Ethical hackers play a crucial role in helping organizations prevent data breaches, protect customer information, maintain compliance with industry regulations, and safeguard their reputation. With the increasing awareness of cybersecurity threats, ethical hackers are in high demand across various industries, including finance, healthcare, technology, and government sectors. Now let's discuss some salary trends for ethical hackers. The rising demand for cybersecurity expertise has led to a significant need for ethical hackers. Consequently, skilled professionals in the field have experienced favorable salary trends in recent years. Several factors impact the salaries of ethical hackers, including their experience, certifications, industry, and region. The roles that fall under the umbrella of an ethical hacker may include penetration tester. Penetration tester, also known as pen tester. If you're interested in pursuing a career as a penetration tester, you will need to develop a strong skill set in various technical areas, including programming, operating system, networking, and cybersecurity principles. Pen testers are responsible for conducting authorized tests on computer systems, networks, and applications to identify vulnerabilities and weaknesses and provide recommendations for improving security. With an average salary of 5 lakhs per year in India and $102,000 in the United States, becoming a penetration tester can be a productive career choice. Simply Learn's professional certificate program in ethical hacking and penetration testing is designed to equip you with the necessary skills to analyze the threat landscape and develop strategies to ensure the stability and security of systems. Through hands-on training in real-world cases, you will master essential cybersecurity skills. In just six months, you will learn the advanced cybersecurity strategies that will enable you to protect networks and data from breaches. Next is Vulnerability Accessor. This role involves identifying and accessing potential vulnerabilities in computer systems, networks, and applications using various tools and techniques to determine the level of risk associated with those vulnerabilities. The average salary of a vulnerability accessor is $9,50,000 in India and $61,000 in the United States. Next up, we have Information Security Analyst. An information security analyst is a professional responsible for protecting an organization information assets, including data systems, network, and applications from potential security breaches and cyber threats. Information security analysts play a critical role in safeguarding sensitive information and ensuring the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. The average salary of an information security analyst is 6 lakhs per year in India and $99,000 per year in the United States. The Caltech Cybersecurity Bootcamp is designed to help you develop the skills needed for this role. This comprehensive course curriculum covers defensive and offensive cybersecurity, digital forensics, penetration testing, infrastructure design, and much more. You'll have the access to labs and assisted practices that expose you to several in-demand cybersecurity tools, allowing you to gain practical hands-on experience in a supportive learning environment. Security Analyst. This role involves monitoring and analyzing computer systems, networks, and applications for security incidents and breaches, and taking appropriate actions to respond to and mitigate these incidents. The average salary of an information security analyst is 6 lakhs per year in India and 99,000 per year in the United States. Now, let's discuss skills required for a career in ethical hacking. A successful career in ethical hacking requires strong foundation in cybersecurity and a diverse skill set. Some of the key skills that aspiring ethical hackers should possess include proficiency in programming language such as Python, C++, and Java, understanding of networking concepts like 
protocols, knowledge of operating systems and databases. Expertise in tools and technologies used in ethical hacking such as Metasploit, Wireshark and Nmap and familiarity with cybersecurity frameworks and best practices. Additionally, ethical hackers should have excellent problem solving skills, critical thinking abilities, attention to detail and the ability to work independent or as a part of the team. Continuous learning and staying updated with the latest developments in cybersecurity is also a crucial for successful career in ethical hacking. Now let's have a look at some tips. Starting a career as an ethical hacker can be exciting and rewarding. Here are some tips to help you kickstart your journey. First is demonstrate an ethical hacker mindset. Develop curiosity, problem solving and continuous learning mindset to excel in the field of ethical hacking. Second is obtain relevant certifications. Certifications like CEH, Caltech Cybersecurity Bootcamp, OSCP and Advanced Executive Programming Cybersecurity. These certifications add credibility and demonstrate expertise. These certifications will help you in securing a nice job in the market. Third is build practical experience. Practice ethical hacking in a controlled environment such as setting up your own lab or practicing in CTF competitions to gain hands-on experience. Real world experience will help you develop practical skills and insights into different types of systems, networks and applications. Next is stay updated with the latest threats and technology. Cybersecurity landscape is a constantly evolving and it's a crucial to stay updated with the latest threats, vulnerabilities and technologies. Follow industry blogs, forums and news sources, practice in online communities and attend conferences and workshops to stay informed and continuously improve your skills. And that's a wrap. Congratulations on completing the Ethical Hacker full course. You are now armed with the insights and skills to navigate the complex world of cybersecurity responsibly and ethically. If you like this section, then like, share and subscribe. If you have any questions, then you can drop them in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more from Simply Learn. Staying ahead in your career requires continuous learning and upskilling. Whether you're a student aiming to learn today's top skills or a working professional looking to advance your career, we've got you covered. Explore our impressive catalog of certification programs in cutting edge domains, including data science, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, or digital marketing. Designed in collaboration with leading universities and top corporations, and delivered by industry experts. Choose any of our programs and set yourself on the path to career success. Click the link in the description to know more. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.